Hey guys, and welcome to HTML and CSS from scratch video, where we'll learn HTML5 and CSS3 from scratch using Visual Studio Code text editor. While video will mostly focus on HTML and CSS, we're also going to cover typical Visual Studio Code text editor setup, including nifty extensions, slick Emmet snippets, and clever keyboard shortcuts to speed up our development flow. Since video consists of more than 120 lectures, I find it a bit counterproductive to go over the whole content of the video in this intro section. So instead, why don't we take a look at a general outline of the video? Video will consist of three modules, HTML tutorial module, HTML project module, and CSS tutorial module. In our first HTML module, we will use few slides to get to know what is HTML. And as a side note, video will be hands on and slides will going to be used only very sparingly. After that, we're going to cover how to install Visual Studio Code text editor and Google Chrome browser on our local machine. And most importantly, we'll start working with HTML by learning HTML syntax and use cases. During the module, we we'll also get comfortable with multiple Visual Studio Code features to improve overall workflow. And by the end of the module, we'll be comfortable working with HTML elements. And as a result, we will progress to HTML project module, where we'll use our knowledge to build our first HTML project. Right after the project, we'll deep dive into a awesome world on CSS by first covering what in the world is CSS, multiple ways how we can add CSS to our projects, and general rules and guidelines for CSS. Then we're going to be off to the races to cover as many properties and their values as we can, including selectors and colors, units in CSS, typography, CSS box model, display options, background images, positioning, transitions, animations, and many, many more. I guess that's enough of me chatting. And why don't we learn some HTML and CSS? As a side note, video is part of my Udemy course, where we'll also learn what is CSS Flexbox and CSS grid layout modules and build more sophisticated projects using HTML and CSS. By the way, course projects are available for free preview, so you are more than welcome to check them out. You can enroll in a course by following the link in the description of the video or by searching for my courses on Udemy. Now, what in the world is HTML? HTML stands for Hypertext Markup Language. And what this mumbo jumbo gibberish means is that HTML is not a programming language. It is, in fact, a markup language. Now, why HTML is so important and well worth our time learning it? You see, HTML is responsible for the structure of the web pages. And that makes HTML elements the building blocks of the web pages. HTML elements are represented by this syntax content between the tags. More precisely, opening tag, which consists of the name of the element we would like to use, surrounded by angle brackets, following what will be displayed on a web page, and then the closing tag for the element. For the closing tag, we also need to add forward slash before the name of the element. So if we want a heading in our web page or web project, we would create a heading tag and write our heading. If we would want the paragraph, we would create a paragraph tag and some text that will be in our paragraph. Same would go for the link and you get an idea. Some elements, though, will not have closing tag, like, for example, image or the line break. And there will be times when you'll see for these elements with a forward slash before a closing angle bracket. While HTML5 does not require that, meaning both syntaxes are valid with and without a forward slash. For example, React, which is probably most popular JavaScript framework around today, has a stricter policy where forward slash is required. Just something to remember. Just to give you an early taste of HTML, let me open up a new browser window. And let's say that we're going to be searching for ESPN.com. Now, once we open up the URL, obviously we have our web page. However, we can do the inspect and look at developer tools. And obviously, we're going to cover this during the course. And as you notice here, even though there's a lot of moving parts because this is a complex page, check this out. 
you have all over the place the opening tag and the closing tag, meaning HTML is still responsible for the structure of this web page. And this is why it's so important to learn HTML. In order to do any kind of web development, we for sure will need two things, a text editor to create our project and a web browser to test our results. While there are many options out there for this course, we'll use Google Chrome as our web browser and Visual Studio Code as our text editor. While I can go on and on about why you should pick these two specific tools in a short one sentence answer, both of them are industry leaders and first ones to implement new features. And by doing so, improve our workflow and overall development experience. Both of them are for free and require simple download. While this is not a requirement, meaning you can use other browser and text editor to your liking, if you want the same exact results during the course as me, I would suggest downloading these two tools. First, let's start by getting the Google Chrome browser. So I'm going to open up whatever default browser I have on my machine. And I'm just going to say Google Chrome and we can maybe add, I don't know, download because this should always point us to the right direction anyway. And as you can see, we have the most secure browser on the web and just click it over here and we have an option for downloading and we just bravely click here, accept and install. And this is going to be installed on my machine. Once the download has been completed, we can head over to downloads and notice over here we have the installer package. So we can just click on a package and notice right away it gives us the Google Chrome. So we can just drag and drop it to our applications just so we can have it available. And right now it's saying that it's copying to the applications and we should have it available to us in no time. Now, once the installation has been completed, we can just close it over here. And if you want, you can just eject the Google Chrome and we can just look for it in the applications. So let me see where in the applications I have the Google Chrome. So first of all, let me open this. And once I open it up over here, it's going to ask me whether I'm OK with this being the application from the web. I'm going to say yes, that I would like to open it as well as I would right away going to set it up in a dock. So I'm just going to right click it and this is going to keep it in a dock. Now, also, I would right away like to make this a default browser. Now, again, you don't have to do this, but I would suggest that you do that with me. Just remember that depending on your operating system, you might need to take different steps. Now on a Mac, I'm going to head over for this icon all the way on the top right corner and just going to click on it. So as you can see over here, we have the settings part and we can just click on the settings link. Now within the settings, we're going to scroll down a little bit and notice here we have make it as a default. So I'm just going to click it over here and I'm going to say that, yes, I would like to use Chrome as my default. And that pretty much completes our downloading of Chrome and setting it up as our default browser. OK, awesome. We have our browser. Now what? Well, I believe I told you that we needed also a text editor. So we can put our good old friend Google right now already, since it is on our machine uh, to use. And we can just search for the Visual Studio Code. And again, same old spiel. You can just say Visual Studio Code. Well, we're not going to be looking for logo. We're going to be looking for the Visual Studio Code. And notice this is going to be the first link that pops up. So again, bravely, without hesitation, we just head over here. And as you can see, it tells me right away what operating system I'm on. And it says, well, here is the download buddy. OK, so I'm just going to click it over here. So this is going to start my download again. The installation package is going to be available to us in a second. And again, obviously, if you're using different operating system, they will going to provide you with a proper installation package for your operating system. Now, here you can see that this would be my download, so I can just open it over here. And once I have it right next to Google Chrome, I have my Visual Studio code. Now, again, the same old spiel. I would just need to grab this and just drag and drop it in my applications. So I'm done with getting my Visual Studio code. And again, the same thing within the applications. I would first find the Visual Studio code and I'm just going to open up over here. Now, let me first of all, maybe close this. I don't need the actual browser open. And again, it will going to ask you, are you OK with this? Well, obviously we are since we want to work with this. And before we do anything again, I'm going to keep this in a doc. So I'm just going to say options and keep it in a doc. Now, once we open up the Visual Studio Code and you know what, let me just make this bigger. So it's a little bit easier to see. We're going to be met by welcoming string. 
now in a welcoming screen, we have a few options. We can open up a new file, open the folder. And as you can see, we can also customize this. Now, this is going to be the first time when you're actually downloading Visual Studio Code. Obviously, you're not going to have the recent projects. The only reason I do is because I had to reinstall the Visual Studio Code just so we can go through all the steps together. Now, I'm not going to spend tons of times right now on Visual Studio Code because I would like to get us up and running and actually create our first web page. I do want to show you, though, the general workspace. So let me close this first of all. And as you notice, these icons, right? So we have at the very top, this is where we're going to be working with our files. So as you notice, I'm opening this up and this is going to be the space where we're going to be doing most of our work. In fact, all of our work. And this would be our file structure. So whether there's going to be folders, files or images or anything like that, this is going to be within this tab over here within the sidebar. Now, next, we have a few other things, few other icons that we're not going to use right now. Let's say search throughout the documents. Then we also have for the source control, which would be Git, as well as debugging. Now, again, we're not going to cover them right now because we're not going to use them. However, there will going to be something useful, which is extensions, meaning with every text editor, you basically have capabilities of adding more features to a text editor. And we're going to do that actually in a second. But for now, just remember that these would be basically the extensions that you are, have available. So as you can see here, recommended. But for now, you shouldn't have any extensions installed if you obviously just downloaded the Visual Studio Code. Now, if you would like to search for extension, again, we can just type whatever extension we're looking for. And obviously, this is not going to come up with anything. But let's say we're going to say JavaScript. And this is going to bring me all kinds of extensions. Now, last but not least, regarding Visual Studio Code, something that will going to be important, especially later on, as we're going to be working a little more and more with Visual Studio Code, it's the settings. So if you click on this cog all the way in the bottom, notice it's going to give us settings. Now, settings allow us to customize the workspace. So let's say we want a bigger font size. So I could change this from 12 to, let's say, 22. If I would want a different tab size, Again, we can just change this around. And what I'm trying to tell you is that as the more you're going to be working with your actual text editor, there's going to be times when you are changing your settings to adjust whether that's going to be an extension or just for your personal preferences. Now, also, the settings are, in fact, in a JSON object. So this would be a basically graphical interface, how we can work with the settings. However, if let's say I'm going to change the setting from font size, let's say I'm going to say that this is going to be 22. And once I make the change, the changes are going to be automatically saved. However, there's also an option for the JSON object. And within JSON object, notice something interesting. So now these would be my settings. As you notice, I changed it from whatever it was initially to, let's say, 22. So if I would want to add something else, I'm going to say, I don't know that this the setting for the fonts is going to be something like 30. Now, in this case, I would need to save it. So I have a few options. Either I can go over here and just look for the file and check this out that I can obviously save it, or I would have to use the shortcut and that would be command and S. Again, if you're working on Windows, that probably would be control and S, but since this is a Mac, I'm just going to say that this would be command and S. Now, in my case, again, I'm going to delete this because I would like to come back to it within a few videos whenever we we're going to make our first web page already. But just to let you know that this is where the settings would be located for the Visual Studio Code. Okay, enough of me yapping. Let's start working on our first web page. Now, in order to do that, we will going to need a project. Now, in order to create a project, we just need to create a new folder. And this is obviously a Mac thing where, or I'm sorry, any operating system thing. It's nothing to do with Visual Studio Code or the actual web development, but we would need to create a new folder. Now, I'm going to be creating my folder, as you can see, in a desktop. But obviously, the same thing would work if you're going to go to your finder and let's say we work in documents. I just find it much more straightforward if I'm going to be working with all my files and folders on a desktop. And like I said, I would like to create a new folder. And obviously, I would need to come up with some kind of name. So let's say that I'm just going to call this HTML. Now, you can call this however you would like. Bobby went to town or whatever. It doesn't really matter. So let me save this. And now I have to look at it, how we can get the folder. So the working project 
to the visual studio code. So first of all, let me go back to the file. And as you can see, we have multiple options. So first of all, I can just click over here on open folder. And you know what? The settings is for now a little bit annoying. So let me just close this. And here I can click on it. And this is going to give me an option. So if I go to the desktop, I can just click it over here. And this will open up the folder in the actual Visual Studio Code. Now, we also have an option of, as you notice, if I'm working with Visual Studio Code, then I'm going to have this file tab. Now, within the file tab, notice again, we have either open recent or in general, we would have open. Now, again, this would work the same way. We click on open and this is going to direct me to the folder already because I obviously was just here a second ago. Now, last but not least, there's a very nifty feature where we can just drag and drop it. So if I'm going to grab this project that I have right now or folder or directory, call this whatever you would like and just drag and drop it here. And this is going to do the same thing where, as you can see right now, I have my folder available to me and I can start creating files and other folders maybe within this project folder and basically get up and running with my project. All right, all right, I have the folder, but how do we create our first web page? Now, first of all, let me just make this bigger again so we can see everything that's happening. Now, second, it's easy to see that everything is in very small fonts. And like I said, we will going to fix this later. But just to give you a tip, whenever you're working again with Visual Studio Code, you're going to have an option of zooming in. So as you can see right now, if I'm pressing Command and Plus or Minus, I'm zooming in or I'm zooming out. I'm going to zoom in so we can see really clearly what we're doing, but we are going to fix this in the next video and we're going to start working with our settings. Now, first and foremost, we're going to have to create a file. Now, again, we have a few options. As you notice here, we have a little icon and when I'm hovering over it, it says that we can create a new file or there's another option where we just right click it on the sidebar. And again, we have multiple options and what we're interested in is new file. Regardless, the result is going to be exactly the same that we can create a new file. Now I want to call my file, my first file index HTML. And both of these things are important. It's important to call this index as well as it is important to have this extension of HTML. Now the reason for HTML extension, because there's going to be different files. There's going to be maybe not maybe there's actually going to be CSS files later on. There's going to be some JavaScript files and all kinds of files. So this tells the browser of what type of file this is going to be. Now, second, the index is important because whenever you're going to download your project or upload your project to the server, this is going to be your home page. So if you're going to home page, this is going to be index HTML. If you're going to have an about page or contact me page, you'll name this however you'd like. But your home page will going to have to be index HTML. Now, on the right hand side, like I said, this would be the space where we're going to be doing all of our work, which would be our workspace. Now, since we know that HTML is made up of elements, let's create our first two elements. And again, we will cover them in bigger detail later on, but let's just get up and running with our first web page. So first of all, we'd like to have a heading one. And again, syntax was the opening tag and a closing tag. Now what's going to happen with Visual Studio Code this will automatically going to create the closing tag for us. So we don't need to worry about it. So here I'm going to say hello world. And then let's also add maybe a paragraph. And again, we had an option of just creating the paragraph tags or paragraph element. And I'm going to say this is my first web page. And again, please don't worry. I'm going to go over detail what these things mean in the later videos. But just for now, let's get up and running with our first web page. Now, as you notice right away, you have this one as well as you have this little circle here. Now, what this says that you haven't saved the file. And again, if you would like to save the file, you have two options. You can head over to the file and then we can just click on save as well as it tells us right away the shortcut, which would be command S. So either you just press on the file or command S. And now we're going to save the file. So how do we look at our first web page? Well, we're going to have to navigate again back to our folder or project or again, call this however you'd like. And notice right now you have this index HTML file. However, it has this little icon right next to it. And maybe in your operating system, the icon might be different. But the general idea is that we can open up this file in the browser. So how do we do that? 
Well, first of all, we can just double click or we have an option of right clicking and notice it says, well, open with. Well, since we already set it up the Google Chrome, this is going to open up as a default browser. But the same way would work if you would have a different default browser. If I'm just going to double click this, this is going to open up in the your default browser. So again, since in our case, both of them are exactly the same, it would have the same result regardless. And sure enough, now I have Hello World, and this is my first web page. Now, again, this is not most sophisticated web page. However, this is a job well done since we created our first web page successfully. Now, making our first web page was a lot of fun. However, there are a few nagging issues that I would like to fix. And first of all, those would be our workspace settings. So I'm going to head over again to the cog and then I click on the settings. And now I'm going to open up this settings window. Now, within the settings window, first of all, I would like to change here the font size. So again, if you'd like to search for it, as you can see, we have an option on the search bar. And again, if I'm going to type something, this is going to bring me whatever setting I would like to change. So I'm going to say here that this the new font size should be something like 26. So as you can see, this is going to be automatically saved. Now, next, again, just to show you that we have other option where we have the JSON object, then I'm just going to click it over here on the little icon. And this is going to open up my JSON object. Now, on the right hand side, these are going to be my settings or our settings that we're going to have. And remember, just by changing the zoom level, notice the setting is right away over here. And again, we didn't do this in a previous screen. Remember, we did it previously when we were zooming in and zooming out. So for now, your zoom level, let's say, is at two. However, if I'm going to press it one more time, notice it's going to zoom in. And now my zoom level is going to be at three. Now, within this screen, the way it will work again, it's going to be the similar way because again, we can look for something. Now, what I'm looking for is the tab size. So I can just say tab size, and this is going to bring me to the editor and tab size. Now, we're not going to be able to do any kind of work here because it's going to complain that this is going to be read only. So if I'm going to try to change this something here, this is not going to work. However, we're all going to have an option of editing. So if I'm going to click on this little pencil, it says right away, copy to the settings. So the moment I'm going to do that, this is going to copy to the settings where I can change them. So in my case, I would have them. I would like to have them as one. Now, again, depending on how you like to work, your zoom level is obviously going to change. For me, I'm going to leave this for now at two. And later on, I'm going to see how this is going to work. So what we can do right now is just close both settings and we are ready to go. Now, another nagging thing about our first web page is all the manual labor that we need to do. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, let's say that in my first web page, I would like to change from hello world to hello people. Well, we can definitely do that. So again, we're going to head over back to our document. I'm going to go over here within the content that's going to be displayed on the page. So within the heading tags, and I'm going to say hello people. Now, again, we would need to save this. And again, you can prefer the shortcut or the long way through the file system. And here I'm going to save this. Now, once I save it, I need to head over back to my web page again and refresh it. The moment we refresh the page, obviously we have hello people. And while this does not seem like a lot of work right now, trust me, the more and more we're going to be learning and working and experimenting, this is going to get annoying really fast. In order to fix that, we're going to install our first extension for the Visual Studio Code. So I'm going to click on this icon and now we would need to search for our extension. Now, if you'd like to search for extension again, we would do this in a search bar. So here I'm just going to type live and the name of the extension is going to be server. Now, this is going to bring up the extension that we're looking for. And as you can see, the moment I make the sidebar a little bit bigger, we can just see more clear what this extension is all about. Now, if you want to have more information about extension, which you should probably read a lot of times before you install this extension. So that is a good option. You can just click on it. So double click on it. And then you're going to have this info window. Now, if you'd like to install the extension, we're just going to click on the installing of the extension. And now we would need to reload the Visual Studio code. So we're just going to click on reloading. And sure enough, now we have our extension available. How do I know that? because these are the extensions that we have on our machine. And these would be the recommended extensions, as well as the moment I'm going to start typing the Visual Studio Code is going to be suggesting me extensions 
obviously based on what we're typing here in the search bar. So with all that being said, what I can do right now is first of all, minimize it just so you can see a little bit better what's happening. I'm also going to close whatever the web browser we had before. So I'm going to close this browser thing. Then let's also maybe make this smaller as well as open it up in the actual file system or I'm sorry, not file system, basically in the folder. And then once we have all that, what we would need to do is right now navigate to our workspace. And once we are in our workspace, again, we have few options. So either we can go here where we have go live. So this is going to open up the live server or we can right click it. And again, we're going to have the option of open with a live server as well as we have a shortcut and the shortcut would be command L and command O. Now I'm just going to press on the go live over here. And this is going to open up our local development server. Now, what's really nice about this? Why we would prefer this way instead of the previous way? Well, first of all, the way the course is going to be setting up is I'm going to set up them side by side. So I'm going to open up this guy. So my Visual Studio code, as well as my code editor, I'm sorry, my uh, local development server on the right hand side. So all the changes that we're going to be doing, we're going to be able to see right away in our live server. So let's say that I'm first of all going to close this because it's complaining that we don't have a proper structure, which we will going to do in the next video. So don't worry about it. But let's say if I would like to change this back to the hello people, I can just delete whatever I would like to change. And we're going to write hello world. Now, for now, nothing is going to change because we still don't have the proper syntax for the HTML document. So basically, there has to be structure. However, later on, we're going to have an option where every time we're going to be making some kind of change, the changes are going to be showing up right away live here on the right hand side in our local development server. And trust me, in the long run, that makes our lives much more easier. While we are very happy with our first web page, as we should be, it's hard to miss an error message by the live server in the very bottom of the screen. So there has to be something missing in our web page. Now that something is a proper HTML structure. So let's take another quick pit stop in the slide wheel to discuss that. You see all HTML elements follow the same basic structure so that the browser that renders the file knows what to do. At the very top, we have a doc type declaration that tells the browser what HTML version the page is written in. The doc type you see in the slide corresponds to the latest version of HTML which is HTML5. Next, we have HTML root element that will wrap all our code in the page and will always contain one head element and one body element. And notice how everything is kind of sandwiched, nested inside HTML element. By the way, that is really important. And we'll discuss that in more detail once we head back to text editor. After HTML root element, we have HTML head element that will contain information about the page, like, for example, page title, page metadata, and links to external resources like CSS style sheets and JavaScript files. Content within the head element will not be visible on a page that is being rendered. And with your permission, I would like to hold off on covering head element content in any more detail, because at this point in time, we have more important business to attend. In short, head element will contain information about the page and will not be visible on the page that is being rendered. Now, body element is whole another ball game because this is where we'll do all of our work, like adding headings, paragraphs, links, and basically creating our fantastic web pages. Now that we know the basics of HTML page structure, let's implement it in our first web page. Now that we are big shots and we know the basic HTML document structure, let's implement that in our page. So first of all, let me just get rid of this heading one and paragraph because we're going to redo this anyway. And let's start with our doc type. So here we're going to declare what version of HTML we're going to use. And in our case, that's going to be HTML5. So as you can see right away, Visual Studio Code gives you a suggestion. It's like, hey, listen, do you want a doc type? And sure enough, we do. Again, this is not a cheating. There's nothing wrong with that. That will going to save you a lot of time in the long run. Now, next, we'll have HTML root element. Again, let me get our all caps and we're going to write HTML. 
now within the HTML, remember we had the head element, and within the head element, we can right away place a title again. Title is just going to be uh, where the title of the page is going to be displayed. So here we're going to say first, not fist, but first web page, and then let's go right away to the body. And let's write within the body, there's going to be two more things. Heading one is going to be hello, my name is John, or whatever name you obviously would like to write. So hello, my name is uh, John. And then we're going to write, I don't know, in a paragraph. And this is my first web page. This is my first web page. Now, once I'm going to save it, nothing is going to change right now, because we still would need to restart the server. Because now we do have the proper actual page structure or document structure. So let me do this. Let me just go over to the port and click on disposing it. So now you can see it's going to say that the server is going to be online. Okay, fair enough. And then let's go live. So the moment I'm going to go live, notice this is going to be my page with the title here at the very top. So I can close this tab. And now let's test it out whether live server is working properly, where we can type something. And the moment we're going to save it, the changes are going to be displayed live in a live server or an in dev server. Sorry. So let's say, and this is my first page and uh, it is very good. And let's add a bunch of exclamation marks here and let's save this. And sure enough, the moment we save it, notice what happens. So all the changes were being displayed right away here on a live server. So what's happening again is we don't need to go and refresh because live server is doing for us. So development server is working hard. So we have to work less hard. Now, also, I would like to right away show you that with a dev server or with the live server, we have an option of right away where we every time we're going to be working, there's going to be changes displayed. And for this, we have auto save. So let's do this, this guy. And then every time we're going to be typing something, it will, in fact, going to be displayed right away in a page. So let's say after the heading one, I'm going to add another one. So as I'm starting to type, notice what happens in a live server. So in this case, we don't even need to save anything. The moment we're going to be typing something or adding something, the changes are going to be displayed live. However, I do find it a little bit annoying, especially when you start working with things like JavaScript. So I usually have my one off. Now it's really up to you. However, you would like to prefer to work. However, for this tutorial, I always will going to have my one off. So first I'm going to make the changes. And then I'm going to save the changes and then they're only going to be displayed here on the page. Also, I would like to talk about how the tags are nested. So as you notice, we have the HTML and HTML would be our root element. And then we have two children. And the reason why they're called children, they're sitting within this HTML element. Now, the two children are the head element as well as the body element. Now, it is important to keep the syntax. Because this will not going to make sense if you have a child within the head element. And then let's say the closing tag of this title is going to be removed and placed, let's say, outside the head element. You always need to follow the structure where if you have the element and if you nest something within this element or sandwich it or whatever, however you'd like to call it, it's important that the closing tag also is going to be sitting within the same element. Now, the same would work here in the body. If let's say I would get rid of this closing tag for my heading one and place it inside the body or even outside HTML, it will not going to make sense. So this is something also you should remember about children and parent. So the parent is going to be the parent element where the child is sitting. And as you can see, the child can also can have multiple or one other child elements. So even though the head is the child of HTML, it can have the child on its own meaning the title element in this case would be the child of the head. Now, I know it might sound foreign with children and parents, everything, but just remember that it is important to follow the syntax where if you're placing something within the element, make sure that that element's closing tag and opening tag are actually sitting within this element. And the same would go over here. Don't mix, let's say, heading one with paragraph. Don't place the closing tag for the heading one within this paragraph, because again, you're going to get errors and it will not going to make sense. Excellent. 
we now know how to implement basic HTML document structure. Our live server is working correctly, and we're good to go and start actually working more with HTML, meaning learning more HTML elements. However, before we do that, let me quickly show you two very important things that are going to come very beneficial as we're going to be working with HTML elements. Now, first of all, I would like to talk about the word wrap. As you notice, since we have the paragraph and it's quite a long and let's say if I'm going to be adding more here exclamation marks and I'm going to save it, everything is going to be displayed nicely in the page. However, notice what happens with our actual text editor. So now I need to start scrolling left and right. And you can say, well, you can always zoom out, right? So I can keep zooming out. However, what if we're going to be adding more text here? That's not going to make sense because then basically I'm going to have to make it really small. And first of all, for the tutorial, it's going to be very hard for you to see as well as in general, whenever you're going to be working, this is not going to make sense. So what would be the solution? Well, again, we're going to have to go back to the settings. So we're going to click on a cog and then we'll look for the setting of the word wrap. So again, let me find this and then you're going to have this control how lines should wrap. And here in this case, we just need to say that this would be on. So instead of off, that was there before, we're just going to go for on. Now what's going to happen again, this is going to auto save right away. And we can just see that in a text editor right now, this is going to wrap the line. And again, this will you make your life easier because you will not going to have to scroll left and right as well as zoom out. So now, whenever you're going to have a longer line, this is just going to wrap into a new line. Now, next, I would like to talk about Emmet. Now, one in the world is Emmet. You see, Emmet is something that speeds up your HTML workflow. Now, if you're using different text editor, you can still access Emmet. However, in the Visual Studio Code, Emmet is built in. Now, again, if you would like to have a little bit more information about the Emmet, you can head over again in the Google and just type Emmet, and you'll see that this is essential toolkit for web developers, where we can quickly write a bunch of code. Now there's tons of things about Emmet, and again, I wouldn't want to spend again, a lot of time on that. However, in our most basic example, what's going to happen is that every time I would like to create a HTML element, I don't have to start by the angle bracket. I can just say whatever element I would like to render. So let's say I'm looking again for heading one. Notice the moment I'm just going to type H1 and the same is going to be for you. We're going to have a suggestion. And as you can see, it says clearly Emmet abbreviation. So what happens is if let's say I would like to have heading one or heading two or heading six, I can just type head like H and then we can choose whatever heading we would like. The same would work if I would want a paragraph. Again, I just need to type whatever name of the element or let's say not the name of the element, but starting letter of the element and Emmet is going to do rest. Now, if I would like to render that element, I would have to press tab or return. So basically the enter key. So once you press it, notice right now I have my element. Now, again, this is just the most basic thing that we can do with Emmet. And later on throughout the course, obviously we're going to expand our knowledge regarding Emmet, but just on a very basic level, this is going to save us from again, typing and typing and typing unnecessary HTML, where we can just look for whatever element we would like. And right away, it's going to be rendered. So let's say here, I'm going to say this is Emmet paragraph, meaning paragraph, like with just a P. Uh, notice if I'm going to save this, sure enough, I'm going to have, and obviously I didn't save it first. So now once I save it, notice I'll have this is Emmet paragraph. So all this is very cool. Again, if you'd like to find out more information, you can just head over to this Emmet IO. And if you're using different text editor, you should be able to install it as an extension. However, with Visual Studio Code, it comes in pre-built. Now, last but not least, all this work that we did, we could have done it actually with an Emmet. So let me delete this. And once you're going to have an exclamation mark, so I'm going to press shift and exclamation mark. And notice again, this is going to give me Emmet abbreviation. And the moment we press enter, notice what happens. So now we're getting the proper HTML structure that we worked on in the last video. So this pretty much saves us time where we don't have to retype this. And again, please don't focus on these meta tags. We were going to talk about them once we already have sufficient knowledge of HTML. There's no point right now to fill your head with this information as well as this language. Again, 
what we need to focus right now is the fact of the title that's sitting within the head element as well as all the work that we're gonna do in the body element. So let me close maybe the summit for now. As you can see right now, this is still saying hello, my name is john. But once we're gonna save this, I don't know, uh, proper uh, structure, let's call this this one structure, structure. And as you can see, my typing is just awesome. And here we're gonna have just a simple heading one with title of the page being a document. Excellent. We're finally gonna take a deep dive into HTML components. And our first component is gonna be headings. Now we obviously have already covered headings because I need to do something with examples. Pretty much I couldn't have them empty. So you're already a little bit familiar with headings. But let me go over the whole spiel again. Now basically headings would be titles. So if you think of any kind of document, you're gonna have a title. And for that we have headings. Now for the headings, we have six types starting with heading one and ending with heading six. And obviously heading one would be the biggest one and heading six would be the smallest one. So let's start with heading one. Again, we can use Emmet obviously, and we can have a tab or enter or a return. And then here I'm just going to say I am, I am heading and we're going to type heading one. Now what I'm going to do right now is I'm just going to copy and paste this line. And later on, I'm going to show you some keyboard key fits. But for now, we're going to be basically doing this manually like we would do normally on a computer, meaning we're going to do it with copy and paste. Later on, we're going to look at a keyboard shortcuts that we're going to improve again our workflow tremendously. So let me first of all copy this and let's say to the second line. And maybe for this one, let's make it as a heading two. So let's change these values as well as this guy. So let me save this. And sure enough, now I have a heading two. Now, maybe in this case, I can just copy and paste it again two of them right away and one more time. So then I'm going to have six of them. So here we would like to change the values. So this would be heading three, heading four, heading five and heading six and the same old spiel over here. Well, obviously not heading six, but we'll have heading three, heading four and heading six. And again, same old thing, like with the rest of the elements that we're going to have, we're going to have the element that is enclosed in an angle brackets as well as the closing tag. So whatever is going to go inside between these two tags is going to be my heading. So obviously, if you want to write a paragraph, you can write a paragraph in a heading. Now, I don't know any case where you would want to use that. Obviously, title is self-explanatory. That is the title. So depending on how long of the titles you write, whether it's one word, two words or 10 words. But in general, you probably wouldn't want to have a title that is actually a paragraph. We have specific paragraph tag for that. Now I digress a little bit, but let's say, first of all, this is going to be heading three, heading four, because I didn't add the numbers. Sorry, I was cheating a little bit. So let me save this. And sure enough, as you can see right now, we have six headings. So depending on the situation, obviously you would pick a heading that you would like to use for that particular situation. Hey guys, just to let you know that starting from this video, if we will write any code during the video, if you would like, you can access lecture code for that particular video in the zip folder in the video resources. So let's take it out for a spin. Let's say that we're going to be looking for the heading elements and we would like to get a source code. We can either click it here. As you can see, this would be the resources. Or while you're watching the video, let's say within the images, we can start watching the video and then we can pause it because we don't listen to this guy. And let's just say in the resources, we're going to have the availability for the images zip. So this is how we can access the images zip. In both cases, you're going to download the zip folder for that particular lecture. And then as I'm going not to my documents, I would like to go to the downloads. And you'll see how I have two zip folders. Now we can just open up these zip folders and we're looking for the folder name. And again, this is going to work exactly the same for the image. So I'm not going to show you for both of them, but we can just drag and drop it or however you would like to open up in your text editor. Now, if you want to save it, obviously you would need to use it for your downloads and then maybe put it in your documents or something like that. But the general sense would be that if you'd like to access the code that we write in a video, you can always have access to it in the video resources. So far, so good. We have headings covered and now we can move on to paragraph. Now, before we start covering paragraph element, let me just quickly correct myself. I believe in the last video I said HTML components. And components we have in react in HTML, we obviously have elements. So what I meant was 
heading elements, not heading components. So I would like to correct that first. And second, I would like to show you that starting from the last video, whenever we're going to do any kind of coding in the video, there's going to be resources for you. So as you're watching, maybe it's hard to understand something. You can always go underneath the resources of the video and you can just download this. Now, obviously, in the download, what you're going to have is the same exact thing we were doing in a video. So it's not like I'm going to send you some kind of black magic over here. This is going to be the same information we already covered. As you can see, this is going to be zip file. Now I already automatically open up the zip file and I'm going to have my index file. Now, I don't think I need to go as far as opening the index HTML to show you that this would be same exact thing. Now, for the project, it might be a little bit different because already previously for the previous projects, uh, you noticed that underneath the setup video, we had the whole zip file where it was the starter files as well as the finished project. Now, as I'm re-recording the course, I might add a, again, folder for each and every video that we're doing. That might be something that I'll do, not because I wouldn't want to do it, but unfortunately, I have a pretty bad memory, so I might forget. But I hopefully I'm going to try to remember. So the same would go for the projects as well. But in general, for sure, I'm going to try to do that with tutorials. So everything that we covered in the last video, it should be accessible for you in resources. OK, enough of talking about again about everything else, but the actual HTML. And now let's get rid of all the tags since you can have always access them in the actual resources. And let's say what we would need for a paragraph. Now for the paragraph, this is going to be very straightforward. We have P. So that would be a letter P, which would reflect a paragraph element. And again, same old spiel, same old syntax, opening tag, total closing tag. And here we can write whatever a novel if we'd like to do it. Now, again, like I said, you can still do it in, H in the actual heading, but probably paragraph is where you're going to put your content. So here I can just say, I don't know, some kind of content and I can just keep on typing. And as you can see, since we have the nice uh, word break, everything is formatted really nicely and we can just save it. And this is going to be my paragraph. However, if we're going to head over to the browser in the bigger browser window, and let's say I'm going to type 127 because that is where the local development server or live development server is going to serve up my index.html. Notice that everything is sitting correctly like it should be. But again, here as well, I have the zoom for 200 again, just so we can see better everything that we're doing. But in the essence, that would be it about the paragraph. Again, it is very straightforward. We wouldn't just need paragraph tags and whatever text is going to be sitting within these tags is going to be displayed as paragraph. I also need to mention that HTML is white space collapsing. And your probably first question is, white space what and what does that mean well white space collapsing means that html is just going to ignore extra spaces now it's going to be easier for me to show you than talk about it for three hours so first of all let's say that there's going to be a heading three that will be on top of the paragraph and in the heading three i would like to write hello and world however i would decide that it's going to be better for my website so I'm going to add like, I don't know, whatever amount of space is in between. Now, what do you think is going to be rendered on the right side in the live server? So Mono, I'm going to save this. Check this out. All the extra white spaces were ignored by HTML. Now, the same would work if I would try to create some space in between the heading three and paragraph. Again, we can test it out the same way. The moment I'm going to save it, nothing is going to change on the right side. And not because there's some error or the live server is not working but because of the simple fact that HTML is ignoring all this white space. Now, the point of this is that in HTML, if we would like to create spaces in between the elements or within the elements, we need to use special HTML elements. Now, I'll look at them a little bit later. But again, if you have been testing it out and if you're confused why, if you're adding the space in between, it's not working. The reason for that is HTML is white space collapsing. While we're still on the subject of the paragraph, I also would like to cover dummy text. You see, there's going to be situations where you know that there's going to be some kind of content, but you don't have the actual content yet. And also, as you can see, in this case, it would also serve me really well since that I don't have to type all this gibberish. Now, how do we can create dummy text in HTML the fastest way? We've seen Emmet, and let me just delete this first. 
if I'm gonna type lorem, you will notice that I'm getting some kind of command. So if I'm just gonna press it over here, notice what's gonna happen. So basically, we're gonna be getting a dummy text lorem ipsum text. Now we can control how big it is because for now, as you can see, as I save this, check this out. So this would be my text, and there's just specific amount of words. However, I can also control how many words I'm getting from this dummy text. So I can say lorem, and then I would need to specifically say how many words. So if I would want 50, I'll write 50. If I would want 10, then obviously I'd get 10 words. And again, press tab or return. And sure enough, we're going to be getting this dummy text. Now, if you don't like for some reason using Emmet in your HTML, then you can also search for this lorem ipsum. It's kind of universal dummy text. So you can just say lorem ipsum, and you're going to be getting tons of generators that pretty much give you the dummy text. Now, if you like to be a hipster, you can just use lorem ipsum hipster. And this is just going to give you a dummy text that has basically a bunch of hipster words. So let's say I could say five paragraphs. Again, we just click on beer me. And as you notice here, instead of this Laura Mipsum typical dummy text, we're getting all kinds of hipster words. So if you are a hipster or you would like to be a hipster, maybe you would want this dummy text as a hipster Ipsum. These days, it would be really hard to find a website without images. So maybe let's see how we can get images to our HTML. However, the issue is that first we would need to get an image to our system. So some kind of image that we would use. So first of all, let me get rid of this paragraph. So I can just delete it and save it. And obviously there's going to be nothing here. And now we're going to go online and search for image. Now I can obviously do it here on the right hand side, but I think it's going to be easier for us to see if I'm going to open up the new browser window and somewhere I'm going to make it and we're going to maximize it. So again, it's easier for you to follow along. And let's say that we're going to search for some kind of image. So let's say uh, Udemy, Udemy image. And let's see some, what's going to come up. Instead of some kind of text, we're going to click on images. And now we have plenty of images to choose from. Now, in this case, I'm going to get this one. And in order to save it to our machine, we would need to use the save image as. And this is going to save the image. Now, obviously, this is going to somewhere save it wherever we are would like to. So in our case, we would like to save it in the folder that we're working on. Now, you can save it in desktop if you want, but eventually you would need to have access in the HTML. So I would suggest right away navigating to HTML folder or folder, whatever you have for this examples, and then save this image. Now, in my case, I'm going to call this Udemy, and then this is going to give it the PNG extension. So now I'm going to save the image and sure enough, we have the image. Now getting the image was the first part and we can obviously double check it in HTML. Sure enough, this is going to be our image. Now we would need to see how we can get it in a document because on the left hand side, we can see that we have new file. We have Udemy PNG. However, it is obviously not showing up in a document. Now the way we display or render images in HTML document is you guessed it, the image element. Now for the image element, the actual syntax would be IMG. So I can just start typing IMG and then it gives us plenty of options. Now we can just go with the regular one and notice what happens. We are giving the image element. And remember the Im image element was without a closing tag. So this was a self closing element. However, we're noticing two interesting things. We're getting something called source and alt now source and alt are attributes so whenever we are thinking about html elements whatever is going to be in in between the tags is going to be rendered however attributes would describe the element so there's going to be attributes that are specific to a specific element and then there's going to be attributes let's say that each and every element can have now for the image we have the source attribute now, source attribute is going to tell us where are we going to be looking for the image? Because obviously for HTML, HTML would need to know where to get the image that's going to be rendered. Now, alternative is going to be if we cannot render the image for some reason. So let's say the path is wrong or something is not working correctly. Then this text is going to be displayed. Now, as always, I think it's going to be easier 
for me to show you how this would work. So if we know that we have this Udemy dot PNG now in a source, we would need to specifically say path. Now path is where this image is located. And if the image is located in the same folder, we just need to have forward slash and check this out what happens. So now we have two options. We have either index HTML, which is the file that we're working and we have you Udemy PNG. So if you are in the image element and you would like to render this Udemy image, which one do you think you would have to pick? Index HTML or Udemy PNG? I think that would be Udemy PNG. So once I save this, notice what happens. Sure enough, right now I'm getting my image. However, let's say, but first of all, I'm going to change this. And I'm going to say for some reason, I'm going to mistakenly say that this is going to be JPEG, not PNG. First of all, then let's see what happens. Now the image is not displayed because our path is wrong. It's not correct. However, if you would have the alternative here, and we're going to say um, image of Udemy. And sure enough, now we're going to have the image of Udemy. So this is going to be displayed if we cannot access the image. This is going to be like a alternative syntax if we cannot render the image properly in the HTML. So first of all, let me fix this. Let's say that this will going to be PNG. And again, we're getting back our image. So let's quickly reiterate what we learned in this video. First and foremost, if we would need the image, we would need to get the image from somewhere. Now that could be from Google, like we just did. But later on, we're going to look at a alternative sources, how we can get images. Then once we have the image in our project, in order to access the image, we would need to use the image tags. So the image element. Now image element is going to have attributes. Now, one of the attributes is going to be the source. And the second one is going to be alternative. Now, for the source, we need to show the path. And if the path is going to be in the same folder, we just use a forward slash and then whatever name of the image. However, we also are going to have suggestions from the Visual Studio Code. So if we're really not trying hard, it's kind of hard to mess it up. And then alternative is going to be displayed if the HTML cannot find the image. Even though everything is displayed correctly in the live server, if we're going to try to run this with the browser. So first of all, let me open up the browser window. And of course, it has to be massive right away. And let's say that we're going to look for our file, which in our case is going to be index.html. Notice that we're not going to see the image. So we're getting this alternative text. Now, the reason for that, because file system is giving you a lot of hustle because of this forward slash. Now, I know we haven't covered yet the comments in HTML, and we're going to do that in a few videos. But let me just first of all, copy and paste this two more times. And let me just show you what other options you have for getting the image. Now, first and foremost, as you can see, I actually made a mess a little bit because I didn't want four of them here. Let's start with a simple one. Now, alternatively, we could just write like this without a forward slash. And once we save it, notice in the live server, everything is going to be displayed correctly as well as in the file system. So if I'm going to refresh it, check this out. So now we have a nice image. And also we have another option. So let me copy and paste this line and let's comment it out the previous one. We have an option of having the dot and then the forward slash. And again, this is going to do the same thing where I can save it. Everything is going to be displayed correctly on the live server as well. It's going to work in a browser because as you can see, once I refresh, there is no errors or in our case, just there's no alternative text. Now, your question probably would be, well, if we can use this guy, why are we using these forward slashes and these dots? And the reason for that is even though I don't like to throw a lot of things in the beginning, eventually the more web development you do, and as you're going to start progressing with node or PHP, or let's say, I don't know, react, you're going to see a lot of these relative paths where you have dot and then you have forward slash. So that would mean that this is in the same directory or you're going to see two dots, which would mean that this would be in the actual folder, maybe outside the directory. And the point of this is for you to get used to this syntax. So later on, once you see it, you're not like deer in a headlight, you know, OK, so this means that this would be in the same directory. And then two dots are going to mean that if it's outside the directory. Now we're going to cover two dots later on as we're working with CSS, because a lot of times CSS is not going to be in the same folder as index HTML. So I'm not going to cover that right now. 
just please remember that if you would like to open up in the file system, you can use one of these two options and it's going to be displayed correctly. However, throughout my projects, I will going to use this dot syntax because I think it's going to make a lot of sense in the long run. So you are very used to the syntax once you progress to that stage. Okay, we have the image that is in our local project. So far, so good. And what about if we're just going to go on top of the image again? Let's use heading three. And let's say image of Udemy, Udemy logo, something like this. Again, we can write whatever we would like to. Do. Now, we have the heading three, we have the image. What about the images that we can directly access from the web? Okay, let's think about it. So we have the image. Image has the attribute of the source. And source points somewhere, meaning in our case, that would be to the same directory where we're working. In. Can we maybe use this source and point it to the image that is actually somewhere on the web? Well, let's test it out. First of all, let's have the heading three that would say image of uh, YouTube logo. Again, we can name this however we would like. And now you can see that I have heading three and heading three. And between them, I have here this image. Okay, let's test it out. So first of all, again, I'm going to open up the new browser window. Again, I'm going to maximize this. And let's write YouTube, not dot com, logo. Then let's specifically say that we're looking for the image. And in this case, what we would like to do, instead of using save as that we did before, remember, we used save image as, now we can have an option of copy image address. So let's click on this. Now the address is going to be copied to our clipboard and we can head over back to our HTML. We can again create a new image element. And in this case, within the source, let's copy and paste whatever we're getting back from our clipboard. Now, the annoying thing is going to be this, that the, obviously this path is so long. So again, I'll tell you right away, this is going to be very annoying whenever you're going to be getting something like this from the web. So unfortunately, this is how it is. But we can write over here that maybe for alternative YouTube uh, logo, something like this. Again, we just want to quickly see it. And that's it. And sure enough, everything works fine. We have our image. But annoying part would be the fact that source would be displayed like this. So as you can see, it pretty much we would need to spend like three minutes just to scroll up and see all the source that is starting here at the very top. Awesome. We know how we can add image to our HTML document. However, where we can get nice images and more importantly, copyright free images. So first of all, let's get rid of this external one because it's going to annoy us really fast with all these lines of code. So let me just delete this guy. And sure enough, right now, I'm just going to have the Udemy logo. And while getting your images simply from Google is fine for whatever small projects we're doing for our own use, whenever you're going to be doing something commercial, you're going to get in a lot of trouble if you're just going to say, let's say some kind of images, and you're going to be using them for your commercial purposes. So what we need to do is get images that have no copyright issues that are copyright free. And obviously, there's many sites that you can use, but I usually prefer using three of them. So one of them would be Pixabay. Then I really like Pexels. Mostly I'm getting everything from the Pexels. And by the way, Pexels also has the video ones, as well as you have Gratisography. And with the Gratisography, it's more like funny pictures. You see us like with a bunch of people. And again, it would work exactly the same way. So if you're going to go to the site and if you're going to find whatever you're looking for, and let's say in the pixels, we would like to have technology, something like this, then obviously we're getting very high quality and copyright free images. So in this case, let's get this laptop. And again, it would work the same way. Save images. Again, we would save it here. Let's say laptop. That's going to be the name. And we're just going to get whatever uh, extension it provides us anyway. So I'm going to head over again and we're going to test it out one more time where we're going to say that this is not going to be image of Udemy. 
I'm gonna write image of Pexel's laptop. And let's do right underneath the heading three, the image tag again. And we know that we have the source attribute. And within the source attribute, again, we're looking for the images. Now, since I would like to have the laptop, I'm obviously going to choose the laptop. And let's say here, this would be the image of laptop. So Pexel's laptop would be my alternative text. So I'm going to save this. And sure enough, I'm getting my image. Now, the issue is that the image is really big. And this is something we're going to cover in the next video. But first of all, let me just double check it how this is going to look in my regular browser, meaning not in this small one that's right next to me by the actual text editor. So you know, let's do the same thing. We're going to look for 127 port 5000. And sure enough, still, this image is going to be much bigger. So in the next video, we're going to talk about it, how we can adjust the size of the images. Okie dokie, we have one decent size image and one very big oversized image. So how we can render them exactly the same size or at least the second one smaller than it is right now. Now, before we do anything, I will right away. I want to tell you that, well, this may be the fastest way. However, you need to understand that later on, you're going to learn better ways that some of them are going to involve CSS. And some of them are just going to involve cropping the image before we even render it. But I'm going to get into this in the next video. In this video, I would just like to show you how we can use attributes, the HTML attributes in order to do that. So first of all, let's test it out. How big is the image? So let's say for the Udemy one. So once we click on image, notice the image is going to be rendered. And there's many ways how we can check it. But the fastest one probably here. You notice this is going to be 259 by 194. So those would be the pixels. Then for the laptop, obviously, this is going to be bigger. We have 1000 by 668. Okay, so we already know that we would be looking for something like this, where we have 259 by 194. Now, whenever we're working with an image, not also we are getting the source attribute and the alt. We also have an option of height and the width. And again, this is going to be very straightforward. So as I start typing, notice again, we're getting a suggestion that we're going to be looking for the height attribute. Now, also, like I said, we have width. Now, if we're going to type width, it automatically is going to adjust the height. So width is probably even going to be the fastest one. So if I'm going to say, let's say 260, because I believe that the first one was 259. And you know what? I maybe wouldn't want to do this with Udemy logo because this is already rendered correctly. So my apologies. Let's get rid of the width on the Udemy logo and let's navigate to the laptop logo or laptop image. Let's be more precise. And let's add here that we would want width of 260. So let's notice what happens. Now, sure enough, I'm getting my width and I right away, like I said, the height was adjusted. Now, if you still like to readjust the height specifically, so let's say the height in my case would be something like 100. Notice now I'm just going to make sure that the height is 100. But again, if we're going to get rid of this, then obviously we're just going to have the width and the height is going to be adjusted automatically. And this is how we can basically the fastest way how we can readjust the height and the width on the image in the HTML. I couldn't be more proud of ourselves. We know how to use width and height, and now both of our images are rendered exactly the same. However, there's a big issue. Even though we change the width and height, or even if we do it in CSS, which again, we'll learn later on, the browser is still rendering that massive image. And what happens is if you're going to have tons of massive images like this, then your user, whoever is going to be using or visiting your website, is going to experience very slow load times. And usually what happens, the user is going to wait for three seconds and then it's just going to leave and find a different page. So even though we have here width of 259 and 194, what we're actually rendering is still this guy with 1668. And there's multiple things that we can do. In general, we would use some kind of application, whether that would be Photoshop or something like that. Or there is maybe a quick way 
meaning obviously it's not the best one. But let's say as we're working just with HTML and CSS, and we just want to quickly crop the image, we can use the actual Mac. Now, if you're using different operating system, you would have to research it how it's done on, let's say, Windows. But on the Mac, it would be kind of simple. We're just going to look for what image we would like to crop. And as you notice, once I right click it, I have an option of open with. And once I navigate to the preview, I'm going to be given options. Now, within the options, I'm going to be looking for tools. And with the tools, we can just adjust the size. So this is the tab that we're going to be looking for. Now, the moment I'm going to click on it, notice here I can change the actual dimensions of the image. Now, here on the right side, you might be having different one. Let's say you might have percent or inches. I would suggest going for the pixels. And then if you have over here this lock, that means that if I'm going to change the width, the height is going to change automatically. So if I'm going to write 100, notice this is going to give me 67. Now, once you click on a lock, now you can change both of them. So in this case, maybe I can say that the height is still going to be 1,000, but the width is going to be 100. Now, again, this is really up to you, however you would like to do it. In this case, it doesn't really matter again. Let's say that I'm going to go with, again, 259, by I believe, right? And let me lock this. I notice uh, I messed it up a little bit, sorry. 259, and this is going to give me 173. So I can just click on OK. Now this is going to quickly crop my image. And again, this is probably nothing, something you would do in production. But in general, just for projects, whatever we're going to be doing, this is going to be good enough where you don't need to learn how you can start using the actual Photoshop. Now I'm going to head over back to our project. Notice again, we have 259 by 173 instead of 1000. And I can also get rid of maybe these guys. Again, it was a good thing to learn. It was beneficial for us. But in order to save our user a trip to a kitchen, let's say to make a coffee while our page loads, we can obviously just crop them images. And that way, everything is looks much nicer and also performs much nicer. While we're still on the topic of images, I would like to talk about path in general HTML. Now, in this example, we're going to look at the images and how the path is important for images. However, please remember, later on, we're going to be working with new pages, meaning there's going to be multiple pages that we're going to be working with, not just index HTML. We're also going to have about as well as contact. So the same we're going to work with whenever we're working with HTML files or CSS files. Now, what I'm talking about. So let's say for now, again, we have two images. The world is great. We are good to go. However, imagine a site where you have 50 images and you have, I don't know, 25 CSS files, and then you have multiple JavaScript files. Now, what's going to happen is you're going to have to start having some kind of structure. Having all the files here in the folder is not going to make sense because it's going to be really messy. So the logical thing is going to be setting up, let's say, images to the side. So there's going to be a special folder with images. In reality, you're going to have images folder. And then within the images folder, you're going to have another folder for, let's say, home page images and then about images. And you get the point. Now, in our case, we're just going to start very simply. We're going to create a new folder. And let's say image folder name is going to be very simply images. Now, what I would like to do right now is move these images because obviously that was the whole point. Now I can move them one by one, or I can just press on the second one as well as the first one. And in order to select them both, you would need to hold the command key. Now, once we hold it, notice I can just drag and drop them. And now I'm dropping them off in the images folder. So as you can see, Visual Studio Code is saying, hey, listen, buddy, are you sure this is what you would like to do? And I'm just going to bravely say, yep, this is exactly what I would like to do. And notice what happens. Hmm. I have the heading three, so that's good. I have the other heading three, and I don't have my images. Now, again, the reason why I don't have the images is because this path is correct only if the images are sitting in the same folder. Are they sitting in the same folder? Well, no, right now the images are, in fact, in the images folder. So what we would need to do is, again, we can obviously add it here, the extra path. Where I'm just going to delete is because this is just going to make a little bit more sense. Again, we do the same thing. Now we do the forward slash. 
now forward slash is gonna go to where? Well, it's gonna go to images folder, and now we're looking for the specific image we would want. So in our case, you demi. So again, this is very important because you will gonna use this for your CSS, for your JavaScript, for your images. Make sure that the path actually makes sense. If it is in a separate folder, you need to look in that folder, and then you're gonna get an image. Now let me fix this the same way. And again, like I said, we can just add it here. So let's say add it and images. And sure enough, once we do that again, this is going to override it. So again, let's look for the laptop. And sure enough, this is going to be proper rendering option since now we have a proper path. So always, always please remember to make sure that your path is correct. At this moment in time, our HTML document is small. I would even say tiny. So adding comments would probably be an overkill. However, as your projects are going to grow bigger in size, it's wise to have some kind of documentation what is happening in the project. And for this, we use the comments in HTML. Now, the syntax for the comment would be very simple. We have the angle bracket. Then we're going to be looking for the exclamation mark. And then we have two dashes. Now, the moment you type that, as you notice, you're having this green line. So now whatever we're going to write is not going to be shown on a web page. So in order to test it out, we can just say hello there. And notice the moment I'm going to save it, it's not going to be shown here on a web page. Now, again, we can write here a novel if we would like to. But in general, you would just write some kind of comments about what is happening, whether you're working with the team or whether you're just working on this by yourself. Because trust me, if you'll work on something, let's say, two weeks ago, and then again, you load the file when you're starting going through comments really help you to get up and running of what's happening in your project. Because even though you created it, trust me, two weeks later, it's going to be hard for you to remember. Now we also have an option of just creating comments with a shortcut. And that shortcut would be very simple. We would have to press command and then forward slash. Now the forward slash is going to be left from your shift key. And just like that, again, we have the comment. So let's say here I could say um, Udemy image, image, then we're going to head over to where the second heading three is. And again, I'm going to create another comment. And let's say laptop image. Again, in this case, this would be clearly an overkill. But in general, this is how we would work with comments. And I also would like to show you how we can use the line break, because having a comment is one thing. Oh, you know what? No, I forgot to tell you something. We also have an option of adding the code within the comment that we would like to hide for that particular time. So let's say that I would like to just check how this image on the laptop was going to look like. However, I wouldn't want to delete the Udemy altogether. So what we can do over here is we can create a comment. And as you can see, this would be my comment. And if I'm going to place whatever HTML elements I would like within this comment, they're not going to be displayed on a page. So for now, I just cut them out and copy and paste them in here. Now notice, first of all, they're green. So we can see already that they're not going to be rendered. And the moment I'm going to save this, check this out. So obviously, I don't have this anymore rendered image. Now, obviously, if you would like to render it again, just delete the comments and everything is going to be working fine. So that's another use where you would use a comment where let's say you would like to test something out, how something looks, but you don't want to delete that other part, and then you would just basically comment it out. Now, like I said, back to the line breaks, because as you can see, even though I'm adding here, let's say more space in my HTML, obviously nothing is happening in my web page. Because again, HTML would be white space collapsing. So instead, we would need to use the element and the element would be line break. Now the syntax for the line break would be very simple. We would just need to write BR. And again, we can use Emmet for that, obviously. And obviously, if I'm going to press on it, notice this. So now I'm starting to get some kind of line break. Now that obviously is only one break. So let me just copy and paste it to add a few more just so we can see for sure that we have more. So one, two, three, so four, something. And the moment I'm going to save it, notice I'm getting line breaks. Now that would work whether in between the image and having three, as well as if we're going to add some line breaks over here. So again, let me just cut this out or copy and paste it. And we can do the same thing over here. And obviously, the more line breaks you're going to add, apologize, 
then the more space you're gonna have in between. Alrighty, then by now we know that images are important. However, what's also important for every web page is to have some kind of link. Now that could be a navigation link when we were going to be navigating throughout our project. That could be the link within the actual single page, or it can be also the external link. So let's say our user can visit, I don't know, Facebook or Google or whatever, some kind of external information. Now, as you can see right away, I did some spring cleaning here because I usually like my tutorial screens kind of just bare minimum because I think it's just going to help us all if we're not going to clutter here. Now, obviously, it's a different scenario whenever we're going to be working with a project because there's going to be tons of information. But for tutorial, I always like to have it as clean as possible. Now, what about the links? How we can create links in HTML? Well, we already know the deal, right? We need to have some kind of tags, and then we're going to place the link within the tag. Now, what tag would be for the link? What would be the element name? Well, for the link, we're going to use a and sure enough, right away, we're going to have our link available. Now, within the link tags, this is where we will write the text. So let's say visit Udemy for more information. Now, as you can see, this one came out really long link. And sure enough, now I have my link. Now, what's going to happen once I click this link? Well, let's think about it. If I'm going to click on it, where I'm going to go. So I click on it and nothing happens. Okay, the reason why nothing happens is because we also need to fill out the href attribute, which comes right away with Emmet because they are doing all the work for us. So if we would manually be creating this, obviously, we would have to write the href attribute ourselves. Now, the href attribute tells us where the user or whoever clicks on this link is going to be navigating to. So here we would need to write the URL. Now, here we can just say HTTPS and then the whole deal. Or if you don't want to make mistakes or maybe you don't know the full URL, maybe it's really long. You can just head over to whatever URL you're searching for, which in my case would be Udemy. So I can just copy and paste this and we can head over back to the href and paste it within the quotation marks. And now once I save it, then the user should be available or user should be able to go to Udemy. So as I click on it, notice now we're navigating to Udemy page. Now there's one thing though, you probably don't want user to leave your site. Because at this moment, notice we went to Udemy, but we left the site that we were currently on. So maybe it's better if we would add the attribute and the attribute name is target. And we would need to set this to blank. So underscore blank. So this would be the value. Now, in this case, what's going to happen? And uh, first of all, I would need to navigate back. And what I would like to do right now with target blank is whenever a user is going to click on a link, instead of navigating and this didn't happen because I needed to refresh probably or something like that. So I have target blank visit Udemy for more. Everything is saved. And sure enough, now once I click on a link, instead of navigating away from the site that the user is currently on, we're opening up the link in the new browser tab. So this probably should be a better option, especially with an external ones where we're adding this target attribute as well as we're setting it equal to blank. Sure thing. Now we know how to create external links. Well, what about internal links? Well, you see, at the moment we have only one home page, but eventually for the project, let's say we're going to have the about page, the contact page. So we would need to set up some kind of navigation. But in order to set up the navigation, we would need to have the links that would point to those pages. So how do we do that? Well, first of all, let's create that new page. Let's say the new page is going to be about HTML. Now we already know how to create a structure. So again, we're just going to have a simple exclamation mark. And then let's say in the title, let's write not document. And let's say about, then we're going to know that we're navigating to about page. And then right away, let's create first of all, a link that's going to be pointing back to the home page. So as we know, again, it's going to be very simple. We just have the link and then here we're going to be pointing to somewhere. Now, in this case, we're not pointing back to the Udemy. In this case, we're going to say where we would like to go. And in our case, we would like to go back to the home page. So as you can see, we just need to point to the correct file. Where is the home page? 
and let's write here back to home page because that's going to be enough. I also would like to re remind you or to show you that we can write anything within the link. What's important is the href. So regardless of what we write over here, we're going to be navigating to whatever we're pointing to here in href. So just because we're saying here, let's say, go to Udemy, doesn't mean that we're going to go to Udemy. This is just going to be text that's being rendered. Now, once we have our about HTML set up, we'll head over back to index HTML and maybe somewhere on the top of the image. Again, we're going to create a new link. And in this case, we're going to be navigating to about HTML. So within the home page, we're going to be pointing to about page. And let's say about page or just about is going to be good enough. Now let's save this. And sure enough, now I have my link. Now, in this case, if I'm going to click on the about, notice I'm navigating to the about page since I know that, first of all, the title is different as well as I have my link. And if I'm going to click on the about page, then I'm going to navigate back to the home page. So this is how we set up links internally within our project. Good enough. We know how to set up external links as well as internal links that will allow us to navigate throughout our project. However, let me show you the case where we would want to use some kind of link within the actual page that we're working on. Now, for this example, you have two options. Either you can create a paragraph with some kind of long lorem text. So let's say 5,000 words or something like this. So that is going to create a very, very long text. Or we can say some kind of line break. Now I'm going to use the line break example, but again, it doesn't really matter what you do. Now, before that, we need to set up some kind of paragraph where in, in the paragraph, let's say some text here. So this is going to be my paragraph. And then maybe right after the paragraph, let's just create a simple link tag for now. Again, this is not going to point anywhere, but we we're going to write back, uh, back to the top again doesn't really matter what we write but we should have some kind of link now okay like i said i'm going to use the line breaks but you can create a new paragraph and add some kind of text now what i'm trying to show you let's say i'm going to have one line break however i'm going to copy and paste it and make like i don't know 50 or 60 of them let's save this and what we have right now so we have the page and let's imagine that this would be some kind of long content. Again, it can be anything, the text, it can be images. It doesn't matter. The point of this is the user needs to start scrolling down because the user is reading this content and scrolling down and all the way in the bottom, we have some text here. Now, what do you think? What would be a better user experience to tell the user to scroll back up? And again, imagine this being really long scrolling, not just what we are doing right now or to have some kind of link that would navigate back to the top of the page. Well, I think the link would be a better option, right? So how do we set it up? Now, in this case, the link is going to be pointing back to ID. Now, I know we haven't covered the ID, and I would like to cover ID in more detail once we cover the CSS, because I would like to cover it together with classes. But for now, the only thing we need to do is instead of pointing to some kind of external resource or internally to the page, we need to have this hashtag and then we would have the ID name. So here I'm going to write top. Now, what hasn't happened yet is I haven't created this some kind of div or whatever, any kind of element that has this ID of top. So I'm going to head over back to the top of my page and maybe where I have the about before that, I'm going to create a heading one. And within the heading one, I'm going to say top of the page. Now, what I would need for this element is to have this attribute of the ID. And again, I'm going to cover IDs in more detail once we start learning with CSS, because I think it's just going to make a little bit more sense. But with an ID, now we would need to have the name. And since I'm pointing here with an href to the top ID, obviously, this would also have to have the same name if you would want this to work. So here I'm going to write top. Now what's going to happen in this case, and maybe let's add a little bit more line breaks, just so you believe me that this is actually happening. So let's add more line breaks. And as you can see right now, I have to do more scrolling. 
but the moment I'm gonna click on it, as you see, I'm navigating back to the top of the page. So this is how we would set up the internal links within the actual page where we would have some type of element. And again, it can be any kind of element that will going to have the ID. And once we have the link, if we're pointing this link to that particular element, and obviously the names need to match. Don't write here. I don't know, John Doe, because this is not going to make sense. Then if the names match, we will going to be navigating to that particular part of the page. Up until now, all our examples with links were with text. So we had some kind of link and then we placed the text within the link. And then obviously the link was displayed and we were navigating somewhere. However, we also have option for placing different things within the link. So we're just not limited to the text. So let's test it out. So let's say here on top of the page. And again, this is just so we can see a little bit clearer. Let's place a link. And for now, let's say the link is going to be, I don't know, going to uh, the same thing, maybe udemy.com. Again, just to save me a little bit of time, I'm just going to grab this text. You can obviously write it if you want, but I'm just going to copy and paste it. And instead of placing the text of Udemy or John Doe, whatever we would like to place there, we can place an image. So let's say here, I'm going to have the image. We know that we need to have the image element within the image element. We're going to have a source. Now, in this case, let's look for the images. Now, within the images folder, we also have an option for laptop. So I'm just going to grab this image and you know what? Just so it looks a little bit better. Again, let's add maybe a width of 200. So it's going to be a little bit smaller. I'm going to skip on alternative attribute and let's see what's going to happen. So as you can see right now, I have the image. The difference, though, is as I'm scrolling or I'm sorry, as I'm hovering over the image, check this out. So I have this little icon that tells me that pretty much this is a link. Now, as I'm hovering over the Udemy image, things like that don't happen. So what this means is that this is actually a link right now. So if I click on it, sure enough, I'm navigating to Udemy page. Now, last but not least, now that we know that we can also place an images within the link, we're not limited to the text. I also want to show you that, let's say, if you don't know right now at this point, where your link should be navigating. Let's say you know that there's going to be a link on a page. However, you don't know right now the URL. What we can always do, we can just place a hashtag. And that way we can be having a link. So it's going to be a link. It's going to be displayed as a link and it's going to be clickable and everything, but it's not going to navigate anywhere. So that's also an option. I mean, again, you can call this however you'd like. This could be an empty link. This could be a dummy link. It doesn't really matter. The main point is instead of placing the URL within the href, we're just placing a hashtag. Job well done. We covered links in the HTML. Now I'd like to switch gears a little bit and take it easy on us. So first, I would like to just get rid of all this information. Because like I said, I would like to keep this clean. So everything within the body, I'm just going to delete. And the moment, obviously, I'm going to save it. I'm going to have the blank page. And here within my text editor, I would like to talk about sub and sub elements. And they were going to be as straightforward as it gets. So let's say we're going to have a creating a heading one. And within the heading one, I'm going to say, um, hello, hello, I am. And here I would like to say first John in town. Now I could obviously write it like this. I can say first, first John in town, or I can use sub and sub elements. And again, this is going to be as straightforward as it gets. So first of all, let me create a little bit of space. And as I stop typing, notice again, I'm getting from them at the suggestion. Now, what I would like to do right now is grab this first and play, place it within the sub. And again, you're going to see in a second what happens. So I'm going to spare us a little bit of time and let's just create these elements first. And then obviously it's going to be very clear of what is happening with these elements. So we don't have to spend hours and hours of talking about it. Instead, we can just look at it. So in this case, I'm going to use the sub element where the first one was sub and the second one was sub. Now, the moment I'm going to save it, notice what happens. So I'm having my text and then everything that's going to be placed within a sub is going to be here on the top of the rest of the text. And everything that's going to be placed in the bottom is obviously going to be here in the bottom, meaning everything that's going to be placed in the sub element is going to be 
eventually shown in the bottom of the rest of the text. So like I said, as straightforward as it gets. If you ever need it, you can use sub and sub elements. Good. We know how to use sub and sub elements. Next, let's look at how we can work with strong and emphasis elements. Again, we're going to do the same old spiel where I will going to create some kind of paragraph. And let's say within the paragraph, I'm going to say, I don't know, 30 words. I think that's going to be more than enough. And then if I would like to use the strong and M elements, we're just going to have to create them somewhere within this paragraph. Again, they can be really anywhere. Just make sure if you would like to have the Emmet suggestion, you need to make like a little bit of space. As you can see, if I press space bar, then this is going to create a space. And now I can write whatever element I would like to have. So since I'm looking for the strong element, this is where I would like to place some text. So again, I'm just going to grab whatever text I would like over here, be it three words or the whole sentence. It doesn't really matter. And the moment we're going to copy and paste it, notice that the text that is within the strong tags is bold. Now let me cover emphasis and then we're going to go a little bit more detail because there's more than the meets the eye with these two elements. So let's say again, we're going to pick some words again, whatever amount of words we would like. So let's say M. So that would stand for emphasis. And let's say in this case, pick a little bit more words and just copy and paste it. And sure enough, as you can see right now, the text that is within the emphasis uh, element is right now displayed italic. So it's a little bit slanted. Now, the key with these two elements is, like I said, there's more than meets the eye because we could have achieved this simply using the CSS. And in general, you would always prefer CSS just because you want to have all your styles in one place and serve as HTML just for a structure. You don't want to mix and match them. Now, in this case, however, is the fact that within the strong and within EM elements, meaning emphasis elements, also help us with accessibility. So let's say you have a user who is accessing your project with a screen reader, then the screen reader is going to treat this differently. Let's say whatever is within the strong, as well as whatever we have within the emphasis. So that's always you should keep an eye on whatever you're working with strong and emphasis elements. There's going to be some cases where we would like to use special characters in HTML. So maybe let's look at it, how we can work with them and how we can access them. So first and foremost, let me get rid of this paragraph. We're not going to need it right now, as well as let's create a heading one, maybe. And you know what? I didn't want to delete the body. So let me just uh, go back. And here, let's say that there's going to be heading one. And within the heading one, we would like to use the copyright special character. So I can just write over here, copy, right? So some kind of text. And then how I would access the special characters in HTML. Well, first of all, I would have to access the ampersand sign. And if you know that you would need to do the shift as well as on my keyboard, at least it's above the uh, number seven. So notice now I'm getting my ampersand sign. And next, I would need to come up with the name that I would be looking for. So obviously, I already know that I'm going to be looking for a copy and check it out. I would need to write whatever the character I'm looking for. And then I would like to use the semicolon. So the moment we're going to save it, I'm going to have the whatever text I had, as well as the special character. Now you can look for special characters. Obviously, online, there's a bunch of tables that give you all kinds of names. I'm not going to go through those tables. It's really going to be time consuming and a lot of wasted time. Just remember that whenever you would be looking for some kind of special character, Again, you can just Google HTML special characters, and it's going to give you tons and tons of options that you can place it within your HTML element. But again, the syntax would be exactly the same. We would have the ampersand. Again, we would know some kind of name or number that we're looking for, and we would finish off with a semicolon. And then we're going to have this special character displayed in our HTML document. A very useful element in the HTML is onward lists and order list. Now, how do we create an order list and order list in the HTML? Well, first of all, we would need again the element and the element name for the unordered list would be UL. And sure enough, right now I have my unordered list. However, if I would want to have some kind of items within the unordered list, I would need to use the LI element. So the syntax would be for unordered list 
we would have the onward list element and then each and every element within this onward list we're going to have the l i element and here we can write whatever we would like so let's say we're just going to have some kind of name and i have right now the list item with this bulletin point shown as the list item now if i would like to copy and paste them so let's say i'm going to create two more second one is going to be peter and third one is going to be sarah i'm going to have these three list items displayed as on order list now the question would be well where are we going to use the list well biggest one where we always use the honor list would be for navigation so for now obviously we only have the about page but imagine that we're going to have multiple pages we can just place our links here so either we can create a new one or i can just uh, delete these guys and say let's delete peter let's also delete sarah and within the list item within the honor list instead of placing some kind of text we can place a link now again i'm going to use just an empty link or a dummy link and let's write here home then let's grab this link and let's just copy and paste it within the next two list items and let's just write over here about as well as i don't know contact would be our third one since we do have the about maybe we can also write the about but i'm not going to navigate there again we already covered this with the links now the moment we save this notice we have our navigation now, obviously, keep in mind, we haven't added any kind of CSS yet. This is where the magic happens when we go to the CSS and start styling. But in general, this would be our navigation, where if I'm going to click on it, notice, obviously, I'm going to go to the about page, as well as I have the other links displayed as list items within my on order list. Similarly, we can also create order lists. So first, let me just delete the on order list. And again, syntax would be exactly the same. The difference would be we're not looking for the unordered list, which has the element name of UL. We're looking for the order list with the in the element name would be OL. And here again, we're going to do the LI. And again, maybe let's write some dummy text. So the first ordered list item would be John. Then the second one will be Peter. And the third one, we're going to have Sarah. And let's see what we're going to have. Not Sari but say ra and the moment we'll save it notice that this would be number one number two and number three again the same idea as with on order list however we would need to use the different element name and then we would have the order list instead of on order list we also have an option of creating the nested list so let me again delete the order list first and let's create a new on order list but again it would work exactly the same way with both of them so again, the syntax was UL, and then within the unordered list, we have the list item. And again, let's start first with John, then copy and paste it. And the second one is going to be Peter and Sarah. So our simple unordered list and Sarah. But let's say that we would like to add some more specific information about Peter. And in our case, the fact that he already knows HTML and CSS. Now within the list item, so within the list item where we would like to have our nested list, we were going to create either an order list or or list. So in our case, let's switch it up a little bit and have it as a order list. And again, we're going to have a list item. Now, in our case, let's say first one is going to be HTML and let's copy and paste it. And the second one is going to be the CSS. So the moment we'll, we're going to save our HTML document, we were going to have John, then the Peter is going to have already the nested list where not only he has a list item with just the name we're also going to have our order list within this list item and this is how this is going to be displayed and again you can get really creative with that if you'd like but just to let you know that this would also be your option if in your project you're going to have to use some kind of table we also have an option of working with tables in html now before we do that obviously as always we'll need to get rid of this on our list first and then let's start working with our table element now, if you would have to guess how we would have to create the table element in HTML with everything that we already know so far. Well, I think you probably guessed it correctly where you said, well, first, we're going to have to create the table element. And then obviously for each and every table, we would have the rows and as well as we would have the columns, right? So in order to create a row, we would need to create a row element. 
and then within the row, this is where we would create our data. And again, whatever columns we would like to create, meaning if you would want to have 10,000 columns or if you would have four columns, the same thing would work where we would have the table data element. And then within the table data, this is where we write our information. Again, let's just have some kind of dummy text with the John. And this is going to be my table data. So if we're going to copy and paste it again, and let's say the second one would be Peter. Then again, Sarah. And again, for the HTML tutorial, I don't see the point of coming up with some kind of exclusive examples. This is just going to give you general understanding of what's happening. So the moment table data I'm going to be adding, meaning the more columns I'm going to be adding, then obviously the more columns are going to be displayed. Now we also have an option of having the table headings. So in our case, we're going to have, let's say, TR. And within the first table row, we have a element of TH, which would stand for table head. And within the table head, we can write again whatever we would like. So I'm just going to say here some info, and we're going to copy and paste it. And now I'm going to have three table headings, as well as three regular columns in the second row. And if I would like to create more rows, I would just have to create again, new row element, and just keep on adding the table data elements. For every web page, there in most cases is always a form that allows us to collect some kind of data, whether you want user to sign up for something or whether you just want this personal information, his or hers, you would need to set up the form. Now, how do we set up the form in the HTML? As always, we're going to have, first of all, the form element. And now within the form element, notice we're going to have the action. Now, I need to tell you right away that whenever we're working with forms in HTML and CSS, we will just going to be displaying because we're all going to be working only with the front end. Now, in order to collect the data, you would need to work with the back end language, like, for example, PHP. So in our case, this action, as well as there's going to be another one that you're going to see a lot, which would be the method is not going to mean anything. Because again, we're not going to collect the form. And there's also going to be few attributes that in our case, are not going to make any kind of changes. But later on, as you're working with PHP or JavaScript, this will going to make sense. Now what we were going to do later on as we're working with CSS projects, so not HTML projects, but CSS projects, we are going to use the service called form spree, which is for free, by the way. So again, don't freak out, you're not going to have to pay anything. But this service, the form spree, is going to allow us to have our form, but the data is going to be submitted to our email. So as you see, they're still using the action and they're still using the method. And just to quickly go over, action basically would mean where this information would be sent and the method would mean how this information is going to be processed. And with the post request, you basically would be adding information to the server. Again, I digress a little bit, but just to give you a general idea. Now, like I said, we're going to keep on working with the form. So the first thing that I would like to look at is the input, because that's going to be our most basic type of form input that we're going to have is just a general input. Now, with an input, you're having multiple types. You can have, let's say, input as an email, but the most basic one is going to be text. So in this case, we can just write text. And the moment we're going to press tab or enter, we're going to be getting this form with, let's say, type, like I said, text, which would be the most basic one. And we have a few more attributes. Now, again, name attribute is going to be used whenever we're collecting the data, because this is something that's going to be shown. Again, in our case, we can write whatever we would like over here, and nothing is going to change. Now, the ID is going to be used for label, which is I'm going to show you in a second. But for now, let's say that I would want to save it. And as you can see right now, we're having our first input. So I can obviously go ahead over here and type whatever I would like, but nothing has happened. Now, for every element that we're going to have in the form, meaning the input element, we also would like to have the submission. And when I said for every, meaning for every form out there, you would also want to submit it, right? Otherwise, what good does it make if you have the form, but you cannot submit it? Now, again, I'm going to repeat in our case, we're not going to be collecting the data. But I would still like to create the form submit elements because you are going to need them later on anyway. Now we have two options. We can use just a simple button. So let's say we have the button. And within the button, we can write type. 
and for the type we would have to write submit. Now, if you're reusing the button, then obviously we're gonna write our values in between the button element. And if I didn't cover before in the HTML the button, again, button would be extremely straightforward. We just write the name of the element, which in our case would be button. And then we have multiple types of button. So in our case, this would be the submit button. So as you can see right now, the submit button is shown. Now, if you would like to have some kind of space in between them, for now, we're going to use the actual line break. But later on, as we start working with divs, we are going to see how we can use this using the divs. So the moment I'm going to save it, I'm going to have my input. I can write whatever I would like to have in my input and I can start clicking submit. Now, for now, what's happening is the form is being submitted back to the same page. Again, this is what happens if we just leave this blank. So you can just write some kind of value, click on submit. Notice we're going to have our name here, but again, we're not going to work with this right now, but in general, the form is going to be empty again because we have resubmitted this to the same old page. Now we also have an option of input of submit. So not only the button, but also input. So let me first comment this out and let's write that this is going to be input. And for the input, I would like to have again the options. So maybe we can just type the input first and notice if I'm not selecting with Emmet what kind of input I'm going to have. I'm going to have the general text one, but here I'm going to change this and I'm going to say that this is not going to be equal to uh, text. It's going to be equal to the submit. Now, the moment we're going to save it, see this, we have right now our submit. Now, this is all working great and fine. However, I also would like to see what's happening with the ID. Now, ID is going to be used for label element. So above the input, let's write that there's going to be a label element. And within the label element, we have the attribute of four. Now within the four, this is where we are targeting the ID. So in our case, if we know that the ID eventually is going to be the name, which is going to be the value, then the moment I'm going to have the four attribute, I'm going to have to add the same ID that I have for the input that I'm targeting. And let's say here, I'm going to write first name. So this would be in my label. Now what's happening with the label then as I'm clicking on the label, Notice right now my input is going to be highlighted. And if I'm going to change this, if let's say I'm going to make a mistake and this is not going to be a name, we can click all day long and the label is not going to be highlighted. So that would be the purpose for the label. As well as we have other options, let's say we can have the paragraph. So we don't have to work with label, although in most cases it does make sense if we're actually implementing the label whenever we're working with input. So now let's look at other options that we have for the input. And again, we're not going to cover all of them, but let's look at more popular ones, which would be password and email. So again, the same old deal. We can write input first of all, and then for input, we can either use the element where we have just the colon and then we're picking, or we can just have the general input type and then change it. So in our case, let's write that we would be looking for the password. And again, we can write the name or we can have two options here. So in this case, since we're not going to be using the name attribute anyway, we're not going to be collecting the data. Maybe let's write above the input that there's going to be paragraph and let's write password. So again, we're not limited to just using the label. We can just use the simple paragraph and we're still going to have the input. Now, maybe to have it displayed a little bit better, let's add the line break first. So this is going to be our submit. And then what we're going to have within the par password. Now we have two options. We can either write a placeholder. So let's write a password. And the placeholder is basically going to be displayed just to give you a general idea of what the user should be typing. However, the moment I'm going to start typing, notice, first of all, the password or the placeholder is going to disappear, as well as with a type of password in for our inputs are going to be hidden. So there's going to be just these little bulletin points. Now I also have an option of the value. So the value attribute for the input and to show you how the value attribute works again, let's create a new input. And for this, we're going to write first of all line break. And in between these two line breaks, let's create the input with an email. And maybe in this case, let's use the semicolon or I'm sorry, colon. And let's say that we're going to be looking for the input type of email. Again, name doesn't really matter for us. ID as well. 
if we're not using the label. And also, I need to let you know that not only for the label, we can use the ID. Uh, it's obviously can be used whenever we're working with JavaScript. That's also another option. But I, again, I digress a little bit. And within the input type of email, we will going to have to submit the correct email, meaning there has to be an ad sign. So if I'm going to try to submit something that doesn't make sense. So let's write maybe email. Uh, I don't know, email, email, email. Then as I'm going to be clicking submit, notice there's just going to be a little bit of uh, HTML validation where it's going to say, well, you cannot submit because there is at missing. The at symbol is missing in your input type of email. So if we're going to write something like some gibberish, like email uh, at email, this could be an option. So let's say email at email. Again, this is not going to validate the actual correct email, but we will going to be able to submit right now because we did add this ad symbol. And last, within just simple input types, I would like to point to you to the value. So the value attribute is going to allow us to hard code something. And that, in most cases, you would use something like this whenever you would like to have some kind of data already. So let's say you're editing something. So there has to be some kind of data that's already being passed on. So let's say in here I could write email at email.com or something like this. Whatever we would like here, whatever we would like to write here within this value. And sure enough, right now I have already hard coded data. Now, the difference between the placeholder and hard coded data that the moment you start working with the placeholder, the placeholder is going to disappear with the hard coded data. This is already going to stay. So with the value, the value is going to be actually displayed. Now, where we could use the value? Well, as you can see here, we have the input type and the type was submit. But what if I would like to change the text? Because by default, we're having here this submit. So here I can just say value and let's say uh, submit, please. Again, whatever we would like to write over here, it doesn't really matter. And the moment we're going to save it, obviously, I'm going to be having the submit, please. So these would be the basics of how we can work with input types. And again, we would first need to have some kind of type. And the most simplest one is going to be text. Then we're going to have usually a name attribute, which we will use only when we are submitting the data. So whenever we're collecting the data and then we have an option for the ID attribute, the ID attribute we can use with the label or if we're going to be working with the JavaScript, then for the label, it will allow us to click on the label. And if the IDs match with the four attribute, then the form is going to be highlighted with the password. We're going to have our bulletin points. So the password is going to be hidden for the placeholder. The information is going to be before the user types anything. But the moment you start typing, obviously, the placeholder is going to disappear. Now, the value is going to give us the hard coded values whenever the form is shown right away. So I can obviously submit this also with hard coded data, but it's still going to show up right away because I still have my value. And we have two types of options of how we can submit the data, whether that would be the input with the type of input, as well as just a button with a type of submit button. Input elements are not the only thing that we can display within the form. So let's look at the other popular ones. Now, with your permission, I'm just going to continue working with the same file. Again, if you would like to access the resources of the previous video, you can just download resources for the previous video. But after the email input, we're just going to look at the few other more popular ones. Now, the first one is going to be text area where we can have some longer description. And you can already see that right away as we start tapping with them. And this gives us a few attributes that we haven't seen before. Now, first one would be columns. And the second one is going to be the rows. So let's say we would like to have some kind of description. Check this out. So again, this is not going to be styled very nicely right now because we have everything all over the place. But let's say that if we would like to have some kind of line break in between them, again, just for styling for now, we are going to have our description, let's say here. And maybe we can just add the paragraph of the description. And we can obviously write our description within our text area and columns would mean how many columns. So if I'm going to say 40, I'm going to have 40 columns. If I'm going to say 20, I'm going to have 20 columns. And the same thing would go for a row. 
now also we have the radio buttons and for the radio buttons. What's unique is that you can have only one value, meaning you can submit one value. That's the whole point of the radio button. Now you don't have to specifically do it that way, but that would make sense since they're obviously were designed for that. Now again, let me add another line break just so it's going to be displayed better. And let's say that we're going to have a paragraph which asks, uh, please, please select, select uh, your favorite coding language. So hopefully this is written correctly. Once we have our paragraph created for us, what is your most favorite coding language? Let's also maybe add a question mark. It's going to make a little bit more sense. And then we are going to be working with input type of radio. So again, we can use the semicolon or we can just create a basic one and change it. So I'm going to use the right away Emmett. And here I'm going to have the name and ID. Now I'm not going to need any of them for now, meaning I will going to use later on name, but for now I'm not going to use it. And let's just write that this is going to be JavaScript. So once I'm going to save it, notice I'm going to have my radio button and there's going to be some kind of value. Now, the thing is with the radio buttons, the names should match. Because the whole idea behind radio button is the fact is that you would just choose one of them. Later on, you will going to have select boxes where we can pick multiple. But if you would like to use radio button, the name of the input should match. Now, how this is going to look like? So first of all, let me copy and paste this. So let's say there's going to be three of them. And let's write that the second one is going to be Java language. And the third one uh, we're going to have as Python. Python. Now, the moment I'm going to save this, I'm going to have an option of choosing one over here. Because again, the idea was would be that if I'm selecting something now, you also would want as you're submitting it as some kind of value, because you not only would want to click on the radio button, you would like to collect the value. So in our case, we're going to hard code that this is going to be JavaScript. Now, obviously, value has to match to whatever you would like to submit. If you would like to submit some kind of John Doe, obviously you would need to write it in the value John Doe. So in our case for the Java, we're going to write over here Java. So this is going to be my value as well as for the Python. We're going to copy and paste it. And here we're going to write Python. I hope you understand the whole purpose of this, since you would want to submit this kind of data, whether this is going to be the JavaScript language or Java language and the radio button is going to allow you to choose which one you're submitting. However, the value is going to be the one that's passed on whenever we are adding this information to the data. And this is just showing what the user is picking. So again, in our case, we're not using the actual value for now, but it is obviously important to use it later on as you're actually submitting the data. Now, if you mess up here with this name, remember the name attribute, all of them need to match. Because if I'm going to do like this, if I'm going to say that Let's say the second one is going to be not coding. It's going to be coding. And if we're going to save it now, the trick here is that I can pick JavaScript and I can pick Java. And this is not something we would want with radio button because the whole idea is to use checkboxes for that. OK, so your next question probably is, well, what is checkboxes and how do we start using them? Well, again, we're going to do the same old deal where we have, first of all, probably some kind of line break in between so we can see a little bit better. And let's say again before the submit and right after the radio button, let's add the line break and we're going to have to again have the input. Now, in this case, this is going to be checkbox. So again, we're not looking for radio. This is going to be checkbox. And you know what? Right away. Also, let's add the paragraph and let's write uh, the same old deal that we had before. So uh, with your permission, I'm just going to copy and paste this just so we save a little bit of time. As well as you notice, we have the type of checkbox. And now again, we have the same old deal where we have the name as well as the value. So what do you think for the value? What we would like to write? I think we can do the same thing, right? So we have the value. First of all, is going to be JavaScript. That's going to be the first thing that's going to be passed on, as well as we would need to write the actual JavaScript here. So I'm going to say, you know what? OK, so this is going to be JavaScript. Now, the difference with actual checkboxes is that we can pick multiple. So let's say we're going to change, first of all, the name to programming. Again, this is going to be our name programming. 
and let me make sure that I write this correctly. And now let's copy and paste this. Let's say one, two, three. And you know what? I did one too many. So let's first of all change whatever value we have because obviously we don't want two JavaScripts or three JavaScripts in our case. We would want only two, meaning, sorry, we would want only one. And let's change the second one to Java. This is also going to be value of Java, uh, value of Python. And again, I know I'm repeating this, but the values we're going to use only when we're submitting data. For now, you could write whatever you would like over there. And let's write Python right over here. And what we have here is the checkboxes. Now, with checkboxes, we can click multiple. So we can choose, let's say, that our favorite languages are going to be all three of them. So that would be the biggest difference between checkboxes and the radio buttons. The simple fact that with checkboxes, we can click multiple, we can choose multiple. But with the radio buttons, the whole idea is that you're just choosing one. Okay, so we also have an option of select. So select would be something like a drop down menu or something like that. So again, same old deal right after the Python. Let's create maybe in this case, again, the paragraph again, the paragraph is going to same old deal. We're going to ask the same old question. Because again, I don't see the point of being really creative during the tutorial right now. Because the most important thing is to understand the general concepts. And for the select box, this would be different where again, we create an element and the element is going to be select. And here we would need to write, let's say what kind of name it would be. Now we're going to write again, languages, languages, and we can just leave the ID for now empty. Ah, uh, you know what? You know what? Uh, one last thing that I wanted to show you with uh, checkboxes, we also have an option of checked. So if we have checked already the checkbox, let's say by default, uh, we can add an attribute. So for this, I'm going to head over back to, let's say, my first one. And we have the attribute of checked. And we can just leave it like this, or we can set it equal to checked. It's going to work exactly the same way. So notice now, once I have the checked for the JavaScript, the JavaScript is going to be automatically checked. Now I can still uncheck it, but by default, it's going to be checked since we added this attribute. And we can add this attribute to all of them if you want. And sometimes you're going to see the long way written, not to the HTML, where we're going to be looking for checked is going to be equal to checked. Again, this would mean exactly the same thing as just having it checked like this. So let's get rid of this. And now let's finish off with the select. Now, within the select, we have options. Those would be something similar like you have with order nor list. Remember, you had the list items. So the same deal would work with select, where within the select, there's an option element. Now, within the option element, again, we're working with the values. So we're saying, OK, what is the value here? Again, we're going to start with uh, JavaScript, JavaScript, which again will be submitted. I know I've said this many times, but I just think that it's important to kind of get this point across where the value is going to be shown. So the text is going to be shown within the HTML, but the value is going to be something that's going to be submitted. Now, again, we have a few other options. So let me, you know what, maybe let me uh, make this a little bit smaller on the right hand side. So then we can see better. And if we copy and paste this multiple times, and again, we're going to do the same deal where we have Java, where we have also Python, Python, and we also would like to change these values. So let's say Java. And last one, but not least, we have the Python. So this would be our drop down menu. And you know what, maybe let's add a little bit more line break. And sure enough, now this is there's going to be a little bit more space. So if you want to click something, let's say again, we can choose Java. And this is going to work. So let's say if we want to test it a little bit, let me just write some mumbo jumbo gibberish here, add something to the email, this is going to work, this is going to be my description, Java, 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 and something let's say from the select is going to be selected as Java. And again, we can just submit. Now in the URL, we're going to see our key value pairs, if we're going to copy and paste it or whatever, if we're going to name this bigger notice, now, these are going to be the value pairs, key value pairs that are going to be submitted. Again, in our case, we don't care about them. 
we only will going to care about them as we start working with some back end languages. But this would be the general principles of working with the forms and the HTML. Awesome. We're done covering the most important parts of HTML. Again, this is just my opinion. Obviously, you can find more and more information about more and more elements. But in my opinion, this would be more than enough to get up and running with HTML. Now, before we dive into our first HTML project, I would like to cover two things that I find really important regarding whether we are working with JavaScript, whether we're working with HTML or CSS. And those would be keyboard shortcuts as well as formatting our code. Now, let's start with the easiest one, which would be formatting our code. So we already know that HTML is white space collapsing, right? So if we're going to write here, let's say paragraph, we're going to type some text that I'm going to have more space and I'm going to type more text. I'm going to save it. The whole text is going to be displayed only with this one space since everything else is collapsed. However, as we're working in the project in our HTML or I'm sorry, with our uh, text error, notice how this gets really annoying really fast where we do have these spaces. And again, for now, we have what we have body with one paragraph element. However, if I'm going to add another one like that, if I'm going to say again, another paragraph, again, time some mumbo jumbo gibberish, do something like this, and yada, 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 what's going to happen? Again, it's going to get really hard to work. Now, granted, right now, I'm obviously zooming in just so we can see everything better in the tutorial. But in general, you wouldn't want something like this because it's going to make your life really hard. You are going to get annoyed really, really quickly. So what would be the solution for this? Well, you could say, I mean, geez, just don't do that. Just delete everything and make sure that everything is displayed correctly. And that is true. Yes, you could do that. However, there's a better way. There is more automated way where I don't have to worry about what I'm doing, meaning whether I'm actually typing everything correctly. We can use the formatting for that. And in order to get up and running with the formatting, we would need to install another extension. So already we know the spiel. We're all going to have to head over to this little icon, click on extensions. For now, we should have live server only installed unless you installed something else. And here on top search bar, we're going to write pre and then we're going to be looking for two T's. This should give us the prettier. This is what we're looking for to install. So we're going to click on this and we're going to install our as we before we installing or right after we installing it doesn't really matter. They tell us to use this editor dot format on save. So this is something that we should also change in our settings. This is kind of important for this to work. So first of all, let's click on install. And let's see by the time this is going to be done installing. I'm probably going to tell you my whole life story. Well, hopefully not. But as you can see, it takes for some reason quite a long time. So hopefully it will going to be done installing. I'm sure enough it does. So now I can reload my text header. So first of all, this is going to be my first point. Then I would like to close probably these extensions. We can just go back again to our folder structure. And now let's navigate to the settings. And again, we're going to have to look for two things. So first one is going to be editor format on save. So we can just write editor. And you know what? This is not going to give me what I wanted. This probably would work better here in the JSON object. Let's just write format on save. So this should give us an option. And this is what I was looking for. So we have format on paste and format on save. So now I would like to click both of them. And again, since this is going to auto save, we don't need to save it anywhere else. And now let's go back to our file. So what's going to happen again for now? Everything is not formatted. But let's say again, I'm going to add one more paragraph. So let's create here another paragraph. So I'm going to have the paragraph tags. And for some reason, I cannot get them. And again, let's write it the same way where we're just typing some something that doesn't really make sense. Now, the moment we're going to press save, notice what happens. So now the Visual Studio code with the help with our extension formats everything nicely. Now, I understand that for now, it might not seem very useful. Because we really have three paragraphs and all the tutorial that we did was pretty much six lines of code. However, as we're going to start working with the project and as you're going to keep on working with CSS and CSS projects, formatting your code is really going to help you out in the long run. 
And by the way, uh, you did need to restart the server because obviously we didn't reload the server. So I did this already behind the scenes. But if you didn't do it, then you're going to have only two paragraphs shown. So again, you would need to restart the server by going live. And just to make my point across, you should want to have some kind of formatting for your code, because this is going to be really painful if you're going to have to do it manually. Hey, guys, in this video, I would like to talk about keyboard shortcuts. Now, in general, the main idea is to save you time of not using the mouse, because the more and more web development with HTML or CSS or with JavaScript you're going to do, you'll notice that instead of reaching for the mouse each and every time you need to do something, if you're going to use a keyboard, that will going to save you a lot of time in the long run. Now, I have to warn you right off the bat that in the beginning, they might seem like a hustle. So you might be like, well, this does not make sense. I can just use the mouse. And you can. But I would suggest incorporating them one by one. Let's say learn one of them. And then every time you need it, start using it. And then eventually pick it up more and more. And you'll see how your workflow is going to improve dramatically. Now, first and foremost, where we can get all of them. So if you'd like to know all your keyboard shortcuts in a Visual Studio Code, where you can find them? Well, we'll need to open the Visual Studio Code in new tab. Then we're going to get the welcome screen. And notice here we have printable keyboard cheat sheets. So this is where we are looking for the keyboard shortcuts. Now, what's going to happen the moment you're going to open up, these are going to be your shortcuts. Now, nobody is expecting you to remember all of them. Obviously, it's impossible, especially like first day. And I wouldn't suggest memorizing them from for some kind of reason. Instead, I, like I said, I would suggest incorporating the most interesting ones and then one by one, pick it up more and more. Now, what I'm going to show you is just a few of the ones that I'm using. Uh, maybe the ones that I kind of feel most important ones. I don't know. It's really up to you. You will see again. You want to use them. Great. If you don't want to use them, it's also fine. It's really up to you. Now, whenever I'm going to be talking about the option key, I also can mention that this probably would be alt. I'm pretty sure because as I'm looking right now at my Mac keyboard, it says option, but I'm quite certain that it would also mean alt and also, I would like to mention that whenever I'm going to say command, in most cases on the windows, this is going to mean control. Again, I cannot guarantee that. But in most cases, I'm quite certain that this is going to be the case. Now, let's start with the most basic one, which in fact probably has nothing to do with Visual Studio Code, but you can still use it here. And that is command Z, which is for undoing stuff. So let's say I'm going to write something. I'm going to say there's going to be a heading one and the heading one is going to be hello world. Now I'm going to copy and paste the line, which we're going to learn later. And you know what? At some point, I'm going to decide that I don't need this line. So I'm going to delete this line. Now, what would happen if I would change my mind again and if I would want to get a line? Now, obviously, I can create a new one, but the fastest way option would be pressing command Z and it pretty much undoes everything that I did last. Now, again, we also have an options of command C for copying and command plus V for pasting. So also those would be the basic ones. And if you want to check some commands, let's say for editing, as you can see, I have the undo and the shortcut would be command Z. Then we have redo again. That would be shift command plus Z. And then I have copy, cut, copy and paste. So again, those would be very basic ones. However, even though they seem basic, Trust me, undo is going to save you a lot of times whenever you make some kind of mess. Now, very interesting one would be creating multiple cursors. So let's say that I have some kind of, I don't know, text. And let me copy and paste more lines. And if I would decide that, you know what? Not only I want to change hello world, to hello people on one line, but let's say in all six of them here. Now, what we can do is we can hold the option key or Alt, and then as we're holding it, then start pressing on the different lines. So notice I would like to place a cursor, cursor here. I would like to place a cursor here, as well as I would like to place the cursor right here. So now my cursor, instead of one line, is on six lines. So what I can do right now is I can just delete Hello World, 
and then just type whatever I would like. So as you can see, this saves me a time of jumping from one line to another one and then adding hello people, hello people, hello people. Again, that shortcut would be holding the option plus kick clicking whenever you would like to place a cursor. Obviously, in this case, I would like to place my cursors where I have the end of the word. But in general, again, you can place them anywhere you would like. Now, also, let's look at how we can select the whole line, because that would be our next one. So let's say if I would like to select that on the second line. Now, of course, I can use the mouse and I can do something like this. Or as we're navigating, I could just press command and plus I and notice right away. I have my line selected. So if I would like to delete it, I can just delete the line, select another one. Okay, sure enough, select another one, select the last one. We just move the cursor down as well as just deleting the line. And in our case, we're not touching the mouse at all. Once we know how to select the whole line, we can also look at how we can navigate, meaning move where the words start or end. So let's say that we are in the beginning of the line and we would like to move to the end of people. Now, obviously, we have an option of just moving the cursor or clicking it with the mouse. However, we have also an option of holding the option key. And then as we're holding the option key, we can move either to the right or to the left. And notice what happens. Now I'm moving with the word, not with just one move the cursor or with the actual mouse. So again, this is going to save you a lot of time whenever you have big line, but you would like to move with the words, not with actual cursors and stuff like that. Now, also, we have an option of right away moving from the end of the line to the beginning of the line. So if I'm going to press command and again, cursor left or right, notice now I'm moving from the one side of the line to the other side of the line. Now, also, I can move up and down the whole document. So if I'm going to press command up, as you can see right now, we're at the top of the document. And if I'm going to press command and down, now we're going to be in the bottom of the document. Also, very interesting is command and D, which gets the same selection. So let's say not only we're going to have the heading one as well as the second heading one, but we're going to have, let's say, heading two, hello world. And then again, let's copy and paste the line. Let's maybe change this to hello people people. But in this case, I would like to change the heading one again back to heading one. I'm sorry, heading two back to heading one. Now, what would happen if I would like to select all the heading ones in this case? Again, not the heading two in a big in the middle that has the hello world, but only the heading ones. Well, I have an option, as you notice, as I'm hovering right now with my cursor over the heading one, if I'm going to press command D, then I'm going to select what I would like to start selecting. And if I'm going to keep on pressing command D, then now I'm selecting the second one. So now I have two heading ones Then I have the third one and then I have the fourth one. So in this case, if I would like to change this to, let's say, heading four, I can just change on all of them. And again, this is really powerful when you have 15 of them or something like that. It really going to save you time. Now, also, we have an option of copy and pasting the same line. Now, the keyboard shortcut for that would be shift, option, and down key. So if I'm keyboard down, basically. So if I'm going to press shift, option, and then keyboard down, check this out. So I have a second line, third one, fourth one. And this is basically how we can do that. Now, we can also have an option of moving the actual line up or down. So let me just navigate to the bottom here. Then let's start a new line. And let's say that this is going to be heading six. So I am heading six. So something like this. And let's say that I would like to move again this heading six somewhere here in the middle. Let's say the third line or something like that. Now, obviously, we have an option. We can maybe select the line. We can cut it out. We can go over here and copy and paste it. That is always an option. However, we have a faster way. We can hold the option key and then just press keyboard up or down. Notice now I'm just moving this heading six up or down as much as I would want to. You want to move it out? You can move it out. You want to move it here in the comments? We can move it in the comments. And this is really powerful. And you will going to use this a lot 
once you're going to start using the keyboard shortcuts. Also, we have an option of creating the comments. I think we already covered this, though. Remember when I said that we can always use the command and forward slash, and this is going to create us the comment. So if you would like to write some gibberish over here, sure enough, you can go ahead and do that. Now, let me select the line and let's just delete the line without touch of the mouse. Also, if we would like to start a new line somewhere in the middle, let's say that I'm navigating somewhere here and I'm at the end of the hello. However, I would like to start a new line. Now, one of the options would be, again, we can move with the command, press, return or enter, and we're going to start a new line. However, there's a faster way. So let me delete this first of all. Let me again navigate somewhere in the middle. And if we're going to press command plus enter in this case, so you need to hold the command, then we're going to start right away a new line. So again, we wouldn't have to navigate to the end of the line. Now, there's also an option of changing these shortcuts. So if we're going to hold command K plus, then we're going to press first time command K, then we're going to press command S. This is going to open us these shortcuts and we can obviously change them. So if you would like to change how the shortcut would be entered, you can obviously do it over here. And as you can see, this would basically tell you what the shortcut is doing and you can change these keys. So this would be in short about the shortcuts. And I would suggest at least starting one by one using them because they will going to save you a lot of time in the long run. I would also like to talk about the external resources and while we're at it, we're all going to look at the head element and the meta tags that I promised you in the beginning. Now, two really good resources are going to be Mozilla Developer Network. And the easiest way to search it again would be just going to Google and you can just type MDN. Now, with Mozilla Development Network, it is really good. However, I think that you're probably going to start using it once you are already somewhat comfortable with HTML or any kind of technology. Because while the documentation is really good, they, it is also very extensive. So let's say, first of all, if we would like to go back there, we can always have an option of searching, right? So we have an option of searching, let's say, HTML in our case. And then we have an option for documentation. So in our case, we would like to select HTML. Then within the HTML, we would need to start navigating to whatever we would like to research. So let's say we're going to be looking for HTML tutorial or you can have the HTML documentation or Mozilla Development Network. And in my case, let's just click on the tutorial. Now in the tutorial, notice we're going to have all these options where on the left hand side, they right away give you the CSS. But if in the beginning you would just like to understand everything about the HTML, then this is where you're going to be doing the research, whether that's going to be multimedia and embedding, let's say images in HTML, or let's say the head element in the HTML. Now, a little bit more user friendly, especially in the beginning, would be W3 schools, where again, you would just search it in Google for W3 schools. And once we click on it, obviously, there's a bunch of tutorials available to us. Now, again, in our case, we will gonna select HTML, since this is what we're covering. And then within HTML, Let's go ahead and let's find the HTML head element. And now we can start reading everything that there is about it. So like I said, this would be a container for metadata. So data about the actual site. And that would be placed within the head element, obviously. And the metadata is not going to be displayed. Now there's going to be tags, let's say for the title. And we already covered title. Title would be for the page title. But then later on, as we're going to be working with style sheets, we're also going to work with style tags as well as linking the style sheet. So linking the CSS as well as we have an option for JavaScript. Now there's always going to be meta tags and for the meta tags. And again, this would be the title. And as you can see, you can read everything that there is about title. Then the style element would be for styling, like I said, and style element we're going to cover in the CSS link is going to be linking to the external style sheets. And then we have the meta element. Now, in the meta element, you have multiple options. Let's say we have character set. Now, if we're going back and checking our basic setup with an Emmet, we notice that our first meta tag would be character set. So this answers what is meta tag is doing. Then also we have an option, let's say for description. 
So again, the syntax would be meta. Then we have the name and in our case, that would be description. And then here we would place the content. Now, the same old spiel would be for the keywords. If you want to add keywords, author in the bottom, we have the viewport meta tag that explains how the viewport meta tag is going to work. So new viewport meta tag allows us or allows our pages to be responsible. So again, if we're going to head over back to our basic setup with Emmet, we'll notice that we already have the viewport tag that sets up the width properly. And that way, our page is going to be responsive. So again, if you'd like to research more information about anything that we talked about it, this is a very good resource, as well as Mozilla Developer Network. While spending time in tutorial will was a lot of fun. The real learning starts whenever we start creating the project. So this is going to be our first project, where we're going to use the knowledge that we learned about HTML to create our first site. Now the site is going to be very basic. We will going to use only HTML in the site. Well, when I say only HTML, there's going to be tiny bit of CSS. Now the site is going to start off with a logo. Then we're going to have a few pages. And let's say for the home page, there's going to be big banner image. Then we're looking for headings with future products. And then let's say there's going to be some kind of products. For every product, we're going to have the details. Not the details is going to be a link that's just going to go to Wikipedia. However, as you can see, we will going to open it up in the new tab. Now there's going to be three of them. There's going to be house blend, French roast and Colombian roast, as well as all the way in the bottom. We're going to have a link that's going to scroll all the way up to the top of the page. Now, this would be the home page. Then we're looking for the about page. Again, the navigation and the image is going to be exactly the same as well as the background. However, here we're going to have just some text about the company. Again, we can click on back to the top and we're going to be brought back to the top. Then in the numbers, we're going to have the table where there's just going to be a little bit of information about the stores of the company. Again, we can scroll back to the top. And last but not least, there's going to be contact where we have the contact form. Now in the contact form, we can just enter some kind of information. Again, let me write some gibberish. And obviously, once we're going to submit it, this is going to be displayed in URL. But we're not going to be collecting this data in any way or shape or form. Again, we can go back to the home page, and this is going to be our home page. So this is going to be our project. I hope you guys enjoy it, and let's start working on it. Okay, our first task is to create some kind of folder structure, because obviously we're going to have to have the project, and within the project there's going to be multiple files. Now we can obviously work in the example folder that we had before. But I think this is going to actually help us by going over the steps again to kind of solidify in our mind. Now, let's start first by, again, creating the folder. You can create it wherever you would like, but I'm going to do this in the desktop. And let me just rename this. And I'm going to say that the folder name is going to be coffee. And then, obviously, I would need my text editor. So I can just open up my text editor. And again, however you would like it, but we would need to get this folder to our text editor. I'm just going to drag and drop it. And sure enough, this is going to be my folder. Now, within the folder, first, I would like to create my home page. So I'm going to say that there will going to be index HTML. And since I know that we can use Emmet, I'm going to use the exclamation mark to get my basic structure. Now, within this basic structure, maybe let's just change the title. And let's say coffee. And let's call this junkie. And maybe within the heading one, let's write some kind of hello world. Now, obviously, there's going to be more work that we're going to be doing, but I would just like to set up the live server first and all kinds of things after that. So let's say first, since we know how to work with live server, we would need to open it up again. We have an option of opening up in multiple ways. So let's say we know that we can right click it and then I have an option of open live server. So I'm just going to click on that and this is going to open up the live server. Now, this is all good. But what's happening is I would like to have two screens. So one screen is going to have the final project where I'm going to show you what we're going to be doing, as well as I'm going to look at my current project in the bigger browser window. However, as I'm working side by side with my project, I would also like to show you how the project looks in a small browser window. So what I'm going to do right now, I'm going to open up the new window and let, just, and let me just make this a little bit smaller because this is really big right now. And I'm going to 
again, check for 127 for my index HTML. Now, in this case, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to set these ones side by side. So as you can see, this would be my project where I'm working. Hopefully you can see everything correctly. Maybe let me make this one a little bit smaller. And then this is where we're going to be doing most of our work. This is the small browser window. So you can see exactly what everything is happening. And then this would be a bigger browser window. So that would be initial setup. Now, I also would like to right away create my folder where we're going to be placing our images. So let's say new folder. And I'm going to name my folder images. So this would be our basic structure for the project. And now we can ready to go and start importing our images. Alrighty, we have our project structure. So what next? Now, as we're checking the project, we can see that there's going to be a few images. And as a side note, if you don't want to download the images in this video, in the resources, you're obviously going to be able to find the whole project with all the images that we're going to be using anyway. Now for the logo, I did very simply. I went to Google and just searched for copy cup uh, logo transparent background. And then obviously there's many ones to pick. And I just picked this one. Now, please understand that this is not something that you're going to do for the production uh, project. But in our case, since this is just a simple HTML project, we can just do it this way for the logo. So in this case, what I would do is I would just say that I would like to get the image. So I'm going to say save image as and I'm going to be looking for a desktop since this is where our project is. And then within the images, I'm going to say that I would like to save this as a logo and either we can add PNG ourselves or we can just go with whatever extension that they give us. So this would be the logo. Okay. After the logo, we also have one big background image as well as three smaller ones. So these would be, I don't know, again, for the house blend or French roast. It doesn't really matter. The main idea would be one big background image and then three smaller ones. So these images I got again in the pixels, the ones that I was telling you before, where you can get nice copyright free images. And again, if we just start searching where if you search for coffee, first of all, so I went here and typed coffee. And as we start scrolling down, you can see that there is going to be quite a few of them that we're using. And let's start with this guy, since this is going to be our background. So let's say here again, save image as, and I'm just going to call this background. And again, let's just go with whatever extension they give us. Now, after that, we have house blend. And I believe for the house blend, uh, let me scroll down, see where I have this. Uh, not this guy. Uh, let's see, let's see, let's see. Which one did I pick? I think I picked this one. So let's save the image as. Uh, let's name this house blend then what else we have we have french roast so i'd be looking for this guy and where i have this one oh uh, do, 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 do. here it is uh save images this would be french roast roast and the last one is going to be i think colombian colombian roast and that's going to be with an espresso machine so let's say that this is going to be colombian beyond roast now i have these four images one for the background and three smaller ones and for the smaller ones again i use the option in the mac where we can just crop them a little bit so let's say that i was going to select first of all all three of them but again not background not logo just these three and then i'm going to open it in the preview and within the preview i would like to select all of them so again the shortcut would be command a so as you notice right now, all the images have been selected and then we can look for the tools and then we're adjusting the size. Now, in my case, I'm going to click on this little padlock. So now they're going to be adjusted exactly like I want, not the height you know, adjusted to that. And let's say that I'm going to be looking for 320 by 240. And yeah, once we do that, these are going to be our images and everything is set and ready to go so we can start working on our project. Once we have our images, we can start working on the project and actually start doing some kind of HTML. Now, as you can see, we need to start by getting the logo first. Then we're going to have the heading three and then we're going to have our little nav bar. Now, this is the first thing that I would like to do. And then we're going to start moving on and working with different sections of the project. Now, first of all, if we would like to get an image, 
obviously we already know that we would need to use the image tag. So here within the body, let's just start getting the image. And for the image, we're going to be looking for the source or obviously we can use also image right away that we're going to give us the source. And within the source, now we would need to navigate to the images folder. Now we know that we would need to use the relative path. And maybe I didn't mention this before, but you're also going to see a lot of times this dot. So again, this dot would mean the same thing where we are navigating somewhere within the folder, meaning the index right now and the images are still within the same folder. However, the image that we're looking for is in the images folder. So first we would need to navigate still within this folder and look for the images folder. So once we get the images folder, what's going to be next? Well, then we're going to be looking for the logo, right? So as you can see right now, we're getting the logo. And let's just write here, uh, coffee, coffee logo. And yeah, now we have our image. So this is all good. Next, what do we have after the image? We have some kind of heading. Now, in my case, I used, I believe, heading three. So I'm going to say heading three. And we're just going to call this that this is going to be the name of the company or website or whatever you would like to make it. And in this case, I'm going to say coffee junkie. And next, we would need to create our nav bar. Now, for the nav bar, I said that we would be using onward list. So first, we would need to create an onward list. Then for every list item, we know that we need to create a list item element. And then within the list item element, this is where we're creating our links. Now, for every link, we're going to have to have the href. So basically, the path or direction where this link is going to be going. And since we're going to start with the home page, I'm going to say that the home page is going to be going to index HTML. Now, obviously, we haven't created yet the rest of the pages. However, it doesn't stop us from creating these links. So what I would like to do right now is just copy and paste this three times. And instead of having this as a home, um, I'm going to change it to about numbers and contact. So first of all, let me again do multiple cursors. So we know that we would need to use alt for that. So in this case, if I'm going to press on multiple places, notice I'm going to be having multiple cursors. So let me delete first of all home because each and every one of them is going to be different as well as let's get rid of all the indexes at the same time. So just like that, we got rid of all the indexes. And let's say the second page is going to be about HTML and the name in our uh, nav bar is going to be about. Now, let me save this. Let's see. Sure enough, we have the about. And then let's have the numbers. Numbers HTML. This is going to be our page. And in the nav bar, we're going to have numbers. Now, last but not least, we're looking for contact HTML. And this would going to be equal in the nav bar to contact. And just contact. We're not going to add anything else. Good. We added the logo. We added heading three as well as our nav bar. And maybe just to double check, we can go to the bigger browser window and let's see how this is going to look like. I think it looks good enough and we are ready to move on and start working the next part of our project. Right after the logo and the nav bar, we have the big background image as well as we have feature products where there's going to be three products, the house blend, the French roast, as well as Colombian roast. And each of them is going to have some kind of link that will going to go to Wikipedia. And as you can see, it's going to open up in the new tab. Now, at the very end, we're going to have here this little paragraph with the copyright. Remember the special HTML character and then back to the top link. So first of all, let's start working on all this. So let's say that right after the navigation bar or nav bar, we would like to get our first big image. So how do we do that? Well, first of all, we would need to get an image, right? So we're going to say IMG, and now we're looking for the source. And again, we need to navigate to the images folder, and there we're going to have our big background image. Now, what else can we add here? Well, let's say first that we would like to add alternative text, and let's say coffee beans. So this is going to be my text. Now, as you notice right now, the image is obviously big. We didn't adjust anything. And also, let's check it out in the bigger browser window. Just so it, how it looks now, as you can see, there's two issues right now. So for the smaller screen, notice the image is way too big. However, on a bigger screen, it's not big enough. It's basically not spanning all across. Now, in order to fix this, usually we would work with CSS. However, in our case, since we haven't looked at the CSS, 
we can do a tiny, a tiny little trick where remember we had the width and then previously we worked with width only with pixels when we were actually adding, let's say 100 pixels here or something like this. We also have an option of using the percentages. So instead of using pixels, I'm going to add the 100%. And what happens right now, the image is actually responsive. So notice on the small screen, the image is exactly big enough for the whole screen instead of spanning it outside of the screen. And for the big screen, notice now it's actually spanning all across. So essentially what we did is we made this image responsive again. Normally, we're going to do this within the CSS, but again, just because it's a little bit annoying, I just added here this whatever two lines of code or uh, with attribute basically. Okay, now what we have next? Well, let's maybe create next a line break just so there's some space in between. And then I would like to start by placing a heading one. So I'm going to say heading one, and here we're going to write featured, featured, and let's say products. So this is going to be my heading one. Now, after the heading one, again, let's add another line break. And maybe right after the line break, let's start using the comments since there's going to be three featured projects and all of them are going to be their own product. So I would have like to have some kind of distinction of what is in there. So let's say first, this is going to be the house blend. And for the house blend, we'll start by heading two. So we're going to add a heading two right here. And let's say house blend. And we're going to be looking for the coffee. Now, let me save this. And this is what I have here on the right hand side. Okay, moving on, I would like to place an image there. So I'm going to say image again. We're going to be looking for the source of the images. And now we have to look for the house blend. Now, what else? Well, we can always add the house blend like this we can say that there's going to be alternative text. So if the image is, is not available or we cannot display it, then there's going to be alternative text. So this is going to be my image. Now, what else? Well, I would like to have the paragraph. And let's say for the paragraph, there's going to be a text of, I don't know, 25 words, 50 words. It doesn't really matter. You can just add some kind of paragraph. Now, the moment I'm going to save this, this is going to look nice on the small screen, right? As you can see right now. However, the issue is on a bigger screen, it is really annoying if I see these lines like this. Again, this is something we were going to do with CSS. But just because it does annoy me hell of a lot, what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a new attribute that we haven't covered that yet. And that is the style attribute. Again, you are not going to use this later on once you learn CSS. But for now, this is going to help us a little bit. So within the CSS, this is basically a inline CSS. And again, you don't need to remember this property. You're going to learn it later on within the CSS anyway. But here I can just say with property. And I'm going to set it equal to 50%. So I'm going to say equals to 50%. Again, please don't worry about the syntax for now. We are going to cover this in CSS. This is a very, very basic CSS syntax, but it will, it will going to help us though, because now I have my paragraph that's only spanning 50% and it's going to look much more better on a bigger screen. Again, it's really up to you. You can just skip this style attribute and just have the normal paragraph. But I'm just going to choose it, choose to do it this way. Then last but not least, there's going to be some type of link. So I'm going to say heading three. And within the heading three, I would like to have the link. Now for the link, again, we're going to have to use some kind of attribute, meaning the href attribute where this link is going to be going. So in our case, we can either copy and paste it from the URL after we search for Wikipedia, or since I know that this is going to be my URL, I can write HTTPS then two forward slashes, then www, then we're looking for wikipedia org, so dot org, and then let's add another forward slash. However, since I would like to open this up in the new tab, meaning I wouldn't want the user to navigate away from our page, can I add target attribute and set it equal to underscore blank? And let's call this details. So this would be the name of the link. Now, once we save it, what do we have? So we have our house blend and then we have also the details link. So if we're going to click on the link, let's check it out. What we're going to have. Well, for now, what's happening is that this is navigating away from our page. And the reason for that is, as you can see, I have a very small, but at the end of the day, very important error. 
because this is not target. This should be target. So as you can see how easy it is to make actually a mistake. So let me navigate back. Maybe let me refresh just to make sure that everything is working correct. And now we're opening up obviously in the correct Wikipedia. Now, if you want to go any maybe further, you can write coffee. So maybe let's search in the Wikipedia for the coffee, and then you're going to have a different URL. So maybe if you really like, you can just copy and paste this URL where you're going to be for the coffee. Now, I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to leave mine for the general Wikipedia. But if you would like to do that, obviously, you just need to copy and paste this URL. Okay, so so far, so good. So we have our first uh, product, our first feature product. Now, next, what I would like to do is just copy and paste this because there's going to be three of them. However, I don't see the point of rewriting everything from the scratch. If we can just copy and paste and create two more. So here I'm going to say copy then we're going to copy and paste. So this is going to be our, I believe, French roast. And the last one is going to be uh, Colombian. Now, once we are done with copying, then we just need to start changing the values. So obviously here, we're not going to be looking for the house blend. It's going to be French roast. Then also the image will going to have to be different. So let's say that not a house blend coffee, French roast, as well as remember the image. So again, let me look for the images. And within the images, we have the French roast. And last but not least, we have the alternative attribute French roast. Okay. That would be our second one. And the last one, the third, but not the least one is going to be our Colombian. But remember, we can just keep this however we would like, uh, meaning we can keep uh, the link the same way. But you know what? I would like to add, though, maybe two more line breaks after the end of the each of the items, because I think it's just going to make a little bit more sense if they're going to be separated a little bit. So let me grab these two values here as well. Uh, where we have the end, I think it's right here. So let's copy these guys, as well as at the end of the third link, we're also just gonna add these line breaks. Now, like I said, we still need to change this Colombian. So Colombian, being roast, roast. Uh, you know what? I can just maybe copy and paste this. Maybe it's gonna be a little bit faster. Let me delete the title. Then we're also going to be looking for the image. So again, another forward slash. And sure enough, we have Colombian. And yeah, I think the last thing just would be changing this alternative. Now, what is at the very, very end of our homepage? That would be our simple paragraph. And let me show you again. Maybe we already forgot what you had. And by the way, we can see right now how our page would look like on a bigger browser window. But at the very bottom, we have our copyright 2019 and link back to the top. Okay, now for the link back to the top, maybe add a little bit more line breaks here just because it's going to look a little bit better. And then here we're going to have the paragraph within the paragraph. There's going to be copyright text. Let me save this. Let me show you. This is where we're typing the paragraph. And then again, let's use the special HTML character. Notice our remember it was the ampersand, then the name of it. And in our case, that was copy. And let's just say the year, which would be 2019. Now, if you're watching this in the future, let's say in 2000, whatever, obviously write whatever year you are currently at. And last but not least, we're going to be looking for the heading, heading three that we're going to include the link back to the top. Now, for the link again, we're going to have to have the href. And then here we would need to navigate to a logo. So somewhere at the very top, we're going to have to create an ID or element with some kind of ID that's going to match logo. And here, let's just write back to, to top. This is going to be my text. Now, what's happening right now is we don't have anything here that has the logo. I'm sorry, the ID of logo. So what I would like to do right now is for my image, my logo image, I'm just going to add the ID and we're going to set this equal to logo. No moment. We're going to save this. Check this out. So I'm going to scroll over and we're going to click on it. We were going to scroll all the way to the top. So we're going to navigate to the top of the page. And yeah, we maybe should just check it out in a bigger browser window. 
make sure that everything is working back to the top is fine. And now we can start working on our about page. Awesome. We have successfully created our first home page. However, we have a few more pages to go. And the next one would be the belt page. Now, before we start doing anything, before we start creating the file or anything like that, well, let's just check it out. What would be the common things between the home page as well as the about page? So if I'm going to open up the about page in the final project, notice again, the logo is going to be here. We're also going to have our headings as well as our navigation and then the big background image. Now I keep calling this the background image. Of course, this is just one big image. But later on, as we're working with CSS, we're going to be setting this up as a background image. So my apologies for now is just one big image, but I keep referring to as one big background image. Now, we also are going to have what? Well, then there's going to be specific text for the about page. But then the footer as well as link back to the top is going to stay the same. So we have two options. Either we can create a new file and start creating everything from the scratch, or we can just copy and paste everything that we have in the index HTML and delete unnecessary stuff. Now, let's say first I would like to create a new file and let's call this about HTML again, since this would be in the HTML page, we need to use the HTML extension. Now, within the file, I would like to copy and paste everything that I have here. So I'm going to select everything with command A. Then we're going to copy this by with command C as well as last but not least, we'd like to paste this with command V. And now I have my index page in my about page. However, this is where we're going to start making changes. So first for the title, maybe let's write that about page or just in general about and as well as for the heading, I would like to change it from coffee junkie to about now what else? Well, the image is going to stay right. However, the feature product is going to be about us. So the text here is going to be about us instead of feature page. Now here we're going to start deleting everything. So I would like to delete all these featured items. So everything starting from the house blend and ending with Colombian roast. I'm just going to delete this. So first of all, we can save this and let's see what we're going to have. Now, this is going to be my home page. However, now I can navigate to my about page. And what we have is the logo, the navigation like we wanted to, as well as the big image. And then we have just some heading with about us. And at the very bottom, we have the paragraph with copyright and link back to the top. So all this is working. Now, the last thing that we would want in the about page is just to have the paragraph with let's say 500 words. So we're going to create a paragraph tags and we're going to paste uh, or you know what not paste. We obviously need to look for the Emmet. So we have lorem 500 and then we're looking for 500 words. Now, the moment we're going to save it, these are going to be our 500 words. And again, as always, we can check it out how it looks like in the bigger browser window. So this for now would be the logo. I mean, sorry, index page. So this would be index HTML. And then as we hover or as we navigate to about HTML, then we're going to have our heading with our big text. And successfully, we also have created our about page. Before we start working on number page, let me just make a quick correction. We're here at the very top. Instead of having this heading three as an about, I would still like to leave this as a coffee junkie because obviously this is going to be the name of our project or page or the company. So let's just keep this coffee junkie as well as let's write the title with capital A. And as we save it right now, everything is working fine. Now let's decide what's happening within the numbers. Now this is going to be my final project. I'm going to navigate to the numbers and within the numbers again, most of the things stay exactly the same. The difference would be here. This our stories where we're going to use our table. Now, in our case, I think it's going to be faster. We're just going to copy and paste everything that's in the about HTML and then then just get rid of this text. Again, let's create a new file. Let's call this numbers HTML. Again, everything was selected in the about HTML. And now I can just copy and paste in the numbers HTML. Now, like I said, I would like to delete all this long paragraph. 
because this is not what we're going to be doing. And let's write first of all numbers or our numbers, uh, however you would like, or you know what? Let's call this our stores. I think that just going to make a little bit more sense. And let me select the whole paragraph, delete it. Uh, let's maybe change the title of the page. This title is going to be right now numbers. Let's save this. And from our about page, we can navigate right now to the numbers. And sure enough, we're just going to have our heading with our stores title. Now, within the title, what we're we going to have? Well, like I said, we're going to be working on our table. So first, we know that we need to have the table element. And then within the table element, we start working with rows. Now, maybe let's add a little bit of clarification. So in our case, again, we're going to use the comments. So we're going to write that this is going to be for the city. So this is going to be our table row for the city. Now, for the table row, we need to create the table row element. And then we're looking for either table data elements that would reflect columns. Or since we would like to have some kind of headings, I'm going to go with table heading element. So here I'm going to write that the first one is going to be city. So that would be pretty much telling what my columns are going to be like. As well as you know what this is going to be the first one is going to be Chicago. And let me copy and paste this. So while the first one is Chicago, we also have an option of New York. So the stores would be located in Chicago as well as New York. And we also have an option of Los Angeles. Let's save this. And this would be my city. And then these would be my cities. Okay, so far so good. Now, we also can right away maybe add the comment of end of city. So we know that this would be the end of the row. And maybe let's create another one where we're going to have some kind of numbers. So let's say maybe before that, add another comment. Orders, end of orders. So the beginning of the comment and end of the comment. Maybe let's add also end of orders. And now let's start creating our rows. Now within the row. There's going to be instead of table heading table data. So let's write table data. And the first one is going to be the name of our row, which will be numbers or orders. My apologies. Let's uh, copy and paste this. And let's write that in the first one is going to be 125. The second one is going to be 250. And last but not least, we're going to be looking for 500. So this is going to be our second row. Again, as we copy and paste it, notice these are going to be our orders. Now, last but not least, we're going to be looking for basically profit. So whatever profit our city stores would be generating. So let's rewrite this. This would be profit, profit. Let's make sure that we write this correctly as well as end of profit. And let's just add some kind of dollar values. Now, I would also like to change the name of my row. This would be profit now. And here we're going to be looking for dollar sign, meaning this would signify that this is a dollars. And let's say 10,000. 10,000. And let's just copy and paste this. So let's say first one, second one, third one. Or here we're going to change it to 20,000, 30,000. And this should be good enough. Now, last but not least, again, I'm going to implement a little bit of CSS because it bothers me that it looks so bad. So what we would need to do, and again, you don't need to worry about the syntax right now. It's a very, very easy uh, CSS syntax that we're going to cover later on. But I would like to write, again, style attribute. So this is going to start my inline CSS. And then let's just add border. And border needs to be two pixels solid uh let's say black as well as the other property would be border spacing border uh spacing and that's going to be equal to let's say 25 pixels so spacing the colon and let's just write 25 pixels now the moment we're going to save it as you can see right now the table looks a little bit more presentable now last but not least let's just check it out in the bigger browser window Again, we would want to navigate away from about. We're going to go to numbers. And yeah, we have our stores. So our number page is finished. And now we can work on contact page. The last page in our project is going to be contact page, where again, we have tons of things that 
we have from the index HTML page, meaning our home page. But we're gonna add the form wherein there's gonna be the name input, email input, as well as the description text editor. Now let's head over back to our project. First of all, let's create the page. So we're gonna say contact HTML. That's gonna be our name. And within the page, again, we would like to copy and paste from the about or numbers because they're just gonna be shorter. Since again, we're gonna reuse tons of things from there. And maybe let's delete the long text. We are not gonna use it or we're not gonna need it in our case. So once that is deleted, we can also change the heading one. And let's write uh, contact us. That's gonna be our heading. And within the little browser window, you can just navigate to the contact page. And this is gonna be our page. Now, before we start working on the form, maybe let's also change the title. This should be contact. And now here on the top of the tab, I have my title of the page. Now, what do we have for the form? Well, we have the heading one, right? And then we would need to create the form element. Form element. And we can use the element, obviously, for this. And we can just leave the action blank. Again, we're not going to be collecting the values. As well as let's start with the simple comment just to separate later on what we're going to be creating this is going to be the name we need to use the label element now the label element will have the four attribute and this is going to point to the id that we're going to be creating now in our case the id will going to have to be name obviously for the label to match as well as let's write input with a type of text also i would like to add name attribute and we're going to set name attribute equal to the name in this case. And last but not least, we have the ID and the ID needs to match four attribute in the label. So in this case, we're going to also name it name. And now I have excellent input where if I'm going to click on the label, the input is going to be highlighted. So this is going to be my name. And again, the reason for the comment is just making a separation later on since this is going to be the name, but the next one is going to be email. So we're going to change the comment to email. And now we're going to change name in a few places since we don't want to keep the name. But in fact, this is going to be email. So first of all, we're going to be deleting it from the four as well as the name of the label, the ID, and last but not least, the name attribute. So I can just delete all of them at the same time. And let's write here email as well as email. Now we could have written the same way how we did it deletion. But since this is capital, I just kind of rewrote it, uh, all of them, one at the same time. Now, we have everything. We have four attribute, name, ID, email. Once we're going to save it, we're going to have our email. Now, maybe we can also add the line break. This is going to look a little bit better. Um, let me just get the actual line break uh, as well as, yeah, maybe another one that might look a little bit more decent if we have two lines in between. And what else we have? Well, we can also use the text area for description. So let me copy this. And now I have two line breaks as well here. And here I'm going to say that there's going to be a comment. The description. This would be the comment for my description. And let's write first of all paragraph. The description. So this would be my paragraph. Basically, the value within the paragraph is going to be description. And we know that we have the uh, text area, right? So we had a text area element. Now within the text area, let's also write the name for the description. Now, as you can see, in this case, we're not using the label. So we don't really care about the ID. It can stay there blank. It doesn't really matter. Columns are going to stay 30. Rows are going to stay 10. And you know what? Let's write just a placeholder. Let's say for the placeholder, we're going to say your uh, description. This is something we should write. And now we have a nice text area with a placeholder of description. And yeah, I think that's going to be enough for our contact page. Let me just double check whether everything is working in the bigger browser window. So we'll have the numbers from the numbers. We're going to navigate to the contact. This is where we're going to have our simple form. And I think that everything is working fine. And we have successfully created all our four pages. Congrats, guys, on finishing the project. Hopefully that everything worked out. However, if you got stuck on something, 
please remember that for every video, there is also there in the resources, the folder that contains the code from that specific video, as well as in the resources of this video that you're watching right now, you can get the final project code. So you can just download it and compare it if you have any kind of mistakes. Hey guys, before we deep dive into CSS, I would like to show you my extensions and workspace settings in the Visual Studio Code. If you are just joining us, you don't have to use Visual Studio Code in order to follow this course. Or even if you are using Visual Studio Code, you can skip this video and use the setup that makes sense to you. However, just to show you what is my setup, let me spend a few minutes on that. Now, first and foremost, I would like to show you a few extensions that I'm using. And for this example, I'm going to use the main CSS. Now, obviously, we haven't covered yet anything to do with CSS. But what I'm about to show you is just a little visual thing. So I don't think we need to cover what is CSS in order to understand. Now, as you notice, these are the extensions that I'm using right now. And if you're just joining us, then please head over to previous videos where we talk about the live server, the installation, as well as the prettier, if you don't have them already. Now, the first extension that I would like to show you is the bracket per colorizer. Now, as you can see right now, these brackets are pretty much white. So there's no distinction in between them. However, if we install this extension, so I'm going to say brackets pair. So here we're searching for the extensions and we should have the brackets per colorizer. Now, again, the only thing we need to do is right away click install. And the extension is available to us. Now, what bracket pair colorizer does it colorizes the matching brackets. Now, in our case, obviously, our example is very simple, where we just had two sets of brackets. And maybe in the project or whatever sections we're going to be working on, it will not going to make as much of sense as later on as you're progressing with web development. However, this is very neat whenever you start working again with large chunks of code, where you can at least see what is happening and understand a little bit more visually. So that would be the first one. And then let's look at the indent rainbow. So again, let me just delete this. It brackets per colorizer. Let's say indent rainbow. And again, this will gonna make indentation easier to read. Now, how we can see that in real life. So first of all, let's install this. So as you can see right now, it's installed. And if I'm gonna head over back to index.html, notice that I'm gonna have these indentations. So this pretty much shows us of what code block we're working with. So everything within the body is going to have this indentation on the left hand side. Now, last one is going to be highlight matching tag. So again, let me delete this and let's say highlight and matching. And there's going to be a lot of them. So we kind of need to be very specific. And in this case, this would be the name. Now, what's really neat about this extension is again, this is going to highlight the matching, closing and opening tag. Again, we're going to install it. However, for this one, we're going to do a little bit of extra setup. So again, let me first save it, make sure that it's here. And what's going to happen is as I click again on some kind of element, it's going to highlight the beginning and the closing tag. However, we're going to add a little bit of more settings. So let me scroll down. And as you notice here, there's going to be more options. Now, in our case, first of all, I would like to select this. And then in here, you would need to use again the edit. So we're going to use the copy. So we're going to copy everything that's right here and we're going to head over to our settings. So we're going to do settings, the cog, the settings. However, we're going to be looking for the JSON object and right after, uh, let's say false, let's just copy and paste it. So in our case, now this would be the setting. And here I would like to change this a little bit around. So I'm going to say that the border width is going to be three pixels. The border style is instead of dotted is going to be solid. So I'm going to write solid. And I'm also going to change the color. I'm going to say that the color is going to be yellow. And you can pick a red, you can pick blue, whatever you would like. And then border raises is still going to be five. Now, the same thing is going to go here. We're going to say three pixels, first of all. Then again, we're looking for solid style, as well as last but not least, the color should be yellow. So this is just going to be a little bit more distinctive of what I had before. So again, let me head over back to index HTML and now check it out. So now I like how these tags are styled this way because that way it really clearly shows me of where I'm working. 
now again, this is not gonna make sense in our very, very basic project. But as we're working with more extensive projects, this is gonna save us many, many times. While we're still on a subject, let me just show you the general settings that I have in my text editor. So first I have the window zoom level, but obviously this is gonna change whether I'm gonna be zooming in or zooming out. Then the editor font size I have on 26. The tab size would be one. And again, tab size is right here. This would be the tab size. And again, if you would want it more, you can obviously have two or four. It's really up to you. Then I do have the auto save off. So that would be over here. Remember, as we're working with live server, we're going to have the auto save. So everything what we're going to be writing is going to be saved and shown right at, right there. And then then I do have the word wrap on. So that way my lines are not going to be extending. So I don't have to scroll. And then two settings that I have with the prettier where I have format on paste and format on save. So every time we are going to be saving, then the our code is going to be formatted. Now I also have the mini map enabled to false. So basically I don't have this little mini map. And again, this, this is really up to you. If you want to keep the mini map, you can keep it. If you want to get rid of it, just set it equal to the false. And if you would like to look at the other settings, let's say, remember that you have this option over here where you can search for them. And once you find them, you can obviously change it, let's say font size to something bigger or smaller. And then obviously, this is going to be displayed here in your JSON settings. Now you can also work right away here in JSON settings. But this obviously gives you a nice graphical interface. Awesome, we made it to the CSS part of the course. If you're just joining us, welcome to the course. If you just finished HTML, welcome back. As always, I would like to keep slide videos short and concise. So what in the world is CSS? CSS stands for cascading style sheets. And in one short sentence answer, CSS is used to make our web projects awesome and beautiful. So you can say CSS is responsible for styling the web. While HTML was responsible for what elements will be displayed, CSS takes care of how elements are displayed meaning the layout and the look of the elements. While well, we'll come back to the syntax like gazillion times in the course, just to get our feet wet, the general CSS syntax would be following. So we're going to have a selector. So what element we would like to style a set of curly braces that start a declaration block. And within the block, we're going to have a property of the element we would like to change. So let's say the font size of the element, the color or the width just to name a few and value for that property. So for example, for the color, we would have to choose the color we would like to apply for that element. We'll come back to it during the course, but always, always make sure you add semicolon between declarations. Otherwise, you're going to get a syntax error. Now that we know the theory about CSS, let's start using it. Why don't we start very simply by setting up our workspace? So as you can see right now, I'm sitting in my desktop. So I'm going to create a new folder. I'm going to call this folder, let's say CSS. But as always, you can name your folders however you would like. And then we're going to open up our text editor. Now I'm going to open up the text editor. And again, we know that there's multiple ways how we can get our files here. But for now, let's just grab the folder since that would be the fastest way. And right now I have my folder in my text editor. So everything is working really nice. Now, next, I would like to create a new index HTML file. So I'm going to say new index HTML, which is going to be our home page. And then you know what, let me just make it bigger. But before I do that, let's open up the new window or the browser window. Because again, we would like to see the all the changes that we're creating in our text editor live as they're happening in the browser. So for this, we're going to say that there's going to be a browser window. And let's set them side by side. Now you don't have to technically do it this way. But I think it's just going to be easier for you too. And then in the index HTML, let's just create a basic HTML structure. Now, again, we're going to be doing this using the Emmet. And maybe we can also change right away the document name. So the title of our web page. And let's just call this CSS tutorial. And maybe let's write it like this CSS tutorial. Hopefully, this is going to be spelled correctly. And we can add some maybe heading one with. Hello world. So I'm going to save this. So this is going to be my starting point. And then let's open up in the live server. And again, we know that we have multiple options. 
we can right click it and notice we have open live server where we can use the actual uh, shortcut, which would be again command uh, plus L plus command O. Now, as I see in the bottom, my server has been started at the port 5500. But sure enough, it right away opened up in the browser anyway. Now, I'm also would like to open this up in the bigger browser window, just in case we would want to see some things shown in the bigger browser window. And for this, I'm going to open up the new window. And here I'm going to be looking again for 127.0.1. Uh, and again, port would be 5500. And then it gives me a suggestion right away for index HTML. And sure enough, this is going to be my web page. So this would be our basic setup. And now let me just maybe make this a little bit smaller, the side window, as well as the browser. Because again, in most cases, most of our work we're going to do here in the center, because this is where we're going to write our CSS. What's really cool about CSS is the fact that just like with HTML, we don't have to download anything to start using CSS. And we can just start using CSS right away. In general, there are three ways how to start using CSS, the inline, internal, and, and external CSS. As a side note, in the beginning, I will use a lot of color property because it gives us the best representation. But don't get hung up on the property names or values right now. We'll cover them very shortly. First, I would just like to get you a general idea. So first, let's look at inline CSS. So let's say at the moment we have one heading one bravely sitting on our page. Now, how I would like to style this. So let's say I would like to add color red. Now, in the HTML, we had a attribute. Now, the attribute name was very simply style. Now, again, for now, please don't get hung up on a syntax. I would just like to show you how we can add CSS to our page. And later on, we're going to cover the properties and values and everything else. So within the style attribute, I would need to have the quotation marks. And then within the quotation marks, this is where I write my styles. So like I said, I would like to have the color. So I'm going to say color is going to be, as you can see, many options I have right away by Visual Studio Code. So let's go with, I don't know, we can go with olive, let's say. Now, I know I said red, but for now, I just changed my mind and we're going with olive. So I'm going to save it. And what happens is right away, my text is olive. So I changed my color. Now, all this is great. However, obviously, there are going to be some downsides to this. Now, what would be the downsides? Well, even though we have the color and everything is looking really nice, what happens if I would like more properties? So let's say font size. Now, remember, we needed to add the semicolon, and I'm going to say font size. And let's go with, again, three REMs. And again, I know I said this before, but please, please don't get hung up on the syntax right now. We're going to cover this shortly. Pretty much you don't have to do anything. Just watch what's happening. So let's say here we're adding the font size. Now, as you can see already, I just added two properties, but my HTML is getting really clogged up. And also another issue would be the fact that what if I have another heading two? Let's say heading two. And here I'm going to say hello, people. Now, what if I would like to have some CSS here, too? Does that mean, again, I'm going to have to create a style attribute and add all these styles? As you can see, it gets really annoying because if you're going to have web page normally with, let's say, 500 elements, what are you going to do for each and every element? You're going to be adding this kind of style. And then what if you are going to change your mind? What if you're going to say, I don't know, I don't feel like olive. I feel like red. So let's head over back and let's say red. Now, for every element that has the olive, you're going to be changing back to red. That is not very practical. So while inline CSS is the most basic way how we can add CSS to our web page, since it has multiple downsides, this is probably not something that you're going to use very often. Hey, guys, just to let you know that starting from this video, if we will write any code during the video, if you would like, you can access lecture code for that particular video in the zip folder in the video resources. So let's take it out for a spin. Let's say that we're going to be looking for the heading elements and we would like to get a source code. We can either click it here. As you can see, this would be the resources. Or while you're watching the video, let's say within the images, we can start watching the video and then we can pause it because we don't listen to this guy. And let's just say in the resources, we're going to have the availability for the images. zip. 
So this is how we can access the images. Zip. In both cases, you're gonna download the zip folder for that particular lecture. And then as I'm going not to my documents, I would like to go to the downloads. And you'll see how I have two zip folders. Now we can just open up these zip folders, then we're looking for the folder name. And again, this is going to work exactly the same for the image. So I'm not going to show you for both of them, but we can just drag and drop it or however you would like to open up in your text editor. Now, if you want to save it, obviously you would need to use it for your downloads and then maybe put it in your documents or something like that. But the general sense would be that if you'd like to access the code that we write in a video, you can always have access to it in the video resources. I know what some of you are probably thinking. Okay, smart guy. You just showed us how to use inline CSS and then spend next five minutes trashing it. So what is the better option? Well, we have the internal CSS. So first of all, let me get rid of these style attribute. I'm not going to need it right now. And let's say there's going to be heading one. And just for kicks, let's add a few more. Let's say that I'm going to have three hello worlds with heading one. And then I'm just going to have one lonely one be heading two. Now, how do we add the internal CSS? Well, we're going to have to head over to the head tags. And again, that is important. Please don't place them somewhere else and then expect them to work. And then within the head tags, we would need to create another tag. Now that tag would be the style tag. So again, we're going to create two sets of tags, the starting one and the closing one. And then we write our CSS within these tags. Now how that would work. Again, we're going to start with a selector. And again, please don't get hang up right now on a syntax. We're going to cover it literally in a few videos. But let's say I would want to start with all the heading ones. So I'm going to say all the heading ones are going to have some kind of style. Now, again, like I said, I will going to go with color because that is just going to be the easier one. And let's just go with blue. So my color is going to be blue as well as I would like to add font size. And again, let's go with something like three REMs. So notice something else. Now I don't have to jump back and forth with my HTML and add for every kind of style. And that way, all of my heading ones have been styled, right? With literally like what? One, two, three, and four lines of code. And I can add whatever styles I would like over here. And all my heading ones are going to be styled. If I want heading two, I can just say heading two. And then let's say again, we're going to use color. Color is going to be red and not red olive, but actually red. And let's add font size to be really small. Uh, that would be, I don't know, 0.5 REMs, something like this. So now my heading two is going to be very small with color red. And if I'm going to add more heading twos, the same thing is going to happen to them. And again, you can see how much more powerful this is already because we don't have to, first of all, clog up our HTML. So I didn't need to add anything here. I can clearly see what kind of structure I have, as well as the only changes we're making are going to be instantly added to all of them. Now, let's say I'm going to change my mind. I'm going to say, you know what? I don't like the color blue. So let's say we're going to go with chocolate. So instantly, all my heading ones are going to get this style. So internal CSS is way, way more powerful than jumping throughout the actual components that we have. Or I'm sorry, not components, the elements that we have in HTML and adding them the inline styles. So far, so good. We know what is the inline CSS as well as the internal CSS. However, there is also a tiny issue with internal CSS. Now, what would be the issue? Well, we are lacking flexibility for multiple pages. And I think it's going to be easier for me to show you than again to talk about it for, let's say, half an hour. So first of all, we would need to create another page. And I'm going to say there's going to be a new file. I'm going to call this page about HTML. And again, we're going to have to get some kind of structure. So I'm going to say that, first of all, I would like to get the basic HTML structure. So let me delete this. And let's say that we're going to be looking for, again, some kind of heading ones. We'll say heading one. And we can do the same thing. Hello, world. And let's copy and paste it. And maybe let's also add the heading two, just so we're staying consistent. Now, here we're going to say hello, people, just like we did before. And let's copy, let's say, three lines over here. So first of all, I would obviously like to see how my about page is going to look like. And here, maybe let's add another title, just so we know that this is going to be about page. And let's write it in the title that this is an about page. And you know what? Let's also right away set up the link 
because that way we can navigate much more easier. So I'm going to say somewhere within my index page. So index HTML all the way on the top. We're going to say that there is going to be a link. The link is going to go to about index page or about HTML page. And let's just say about page. Now I can do the same link in the about page just so we can navigate back. So we're going to head over to my about page. And instead of about HTML, we're obviously going to write index HTML. And let's just change this to a home page. So again, we're just setting up a easy navigation just so we don't have to deal with whatever tabs here. So let's say here, we're going to get rid of this. We're going to save it. And now I have my about page link. Now, if I head over to about page, what do I see? Well, I see that there is pretty much three heading ones and then the heading two. But obviously, all of them are not styled. So I would have to style them. Well, the easy way would be, well, I mean, it's very simple. We're just going to grab the style tags. We're going to copy and paste them here. And we're going to say that somewhere again within the head element within the about page, we're going to copy and paste them. And sure enough, I have my styles. So everything is working really nice. But let's say, I don't know, next day or next hour or whatever. Sometime after I have created this initial styles, I changed my mind and I say, you know what? This chocolate color doesn't really good, look good. So let's say if we're going to head over to my home page, I'm going to say, you know what? I would like to change this and I would like to change this to green again. No specific reason. This is just how I feel. Now, what happens, though? I would like to change these heading ones to all my pages to index page about page. Let's say there's going to be contact page or whatever, 10 other thousand pages. Now, what happens, though? If I go to about HTML, what do I see? Do you think this is going to be green or this is going to be still chocolate? Well, I'm going to go out here on a limb and say that this is still going to be chocolate because within this page, we're obviously styling it as a chocolate. So that is probably an issue. I mean, changing one color is no big deal. But imagine that in general with your styles, you're going to have, I don't know, 1000 lines of code, 500 lines of code, even 30 lines of code. So what are you going to do each time you're going to change your mind to some kind of property or the value? You're going to be jumping all through your pages and changing it. And what, for example, happens if you forget what kind of style you need to change? So then you're going to have to scour through and I don't know, compare them or do something like this. Now, again, that doesn't sound very productive to me. So there has to be a better option. OK, in order to show you the better option, first of all, let's get rid of these styles. So we don't need them for now. We're just going to get rid of the internal CSS now within the about page as well as the index page. So let's say we're going to have no internal CSS. So we're just going to go again back to the basic HTML that we already worked before. Now, that better way would be a external CSS. Now, in order to create the external CSS, we would first need to create the CSS file. Now, we can name our CSS file however we would like, but similarly how we had with index when we needed to have this HTML extension, the same works with CSS. So here, if I'm going to say, let's say styles CSS, and again, you can name this Bobby CSS. It doesn't really matter. There's just some conventions where you say main CSS or style CSS, something that would actually reflect that this is something to do with styles. But the most important thing is here, the CSS extension. You always, always need to have it if you want to use it, the CSS. Now here again, we can write the styles. Now again, let's remember what we had. So let's say heading one. And for the heading one, let's have just a simple color and let's look for some kind of color. So I could go with, I don't know, crimson, something like this. So I'm not going to add any more font size. I think it's we already have covered this, but let's say for heading three. And when I say cover this, I mean, we don't need to add it right now. We're going to cover the syntax. That doesn't mean that I'm not going to cover what is the font size, just as a side note. And let's say for heading two, we're going to add another color. Let's say color, and I'm going to look this time for a yellow one. So I'm going to save the file. And surprise, surprise, nothing happened. You might be wondering, well, this dude doesn't know what he's talking about. We just had a perfectly working CSS, and now he just ruined everything. He deleted it. He created some funky CSS style, and nothing is working. Well, please just wait. 
if we're gonna head over to index HTML and again within the head element, please don't place it somewhere else within the head element. We are gonna have to create a link now with Emmet. If I just type a link, notice I'm getting all these options here. So what I can do is I can select the CSS one, which is gonna give me right away everything that I'm looking for. Now it might be funky sometimes if you have multiple actual files. So be care careful. It's gonna give you something automatically. So again, let me head over back with Command Z. So undo what we just did, and instead of maybe CSS, we can just look for basic link. So let me again get me up suggestions, and within the link notice, we're getting the link tag. Now the link tag is not gonna have a closing tag. However, we're getting this relationship attribute, and this is gonna point to the style sheet. So we're saying we would want to link this page to a style sheet. Now, this is where we would need to go with the path. And again, we have covered this already in HTML, where we can have, let's say, the simple path and just say styles CSS, or we can obviously add here the dot and forward slash. And again, this is where we're looking within the folder. Now, up to this point, it's not going to matter which one you use. Like I said before, later on, as you're using the React or Node, this will going to matter. So you might as well get used to it right away, the actual uh, relative paths. But anyway, let's just stay with a simple example. And let's say we're looking for style CSS. No, okay. So I'm looking right now and I don't see anything. And the reason why I don't see anything that if I'm actually in the index page, or I'm sorry, the belt page, I'm obviously not going to be able to see that. However, if I'm going to click on the index page, so I'm currently at the index page, check this out. So I have all my styles red for heading one, as well as, I mean, it's annoying probably. So this was probably a bad choice. Let's pick another color. Let's say that we're going to be looking for this guy. Maybe this is going to be a little bit friendlier to eye. And now we have this cat at blue for my heading two. Okay. So this is already a good start. Now, what about the about page? Well, we would have to do the same thing. I'm going to head over back to the about page. I'm going to create a link. Now, again, this link is going to have to be the actual element with the relationship attribute that going to have the value of style sheet as well as the href attribute with where this is located. And remember, whenever we were working with links, we were also using this href attribute. Check this out just like this here. So the same way would work over here. Again, we're going to point to the same thing. And I'm sorry, not main CSS, but style CSS. So once we save it, notice what happens. So if I'm going to go to a about page, what do you think I'm going to have over here? Um, if we're working or I'm sorry, if we're looking at this correctly, we notice that both of them are exactly the same. So we have been successful. Now, what does that mean to us? Well, that means that if I'm going to go here back to the styles CSS, and if I'm going to change this, and let's say if I'm going to go back to, I don't know, like regular blue color, on both pages, not only the about page, but also the home page, these styles are going to work. So you can see already how much pro more productive this is, where we can right away work with multiple pages. Again, let's add maybe a font size, say font size, and let's say this is going to be four REMs. And right away on both pages, and again, for the last time, let me show you that this really works on both pages, they are working. So we know we have been successful. So in general, this is going to make your life much more easier if you're using the external CSS. Now, one last point that I would like to cover, though, is this path. In a lot of times, whenever you're working, your styles are going to be, in fact, in a separate folder because you're going to have multiple files within your root directory, as well as you're going to have multiple CSS. And it's not a good idea just have all these files over here. So what you would do in most cases, and we're not going to do this throughout the tutorial, but throughout the project, we're going to have the folder. And then within the folder, let's call this folder. And again, it just makes sense if the folder is going to be CSS. And let's grab and copy and paste the styles. Now, the moment we do that, notice we don't have our styles anymore because the relative path or path in general matters. It does matter where you're pointing, where this href is pointing. So let's fix this. Let's say for the index HTML, again, we need to look for the CSS folder first. So we're going to say we're looking for the CSS and then we're looking for styles. And again, as a side note, this is also going to work. So if I'm going to say for index HTML, 
I would have to look for CSS folder and then for the style CSS. Now everything is working fine. And again, this is going to work the same way if we're using the relative path. Now, let's also check it out in the about HTML. Again, we just need to point to CSS folder. And then within the CSS folder, we have the style CSS. And this is how we can start using the external style sheet in our CSS projects. Awesome. We have covered inline, internal and external CSS. However, before we dive into the syntax and how we can create a syntax, what are the rules for the syntax? I would like to show you which one is more powerful. So if you're looking at these three options, it's going to come important later on. It's going to basically matter a lot of times which one of them is more powerful. Now, let me show you what I mean by this. Now, first of all, I'd like to clean up a little workspace a little bit. I mean, you don't have to do this, but I'm going to set it up. Basically, the workspace, how we are going to use this. So let me close, first of all, the tabs. For now, I would just like to have my index HTML. I'm going to use the style CSS, and I'm going to move them out of the CSS folder, as well as I'm going to delete the CSS folder. So I'm not going to use it right now. And I'm going to get rid of the about HTML as well. So I'm going to be left with only index HTML. And here, let's create the proper path. So I'm going to have the style CSS. And now this is going to be my setup. So as I'm looking at this, right? I have my heading one as well as heading two. And for now, what you know what? I can just deal with heading one because we're only going to show you one example. And then if I have my styles with, let's say, color blue, what do you think happens if I'm going to create another one, the internal CSS? And again, remember, this was done by using the style sheets. And let's say here I'm going to write that, you know what, heading ones are going to be different color. Heading one is going to be, let's say, uh, red. So again, let me write the proper syntax, which we will cover later in, in the next video. And let's say color is going to be red. What do you think is going to happen? Notice here I'm having heading one with color blue. But in my internal style sheet, I am writing this as color red. Now, I haven't saved it yet, so nothing obviously is happening. But what do you think is going to happen once I save it? Do you think heading one is going to be blue or red? Well, let's test it out. Let me save this. And uh, interesting. What's happening is my headings not blue, but in fact, they're red. So I can see that the internal style sheet is stronger than the external one because we are overriding this. Now, let me tell you right away that we can use both of them. So let's say if you would have some kind of styles here for heading one, but you would have different styling here for heading two. You can do that. It's not like against the law or anything like that. However, just remember that if you're going to have some kind of style here already for heading one, you will going to override this. So if you're selecting the same element or the same class or ID or whatever, if you're having the same selector and you already have this style property and value in your external CSS in the internal one, you're going to override this. Now, obviously, if I'm selecting the heading two, and for heading two, I have no selections right now. I have no CSS rules in the external one. It's obviously not going to matter. So let's say font size is going to be, I don't know, three REMs. Then this is just going to affect it because I don't have any styles there. But if I would have some different style here, it will going to get overwritten. That's something important. Now, we also have the inline CSS, remember? So what about if we go to one of the heading ones? And obviously, this is going to work the same on all of them, but I'm not going to show you the way we do it in all of them because it's just a waste of time. So let's just look at the first one. And here we'll again change the color and let's use the green one. Now, what do you think is going to happen right now? So let's save this and let's see. Hmm. Interesting. So we had the external one that had the color blue. Then we use the internal one. And we basically said, you know what? No, it's going to be red. And then last but not least, we have the inline one, which pretty much override both of them. And now we have the color green. So what you need to remember is that the inline one is going to be the most strongest one. So whatever you're going to write here within inline is going to override everything that you have with an internal or external. The same way with internal, you are going to override the external one. And again, this is going to save you a lot of time when you're looking for some kind of bugs is to remember that inline one would be the most powerful one. 
then we have the internal one and only then we have the external one. Excellent. We know who is the biggest bully and that would be the inline CSS. So let's right now look at the syntax and the way the general syntax works. Now, before again, we do this. Let me just delete this comment in HTML. Let's get rid of the link. I think we can get rid of all these headings. We can just leave maybe two of them. So I'm just going to get a, a rid of these ones as delete the other heading two as well. We can get uh, this one deleted. So there's going to be no inline style. And just as a side note, if you would like throughout the CSS tutorial, you can work within the style sheet, the internal one. So let's say all the examples that I'm going to be doing are going to be in the external style sheet. However, if you do find it more useful during the tutorial, you can obviously work here within the internal one. So let's say it's a little bit more powerful to you to see that you're going to be selecting heading one. And you can see that the actual heading one is going to be right in front of you in your HTML. Now, I wouldn't suggest doing that when we were going to be working with the projects because there's going to be way more code in the actual CSS. But for now, there's not going to be that many. So you might as well can do that. Now, I'm going to write everything in external one because I just find it a little bit more uh, interesting and useful for me when I have that external style sheet. But this is really up to you. So if this is something you enjoy more working with the internal one during the tutorial, go ahead and just do that. Now I'm going to delete it and I'm going to do all my work in the external one. Now, if we're going to head over to external one, we're not going to cover yet all the values yet. However, we will going to go over the general things that are there. So first and foremost, this is going to be called CSS rules. So this whole thing together is a CSS rule. Also, if you are working in CSS, we have an option for comments. So the way create comments is just by command and a forward slash. Or again, if you don't like the actual shortcuts, we can head over to the file or you know what? It wasn't file. I think it was in the edit. Notice we have toggle comment. So that's going to do the same thing. Now that's going to be useful, especially as we're working through the project, because you would want to separate your styles a little bit. So there's going to be some styles that are for some type of section of the page. Then there's going to be other ones. So you are going to use the comments. So just so you're not surprised at what's happening right now, if you'd like to add the comment again, you will just go here. Let me start a new line. Maybe that's going to be a little bit more useful. And if you click on toggle line comment, you're going to get new sets of comments. So everything that we're going to write over here, similarly, how we have within the HTML is not going to be infected in our style sheet. So we can even comment out the actual styles that we have for now. So let's say I can comment them out. Once we save it, notice we have no styles anymore. So it's also something that you might do later on when you would like to test something. So I digress a little bit, but I wanted to show you just so you're not surprised of what's happening. So let me delete this comment here. Let's get rid of this one, the second one. And here we're going to say that this would be CSS rule. Now, next on our agenda is going to be this guy. So this is going to be our selector. So again, let me create another comment and let's write that we are looking for selectors. Now there's going to be tons of selectors. However, in my opinion, it's not necessary, especially in the beginning to really know all of them, because you can do a lot of powerful things by knowing, I don't know, maybe six or seven of them. And for most cases, believe me, you can do a lot of powerful things just by using the class selectors that we haven't covered and the ID. So later on, we're going to look at more selectors. But in general, just remember that this is going to be something that you're selecting. So let's say in our case, we're selecting the heading one. If there's going to be heading two, we're going to be selecting heading two. If there's going to be a class, we're going to be selecting class and so on and so forth. So this would be something that we're selecting with the selector. After the selector, we have the declaration block. So first of all, let me write this declaration. That's going to be probably proper spelling. And this whole thing is going to be declaration block. Or notice that we do need to have the opening curly brace and the closing one. So again, if you're going to omit this and if I'm going to save this for now, this is going to work, but it gives you an error. So technically, if you're going to do something like this, if we're going to use another heading two, notice it's going to be really hard. You are getting right away the error. So here we're going to write color red. Let's check it out what we're going to have. And we cannot select anymore our heading two 
because we already made here the syntax error. So you need to be careful with the fact that you do need to follow the proper syntax. So the moment I'm going to open up or I'm sorry, add the closing curly brace, then everything is going to be working fine. So this is going to be our whole declaration block. Now, like I probably mentioned before, and no, I, this is not what I would like to do. The whole thing is going to be called CSS rule. So this is going to be our whole rule that includes the selector and the declaration block. Now, you don't need to remember these names, but the reason why I'm telling you this is as we're going to be going through tutorial, just so you're not surprised if I'm using one of them. If I let's say, well, let's work on the most basic selector, you know what I'm talking about. Now, this within is going to be the property. So let's say within the declaration block, there's going to be a declaration. Now, declaration is the property plus the value. So in our case, this would be this line. And let's write over here declaration. That's going to be the naming. And then within the declaration, this guy is going to be the property. So what kind of property would we want? Whether this is going to be the color or font size. And again, there's many, many properties. So obviously, I'm not going to cover them right now. But in general, what you need to remember that this is going to be the property. Then we have the syntax of a colon. And then here we have the values. And if we have many properties, we also have even more values. So let's say for colors, again, you name it. You want blue, you will get blue. You want red, you will get red. And you get the idea. Now, like I also mentioned before, the semicolon is important. Because if I'm going to omit the semicolon, and again, if we're going to save it, notice something interesting. My color blue is not working, as was my font size. And again, we're getting the errors right away. So it's kind of hard to miss. And this is one of the neat things of using the actual nice text header, which is going to give you right away the suggestions. So you don't have to spend hours or minutes or whatever on looking for these er syntax errors that you created. Because believe me, again, with four lines of code, seven lines of code. Yeah, of course, it's easy. But once you get to hundreds and thousands, then this small error might take you a long long to fix it and find it. So it's always better if you have something visually telling you that, hey, listen, buddy, you made some kind of mistake. So semicolons important in short. So let me maybe add over here that there's going to be property. So let's write property. And right after the property, we have the value. Let me save it. Now we have all our comments. So now we know the basic syntax. And again, in a nutshell, all these things are going to change depending on what you're doing. You're going to have different selectors. You're going to have different properties and you're going to have different values. So these things are going to be constantly changing. You're not always going to work with heading once. You're not always going to work with just colors or let's say color value of blue. So all things can change all the time. However, the syntax is going to stay the same. You will going to have a selector, you will going to have a property, and you will going to have value. Excellent. Now that we know the syntax, why don't we start with our first most basic selector, which is going to be the type selector. Now, in order to work properly, let me just delete everything that I have in the CSS. Now, you don't have to do this, but in my opinion, I would like to start from scratch because that way you don't get confused with the previous code. It's HTML. I'm going to create a new element. So there's going to be one heading one with hello world, then heading two. And let's add maybe a paragraph. Now, please understand that we can add all the HTML elements we would like. But in my case, I'm just going to add three of them because it's going to work exactly the same. So there's going to be a heading one, heading two, and paragraph with 50 words. OK, so far, so good. Then if I'm going to head over to style CSS and make my first selection. Now, whenever we're going to be working with selectors, the most basic selector is going to be the type selector. Now, type selector reflects of the type of the ML element you would like to select. So if you want to select heading one, you're going to type heading one. If you're going to want to select heading two, you're going to type heading two. Now, what do you think you're going to have to type if you want to select paragraph? I think you probably answered P, meaning for paragraph. So that would be correct. Now, in order to work with that, we already know we would need to create a selector. In my case, let's say heading one. And now I'd like to say what kind of styles I would want to add for this element. Now, in my case, I'm going to write color again, and we're going to use color quite excessively in the beginning because that's just 
easier one to show you because you can right away see it on the browser. And let's say again, we're going to start very simply by heading one it is going to be red. So sure enough, all the heading ones, or in our case, just one that we have in our document are going to have the color of red. Now the same is going to work if I'm going to have the heading two. And again, I'm just selecting this as my selector. So all the elements on my page that are going to be heading two are going to have color. And let's say green again, nothing really earth shattering, but we know that this is working. And last but not least, we have the paragraph. And again, work exactly the same way of whatever HTML element you have. Now, in my case, I have a paragraph and let's say color is going to be gray. So, so far, so good. Every time we would like to style some kind of HTML element, the easiest and the most basic selector would be type selector, where we just select the type of the HTML element we would like to style. If we want to be extremely precise, we should address these selectors as element selectors. So if you're a stickler for names, here you go. Keep in mind, though, at least in my opinion, it is much more important to know how to use them, not to remember every naming convention out there. With that being said, once we have element selectors in our CSS tool build, CSS offers something really cool called element grouping, where we can combine multiple selectors. While we will use element selectors as our example, please understand that you can group any featured CSS selectors we will cover in the future the same way. So how selector grouping would work. So let's say right now we have three selectors. We have the heading one, heading two, and paragraph. And what we would want to do if, let's say, we would want the whole text to be blue. Well, you could say the simplest way would be very simple. We could just select the body since this is a tag and add color blue. So let's try this out. So maybe let me delete this. And let's say that instead of selecting heading one or paragraph, we can just do body. And we can use color blue. So simple enough. Let's see what happens. Well, sure enough, it works. Okay. What about if I would just want the heading one and heading two to be blue? However, paragraph should say, I don't know, stay red or something like that. So let's say the whole body is going to be red. But then these two I would want to be blue. Well, I can either select them specifically separately. So I can say heading one and heading two, or I can just group them together. So in this case, I can just say heading one, comma. So that would be the syntax. And heading two is going to be in a different color. So in our case, let's say that it would be blue. So I'm going to again use the color blue. And the moment we save it, notice what happens. So both of the selectors that we had, if we group them together, both of them have the same property with the same value. So this is how we can use grouping selectors in CSS. So far, so good. We know how we can work with grouping. But let's imagine a little bit different scenario. So let's say I'm going to first delete this and we're going to write heading one is going to be title heading, title heading. And then we're going to add some kind of paragraph. So we're going to say paragraph and within the paragraph, I don't know, let's place like 20 words or something like that. And then after the paragraph, let's imagine there's going to be another heading one, but this one is just going to be, I don't know, footer heading. Again, it doesn't really matter how we call this. The main idea is going to be very simple. So I would like to work with heading one and add some kind of styles only to the heading one. And let's say the other heading one, the footer heading he is going to have a separate styles. Well, first of all, let me get rid of everything that I have for now in my style sheet. And now let's decide how we're going to do this. So only the title heading is going to have specific styles. And then the footer heading would have totally different styles. So how we would do this? Well, in the CSS, we have an option of using the ID selector. Now, the way we work with ID selector, first, we would need to create an ID. So in my case, I know that I would need to work with a attribute in my HTML which would be ID and naming here is important because we're going to use it to actually select it in CSS. So let's call this, I don't know, a heading title. And then also we can work with a heading one, but we're going to do that in a second. Once we understand how we can select this with the ID of heading so far, so good. So we have the ID with a value of heading. 
Now, once we go to style CSS, if we would like to select this ID, the syntax would be following. So first, we we're going to go with hey hashtag, and then we would need to come up with a name. Now, when I say we would need to come up with a name, that means that the name should match whatever you have here in the values. Otherwise, if you're going to call this grandma idea, the CSS is not going to be able to select it. So in our case, we know that we are selecting the heading and let's maybe use the color again property. And we're going to say the color should be green. However, let's also look at the other property that we can use for colors. That would be for the background. And again, we we're going to cover colors in literally a few videos. However, just remember that with a color, what you're doing is you're selecting the color of the text. Then the background is going to be self explanatory with a background. So let's say background should be, I don't know, black. Now, the moment we save it, notice what happens. Only the heading, the heading one that had the title of the heading has over here this background black as well as the color green. Now I can go back and I can change it. Okay, maybe let's call this title heading. Maybe that should make a little bit more sense. So I can write title. However, the moment I change the name or my value in the ID attribute, obviously the CSS is not anymore selecting because names don't match. So in our case, again, we would need to head over. And let's say that this is going to be the title. Now, one thing with IDs, what we should remember is the simple fact that they should be unique. What I mean by this. So let's say if we're going to be working with the other heading, the footer heading, we should have the ID. However, that ID should match the IDs that we already have currently on a page. So I'm going to call this here subheading. So instead of using again the title, IDs should be unique because there's other ways how we can work with CSS in order to work with multiple elements together, not just grouping the actual selectors. So that's something you should always remember that if you would like to use IDs, make sure that they are unique for that specific element, meaning you're not reusing them somewhere around the actual page. Otherwise, if the IDs are not unique, you're kind of losing the actual meaning of what is the reasoning for using the ID. Now, if we have the subheading, Let's change it around a little bit. Let's say again, we're going to be selecting hub subheading. Now we know that the naming right now is correct. Maybe let's select these styles and let's just change these colors. So instead of green, let's going to go with, I don't know, text red. And then what we should use for the background. I don't know. Let's decide. So for the background, we can use maybe gray. So let's test this out. Now, the moment we're going to save it, notice for the title ID. We're selecting the background black and the color green. And for the subheading, again, we're using the ID selector. And we're saying that the background is going to be gray and color is going to be red. Excellent. We know how to use the ID selectors. But CSS offers also something really cool called class selectors. So where we would use these bad boys? As always, we're going to start by getting rid of what we had in a previous video. And let's say in the index HTML. We're going to change this around a little bit. So I'm going to say that I'm going to get rid of all my headings and everything. And I would just like to work with, I don't know, heading three. And again, it doesn't really matter what kind of elements we're creating. The whole point is going to be working with classes. So let's say there's going to be a heading three and I'm going to call this I am and we're going to have green. So that would be a green heading. Now, within the second heading, the other heading three, I'm going to say, well, you know what? I am red. So those are going to be in my two headings. So I can save this. And you know what? We can just select them both and copy and paste them a few times. So let's say that there's going to be six headings total. Three of them are going to be green and three of them are going to be red. Now, as I'm looking at it, I already can see that. Yeah, everything is fine. So I have red, red, red. Everything is correct. Now, how do I actually style them green or red? Well, you can say we could use the IDs, right? Because we cannot select them all. I cannot do like this because otherwise this is not going to make sense. I'm going to style them, but all of them are going to be exactly the same. So if I'm going to write color green, all of them are going to be green. And if I'm going to write color red, all of them are going to be color red. So what would be the solution? Well, you can say, okay, we can go back and we can start adding the IDs. We can say, I don't know, maybe one, right? So this would be number one, then number two, three, four, and then go back. Yeah, you could technically do this, but that probably wouldn't be the fastest way. And there's actually a better way, and that would be using the class. 
now the class is going to be again attribute on our HTML and safe self explanatory. The name is going to be class. So class selectors would be using the class attribute. And again, for the class attribute, we will need to write the value. Now, this is not the best naming convention. I can tell you right away, naming this green, and we're going to cover this a lot in the projects. But for now, let's just go with class of green, where for every heading that I would like to have green, I'm going to add this class of green. So instead of using the IDs, we're going to create a class. And for every heading, like I said, that I would like to have green, I'm going to copy and paste this and add the value of green. Now for all the red ones, I'm going to change it. I'm not going to say green. We're going to use red. So again, let me select this value for this guy. And let's say for the red one, copy and paste. And for the last one, the same way. Now, how do we select them in CSS, though? So we'll head over back and we're going to get rid of this heading three. We're not interested in this. And now instead of the hashtag that we used for the IDs, we need to use dot. So this is how we can select classes. And again, we need to write the name of the class. And don't write grandmom idea because you don't have this class in your document. Well, maybe you do have in yours, but I don't have in mine. So in my case, we're going to write green. And now again, I can write whatever I would like. So in our case, since this is going to be best visual example, we're going to use green. And what happens? Only the headings that had the class of green turn green. Simple enough. Now let's copy and paste this. Let's say we're going to select not the green, but instead we're going to work with red. And what happens? Well, we're going to add, let's say, color red and also background, I don't know, gray. Background is going to be gray. Now, what do you think is going to happen in this case? So only the classes that were added to the heading threes with the value of red were styled this way. So this is how we can use class selectors in CSS, and they are very, very powerful. Just to hit home about the ID and class selectors, we can also combine them. So first and foremost, if we would like to add the ID of, let's say, title, so this is going to be my main title, I can just add the ID and I can also add the styling. So just because you already have the class doesn't mean that you cannot add the ID as well as you can add the second class. So let's say here, not only we're going to have the add of title, but we're also going to have, I don't know, the class of lowercase. So again, the naming is not going to be the best one, but this is just to show you that we can work not only with multiple classes for the same element, as well as we can use the IDs combined with classes. So how this is going to work. So let's say I'm going to go back to the style CSS and we're going to say the ID for the title. We're just going to say that font size is going to be really big. And again, we're going to cover these properties in a second. I just need to show you how things work with classes and IDs. And let's say for the ID of title, we're going to have the font size with 40 pixels. So now it's right away how it got bigger. But then let's say we also have a class of lowercase, lowercase. And for this one, we have text transform. Again, some property we're going to cover later, but we're going to have the lowercase in this case. So every time I started with I am is going to be turned into lowercase. Now, again, the main difference between the ID selectors and class selectors, because as you can see, the only thing was the syntax in the CSS, but everything else was the same. But in the HTML, you should use only IDs as something unique. So don't add the same ID with the title somewhere else here. However, classes we can reuse however we would like. So for everything that I wanted green, I could just add the class of green. However, for lowercase, if I would just want, let's say, this class of red, also lowercase, I can do the same thing. So now this guy has the lowercase. And hopefully you get an idea. Where classes, we can reuse them however we would like for everything that we would want to style. However, with IDs, they should be unique. So you shouldn't reuse them with the same value. While working with HTML, we didn't cover two specific elements. One was div and the other one was span. Now, the reason why I didn't cover them because I didn't find it useful with an HTML because they're used for grouping. However, in the CSS, these two elements are going to come very, very powerful and very, very useful. So again, as always, let's look at the example. So first of all, let me just keep this green. So the color is going to stay green as well as we're going to keep this class of red. 
just to show you how basically things would work. Now I'm gonna get rid of the titles and the IDs and everything else. So let me save it and let's head over back to index HTML. Now in the index HTML, I'm gonna create a heading, let's say three, with a title um, heading number one. Heading, heading number one. And let's add maybe a paragraph with, I'm sorry, I would have to first have a paragraph with, I don't know, text like, I don't know, 10 words or you know what, 20. That's going to be our paragraph. Now, what I would like to do right now is copy and paste the same thing here. And let's write heading not number one, but this is going to be heading number two. And also let's decide that somewhere within the second paragraph, there's going to be some text and I'm going to add my own text where I'm going to say, hey. I am, I am uppercase, and I'm going to write here a I am uppercase. So we would like to have this text uppercase, and I'm going to place it in two places. So I'm going to say the first one is going to be here, and the second one is going to be somewhere over here. And again, this all is going to make sense literally in a second. Now, what happens? So I would like only this heading, so the heading number one, and the paragraph to be read, as well as the heading three the second heading as well as the paragraph to be blue so now let's think about it again i cannot select all the heading threes because i would want them different as well as i cannot select all the paragraphs because it will work the same way now again we could say well we can easily just add here the grouping or we can add the ids however there's a better way so we can use div and span for this like i said div and span would be used for grouping so first, let me create a element and the element is going to be very simple. So we just write a div. That's all since that is the name of the element. And now I would like to place the ending tag for this div where I would want to group something. So in my case, I want to group the heading three as well as the paragraph, the first paragraph. So I'm going to add over here and the moment we save it, notice nothing happens. Nothing literally changes. No. OK. However, that was a good start. Now, why don't we do the same thing with the span? However, in this case, we're going to work with this. Hey, I'm uppercase. So again, right before this text, I am uppercase. Let's create a span element. And now let's say that I would like to work with an uppercase. So I'm going to grab this whatever text and I'm going to copy and paste it here. Now I would like to do the same thing with this guy. So we have a few options. We can either just copy and paste everything that we had here. Or, you know, what? I didn't want to cut it out. Let's say copy and we're going to replace whatever text we had already with a span. And again, the moment we do this, nothing changes in our actual browser. So we might be tempted thinking, well, listen, there's something wrong with this. What's happening? Well, we should already know that we can use just the simple element selectors, right? So we're going to head over back and we're going to say for all my divs, I would want to first have some kind of color and the background. So again, we can just copy and paste whatever properties and the values. And let's notice something interesting. So right away, what's happening is the div element that had the heading and a paragraph has the styles that we wanted just by obviously using our element selector. OK, let's test it out the same thing with the span. Let's say for the span, we're going to use a text transform again property that we're going to cover later on with an uppercase. Now, also, we notice something interesting. So everywhere we use the span, we were able to group whatever we placed within the span and add these styles. Now, I'm not going to cover right now the reasoning for why this is basically displayed one way and the span is going to be in the inline because we're going to cover this as we start talking about the box model. Because for now, what we're seeing is that there's just a difference with a div. We are basically starting a new line and the span we're using for inline styles. And in general, this would be the block level element, and this is going to be the inline element. But again, we're going to cover this later on the course. What I would like to understand that whenever we're going to be using div and span, this is going to be used for grouping. So if you want to group something together, we're going to place this in a div. And if we would like to style this as a block element, then the divs are going to be important. However, if you would like to style something as the inline element, Whereas you notice it's not starting a new line, then we're going to use span. But again, we're going to cover this later on in much more detail. For now, though, what is going to happen with the set second heading two and the paragraph? Because remember, we wanted the second one to also have different styling. And for now, we have the div. 
now if i'm gonna add another div here so i'm gonna say okay so there's gonna be a second div and let me cut this out and let's say that i'm gonna obviously end where i would like to end my grouping so this is going to be at the end of the paragraph now both of them are obviously having the same styles now this is not what we want right so we wanted the second one to have just a green color let's say well we know that we can use classes so this is where the divs become important because we can add these classes we can say you know what there's going to be class and we already have the classes so i'm going to have the class of red now at the moment nothing changes because obviously we have the both the same things or what if i'm going to get rid of this div so i'm not going to select anything anymore with a div notice only the first one obviously has the class now i can head over back to the second one and say you know what okay for this guy let's add the class of green so the power of div and the span is the fact that not only we can style them as element selectors we can also add whatever ids we would want whatever classes we would want and that way we can start grouping things together and adding whatever styles we would like now how also is going to work with the span so let's say that i have this i am uppercase well i can head over to the first one since i wouldn't want all my spans just to be uppercase but let's imagine there's going to be span where i would like to reuse my class of red okay all we have to do is just add the class of red and let's see what happens so now only the span that has the class of red is getting these styles now again please don't focus on the fact that divs are block level elements and the spans are going to be inline level elements because we haven't covered that but just remember that whenever we would like to group something we can either use div or we can use the span and just in a very basic level span we're going to use if we would like to style something within the text already so we wouldn't want to start a new line however div we would style if we would want to style it as a block level so just to give you an idea if i'm going to head over here and change the span to the div so let's say there's going to be div instead of the class of span i'm sorry the div with the class of red instead of the span notice what happens so in this case we will going to start a new line so instead of just styling everything in line so again that would be the most basic differences but we're going to cover the more differences later on once we have covered div now let's talk about the inheritance in css now please don't be scared of this word it's not as scary as it seems it basically operates on a principle that whatever styles we're going to be adding for the parent element in the html the children element are going to be inherited unless we specifically style the children element now as always i think it's going to be much more easier to go over it with the actual code so first of all let me get rid of the styles that i have over here and let's also delete everything that we had so far in the previous lesson so we're going to start very simply by working with paragraphs so i'm going to say there's going to be two paragraphs each of them i don't know 10 words so let's do it this way i'm going to select them both and i'm going to say you know what the first and the second one is just going to be paragraph okay so far so good now if i'm going to head over back to style css notice that if i'm going to style the body and let's add the color red what's going to happen both paragraphs are going to turn red now why is this happening well you see if we're looking at the body element we should already know that body element at the moment has two children and both of them are paragraph elements so paragraph number one and paragraph number two and what happens is if we're going to add styles to a parent element the children are going to inherit them so as we're styling the body we're ultimately also styling right now the paragraph now if i'm going to head over back and let's say that there is going to be a div and now these two paragraphs are going to be sitting within the div and let's test it out so i'm going to copy and paste them for now all of them are styled the same way however if we're going to say uh, that div is going to have a color of red check this out so i'm sorry not red blue something different now both paragraphs are blue now why is this happening because even though the div is still the child of the body now we specifically say okay for this div there's going to be a separate style so instead of just inheriting everything from body 
we specifically say, okay, so for day we're gonna have color of blue. So now both paragraphs are actually inheriting from the div. So in general, this is how the inheritance would work. However, if I'm gonna head over and if I'm gonna say that I also would like to place a, I don't know, heading two, and I'm gonna say I am heading. And if within the CSS, we're gonna add a specific style here for the heading two. And again, this could be ID, this could be class, this could be a simple element selector. Please understand that there would be no difference and for our case, we're just going to use a simple element selector. And if we're going to again add the color of green, note this notice something interesting. So now the heading is going to be having only the color of green. So what I'm trying to explain to you that inheritance is going to work unless you're adding a specific style for that particular element. However, if something is going to be sitting here as a child element, it will going to be inherited from the parent element as you're applying styles to a parent element. Hopefully you understand the general idea behind inheritance. Now let's look at some caveats to the inheritance. Now, in order to do that, we're going to head over back to the style CSS and we're going to have a selection for the body and for the body, we would like to have some kind of font family. Now, I know I keep repeating this, but please don't focus on the properties and the values because we will going to cover them. In general, I would have to cover some very major topics first, and then we're going to look at the specific properties and the values. Now, like I said, we're going to be looking for the font family. And in our case, we're going to go for the monospace. And we're also going to add some line height. So let's say line height is going to be 1.5 EMs. So something like this. So notice something interesting. Now, all my children element are inheriting this from the body. Now, the reason for that is not only we are just using some kind of CSS, we are not overriding this specific property. So this is important. Now, let's say again, we're going to add the color of red within the body. Then because we are selecting this color within the div as well as within the heading two, this is where we are more specifically working with this element. However, if there's going to be a property that we're passing down from the parent, we will going to inherit it. So this is kind of important point because understand that this will be inherited unless you specifically overwrite that specific property. So please don't get confused and don't think that just because you added color blue in a div doesn't mean that you're going to also overwrite the font family and line break. It doesn't work that way. It needs to be a specific property. Now, in that case, obviously, you're going to be using different value, like with heading two where you have the same property, but different value. But if you are not working with that property, then you will going to be inherited that property. Now, what's also important is that not every properties are going to be inherited. So let's say we're going to work with a border. And in this case, we're going to add like three pixels, solid, and I don't know, black, something like this. Check this out. Only div right now has this property. So not all the properties are going to be inherited by children. So that's also something to remember. As you start working with CSS, inevitably, you're going to meet the last rule principle as well as specificity. And then you're also going to see later on whenever we're working with universal selector. And I'm going to kind of lump them together because I think all of them pretty much work on a principle of the previous one. So let's start with a last rule. So let's imagine this scenario. Again, we have our div, we have heading two, and then here I have two paragraphs. Now, let's just get rid of all the styles, just so you don't get confused. And let's imagine that we're going to be styling just the paragraph by itself. So as always, we're going to use the color example, and I'm going to say color is blue. Now, if I'm going to later on in the same style sheet, add the same selection for the paragraph with a different color, what do you think is going to happen? So let's say here, I'm going to say paragraph. And in my case, this is going to be red. Now, what do you think is going to happen? Well, we can already see that paragraphs are right now going to be with a color of red. Now, why is that happening? Well, because CSS is going to use the last rule that you added and then apply that to the style sheet. Now, usually what's going to happen is that you're going to be hard, hard working with your CSS and you're going to be adding lines and lines and lines in CSS. And then later on, you're going to come here somewhere at line 32 or 3049. 
and then you're gonna add in the style. So what happens is that you're gonna confuse the fact that you already had your style selection over here. And CSS is gonna be like, okay, so you had your first rule or whatever second rule or whatever, but later on you actually create a new one. So I'm gonna use right now the fact that you added this last rule and I'm gonna apply only the last rule. So please remember whenever you're working that your last rule is gonna be applied regardless of what you have in between. So that's something to really too important to remember, because there's going to be cases where you're going to find yourself looking for the reasoning of why certain CSS is displayed. So always check whether you haven't applied another rule that pretty much overrides your initial one. Now, we also have a topic of specificity. Now, what would that mean? Well, okay, let's look at the same example. We have one paragraph and the second one. So let's add maybe some kind of class to them. So let's write class is going to be red over here, as well as for this guy. So let's add the class of red. Now, what happens if I'm going to head over again back to the CSS? First of all, let's style the class of red. Let's write, obviously, that the color in our case is going to be red. But let's say that later on, again, somewhere in a document, we're going to write that for all my paragraphs in this case, I would like to style them blue. Do you think they're going to be blue right now since we just covered the last rule or they're still going to be red? Well, let's test it out. As you notice, they are staying red. And the reason for that is even though we are applying this with a last rule, the first rule is more specific. So what's happening with CSS? CSS has a specific measurement system for specificity. And if you want to be really diligent about that, you can just go ahead and Google specificity measurement in CSS. Now, I'm not going to cover this because I don't really find it useful right now, especially if we're just starting with CSS. However, if you would like to go and explore it on your own, you're more than welcome to do that. And at the very beginning, I believe I would go with W3 schools again, because their explanation probably is going to be the most straightforward, especially as you're just starting out with a CSS. Now, I'd also would like to cover very quickly the fact that we have the universal selector, which selects all the elements. So if I'm just going to get rid of this, and if I'm going to say that there's going to be universal selector, and the way we type universal selector is by this asterisk. And again, let's add some kind of value. So let's say color is going to be blue. All my elements are going to be the blue. However, the kicker here is that the universal selector has the least amount of the actual specificity. So even though we can add this at the very end, if we're going to be overriding this somewhere, so let's say again for the paragraphs, we're going to say color red, then the actual universal selector is going to be the least powerful one. So it's going to have the least amount of specificity. Now we are using universal selector whenever we want to reset the default browser test, which we will going to cover a little bit later. And we will going to use this universal selector as we start working with the project. But in general, this is all it's going to do. It's going to select all the elements, however, with least amount of specificity. Hey, guys, at this point, I think we are comfortable with CSS basics. So we can start exploring more specific parts of CSS. And since we have used colors for most of our examples anyway, why don't we start with colors in CSS? In the following videos, we will look at color properties, values, how Visual Studio Code can help us out with picking the best colors possible for our project. And last but not least, we'll explore useful external resources for colors in CSS. So what do you say? Sounds like a plan? All right, all right. I know you're eager to start working with actual properties and values. So here it goes. Even though we have already used color properties pretty much for all our examples, why don't we start with colors and then we're going to go from there and we'll start very simply by looking at two properties that you'll use most of the time with colors color property responsible for the color of the text and background color responsible for the color of the background. First, let's practice with some more HTML. So I'm going to head over to my index HTML and you know what? Maybe before we do that, I'm going to get rid of these paragraphs and whatever uh, asterisks. I'm not going to need it right now. And then within the index HTML, I'm just going to create basically two headings with each of them having a separate div or I'm sorry, not just div uh, with separate ID. 
So I'm going to say, let's say there's going to be heading three and within the heading three, we're going to write, I don't know, ID and let's call this first. And this is just going to be, I am uh, heading, heading number one. And by the way, I noticed that all the time I'm misspelling this. So if you're annoyed by this, my apologies, but unfortunately that's what happens. I do like the misspell stuff. So let's write here second. So I'm going to have two headings. One is going to be number and one, let's say, and the other one is going to be number two. So let's see how this is going to look like. Very simply, we have two headings. Now I'm going to head over back to style CSS. And like I said, we're going to start working with the color properties. Now we're not going to look at the values right now, meaning we're going to use the most basic ones. Those are we're going to cover in next videos. But let's just start by looking at the properties that you will use all the time with your colors. So first, let's start by selecting a div. Now the div or I'm sorry, the ID for some reason, I keep naming my IDs, the divs and my first ID is going to have color. Now the color property again could be anything. We're going to go with, I don't know, something like this. So this is going to be my color. And then we're looking for the background color. Now the background color is obviously going to be responsible for the background. So the moment I'm going to save it, notice right now my ID with a name of first is going to look like this. So it's going to have this background. And obviously this would be the color. And again, this would work with any element that you would like to, apart from obviously something like image where image is totally separate HTML element, but let's say it would work with the link. It would work with the paragraph. Now with the links, there's some caveats to it, but generally speaking, every time you would want the color of the text to be some kind of color, you would use the color property. And every time you would want the background, you would use the background color property. Now let's also test it out for the second ID, because I would like to show you where the background actually has the shorthand. So we're going to go over here and we're going to say that there is going to be obviously the ID second. I believe that's how I named it. And here, let's again, use some kind of color. Now this is just going to be some crimson or something like this. And then let's work with the background. Now with the background, eventually we're going to also look at the background images. And what happens is that for the images, we would use something like this. And again, we're not going to cover this in a great detail right now because we're going to look at it later. But at the end of the day, we can combine both of these properties here and just write the shorthand. And this is something that you're going to see a lot in a CSS. And obviously, we're going to cover this a lot because we can do the same thing with, let's say, paddings or margin, and you get an idea. So in our case, instead of writing the long way where we're just looking for the color, we can just write background. And then here we can write either the color or later on, we're obviously going to start working with images as our background. So in our case, let's just say that this is going to be yellow and we can save it and notice that it's going to work exactly the same way. So just please be aware that you can use background color just as you're working with the color. But later on, as we're going to start working with the images, we also can use the background shorthand where we just write background and then whatever value we're typing here for the color. Awesome. We are experts on color properties. What about the values? Well, our most basic option would be using color names. And um, this is as, as straightforward as it gets. Every time we're going to be using the property, let's say color or background color or the shorthand for the background, we would want to use some kind of color name. Now, what's neat about Visual Studio Code that it gives us suggestions. So if I would want color names starting with Y, it's going to give me the color name starting with Y. If I'm going to start with A, it's going to give me color names with A. And you get the point. There's 140 of the color names. If you would like to know all of them, you can again head over to W3 schools and just start scrolling down and you'll see all the color names. Now, like I said, this is just going to be as basic as it gets. Every time you would want to have color or background color property, you can always pick a value from the color names. Using color names for your projects is very neat and handy. However, eventually you're going to run out of your options. Basically, the more projects you're going to build, the bigger project you would like to build, you're going to be reaching for some more color options. And one of the color options we have is RGB. Now, what in the world is RGB? Well, you see, RGB stands for red, green and blue. And then we can pick color values from zero to 255, meaning zero would be the smallest. 
and 255 would be the largest. So how we would use this? Well, first of all, let's delete this color name and let's write that we're going to be looking for RGB color. Now we're going to write RGB and let's write over here what values you would like. Well, since I would like my color to be completely red, I'm going to have my value to 255. And then for the rest of them for green and blue, I'm just going to set them zero. Now I already can see that Visual Studio Gold is giving me this suggestion. So basically, this is going to be the color that we're going to have. And we can clearly see that this is going to be red. Now, let me save it. And sure enough, I have my red color. Now, as we're working with RGB values, we also have an option of having the black or white color. So how we would get the black color again, let's write RGB. That would be our syntax. And then we're looking for zero, zero, zero. So all three zeros would mean that we're getting the black color. Now, the white one would be completely opposite. That one would be 255, 255, and 255. So let's test it out. First of all, let's change for the ID number second to green color. So let's say the color of the text is going to be green. So how do we do this? Again, 0, 255, and 255, since the green is the second value, correct? And then we're looking for the background of white. Now, obviously, the moment I'm going to do that, you'll see that it's going to be hard to notice because our whole text is white, our whole document. But let's try it out. So let's write 255, 255, and let's say 255. Like I said, it's hard to notice because our whole background is white. Now, why don't we go to the body and let's look at different values? Because for now, you're probably thinking, well, wait a minute. He's just using the red and green color. Well, let's mix it up a little bit. Let's say for the body, there's going to be background and let's write RGB values. And then you can write here whatever your heart desires. So I'm going to write 100. Let's say 34. And maybe here, this is going to be 210. And let's see what kind of color. And obviously, first of all, I can see that I have my background of white. So all this is working. And here I'm getting this purple curl. Now, obviously, we're not going to be covering each and every number right now. But just to give you an idea, if you would like, let's say your color to be reddish, you obviously would be focusing on this value. If you would be having your color as green, you would be focusing on green value. And let's maybe add one more ID here. Let's basically say heading with a ID of three. And let's also write, I'm not going to be two, I'm going to be three. And let's test it out for the blue one. So let's say over here in the styles, again, we can just create a new rule. I'm going to say we're going to be looking for number three. And for the color, maybe let's have the color again of blue. So let's look for RGB. And then we're saying zero, zero. And the last one is going to be 255, because obviously that is for the blue one. And then for the background, again, maybe let's test it out a little bit different values. So let's say RGB. And then we're looking for, I don't know, 100, 100, and 100. And let's see how this is going to work out. And this is like a dark grayish color. Now, hopefully you understand that this is how we work with RGB values. And feel free to experience with these values. And then in the next video, we're going to look at the RGBA value. It's easy to see that RGB values give you much more power because you have way more options than just choosing the color names. However, what's also really neat about RGB that it allows you to use RGBA, which would stand for opacity and transparency. And the values would be from zero to one. Now, as always, I think it's going to be easier for me to show you how that would work. So first of all, let's head over to index HTML and we're going to add one more ID here. Let's call this four. Let's say there's going to be heading three with a ID of four, and the value is also going to be here for once we have added our heading with an ID of four, we can head over back to style CSS. And here I'm going to do a little bit of spring cleaning. So first, again, we're going to start very basic. We're going to say for the first one, I would like to select it. However, right now, you know what? Maybe let's just save it and let's see that everything right now is pretty much white and the color is obviously black. And here, let's write some color values. So I'm going to start first by color. And I would like to practice a little bit of RGBA. And we're going to say that, I don't know, this is going to be like 100. And then again, let's say 123. 
and I don't know, 56, whatever value you would like. Now, the difference here is for the background, I would like to go with a black background. However, I would like to use the opacity and transparency values. So here I'm going to write background. And then again, I'm going to be looking for RGB, but instead of just simple RGB, we're going to be looking for RGBA. Now, how we would write this again, we would look for the black color, obviously, since this is our option. And then we're going to be looking for what kind of opacity or transparency this is going to be. So let's say here, if I'm going to write 0.5, this is not going to be totally black color. Notice that this would be a grayish color because we would be adding the opacity of 0.5. Now we are going to be practicing all only with RGBA for the background of black, but obviously understand that you can use any color here. What's important here is this opacity color. Now, again, it's probably going to be easier if we're going to look at multiple values. So let's copy and paste this. Let's say for the second one, we're going to be using a different one. So first of all, let me select again the first and let's change this to a second one. So for the second ID, I would like to maybe have a different color. The color is going to be, I don't know, 45 and uh, I don't know, 200. And let's say the third one is going to be, I don't know, 34. And again, just to show you that you can obviously have different color values. Now, I'm mostly focusing on a green one. So maybe let's add this one like 10, because otherwise all of them are going to be green. So this is going to be totally black over here. So why don't we practice on having the opacity of zero point, let's say 25. And I'm giving right now kind of round values, but understand that you have an option of zero to one. So one is going to be the max one and the zero would be the smallest one. So as I'm working here, notice. 0.5 would have a less transparency than 0.25. So if I'm going to go totally with zero, this is going to give me totally white color. Don't believe me? Well, let's test it out. And we're going to copy and paste it here. In this case, we're going to change it around. I'm going to say the value is going to be three. So obviously for the idea of two. Now let's go totally red color. So here we have 255, zero, zero. That's going to be my option. And let's notice if I'm going to go with totally black color. However, also my opacity is going to be zero. What's going to happen? Well, the background is there, but we cannot see it. And this is how would opacity value would work. So even though we have a black color, we made it totally transparent by adding here for the opacity value zero. However, if we would like to check totally black color, we know we have the idea of four. Then let's add a different color, maybe a blue one. Let's say RGB again, RGB. Then we're looking for zero, zero. And then the third value is going to be 255. And here for the background, let's add totally black color with RGBA, RGBA. And that will be zero, zero, and one. Now, obviously, in this case, you might as well just write RGB because there's no difference. And again, we are using the round values just to show you that how this would work. Because I'm not going to cover every number from zero to one, 0 0.01 or 0 0.02, because this is going to waste a lot of my time. But we notice that the, our fourth ID is having a totally black color with a color, obviously, of blue, because we already know how the RGB would work. Now, if you would want to experiment a little bit more, let's say body, let's go for some kind of background color. And in our case, again, let's use RGBA. And then again, we can write whatever our hearts desire. So if I'm going to start by 10, uh, 10, and maybe here, I don't know, 200. And I would like to add some kind of opacity, let's say point 0 0.3. Let's notice what we're going to have. So now this color would look like this. However, if I'm going to omit that, and if I'm going to say RGBA, notice I'm going to be having totally blue color. So what the opacity adds is right now pretty much our transparency. So again, let's go back and let's say that RGBA is going to be, I don't know, 0 0.01, something like this, or 0 0.2. It doesn't really matter. At the moment I'm going to save it, it's going to be almost white because we're almost at transparency level. Okay, so if we're going to go up, obviously, if we're going to go like 0 point, I don't know, 56, what are we going to have? Well, now we're going to have less transparent color, so more towards the blue one. And again, this would work with any color value. 
So if I'm going to write here, uh, not 355, but let's say 200, let's notice. Now we're going more towards the green. And again, green with some kind of transparency value, not just regular green. And this is really powerful whenever we are working with a CSS, because this is going to allow us to create like an overlay. So let's say there's going to be some kind of picture and we would want to add some kind of color on top of the picture. So the picture, let's say, is not as bright. So that is where we can use RGBA values by controlling our opacity. One would think that having color names as well as RGB and RGBA values would give us more than enough options. But lucky for us, we have more ways to work with colors in CSS. And those would be HSL as well as hexadecimal values. Now we will not cover HSL since at this point, I find it a massive overkill. If you would like to research on your own, of course, there are plenty of great resources. Just type CSS HSL and you're going to be blown away. We will, however, cover hexadecimal color values or just hex values for short. Hex values work a lot like RGB, where it covers the spectrum of red, green, and you guessed it, blue colors. The difference, though, would be the fact that hex gives you much more color choices, because instead of just using numbers, hex values can also be letters from A to F, where A would represent a number of 10 and F would represent a number of 15. Well, the syntax would be following. First, we would need to have the hashtag. Then the first two values would represent color of red, and it can be any number from 1 to 10 and the letter from A to F. For example, if we would want to have a red color, we would write like this. Notice we have the hashtag. So we're looking for the hex value. And then we have two F's since we know that the F is going to be the highest one. Now, does that mean is the same thing as we were working before with RGB, where the highest one, the 255 was obviously red in our case, since with the hex value, it's exactly the same. However, what you notice here is that you have way more numbers in between. If you were just looking here from zero to 255, here you're looking at two values that each of them can be from zero to 50. So again, in general, in one short sentence, the hex values are just going to give you way more color options. That's all there is to it. And as always, I think it's the best way to actually practice with this. Now, I will going to get rid of the body. I don't think that color is helping us right now, as well as I don't think I need to create anything in HTML. I think that's a little bit overkill already each and every time heading over to HTML. And let's start maybe with an idea first and let's decide what we would like to see. So I guess again, as always, let's start with the red one. But please remember, these are not the only colors you can have. We will just using them, for example. So let's say that we were going to get rid of the RGB. We don't need this. And you know what? Let me right away delete both of the lines since we're going to rewrite both of them. And let's say that here I'm going to be looking for the hex color. And that way we know that this is going to be hashtag then FF because I would like to have the red one. And then let's say zero zero for blue and zero zero for red. I'm sorry, the zero zero for green and zero zero for blue. And as you can see right away, the Visual Studio Code gives us the color box where it tells us that this is going to be a red color. So I wasn't the pulling a fast one on you. Okay, what about the background? Well, let's check it out how we can get a black one. Well, if we would have to guess if we already were working with RGB, what would you think how we would get the black one? Well, with RGB, we got zero, zero, zero. Well, what about if we try it with hex? So we can say here zero, zero, zero. And what you can see is that there's going to be an options for you in hex colors, where you don't have to type all six zeros. You can just type three. And this pretty much is going to mean the exactly the same thing. Now let me save it. And let's see what's going to happen. And surprise, surprise, I'm having a black color as my background. And my hex color would be for the red one. Okay, let's test it out the green one. However, let's switch it up a little bit. Let's say that this guy is going to be green. And we know that this would be hex value. And we're looking for zero, zero, FF. That would be for the green one. And then we're looking for zero, zero. So this should turn green. And instead of the color being green, we're going to have the background green, but the color is going to be white. So I'm going to show you how we can get the white color with a hex values. 
So let's say hashtag. Then we're looking for F F F. Now, why again? We're using F F F. Remember R G B. What was the value? Well, it was 255. That was the max and zero was the black one. So max was the white one. And then zero was the black one. Well, it works the same way with hex values. Just the difference with hex value max is over here. Max is the 15. Again, let's save it. And what do we see? The color, the background color is green. And the actual color is white. Awesome. Now let's try with div or I'm sorry, heading number three, meaning the ID number three. And in this case, let's try it out. Maybe the blue one. Let's say hashtag. And this would be again, zero, 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 zero. And then we're looking for FF, which should give us the black value. I'm sorry, the blue value. And as you can see right now, I'm having the syntax error. Now I'm having the syntax error because I'm trying to write the hex color with seven values instead of six. So let me delete one of the zeros and we have ourselves a blue color. Now, maybe let's test it out some different value because again, probably you are a little bit confused of why we always use these colors, the red, green, and blue, why we cannot try some other colors. And sure enough, we can. And let me show you my favorite, at least orange color, which would be F15025. So at the moment we're going to save it, this is going to be our orange color. And then obviously my color for the text is still going to be green. I'm sorry, the blue, not green. And then last but not least, let's work with the four where we're just going to give some random colors for hex. So let's say hex value. And then we're looking for, I don't know, two, three, four, uh, a D something like this. So this should be a pink one. And then what's happening here is going to be another value of hex. And let's just go with two, 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 which is going to be the black one. But in general, this is how you would work with hex colors in the CSS. It would also be a crime from my part, not to mention the awesome tools that Visual Studio Code offers us whenever we're working with colors. So let's say if I'm looking at this hex color, what if I would like to change the color? What you notice as I'm hovering over the color, I have these options. So first and foremost, I could change whatever values I'm getting back. So as you can see right now, I'm working with hex values. But if, what if I change my mind and I say, hey, you know what? I would like to have the HSL. Well, I can just click on it. And now my value is in HSL. Now, if I would want RGB, I'm getting the RGB. Now, also notice something else. If you have here this board, this color board, as I left click it on this dot, I can just change whatever color value I have over here. And it gives me the values here in RGB. So let's say here I'm looking for this color, then I would want that one. Let's say black one, let's brighter one. And here on right hand side, I can just change the color scheme altogether. So let's say I don't like the red one. Well, what about if we're trying out uh, green? What about red? And again, I can go on and on the whole day to show you that you kinds of you have all kinds of options over here. Now we can also control the opacity. So even though this is going to be the color, then here we're looking basically for the tone. We also can change the opacity. And if I'm going to go completely over here to the zero, I'm going to have RGBA value of zero. Now I remember what was the zero. Well, it was totally transparent. So if I'm going to save this right now, check it out. You're not going to be able to see any of the text because right now the opacity is level is all the way down to zero. If you want the opacity 0 0.5, well, let's go somewhere there, 0 0.5. And then this is going to spit me back some value of whatever I'm having. Again, if I would like to change it to, let's say, hex color, right away, I can just change it to hex color. So we have all kinds of options here with Visual Studio Code. And all of these things combined make it the best text editor out there. If you're anything like me, it is a great struggle for you to pick nice colors for your next project. And while there are many great options out there, since all of them essentially do the same thing, that is offer you a color palette, I'll show you coolers, which I use the most. As always, this is subjective. So if you like some other resource, no hard feelings. And the way it works is we're going to have to visit coolers.com. And if you're looking at URL, this is just going to be basically C and then two O's and then again, L O R S. And then we're looking for dot CO. Now, the moment we visit the site, we notice that we're getting this interface. And on the home screen, we see this button start the generator. It's free. So we can just click on it. Have no fear. They're not going to charge you anything. Then this is going to load up the generator. And now we're getting the color palettes. Now, let's say it starts here with a black one. And obviously, you can see this 
greenish, yellowish or whatever. Now you can pick all these colors or let's say you would test some more. So you will have to press the space bar and now it spits back another set of colors and I can go endlessly here with the space bar and you understand the idea that this is just going to give us each and every time a new color palette. Now, let's say if I like this green bluish color, I can just click on it and notice it says here lock. And again, we can test some more. And let's say this is going to give me the matching colors. Now, I think this is going to match with this guy. Okay, I can test some more colors again with the space bar. And I can go on and on and on. Now, in the bottom right now, we already know what are the hex colors. So we can just copy and paste this value. And we'll get, we can head over back to our text editor. And let's say for the color, I'm going to pick this guy. Notice that it doesn't come with the hex value, actual hashtag. So I'm going to leave the hashtag. Once I delete the old color, let me copy and paste it. Once we're going to save it right now, my color is going to be this greenish. If we would like to, let's say, change our background to this guy, to the part of one. Again, we're going to copy the value. We're going to head over back to text editor. And let's say here for the background, again, with a hashtag, we're just going to add the background color. Now, normally what you're going to do is you're going to get all these colors up here on top of the CSS, and then we're going to later on learn how to use the CSS variables and how we are using them. Most likely you're not going to be jumping back and forth for each and every element and getting the colors. But the main idea is if you would like to pick some kind of nice colors that actually go together, you would be looking for some kind of external resource. And the one that I like to use is the coolers.co. Beautiful. We now know how to implement colors in CSS. What's next on our agenda? How about CSS units? Over the course of next videos, we'll discuss what are units, what is the difference between absolute and relative units, as well as take a closer look at pixels, EM, REM values, as well as viewport units of width and height. In the process, we're also going to learn new CSS properties that implement units in their values. Okay, enough theory, let's get after it. All right, we have added colors to our CSS tool belt. What's next? Our next topic is very interesting because it will control the layout of our project. So my friends, let's get to know units in CSS. And we'll start with something called pixels. Here's the kicker though. In order to cover units, we're gonna have to use them on some properties. Otherwise, we might as well look at the slides for the next three hours. So let's quickly learn three properties in the CSS, font size, width, and height. If you would have to guess, what do you think these properties control? Well, if I would have to go out on a limb, I would say font size is responsible for the size of our fonts or text, and width and height would control the width and height of the elements. So far, so good. What about pixels? Well, again, we can spend two hours and 20 slides or we can resolve it in one sentence answer where pixel is an absolute unit of measurement. And speaking very broadly, one pixel represents one dot on a screen. So as you're looking at this screen right now, one pixel is basically going to be one dot. And again, this is speaking very broadly because I don't want to spend two hours in slides. Now, let's test it out because this is just going to be the easiest way to understand it. Now, as you can see, by the way, I cleaned everything out in the CSS and HTML because for this new section, I would like to start fresh. Now, again, I'm going to do very simply where there's going to be heading one and I'm just going to say units in the CSS, in the CSS. So that's going to be my text. And the moment I finish typing, awesome, we have our heading one. Now I'm going to head over back to the styles and we're going to test our first property, which would be font size. So we know that we can select it in multiple ways. And in my case, I'm just going to pick the element selector. Then I'm going to write what kind of font size I would like. So I'm going to say font size. And this is going to be my property. And now I'm using the values. And as you can see, there's many options that right now Visual Studio Code gives us. But what we are interested in is the pixels. So here we're going to say that let's say this is going to be 30 pixels. Now check this out. The moment we're going to save it, this is in fact going to get smaller. Okay. What if we're going to write 60 pixels? Now my font size is going to get way bigger because I added this absolute value. Now, why did I say that pixels are absolute values of measurement? Well, you see 60 pixels right now, what we have here is going to be 60 pixels here 
as well as going to be 60 pixels on the different screen size. So the 60 pixels or pixels in general are not going to depend on anything else. You're just going to come up with your absolute size, whatever that might be. And then you're just going to go with it. Now, later on, as we're looking for responsive values, you'll see how with responsive values, we will going to be depending on other things. But with pixels, this is just going to be straight up. Give me the value for the pixels. And these are going to be dots on a screen. Now, let's say for the font size, it's one thing. Now, what about the width? Let's say, what if we're going to say some kind of width? And for the setting one, again, let me write it properly. Let's say width is going to be, I don't know, 200 pixels. Now, let me save it and check this out. Well, first of all, we can already see that something changed. So our text basically wrapped to a new line. However, maybe visually it would be easier if we would use the color. So how we can use the color? Well, we already covered this, right? So we had the background. And let's say let's go with some kind of color. Again, I'm going to go with the color name because I find it much more easier. So I'm going to say blue. And as you can see right now, I'm having my heading one that is 200 pixels wide. And again, it would look 200 pixels on a small screen, as well as this is going to be 200 pixels on a bigger screen. So again, it's not going to depend on any parent elements, any root elements, anything like that. This is just going to be straight up value that we're giving. You want more width? Well, here you go. I have 400 pixels. This is not what I wanted, but let me save it properly. Now this is going to be 400 pixels. Again, depending on a screen size, if I'm going to say that this is going to be, let's say, 1,000, now obviously this is going to be wrapping out. So now I actually need to scroll because this is literally going to be 1,000 pixels. So on a smaller screen, obviously, this is not going to be able to fit in a screen. However, if we move to the bigger screen size, everything is working fine. This is going to be our 1,000 pixels. Now let's test it out. Also, maybe the height. And you know what? Let's change this one to decent 400. That's going to stay the same. So let's save it. Or you know what? 400 is still too big. Let's do 200. That's going to be our value. And let's maybe add some kind of height. And for the height, we're going to be looking for the height property again. And in this case, we're going to go with 300 pixels. And again, all of these are very straightforward. You want bigger size? Just go with bigger size. Now, you don't have to always use pixels. We will going to cover all the relative values. However, the main importance is to understand that the font size is going to control the height of the text. So the bigger, obviously, the value here, the bigger is going to be the text. The smaller the value, you get an idea. Now, the same would work with width. Again, we're going to be working later on with responsive values, but you just need to pass some kind of unit here. In our case, we're using the absolute values. So everything that's showing on a small screen is going to look exactly the same on a bigger screen. You want different height? Add different height. You want to add different width? Go ahead, add different width. And this is as straightforward as it gets. Absolute values were a piece of cake. Just type the value and CSS is going to spit back in the browser whatever value you chose. What about relative values? And the first value we're going to be looking at it is going to be the percent value. Now for this, I will going to delete the CSS. So we will going to get rid of the heading one as well as we're going to head over back to a HTML. And here I'm going to create a new div. I'm going to add some class. I'm going to say that this would be the outer div. And within the outer div, let's add another div with a class of inner. So again, the naming is really up to you, as long as you obviously remember it by the time you get to CSS. So far, so good. So we have our HTML done. Now I'm going to head over to the CSS. And first, I'm going to start styling the inner div. Now for the inner div, I'm going to say very simply that I would want width. And I would want, let's say, width in percentages. So let's start very easy. We're going to say 50%. So far, so good. After that, we would like to look at the height. So I'm going to say height. And again, we can do the same thing. The height is going to be 50%. Now, also, in order to see what's happening, maybe add some background color. So let's say there's going to be a background color. And we're just going to go with the red one. Now, once I save it, nothing happens. And I mean, you can jump back to HTML. You can probably double check. Maybe your classes were not matching. Maybe, I don't know, you didn't have enough coffee today. But it's not working. So either we can yell out some nasty things towards the screen, or we can figure out what is happening with the percentages. You see, the percentages are going to depend on the parent element. Now, what is in our case parent element? 
we have the inner correct, and then we have the outer. So I would assume that the outer is going to be the parent, and then the inner is going to be the child. Now, let me fix this a little bit, and we're going to add for the outer also some width and height. So here I'm going to say for the outer div, I'm going to be looking for what? Well, first, I would like to have some width. And let's say again, we're going to go back to the pixels. And we're going to say that the width is going to be 500 pixels. And also the height is as well going to be 500 pixels. So far, so good. And let's add maybe also a background color. And the background color is going to be blue. Let's save this. And what do we see? So we have the outer div that should have the 500 and 500. And then the inner one is going to be exactly the half. Because obviously, we went with 50% as well as the 50% for the height. So now you can see that this is a relative. And this is relative to the parent. So if I'm going to make this 200, just so we can understand a little bit easier, we should, we should see that the inner div should be 100 by 100. Now it is still going to be displayed in the percentages. However, the moment we're going to be changing these values, the 200 or the 200, also the width of the inner one is also going to change. Now, we can also change it by just changing the percentages. We're not limited to 50% by any means. So if I'm going to say the width is going to be 100%, now my width is going to be 100% of this 200 pixels. You want more? Here you go. We can do 400. Now we have the outer one of 400. And again, it follows the same principle. The only thing we need to remember that percentages will going to depend on a parent element. All right. Up next, we have EM values, which again, in one sentence would be a relative value. However, the key is in the details. So basically, devil is in the details where it depends on a parent again. And as always, I think it's just easier to go through with an example. Now we're going to head over first to index HTML and we're going to create something else. I'm going to say there's going to be paragraph and for a paragraph, I don't know, can be, you know what? Let's just write text. Absolute. And I actually changed my mind. It's not going to be paragraph. It's going to be heading three with a text of first, maybe relative as well as we're going to add the same class. So I'm going to say class and this is also going to be relative. Now, what I would like to do with the second heading one, since I'm going to copy and paste it is I'm going to change this value from the relative. And I'm going to say this will going to be absolute. So two heading threes, one with relative and the other one with absolute. So far, so good. Then we're heading back to style CSS and we can obviously get rid of these styles because we already don't have the divs. So there's no use for them. Whenever I'm going to be working right now with the relative and absolute, I would like to select the classes because this is what I have in my index HTML. So first, let's me try to select it. So I'm going to say for relative value, I'm going to add something that's not going to make sense right now. I'm going to say, let's say font size, the property we already know. So this should make sense. But I'm going to write two EMs. Okay, so I'm getting the text. I mean, it doesn't really matter what I have there because I haven't covered yet what is EMs. But now let's look at the absolute. So I'm going to say absolute absolute and this is going to be font size and obviously this would be the second heading three and we're going to say font size it is going to be 32 pixels okay now i know it might be hard to see because it's a different text so maybe if you want you can go back and just write a different text the one that would match absolute but i can tell you right away they are exactly the same now how do i know that well you see First of all, as I'm looking here, what do you think is a parent element for my relative class here? Well, if I'm looking at it, I see that this is a body. And for the body, by default, in most cases, the base text for default browser styles, which will, by the way, cover the default browser styles right after this section. And the default browser style is 16 pixels. Basically, the font size for default browsers, I'm sorry, in the browser's default font size, is 16 pixels. Now, one EM, one EM value is equal to, in this case, 16 pixels. However, if we're going to change this value, then also the EM is going to change. So for now, both of them are exactly the same because this is 32 pixels, absolute value. And this two EM is also 32 pixels because my default browser style 
is 16 pixels. But what about if we're gonna go to the settings? And again, you don't have to do this. You can just watch how I'm doing it. But as I click on this icon over here, I have an option for the settings. Now I'm gonna click on the settings. And then as you scroll down, notice you have an option for font size. Now again, if you're using different browser, it would be located in different place. But if you are using Google Chrome, you should be able to find here font size. Now in this case, I have right away medium, which is default style. But what if I would change this? What if I would say over here, very large, and I can close the settings. Notice something interesting. So now my relative is actually way bigger than the absolute because I changed this default browser style font size. Now this is not anymore 16. This is in fact bigger and I can see this because this relative is actually bigger than absolute. Now let me first of all, change it back. And once I change it back, let's create another example just so you know for sure that this is exactly what I'm saying. Now I'm going to head over again back to index HTML. And in this case, we're going to create our own parent containers for the setting threes. So for the first one, we're going to create some random div. And let me again select it properly. I'm going to place it here within the div. And for the second one, we're also going to do the same thing. So almost everything the same. However, now both of our heading threes are as a children for two of the divs. So I have parent div as well as the second parent div. What about now? Well, I'm going to go back to a CSS. And I'm going to say for all the divs, the font size, the base font size should be, let's say, I don't know, 20 pixels. So font size, that would be my property. And I'm going to say 20 pixels. Now, what do you think is going to happen? Notice again, this is bigger. And if I would actually want to maybe prove the point a little bit better, I'm going to say 10 pixels. So right now the EM is following the fact that the parent has the base size of 10 pixels. So it's one EM or is right now equal to what? Well, this is equal to a 10 pixels. So now this font size is in fact 20 pixels because all we're doing is basically multiplying this. So if my base font size is 10 pixels, now I multiply by two and I'm getting 20 pixels right here. Then the absolute one doesn't care about that. The absolute still stays 32. So that's the key whenever you're working with the EM values. Remember that you will going to be depending on the parent container. And if you're changing something in the parent container, that's going to reflect of what's happening with the EM values. After EM values, we're going to look at REM values. And even though they look exactly the same, they in fact perform quite differently. Now, before we actually go over any theory, let's just do a small test. Now, for now, we have the relative, which would be an EM, which would depend on a parent. However, let's change this around. Let's say that this value again is going to be two REMs. So the moment we change it, notice again something interesting. So now both of them are again exactly the same. So the first key about REM values is that they will not depend on a parent. So I can change this all day long. I can say that the div should have 40 and nothing is going to change. What does matter is as I'm working with my root of the document. Now, in our case, what is the root of the document? Whenever we're looking at our document, I believe this is going to be the HTML. So instead, if I'm going to go and say that 40 HTML is we would like to change it. And let's say instead of 16 pixels, which again comes by default from the browsers, the same way how we looked at the EM values, we can say, let's say that the font size is going to be, I don't know, not 16, but we're going to go with, I don't know, 32. So let's write font size, 32 pixels, and let's see what we're going to have. And now, obviously, this is going to be 64 pixels. Now, how do we know that? Well, if I'm going to go ahead over here and we're going to change it again from 32 to 64, we'll see that now they're exactly the same. So what's happening is it's the same system. So whatever we have here as a font size original for the actual root of the document, this is going to be either doubled if we're going to REMs or if we're going with 1.5, we'll just need to do the math where we calculate how much is 1.5 from the 32. And I believe this is going to be like 48. And again, we can test this out and we can say that this is going to be 48. And now both of them should match. So what's happening is that with REM values, again, we're not depending on a parent. We are depending on a root, which in a document is going to be HTML. 
now what's also gonna happen is not say that i'm gonna get rid of this html and i'm gonna keep this first of all again as i don't know uh two rems now i'm also gonna keep it here i'm gonna say that this value is also gonna be 32 pixels so i would like to set them side by side so both of them should be equal however if your user again is gonna head over to the settings and in the settings he or she is gonna change it to the very large check this out now obviously this is much more bigger because again we're doing the same thing we're changing this default browser style setup for the pixels i'm sorry for the fonts so it's not anymore 16 pixels but in fact we change it to the bigger font size so right away the values with rem got bigger my absolute favorite units in the css have to be view height and view width and the reason for that is because you can make really cool banners like this now how are they going to work well first and foremost they are going to be again relative however they're all going to be relative to a screen so whatever you're seeing right now everything is going to be relative to that now what that means is that even though we're going to be changing the screen size they were also going to change their dimensions depending on that so how this is going to work well as always we're going to head over to index html we're going to get rid of some of these suckers we don't need them and we're going to go first with the div the class is going to be i don't know let's call this banner and then let's copy and paste it and instead of the banner we're going to call this header again it doesn't really matter what your color class is it's for testing anyway okay so far so good so we have our two divs and then let me also delete these guys we don't need them as well now let's start first with well let's see what we have first i think it was the banner okay so we're selecting the class of banner and now i'd like to use let's say 50 and in my case i obviously need to go with 51 well i'm going to say width so 50 width is going to be in my case i don't know view width now the reason for it again for the width we would have to use view width for the height we're going to have to use view height so we have the width what about the height let's also say view heights and then let's check it out again background is going to be red now notice something interesting don't pay attention please again there's going to be some margins that we're getting from default browser styles but what's happening is we're getting 50 percent of the screen horizontally as well as vertically now if i'm going to make my screen size bigger it's not going to change again depending on a screen size this is still going to be 50 percent horizontally and 50 percent vertically don't believe me let's test it out with another guy let's say that there's going to be a header and the header is going to be i don't know again width and we can again use any kind of values i'm just using the round values because they kind of make a little bit more sense let me copy and paste it in this case i don't want the width i want the height and in my case the height is going to be again 100 view heights and we will going to use this a lot every time we're working with the banners so every time we're going to be making some kind of banners like this we will going to use these values or these units now let me add one more thing and let's say background is going to be blue now this is going to be harder to see right away because notice we're kind of have to scroll so you might be like well wait a minute this is not exactly 100 percent, and this is not going to be 100 view heights okay i guess you don't believe me well let's test it out now you don't have to write this code right now we will going to cover this a little bit later but i'm basically going to do like a little reset and i'm going to do this with properties we haven't covered yet so again please don't freak out we will going to cover them later so let's say first i'm going to say margin zero and by the way you don't have to do this i'm just doing it just so you can see that it's really happening then the padding is going to be zero and we're also going to add box sizing to a border box so something like this now what happens you can see that this is exactly right now 100 percent horizontally as well as 100 percent vertically and you know what let me do one last thing and let's flip them over let's say that we're going to be looking first for the header and then the banner so as you start scrolling this is going to be 100 percent. so the moment it loads this is exactly my height and width on the screen but the moment that's scrolling this is where i'm getting to my next item and this right now is going to be 50 percent now if i'm going to make again my screen size bigger this guy obviously is going to work with 50 percent of the screen so again they are really really cool values or units that we're going to use them quite a lot every time we're going to be working with the banner but also you can use for many other things 
And what it allows you to do is not to use some kind of hacks or anything like that dealing with percentages. Instead, again, you're just using the screen. You're saying, hey, listen, give me 25% of the screen. Give me 75%. Give me 10%. It doesn't matter. You're working with the screen. So every time you're going to be working, depending on different screen size, it is going to perform exactly the same way. At this point, I have mentioned default browser styles far too many times without going into too much detail. So why don't we change that and see what default browser styles are all about, as well as getting our feet wet with Google DevTools, which is an awesome tool to test, examine, and to debug our code. Now, first things first, I would like to get rid of the content in the style CSS. So we can just delete these suckers here. We can save it. We can also head over to index.html and get rid of both of these divs. Now let's write just a simple heading one that would say default browser styles. So something like this. And once we have our heading one with some generic text, now let's decide what we're going to do. Well, we would like to see where are the default browser styles. We can do this on a side browser window here on a small one, but I'm going to do it on the bigger browser window because I think it's going to be easier for us to see. And in order to see default browser styles in action, we would need to head over to our dev tools, to the Google dev tools. Now, in order to do that, we would need to either use the right click and notice we would have to come to an inspect, or we can go the long route where we are right clicking, or I'm sorry, just clicking on this little icon. Then we're looking for more tools. And within the more tools, we have the dev tools. And notice they even give you the shortcut for that. So again, doesn't really matter which option you choose as long as you get to this window. Now, I know this might look a little bit scary in the beginning. I trust you and I really feel your pain. However, please don't be scared of this, especially right now, because we're not going to be covering all these tabs or anything like that. We're not working with JavaScript, so we don't need a console. We're not going to be working with Redux, so we don't care about the Redux. What we will going to be working is the elements. And you know what? Let me just zoom in a little bit, because I think that way we're going to be able to see everything better. Okay, so far, so good. So we have our elements. Now, what do you see here in this pane or screen or however you would call it? What do you see here as the text or as the content? Well, if we're looking correctly, we see the doc tag. So that already should ring us the bell. Then we also see the heading one. And unless I'm half asleep right now, I think this is our heading one. Now let me double check. I think it is, yeah. So we have the heading one and that actually matches that we have in our document. So basically what we see over here are the elements that are going to be in our document. So everything that we have in a document, we also see here on this screen. Now I can open this up and notice we have the head element, where obviously we have the meta tags as well as we have the link. So, so far, so good, as well as we have the actual body. Now within the body, this is where we have our heading one. Okay, so far, so good. So if I'm going to click here on this heading one, what do you see here on the right hand side? Well, we see that there's going to be syntax that we already have covered it quite a lot of times, which is the CSS syntax. We have the curly braces, then we have the styles. But what about the styles? Display block, well, that doesn't ring a bell. We didn't write that. Font size, well, we know the property, but I don't think we included it. Okay, well, maybe I'm wrong. Let's head over back to style CSS make sure that I did have my coffee and I, we didn't add any of these styles. No, I see the clean style sheet. There's nothing here as well as everything is saved. So it's not like we added them and maybe didn't save them or something like that. So what's happening here? Well, you see for every browser in order just to display heading one or any kind of HTML, it needs to have some default browser styles. Otherwise, think about it. So we're going to write something we were going to need to have some type of CSS to display it, right? Otherwise, how we're going to display it on a page. So we're going to write the heading one and then what? It's just going to magically appear. So this is where the default browser styles uh, come into play. Now, again, we see quite a few of them here. And one thing about them is that as you're going to be heading through, let's say your dev tools, if ever you're going to notice this user agent style sheet, so that means that that comes from default browser styles. Now, there's going to be cases where we're going to override them, just like we did in a previous video where I used some preset. 
so I got rid of some margins that come by default. Now, in most cases, we're just going to use them. So that's the thing if we're using, let's say, heading one. So it's going to have by default font size two EMs. Now, unless you override this in your CSS, you're just going to use that. You're just going to assume that all the heading ones that you're going to have are, are going to have this kind of font size. So that's all there is to it. So it comes with some default browser styles. Some of them you might override it. Some of them you won't. Some of them you're just going to use it. Like, for example, again, let's say font weight bold. Unless you override this for your heading ones, then they're just going to be bold. Now let's test something out. We're going to head over back to index HTML and we're going to say that, you know what? Not only there's going to be heading one with default browser styles, let's create a heading two. In heading two, we're going to say um, Google, Google Dev Chrome. Let's, let's use Chrome. Chrome Dev Tools, something like this, are awesome. Let's write this over here in heading two. But in this case, we're going to head over to style CSS and actually add some styles. Now, what we're going to add again, it's going to be very simply something we have done already before color is going to be red. And let's say font size is going to be, I don't know what we can do, maybe 60 pixels, something like this. Again, it doesn't really matter what you write as long as you add some type of style. Again, we're going to head over back to our dev tools. Notice something interesting. So I have my heading one. And if I would like to check any element as I'm hovering over the element, then already dev tools are telling me some stuff about them. So from the body, let's say it shows over here that the width and the height. So there's going to be some width and height in the pixels, as well as we have an option here. If let's say we click on them, then on the right side, it's being displayed. So if I click on them again, it shows over here. If I click on heading one and as well, this is being displayed on the right hand side. Now, what's also nifty about Google Dev Tools is the fact that I can just select the element. So I have this option of just clicking on it on this little arrow. And then as I'm hovering over the document, I can just select wherever I would want. Now that's going to come in handy, especially if you have something really nested, which was going to happen later on as we're working with projects. Please understand that right now we have two elements. So that's probably going to be no case in your scenario whenever you're working with anything that has to do with HTML and CSS. So again, this is going to be very nifty later on for you whenever you can just find whatever element you would like. And notice it pretty much shows me that there's going to be heading one or heading two, and I can just click on it. And again, this is going to show me on the right hand side what I have here. And notice something interesting. And I can, you know what, I can actually maybe make this a little bit bigger. I have the heading two, but in this case, not only I have the default styles that I'm getting again from the browser, I also have our own styles. And here we see obviously the style CSS. Now, what is style CSS? Well, the last time I checked, it was actually our style sheet, our CSS style sheet. So this tells me where I'm getting these styles from. Now, what's also really, really nifty is the fact that we can test it in a browser. Now, be aware, though, whatever we're going to write here is not going to stay in our actual CSS, meaning the moment we're going to refresh the page, all the changes are going to go away. But what we can do in the dev tools is we can test something out. So let's say I don't like the red color. I thought I did, but in fact, I don't. Well, what we can do? Well, I can head over here. I can click on it. And you know what? Not red. Let's just write blue. And sure enough, this is blue. Now, again, the moment I'm going to refresh the page, it's going to go back to the red because this is what we're getting from the style sheet. But we can change this in the browser and that way we can test it out. Now, again, for this kind of scenario, two elements, quite realistically, you're probably not going to be checking anything here. You're going to write everything in the CSS. As your project grows bigger, though, there's going to be cases where you just want to hop over to dev tools, quickly check something, whether that makes sense. Or maybe you're going to be debugging something. You're going to be checking for these default browser styles because what's going to happen is there's going to be cases, especially with layout. Trust me, with layout, you're going to have a pain where you're going to be looking for something. You're going to be like, hey, listen, I added some margins and paddings. And again, these are things we haven't covered yet and we will. But I added this padding, I added margin. What is happening? Why this is not working? And this is where it's really helpful. Again, at the moment, scary. Gotcha. I understand. No problem. But I would strongly encourage you to at least try to start using it. In a sense, just don't dismiss it. 
don't say, OK, it looks scary right now, so I'm not going to touch it. I don't ever want to know about them because they will going to come really handy. And as far as the default browser styles come and go, then there's going to be styles that we will going to overwrite, like I said, and there's going to be styles that we're just going to use it and we're going to be fine with it. And that's the basic scenario. All right, why we're still on a subject of the units in the CSS. Why don't we take a look at the calc function, which is really going to help us out in a lot of cases. Now, what's happening in the index HTML? We're going to set up two elements. One of them is going to be nav bar. So I'm going to say div and then we're looking for the class. And let's give it a class of nav bar and let's just write this is nav bar. Now, this obviously is not going to be a real nav bar. We're just going to set it up as a element with the class of nav bar. So far, so good. What else we have? Well, let's say there's going to be another div with a class of banner. And then you know what? We're not going to type any kind of uh, text in here because we're going to be adding the background color anyway. OK, what do we have in the CSS? Well, first of all, I'm going to head over back and I'm going to reset the browser styles, the default ones, because I would like to show you something with view heights. And I think this is just going to make a little bit of sense if I'm going to say margin is going to be zero. So now we're resetting the default styles. OK, what's next? Well, let's say for the nav bar, since this is going to be the class, we know how to select it. Then we can maybe add some, I don't know, background first, maybe background is going to be blue and then height would be something like 100 pixels. So let's say 100 pixels. And then we also would like to have a little bit of color. Color could be white and maybe, I don't know, font size. Uh, three REMs. So this is going to be our nav bar. So far, so good. What is happening next? Well, let's say that for the nav bar, I would like to, or I'm sorry, for the banner nav bar, we already styled it. But for the banner, I would like to add, first of all, the background. So let's write background is going to be red. And then we would need to have some kind of height. Well, we already know we can use min height for this if the content doesn't support whatever we're having right now then at least the minimal height is going to be whatever we're typing here. So the difference would be between the height. You're just setting the height with the min height. If the content is going to be enough in the actual element, then it's obviously going to be bigger. Meaning if we're going to be placing a bunch of text here within the banner, if it gets bigger than 100 view heights, then obviously this is going to be bigger. However, if the content doesn't provide that much height, which is this case, of course, because we haven't provided any kind of content, then we're just setting here what would be the value. So I'm going to say here 100 view heights. Now what's happening? Well, I can see that there's going to be an app bar, but then I need to scroll down for my 100 view heights. And that is an issue because let's imagine the situation where I would want my nav bar as well as my banner shared 100% here of the screen. Because right now I'm having 100% plus these 100 pixels, correct? Well, this is where the calc function comes to rescue. And what's really neat about calc function, we can perform math operations. So addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, as well as we can mix and match values. So how this is going to look like. So instead of using the min height for 100 view heights, what I can write over here, I can say calc. So this is going to be the function. And then we're just going to perform the math operation. And in this case, well, first of all, I misspelled it. But we can write whatever values you would like to be calculated so we can mix and match them. I can say, yeah, my min height should be 100 view heights. However, I would like to subtract the 100 pixels. So what I'm saying here is, yeah, make this 100 percent, but get rid of whatever nav bar value was over here. So the moment we're going to save it, now we have exactly 100 percent. And this is for most cases what we're going to do in a project. Where we're going to be setting up the banner, and then we're going to make sure that the actual welcome page is exactly 100 percent or 100 view heights. And for that, we're going to use the division to get rid of these whatever value would be for nav bar. However, be careful though, if you're just going to omit something, if you're going to say something like this, then the calc is not going to work. So, what's happening right away, it spits you back the error, or we can do something like this, and again, this is not going to work. So you need to make sure that whenever you are doing the actual calculation, that there's space in between. So the CSS can see what is the operator. So that would be the short hat to a CSS calc function. Hey, guys, congrats on making this far. We already know about colors and units in CSS. 
So in this module, we'll focus on typography and CSS. Basically, text on our page. Everything starting from properties that are used for typography. What is font stack and generic fonts? And at the end, we'll look how we can add awesome Google fonts to our project. So what do you say? Let's get after it. We will start very basic by looking at a font family property. And ultimately, font family property describes the font of an element. And as a side note, we did already cover font size property, which would be responsible for the size of the text. Now, as you can see right now, I already deleted everything that we had in the previous module because I wanted to start fresh in the index HTML as well as style CSS. So if you need to do the same, please pause the video and resume whenever you are ready to go. Let's start simply in the index HTML by creating the heading one. And in the heading one, let's say, hey, dude, I am heading or main heading. Let's call this main heading as well as we can also create paragraph. And for the paragraph, let's, I don't know, add some 50 words in here or something like this. Let's have 50 words and we're going to save our HTML. So far, so good. We have the heading and we have the paragraph. If I'm going to head over to style CSS, I can just select the whole body. And since we already have covered the inheritance, we know that if we're not going to change anything with any of the elements, they will get inherit this from the parent, which would be the body. So in our case, we're going to do like this. We're going to say fun family. And I don't know, let's go with Helverica, something like this. Let's save it. And first of all, we right away notice that our font family changed. Okay, awesome. Now I'm going to head over to heading one and more specifically change my font family. So what happens is that we can change the family of the fonts for whatever element we would like. And in most cases, this is exactly what you're going to do. You're going to set up some kind of fonts for probably most of your project. And then there's going to be specific elements like headings or paragraphs. It doesn't really matter in your situation. It really depends on that. But you're going to change the font family for specific type of element. In my case, I'm just going to change for my heading one, which maybe for project could be all heading ones. So here, let's say again, font family. And let's write, I don't know, Verdana, something like this. Let's say Verdana. And now I can see that even though the paragraph inherits this from the body, the Helvetica, then the heading one is going to be more specifically with the Verdana font family. And this is as straightforward as it gets, where you can just pick whatever font family you would like and just add it with font family property to that specific element. All is well and dandy. But what if browser that the user is using does not support the fonts we have picked? Well, I guess we're in deep trouble. Not so fast. You see, for font family property, we can add several font families as a fallback system. So if the browser does not support the first one, it can try getting the next one and so on and so forth. We call that a font stack. And what's also interesting at the end of the font stack, we can pass a generic font family that allows browser to pick similar fonts from generic family. So let's see that in action. As you can see right now, we have the Helvetica and we have the Verdana. But whenever we were writing them, you probably noticed how right away the Visual Studio Code gave us multiple options. Now again, let's test it out first because it's going to be easier for me to show you. So let's say first we're going to get rid of the heading one. So I'm going to comment this out and let me just delete this Helvetica. Now, the moment I type font family, what's going to happen? Well, actually, this should give me suggestions and it doesn't. So what I would need to do is press control and space bar. Now, again, that's going to be with element. Now, what do you see over here? Well, there's going to be a bunch of fonts and the way they are written is not just one family. It's in fact like this. So you're going to have one font family. Then you're going to have another one and then you'll have the third one. Now, third one is the generic one. And this whole thing is called font stack. So we're going to try with our favorite one. If the browser doesn't have it, OK, pick this guy. Then if this one is not available, grab this generic font family and pick some kind of fonts that would at least match better than just passing some kind of default ones. And that's the whole idea over here. Now, the generic ones are serifs and serif, cursive, fantasy, and monospace. 
And sure enough, now I can see that everything is pretty much in this font family as well as you know what? Let's do the same thing with heading one. Now, let me again uncomment this. So we're gonna have heading one, and the same thing is gonna work. Let's say with Verdana, what we're getting is Verdana, Geneva, the home, and then we're looking for this generic one that will gonna try to supply at least some type of font from this generic family that would match this guy that we picked already in the beginning. Again, it's obviously not gonna be exactly the same, but at least it's not gonna be default browser font family. Thanks to Google Fonts, we're not limited just picking our fonts over here. In fact, we can get them from that awesome resource and we can include them in our project. So how does that would work? Now, before I actually cover that, let me just quickly show you that if we're looking for generic font families, we can check them out in the Visual Studio code. So again, we can create maybe a new line of code. Let's write font family and notice here in the bottom. All the single ones are going to be cursive fantasy. Now, don't look at the inherit initial and onset. We don't care about those, but you'll see again all the fives that I just mentioned, which would be the generic ones. Again, that's basically a side note. Now, let me delete this font family. And you know what? I will going to get rid of this for now because I would like to show you how we can use the awesome Google fonts. So, so far, we'd have no font family property as well as obviously no value. So I'm going to head over to the browser. I'm going to maybe open up the new tab. Then we're going to write Google fonts. That's all we have to do. And then we're looking for Google fonts. This is going to bring us to the URL. We're going to bravely click on a link and voila, we have our fonts. And again, there's many, many fonts we can pick over here. Uh, there's many options how we can pick. Let's say we can pick on the styles, the thickness and the slant. So let's say Let's try to get a really slanted and thick one. So I'm going to click on the slant and I'm going to increase the slant. So now we see that the slant is increasing. Also, maybe let's include a little bit thicker. And what happens is now it tells me, listen, buddy, you pick thickness and slant. And realistically, you can have one of these two. And that's fine. So in order to pick a font, we can just click over here on this plus sign. And then in the bottom, we're getting the font. Now, with the, for the font, we have two options how we can include it. We can import it or we can use the link. Now, we're obviously going to look at both of them just so we have covered that, but just to give you a general idea. Then also, we have an option of customizing it. So we can add custom options. Well, in this case, there's not many of them. There's just one regular 400. So why don't we pick a popular font where we can maybe see more customizable options? And also, by the way, it tells you the load time which in our case is going to be fast. So far, so good. Again, we're going back to embed. We can just minimize this and now we can search for them. And by the way, you can see that there's going to be some articles if you're looking for something as well as we have an option for, let's say, trending. Now I'm going to get rid of this thickness and the slant. So this is basically going to stay simple. And then probably the most used one that you're going to see is going to be Roboto. This is very popular. But let's say you can see check here for trending, popular, date, added, or alphabetical. Let's look for the popular one. And sure enough, we have the Roboto, like I said. Then we have Open Sans. Then this guy also. Again, there's quite a few that are very popular. But Roboto, you'll probably see a lot. And again, we know already how to pick it. We can just click on it. Now we have two font families selected. And let's head over again to the customize. Because like I said, this is going to be our option. And then with Roboto, notice that we have more options. So let's say if we would want bold 700 italic, but it right away tells you that now the load time is going to suffer. So keep in mind that I know that everyone likes to be artistic, especially in the beginning, as you start working with CSS, basically learning CSS, but also understand that this will going to affect your user experience. So probably don't try to take it too seriously and go too crazy. Now, in my case, I don't really care. Of course, we can just add it just to see how it looks. But in general, just keep that in mind. Now, again, we're going to head over to embedding. And like I already previously mentioned, we have two options. Again, we can use the link that would be included in our CSS, meaning when I say CSS, basically in our HTML, or we can do the actual embedding. I'm sorry, importing. Okay, we have the link. Let's say this, let's say link. 
and the way we would need to include it, we're gonna head over back to index HTML. And let's say right before our style CSS, we're gonna maybe make a comment first. Let's say Google fonts, Google fonts, and let's copy and paste this line. And again, please don't delete something here. Just copy and paste the way this comes from the Google. And then we're gonna head over here and notice that they tell us, well, if you want the font family, the one that's gonna be thickness and slant, then you would need to write this type of code. And then just a normal one, Roboto, would be something like this. So again, let me select maybe the first one here. And we're going to head over to style CSS. Maybe if, before we do that, let's save the index HTML. And then within the style CSS, I would want this for my heading one. So I'm going to add this font family for my heading one. And then for main one, for the body, I'm just going to use the normal Roboto. And I'm going to copy and paste it. And we're going to save it. Now, my heading right now has obviously this one family and then the rest of my body, which obviously in my case is only a paragraph, has this type of font family, which is Roboto. OK, one last thing. Let's check it out how we can import this. Now, for importing, we just need to click it over here. And you know what? Let's change it around. Let's head over back to our document and just comment this out. So that way we know for sure that our import is actually going to work. So I'm going to do it like this. I'm going to comment this out. We're going to save it and notice right now. So I'm not definitely having the same fonts, right? So again, let me comment this and you'll notice that fonts are going to look like this. But then once I'm going to comment this out, the fonts are going to change. So now I know that my fonts are not included. OK, let's test it out. Let's say that again, we would need to copy and paste this line of code. Let's copy and paste it. Let's head over to the styles and right on the top here, maybe even above the comments, although it's obviously not necessary, but let me just put it all the way in the top. And now again, my fonts are working because I'm grabbing the exact fonts that we're using. And this is how you can get up and running with Google fonts in your project. Next, maybe let's cover properties that we're going to use our text. But since I don't want to crab them in one video, I'm going to spread them out either two properties at one video or maybe three. Let's see. And we're going to start with font weight and file style. Now, as a side note, though, I just want to show you that wherever generic family kicks in. Now, if we're going to head over to our import and if we're just going to comment this out, notice that we're still going to get these generic font families. So some kind of fonts from these generic font families. If we have cursive, this is the reason why this is going to look like this. And then for Roboto, we're getting sensor. So here you can see actually the generic families in the work where we have commented this out. So obviously the browser cannot find this Roboto, but then it finds something that is at least close to that from the sans serif generic font family. So in a nutshell, that is how the generic font family would work. Now, again, maybe let's comment this out or let me just make this visible. Let me save it. And now I have both of the found families and I'm going to head over back to heading one. And I'm just going to say, first of all, that I would want to have some class. So I'm going to say main. And you know what? I would like to add some more things here and maybe change around the paragraph. So first I'm going to say for the paragraph, I'm going to say some lorem of 25. I'm going to have a little bit less text. However, I would want to have another heading one. So this is going to be a, let's say, subheading. And I'm not going to add right now, maybe, or you know what? I should probably. So let's write class of subheading as well, just so we can test different things. And we're going to do another one under a paragraph with lorem of, I guess, 25. Now I'm going to save it. So I have two subheadings, obviously, because they're heading ones. And then both of them have this kind of font. Now, if we're going to go over to style CSS, I would like to change this. And I'm going to say that this font family is only going to be for the main one. The moment I save it, obviously, this font family is applied for the first one because the other one has the class of subheading. Now, where the font weight comes in and what does it do? Well, it just makes our fonts bolder. How, do, how would that work? Let's say for the body, we're going to go with font family. And then we're looking for these guys. So we have, I'm sorry, not found family. We're looking for found weight. And then we have a bunch of numbers here. 
also options of bold, bolder and lighter. Now, I can probably already tell you what they're gonna do. Bold is gonna make it bold, bolder is gonna make it bolder, and lighter is gonna make it lighter. Uh, these numbers here, keep in mind that if you haven't imported it, just because you're gonna set something to 900, it's gonna default back to that 700 anyway. So be careful about that. Don't think that just in case you're gonna add 900, then this is gonna be definitely bolder. Now, in order to show you that, why don't we go over to the paragraphs and add also some classes because that way we can be a little bit more specific. So this is going to be paragraph number one, as well as we're going to do class of paragraph number two. Again, not very uh, general names, meaning not very original names, but we are just going to add a little bit of font weight. So let's say for the paragraph number one, we would want, I don't know, font uh, font weight. Uh, is going to be like I said, let's try with 700 here. So that's going to be the first one. And notice it is right now bolder. And let's try with number two to go for 900 just to kind of prove my point. Now, again, let me look for the proper family or I'm sorry for the proper property. For some reason, font family is stuck in my head and I cannot get it out. So once we have found way to 900, what do you think is going to happen? Do you think this is really bolder than that? I don't think so. I think they're both exactly the same. And obviously, the reason for that is the max we have is 700. So far, so good. Again, we can do the same thing here. We can say bold. And let's say for this guy, we're going to have bolder. Again, let's try it out. And pretty much they both look the same. Okay, we have the font weight covered. Now, also, maybe look for lighter. So we're going to go with lighter. Now, obviously, this is going to fall back to 400. Then uh, we would also want to look at font style. Now, for the font style, let's go with font style. And here we have a few options. We have, again, the initial inherit. And then we're looking for italic, normal, and oblique. Now we have the italic one. So this is going to look like this. Let's copy and paste the style. And let's say for this guy, for number two, we're going to add oblique. So let me copy and paste. And let's change it around. Let's say oblique over here. And again, as you can see, very, very similar things. And maybe the last thing what we would want is check it out. What, what else we have here? So for this, I'm going to do the subheading. So I have a class of subheading. And here I'm going to be looking again for the font style. And for the font style, what do we have? Well, I believe we had the italic. Then we had the oblique. And you know what? Let me get my suggestions. And again, the suggestions was the control and space. And here I have the normal one. Now, your question probably, well, where are we going to try the normal ones? Now, there's going to be cases where you set something for, let's say, three paragraphs, but one of them you would want the default setting. So in general, you're not going to use this normal setting because this already comes by default. That's the reason why nothing changed here. But let's say for all the headings, you have set some kind of style. Now, what is going to happen? Well, let's change this around. Let's say that I'm going to get rid of the font style here as well as here. So let me get rid of this guy. Number two, uh, we're going to do like this. Let me save it. So that's going to work now. So you know what? Yeah, let me get rid of the italic ones. But somewhere in the body, let's write like this. Let's say font, font here, font. And we're going to write style. So for home, my body, I would want to, let's say, have italic. Now, the moment I'm going to save it, notice something interesting. So everything here turns italic because obviously this is the inheritance in the works. We have the parent and we're just passing down his property. However, let's say for this guy, we would want only normal ones. And that's the reason why we would add normal. And that is something that you're going to see a lot where meaning you're not going to use it maybe a lot, but you'll see it a lot where if you're going to have those default properties, like let's say there's going to be text uh, uh, left, so text should be left. This is going to be applied only if you're applying to multiple items, let's say some kind of font style that would be italic, but then you're going to use the default one on some of the elements that you don't want to follow the same pattern. Since I mentioned it in the previous video, why don't we check it out also right away, text align property as well as text indent. 
However, with your permission, I would like to get rid of these font styles because this is annoying me a little bit when I have all these selections. I'm still gonna keep here the selectors and curly braces, but I'm just gonna get rid of the properties as well as the values. So I'm just gonna delete them, and now I'm just gonna have normal text. Now for text align, what's gonna happen? Well, we're gonna be able to control the alignment of the text. Now we can start very simply by the whole body, and just say for the whole body, we would like to text align it in the center, or we can do left or right. So let's do the center one first, which is always going to place it text in the center. Now I can maybe make my browser window a little bit bigger, but you can see right now that text has been placed in the center. Now, similarly, if I'm going to go text align right, this is going to place it all the way to the right. Now, here I would like to again show you where we would use the normal one, which would be the left one, meaning the default one. Because right now, notice we have the text align on the left. Or if I'm going to comment this out, nothing is going to change because this comes preset with a browser. Now again, we can just delete this, maybe this guy here. And let's just add again the same thing that for the whole text for whole body, I'm going to align it to the right. All my headings. So let's say my main one or, you know, what, not all of them, maybe the main one. I'm going to align it in the center. I'm going to say text align center. So this heading, the first one, main one is going to be the center. And let's say for both of the paragraphs or, you know what? No, I'm just lazy. Let's just write for the second paragraph. We're going to place it all the way to the left. So we're going to write text align. And this is going to be on the right hand side. Or, you know what? Not right hand side. That's obviously coming from the body here. We're going to use the default one, which would be the left. Now, again, this would be the case where you would use it. So if you're applying some kind of property, either right or center in this case, then if you would want to go for your default one, you would use text align left. Now, if you're not doing that, there's no need for using the text align left because this is already preset for you. Then we have text indent and maybe let's practice on this paragraph. And that would basically indent the first line. It accepts multiple values. We are just going to use pixels, but we can also look at REMs. Let's say uh, text indent was the property name indent and the values like i said we can use whatever we would like uh we're gonna go first by let's say 50 pixels i'm gonna say like this so now this is gonna indent this first line uh, but maybe it is annoying the fact that everything is aligned right anyway so let me comment this out i'm gonna save it now this is gonna be normal and then sure enough we have text indent of 50 pixels if you don't believe me let's make 100 pixels and now this is indenting again our first line now, like I said, we can use also REM values. So I don't know, 10 REMs that should do the trick. Now then 10 REMs. And that's how we can work with text align properties and text indent. You know what? I changed my mind just because I would like to be done covering the text properties. We're going to cover five properties in this video, and then we can move on to the next module. However, I will going to do a little bit of spring cleaning. So first I'm going to get rid of the Google fonts. Uh, then as well, we're going to get rid of rest of the styles. So we're going to delete them. And within the index HTML, let's do a little bit of different setup where we, again, I just want to delete everything and we're going to start from scratch. So first I would like to create a link and then we can create this as a dummy link. So if this link is not going to going anywhere, we can just add a hashtag and we're good to go. And let's write over here. Let's say Google. So that's going to be our link, which is not going to go anywhere. And then we're going to have one heading one and we're going to say, hey, I am I am the uh, main heading. Something like this main heading. Let's say this Let's see what we'll have. This is going to be our main heading. And then we can have two paragraphs with, let's say, each of them class of one, two, three. So first, let's create a paragraph. This paragraph is going to be lorem. I don't know, like 25. I actually want multiple lines. So that's kind of my important thing. I think three lines is more enough. So I'm just going to say here, class, class is going to be number one. And now I would like to copy and paste this. So I'm going to select all of this and one, two. So there's going to be paragraph with the class of number two. You know what? I can just use the multiple selectors, delete it here, then head over back to my class number two, add that class actually. Here, let's say that class is going to be number two. 
and then for the third guy, this is gonna be the class of number three again, not very original, but this is gonna do a job now within the style c s s we're gonna start by simply looking at the line height now the line height is gonna control how the lines have the space in between them. So let's test it out on the paragraph number one. And here let's write line height property, since that is obviously the name that we're looking for. And for the line height, this is going to be relative. Again, at the moment, we haven't set it up anything to the parent, which would be the body. But in general, this is going to be relative to something. So at the moment, this is going to be relative to the browser. So I'm going to say 1.5 EMs. Notice right now my line heights are getting bigger. Don't believe me. Let's try 2.5 and you'll see that right now I have way bigger line heights. But again, if we're going to change this somewhere in the body or the parent element, let's say there's going to be a div, then this is going to depend again of how we're controlling for the parent. At the moment, this is working with the browser. And let's say if I'm going to say 0 0.5, then my lines are going to be very small. And that's how the line height would work. Next up, we have the letter spacing. So let's write for the paragraph number two. We're going to be looking for the letter spacing that will be the name. And again, let's go with pixels in this case, but you can use different values. And for letter spacing, we're going to add a five pixels. And what do you think is going to happen? I think the name is quite self explanatory. The moment we're going to save it, I'm going to be getting these five pixels in between each and every letter on the actual element that I have selected. So far, so good. We also have the word spacing. So let's say for the guy number three, we're going to have the word spacing property. So let's say where's word spacing again. Let's do the same thing. 20 pixels should be more than enough. Now, in between each and every word, we are getting our 20 pixels again, extremely self explanatory. The two properties with letter spacing and word spacing, as well as line height is also very self explanatory. Then we have text transform. So why don't we practice on our heading here? I'm going to say, first of all, heading one, and then we're going to be looking for text transform. And in the text transform, we're going to have capitalized. We're going to have lowercase and we're going to be looking for uppercase. So these are the ones that we will going to use most of the time. So let's say start with an uppercase. The whole text is going to be uppercase. And sure enough, right now, my heading is uppercase. I can also do, let's say, capitalize. Then the letter of each word is going to first letter is going to be capitalized just like this. And then if you want to test that out, the lowercase, obviously, again, we're going to have to go to the body and let's say for all of them, for all the elements I have text transform is going to be the uppercase. And here for the heading, I'm going to change my mind and I'm going to say I would like to go with the default one, which is lowercase. But if you're not going to add anything to the parent element, which in our case would be the body then obviously nothing is going to happen if you're going to add lowercase because this comes by default as well as we have text decoration. Now, the easiest way to show you the text decoration, especially the default one for the links is by looking at the link. OK, maybe let's make it a little bit bigger just so I can get my point across. So in order to select the link, I can use the easiest selector that is out there, which is an element selector because you guessed it right link as what? Well, the element is a, so I'm just selecting the link and let's add the property. We already know the font size, let's say 40 pixels. Now I have a massive, massive link. Now, one of the things that is kind of annoying about the link is the fact that it has this underline by default. So what you're going to do a lot whenever you're going to be working with CSS, you're going to be looking for text decoration. And in this case, we're not going to be looking for colors. I'm going to say that we would want text decoration none. So you are going to get rid of this underline unless you really dig the underline. And let's look at different properties that we have for the underline. And let's say not for the whole body, but for the heading one. Let's again go for text decoration. And for the text decoration, let's do line through. So now we're going to have line heading through our heading one. Also, we have the on overline option. Why don't we test it out on this guy? on paragraph number two, where we have the line, uh, I'm sorry, not line text, text decoration uh, would be in our case overline. So this would go not underline and not old lace. Uh, we're going to have overline. 
And sure enough, what happens is you see that we have overlines. Now, again, it's kind of doesn't make sense. We have multiple lines, right? So you might be thinking, well, it's kind of like an underline. Yeah, it is underline because if you're looking from this perspective and just to kind of give you an idea, we know we can use line height. So why don't we get really creative and add this line height? And now for sure, you must agree with me that this is going to be overline. And last but not least, we have the underline, which again, we can use it. So let's say for this guy, we will gonna change it to underline. So let's write text uh, decoration. Yeah, not text decoration. Yeah, text decoration. Uh, it was the underline. And sure enough, we have it as an underline. So this is how we can use all these five properties, line height, letter spacing, word spacing, text transform, as well as text decoration. Right after topography, we have an extremely important subject called CSS box model. First, we'll understand how CSS box model works, and then we'll implement it by using padding, border, and margin properties. Awesome. Let's get to know CSS box model. All right, people. Next topic is extremely important because you will practice it daily. The name of the topic will be CSS box model. And since it is so important, we will get some visual help. And by the way, if you are falling asleep, get up. You don't want to miss it. So CSS box model. Now, like I said, we're going to be getting some visual help. So we will going to head over to browser and within the browser, we're just going to type CSS box model. And then instead of looking for the text, we're going to be looking for the images. I'm going to pick this image. You can pick any image that you like, because pretty much they were going to explain the same things that I'm going to be talking about. Now I'm going to click on the image and now let's get over what's happening here. You see, every time you're going to be working with CSS, each and every element is going to be displayed as a box. Now, within that box, you're going to be dealing with three properties. Padding, that's going to be distance between the content you have in your element and the edge over here. Then we're going to have the border that's going to go around the element. And then we're looking for the margin. That's going to be the distance between, let's say, either the edges of the screen or some other element. Now, as always, the best way is to practice with these properties. We're going to head over back to our document, but I will going to be switching back and forth because I think at some point, maybe we will going to need some help here again with an image and actually looking at this visually might help us a little bit. Now, back to the document. I know it might be annoying to some of you, but I will going to delete this. So I'm going to say blah, blah, blah. I would like to select everything here. We will going to delete this. So once we delete it, we're going to head over to index HTML. And also we're going to do a little bit of spring cleaning S since it takes like 30 seconds. I don't think you should be that annoyed by that. Now within the body, what we're going to have, I don't know. We can start by hitting one and you know what? Maybe let's make this a little bit smaller because I think it's going to be easier for us. And here, let's write some hello. Uh, I would like to learn about CSS box model. And uh, let's add maybe some exclamation marks. Now that is going to be my heading one. Okay, so far, so good. What about the paragraph? I don't know. Let's add lorem 20. So there's going to be a paragraph with some text of 20 words. So far, so good. We're going to head over back to the styles. We still have our comment. And now let's start working with the famous CSS box model. First, let's start with heading one. And we're going to add simply a color. Or you know what? Let's add background color. I think that's just going to make a little bit more sense. And for the background, we're going to do a very pretty one, which is going to be red. Okay, so far, so good. Then we also have the paragraph. And the paragraph is going to be background. And let's say blue. So we have two elements. Now, like I said, we're going to have to start working with our box model. Within the box model, what do we have? I believe we had the padding. That was one of the properties that was available to us. So if I'm going to head over back and if I'm going to say for the heading one, I'm going to be looking for the padding and then notice I have a bunch of options here. Well, let's start with the most basic one. I'm going to have padding top. Now, what is going to be in the padding top? Well, we can use 
any kind of values. We already covered CSS units, so we should be very comfortable with it. Let's say, I don't know, 30 pixels. So what do you think is going to happen right now? As I'm looking at my text and the edge of my element, right now I'm getting this padding in between. Does that reflect what we see in a picture? So we have the padding that's going to be around the content within the element. In this case, we just add it to the top. Okay, let's test it out. Let's say padding is going to be also on the bottom. Let's add padding bottom. And let's also do 30 pixels. And we have right now the padding in between where the text ends. And again, the edge of our element. Now, maybe let's increase it. Let's get really creative. And let's say this is going to be 60. So now I'm getting my padding with 60. I also can do padding left. So let's write padding left. And in this case, you know what? Let's do, I don't know, 25 pixels. Again, it doesn't really matter. Now my text is being pushed here. From the left hand side, I'm getting my padding as well as we obviously have padding right. Since we are covering pretty much top, bottom, left, we can also do right now within the right. Uh, I don't know, we can do 50 pixels. So now I'm pushing my padding here from the right hand side. So this is how we can write with the padding the long way. However, in the CSS, we're going to have a bunch of shortcuts. And now we can look at it, how we can create these shortcuts with the padding. So for this case, we're going to use the paragraph. So instead of writing each and every time padding top, padding bottom, padding left, padding right, we can write padding. And then we need to start working with the values. Now, right away, I can tell you that this is going to work exactly the same with the margin that we're going to look at in the next video. And there's also going to be shortcut for the border. So just as a side note, now for the padding, first, I have an option of using the same padding all around. Now, why do I use the same word? Well, because if I'm going to write 50 pixels, notice what's going to happen with my padding. So I'm going to be getting the exact same padding all around. So if you know that you want exactly the same padding, just bounce the number and then you're going to be getting the value. So everything is going to be working fine. Now, since I want to test out a few more options for my shortcuts, I would like to, first of all, comment this out just so you can see that this is still valuable, but I would like to see you show you other options. Now, the other option is using two values, the top, bottom and left and right. So how is that going to work? I'm going to say padding. Then the first value is going to be top, bottom. And you know what? Let me just first save it. Notice right now it's basically complaining. It's saying, well, you have the syntax error. You haven't added any value, but the padding basically goes back to zero ultimately. And in my case, I'm going to say the first value, the top bottom is going to be 30 pixels and left and right. We're going to have 60 pixels. Now what happens right now? So I have the padding on the top 30 pixels. Bottom is also going to be 30 pixels and left and right is going to be 60 pixels. So quite predictable. Okay, so far, so good. Again, let's do the same thing. Let's comment this out. We know that this is going to be valuable option, but we also have an option of checking each and every value. Now, how is that going to work? Well, we're going to write padding. And now I can start looking by the first value is going to be the top. The next value is going to be right hand side. The third value is going to be the bottom. And then the fourth value would be the left hand side right over here. Let's test it out. Let's say 20 pixels on the top. Then let's say 40 pixels on the right hand side, 60 pixels on the bottom. And then let's do, I don't know, 80 pixels or you know what? 10 pixels on the left hand side. Now, what do we have here? I have 20 pixels predictably on the top. Then I have 40 here, then 60 over here. And the 10 is going to be all the way on the left hand side. Please keep in mind. All of them are valid. However, you would need to pick whatever value you would like to use for the property, whether you're going to write that there's going to be padding all around, whether there's going to be padding left and right and top and bottom, or you're going to be single handedly working with each and every dimension, top, right, left and the bottom. And again, just to cover the basics, the padding is going to be difference in between or spacing in between the content that you have an element and the edge of an element. And we can have four options. That would be top, right, bottom, and the left. Next one up, we will going to have the margin. And again, we will just going to check it out first in the image. 
and we see that padding was the distance in between the edge of the element and the content. And then the margin would be the distance in between, let's say, the screen or other elements. And we can just test that out first. Now, you know what? I can just get rid of all these values and I was going to keep it simply by padding and let's say 20 pixels. So there's going to be 20 pixels all around. And also, let's do the same thing over here. I will going to comment this out just so we know that this obviously works. But I'm going to uncomment right now the first padding. And let's do exactly the same thing where it was 20 pixels. Awesome. Everything is working really nice with the padding. And what about the margin? Well, we have the same options. We can write margin. And then we're again, we're looking for margin bottom, margin left, margin top. Maybe not. Let's test it out all of the options. Let's just say first with margin, right? What do you think is going to happen right now? So I have some kind of margin. And this is some case already where even though we didn't add any margins, the default browser styles are adding these margins. And this is the reason why you see these distances in between. And this is going to be a lot of times, especially in the beginning, once you start out, the annoying factor where you're like, oh, wait a minute, I'm doing all this with a layout and why this is not working, why I'm keep getting this margin. Well, that's the case because it starts off by default. So you need to be very careful with that. But with margin, right, what I would like to write, and let's try 50 pixels. What do I have right now? So I have more than my margin on the right is going to be 50 pixels. And again, I can go all around like we did with the padding, but I think it would be a waste of our time since we know that they would work exactly the same like we had with the padding. What I do want to show you is that how we can get rid of this default one. Now, I already set the preset previously in my videos where I just select all the elements and we added the properties. Now, I'm not going to do this in this video because eventually we're going to come back to it anyway. But I do want to show you that if I'm going to head over to margin, and in this case, I would like to have margin bottom. Now, the reason why I would want to set margin bottom is because I would want to show you how we can stack one on top of each other. Because at the moment, you notice they do have the margin in between, but we didn't work on that margin. It's obviously nowhere in our CSS. So how do we do that? I'm going to say margin bottom. And instead of the value of 20 pixels, 50 pixels, 120 pixels, I'm going to go with simple zero. What happens? Well, I'm getting my margin smaller. I do still have the margin because the key here is paragraph still has the margin on top. Okay, let's get rid of it. Let's say margin, then we're looking for margin top and margin top. Surprise, surprise, we're going to go with zero. Now, what do you see right now? Did we eventually get rid of the default margin that we're getting? I think we did. So again, the short way you would do it something like this, you would say the asterisk, and then you would say margin zero. Again, we'll, we will going to be adding more properties later on, but you would do something like this, where you would just say, whatever I'm getting, I want to get rid of all the default margins and just let me work from the scratch. So this is, again, something you would normally do, and this is something we will, in fact, do throughout the project. So let me again... You know what? Let me uncomment this or comment this out just so you know that this is an option, but let's keep working with these values. So now I have margin bottom zero as well as this guy. Now, you know what? We can also maybe get rid of this and let's look at again whether we have the same options for shortcuts because we know already margin top, margin left, and all those properties are going to be available to us. How often will you use it? I have no idea. In most cases, I think you're going to go with either this one where there's going to be margin all around or the top bottom and left and right. So why don't we practice on these ones? So let's say for here, I'm going to say margin all around is going to be, I don't know, uh, 30 pixels. So something like this. So that would be my margin. And I'm also going to be working with the paragraph. So for the paragraph, let's try margin top bottom is going to be 50 pixels and I don't know, 20 pixels left and right. That would look something like this. And once we have margin top bottom, why don't we also try all four options where we have margin all around. And for this, we're going to say margin. Again, let's look for some kind of values 100 pixels just so we can see. Uh, I don't know, 20 pixels again, left and right. I mean, 
sorry, right, not left and right. Uh, the bottom, obviously, we're not going to be able to see. There's nothing here right now. But let's just add again something like 20 pixels. And last but not least, we're going to be looking at a right one where we can get again something like 50 pixels. Let's save this. And what do I have? I have 100, so I have 20, and I have all around. So this is how the margin would work in the CSS box model. Last but not least, we have the border. And again, if we're checking our image, we notice that the border is going to be around our edge. So we're going to be able to control how the border of our element looks like. We're going to head over back to our CSS and let's start with heading one. Now for the heading one, again, we just need to type the border and then we're going to have multiple options to choose from. What we are looking for first is going to be border style. So what kind of style of the border is going to be? I'm not going to cover all these options. It doesn't make sense. In most cases, you're going to go probably with something like solid. But we are going to look at, I believe, dashed or dotted just to give you kind of a taste of a different border. So first, we're going to go with the style. So what kind of style of the border this is going to be? Then the moment we're going to save it, notice that I'm getting right now my solid border all around my element. Awesome. Everything is working fine. And then we're going to be looking for the border. And the property here is going to be width. So what would be the width of that border? Again, we can use our yams, we can use the pixels, and I'm just going to go with pixels. And let's say, I don't know, 10 pixels should cover. I have a black, beautiful border around my heading one. And probably last one, what I would like to show you is the fact of not only style, not only width, but we can change the color. So I'm going to say border color and then what we're looking for again we can use rgb we can use rgba we can use uh hex colors we can use the net color names whatever whatever you would like whatever your heart desires in my case i'm gonna go with i don't know something like pink just so we can see better what's happening and i don't think that is the best case because it's kind of bright so let me do the yellow one which obviously also doesn't really work I mean, something, okay, the green one is going to work fine enough. Where we're just going to have this all around. Awesome. What do we have next? Well, next, we would like to cover what happens if I don't want to type this just like this, where each and every time I have the property, then I like to look for a value. So if we know already with padding and margin, we have the shortcuts. What do you think that I'm trying to show you right now? I think you would probably guessing that there's some kind of a shorter version how we can write this and sure enough there is the way we're going to write this we're going to say border and then the actual syntax here matters so the order will going to matter so first we're going to be looking for the width of the border so let's say in my case we're going to go with i don't know 10 pixels but you know what let's change it otherwise you're going to think that all the borders have to be 10 pixels so first is going to be the width then we're going to be looking for what kind of border this is going to be so in our case, this is going to be solid. And now we're looking for the color. Now, what would be the color? I don't know. Let's try maybe yellow one here. Let's say yellow. Excellent. We have our border and we didn't have to use all the properties. Now, there's also an option of, let's say you don't want border all around. You're like looking at it and you're like saying, well, I have this specific element where I don't want the border all around. How I can do this? Why he's just showing me all the options of all around the border? I mean, no fear. We can do that also too. comment this out just so you can have for the reference all three of them. And the moment I save it, obviously there's no border, but we have the other options. And again, I'm not going to show you for each and every side, but we can maybe test it out with, I don't know, let's say bottom. Let's write border. Now what we're looking for. Well, we're looking for border and then the side we would like to style. So let's say we're looking for border bottom style. And like I promised before, we will going to look at different options. So let's go with dashed. Let's see how that is going to work out. And then we also have a thing for width. So let's write border and you probably get the gist already bottom. Then the width is going to be, I don't know, five pixels. Hopefully you're going to be able to see and border bottom width or bottom color. Let's try hashtag. Let's say hashtag, um, I don't know, two, two, two. Let's see how this is going to work out. And yeah, 
I have my nice dashed border. Now that is the CSS box model. Again, this is going to be very important because you will going to use it a lot, whether this is for layout, whether this is just going to be for styling. So if you're maybe not comfortable with some of these properties here, uh, maybe again, rewind the videos, practice a little bit more because you will going to use this a lot. Before I let you go, while we're still on a subject on CSS box model, I would like to cover one more property as well as one more value. Now the property name is going to be border radius and the value is going to be negative margin. So how this is going to work? Well, first and foremost, let me just make some changes here because otherwise this is not going to look as well as I would like to. So let's say by this time, I hope that you already know all these values and properties, meaning at least the basics of them. So we're going to start deleting them just so I have a little bit more room. And again, if you need to go back, just go back to the previous video and you can obviously get the source code. Now, what I have here, I have the border, but I have dashed and it's only for the bottom. So that's not something I'm interested. So here I'm just going to say that I'm going to get rid of all these three and we're going to work with border. Let's say five pixels solid. And I'm going to go with something that we can see clearer. So I'm going to go black. So that's going to be my border as well as I'm going to get rid of this margin. So I'm just going to leave the default margin for whatever heading one. Now, I'm also going to make some changes for the paragraph. And here we're also going to do something similar. Where we're going to get rid of all the margins uh, as well as we're going to change the color. So here, let's say the color is going to be green. Maybe this guy's we're going to see it a little bit better. Now, what about border radius? What does it do? Well, with border radius property, we can work on the edges of the border. And I think it's going to be easier again to show you. So we have border. Then we have radius. And now again, we can insert whatever values you would like. Now, in my case, let's start with 20 pixels. So check this out. The moment we do that, we have right now the border, but the edges around. So that's the whole point of this border radius. Now, if we want to be really creative, we can obviously change the values here. We can add more and more values. Now, the option, though, is we can also go and make it totally round. So let's say in my case, we can use border radius and let's set this to 50 percent because we can also use the percentages so i can do something like this and check this out now my paragraph is actually around like this if i'm going with 50 percent now you can obviously go 80 if you want and you can go even more but probably in most cases you're going to be dealing yours is going to go with 50 uh, percent now we also have an option for negative margin so how that is going to work out well, for now, we're looking at it and we see that this would be the default margin that we're getting from the default browser status. So there's some margin here in the bottom, and then there's also some on the top for the paragraph. Well, what about if we change a little bit? What if we're going to say here border, or I'm sorry, margin, not border, and for the margin top for the paragraph, we're going to set margin, but this is not going to be a positive value. Instead, I'm going to go with like negative 100 pixels. So what's going to happen here? Now, the moment we save it, notice that right now our paragraph is sitting actually on the top of our previous element, which was heading one. And in most cases, whenever you want to deal with some kind of layout, this might be one of the options. Now, I'm not saying this is going to be the only option you're going to be using, but it's good to be aware of it because it might come in handy. Well, we're still on a subject of border radius and border margin padding and everything that has to do with a CSS box model, why don't we take a look at some very, very nifty property called outline. And you know what? For this, again, we're going to use some visual aid. So again, we're going to write over here CSS outline property, something like this. And then we're going to be looking for the images. Now, within images, what this is going to show you again, there's plenty of them. You can choose whatever you'd like. But what's happening is that we have the content. So we already have it where we have the padding. Then we have the border. And then past the border, we, in fact, have the outline. And then we're dealing with the margin. Now, let me see. Maybe there's a better a little bit uh, actual image. So let me check again for the images. And let me scroll. Here's the border content. Uh, let me see where there's one with the margin, maybe. Uh, yeah, I don't think this is going to be here. But anyway, just understand that there's still going to be margin right here. Because remember, margin was kind of behind the border. So what, in fact, we're having here is the content. Then we have the border 
then we have the outline and eventually we have obviously our margin your question probably would be why why does it make sense so we're having right now the border and why we care about so much about the outline well we don't care it like excessively but we can do some pretty nifty things with an outline that we cannot do with the border and as always you guessed it in order to show you that we're going to head over back to index html and here we're going to say something like along the lines like this there is going to be a div the div is going to have class so the class is going to be buttons let's say and you know what let me spell it correctly as well as within this div we're going to have two links now each of the links is going to have hashtag so the link is not going to go anywhere However, the first one is going to have the class of let's say one or you know what just to switch it around let's use the div let's say this is going to be a div or i'm sorry what div id let's use the id <laughs> and i don't know why i'm using the hashtag because this is something i'm gonna have to use in a css so i'm uh, sorry i guess that's what happens if i'm using classes 20 times anyway i want id now the first one id is going to be one and i'm going to say is no outline so that would be written in a link and i'm going to copy and paste it now for the second one i'm going to say that this buddy is going to be number two and here this guy is going to have the outline awesome we have everything set up in the html now what's next well let's start in the buttons in the css and let's say for the buttons first of all i would want some margin and margin is going to be three rems all around okay it's a very very nice start then i would like to select both of the links and we're going to add bunch of styles just for both of the links and then we specifically work with one of them with the border and then the other one you guessed it we're going to use the outline so here we're going to say something like this we're going to say first of all background is going to be some x value uh six eight nine let's say again hashtag six eight nine and then i'm looking for f three f so it's going to be a green color as well as we're going to be looking for some text decoration I'm going to say text decoration is going to be none uh, padding. Let's add some padding a little bit. Let's say 1.2 REMs and 1.5 REMs as well. So this is going to be my padding. Awesome. Then we're having the color and the color we can do. I don't know. Again, hex value 222. So blackish color. And you know what? We can also do text transform uppercase. Text transform uppercase. This is going to be transformed uppercase. And you know what? We haven't covered yet display properties. So let me make this smaller. And later on, we're going to see why this is happening. But don't worry about it too much right now. What we're looking for is the outline property. What else is happening? Well, now we would want, uh, I don't know, a cursor pointer. Now, this is going to make sure that as we're hovering, that there's going to be a little pointer. Now, once we save it, check it out what happens as I'm hovering over the links. That I'm gonna having this cursor pointer. Mouse. Okay. What else? Now this is the time we're all gonna meet the border again. Well, we have already met the border, but I guess we're gonna get to know border one more time. Where we're gonna write the shortcut, and we're gonna say border, and for the border, I don't know, zero point two REMs. That would be the actual width of the border. Then we're looking for solid, and then two two two. Okay. Finally, we can start working on our outline and outline is going to have to be a lot similar the way the border is, meaning if I'm going to go to the second one, I can write like this. You can say number two he is going to first going to have some kind of outline width. Now let's do again the same thing. 0.2 REMs. Then we're going to have the outline and we're going to be looking for style. So in this case, again, we're going to go with solid just because we want to match exactly the same like we had here, just so you can see that there's a lot of similarities. And last but not least, we're going to have outline color. Now, once we add these three things, hashtag two, 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 you'll see that everything looks exactly the same. Now, your question probably would be, well, what is the difference then why you're showing this? Well, what's nifty about the outline? is the fact that you know what before we do that let me sh uh, quickly add some margin so margin is going to be for both links zero top bottom and then we're going to be looking for like 20 pixels so something like this just because they're not actually sitting side by side and again i'm struggling because we haven't covered display properties yet 
But the moment we add outline, you might be tempted thinking, okay, so that looks exactly the same. Why? Why you're going over this? Why you're covering the outline? Well, first of all, I would like to tell you, yes, there's going to be a lot of similarities because I can do the shortcut. Remember how we had the border border. So here I can write the same thing. I can say outline, then whatever styles I had, 0.2 REMs, uh, solid REMs, solid, and then I have hashtag 222. What's really, really nifty, though, about this property is the fact that we can use the property of offset. How is that going to work? Well, let's see. So if I'm going to write here outline offset, I'm going to be able to move this outline whether more out from the actual um, button in our case, or we can move it more in. So let's say if I'm going to say that the outline is going to be 10 pixels, notice what's going to happen. So now we have nice effects where our border has been actually moved away from currently the element that we're working. In. And what's also really cool, we can move it the opposite direction. So if I'm going to copy and paste it, and obviously right now, because of the order, I'm going to overwrite this. And if I'm going to say negative 10 pixels, what happens is right now my outline is going to be within the element. So those are the cool things that we can do with outline. And that is the reason why we would want to know about the border as well as about the outline. Brilliant. We now know what is CSX box model. Next, how about we take a closer look at another CSS doozy display property, what it is, how it works and why we care about it so much. Since I don't hear any other suggestions, I guess it's settled. This play property it is incredible. We finished another major milestone in CSS because now we know what is CSS box model. Well, next property is very, very interesting because it might confuse you a lot in the beginning, and that is going to be the property of display. Now, as always, let's start with an example, and here I'm going to get rid of the heading one as well as the paragraph. So the styles that we have in the CSS and also in the index HTML, we're going to clean it up a little bit and add different elements. So we're going to get rid of the heading ones and paragraphs. And we're going to start very simply by having a div. So I'm going to say there's going to be a div. Now here in a div, I'm going to write that I am block element. So just some kind of random text. Well, random at the moment, but you'll see why we're doing that. Then within the div, let's add a class. And let's say class is going to be a block. Again, it doesn't really matter. Uh, you can call this class orange. It's not going to change anything. The most important thing is what we're going to do in the CSS. So let's say there's going to be another heading. And the heading is also going to have the class. Now the class, again, is going to be the same thing, block. And also we're going to do the same thing with the text. So text is going to be block element. And sure enough, now I have two of them. Now, last but not least, we're going to have paragraph. And don't worry, we're not going to add any more block elements. But for now, let's add a paragraph. Again, we're going to do the same thing and block element, something like this. And then let's add the same class. So let me copy and paste the class. Class is going to be right here with a paragraph. And I have three elements. So far, so good. Then I would like to head over online somewhere. So I'm going to say I would like to open up the new window. And I'm going to be going to pixels. And those of you who are following the HTML part know that within the pixels website, we can get nice images. So I'm just going to search for some nice image. And let's say here, we're going to call this smoothie. And again, you can look for kitten. It doesn't really matter as long as you get the image. And I'm going to go with this image and I'm going to say save image. Now I'm going to look for my CSS folder. And then within the CSS folder, let's just call this photo. Because again, it doesn't really matter. I just need it for example. Now I have my photo so far. So good. It's obviously here photo JPEG. And now let's create three more elements. So there's going to be the first one span. And for this guy, we're going to say class in line. And the only thing I would suggest is if you're adding different class names, try to match them because then you're going to see the actually better what's happening. Please don't name this orange, then this one Apple, and then it's going to be hard for, to, for you to see what we're doing. So I'm going to say I am in line element. So that's going to be my span. And here, maybe we can just copy and paste this and change this around a little bit. You know what? I actually did one too many. So I would like to have here image. That's going to be my uh, element. And for the source, I know that I can look in this folder. 
and in this folder, I have photo and we're looking for JPEG. Now, what else I have? I would also add like to add some width. And let's say width is going to be 50 pixels. So far, so good. I have two spans. And then I'm also looking here for the last one, which is going to be link. And you know what? I actually didn't need to copy and paste it. And uh, that was a useless part of my uh, actions. And let's do href attribute. Let's just say that link is not going to go anywhere. It's going to stay on this page. And the class is also going to be in line. So far, so good. Let's call this also I am in line element. I know this was kind of a little bit annoying and long example HTML, but hopefully you're going to forgive me and we'll be able to work in a CSS and see why we're doing all this. Now, let's head over to CSS and let's add some basic styles to them. So for the block ones, so all of them who are block, let's just write, I don't know, uh, background is going to be, let's say, blue. Very, very uh, original. And then color, let's say, is going to be white. Now, for the inline ones, I would like to add something else. So I'm going to say inline element. And here I'm going to have the background of red. And the color is going to be white. So I think this is going to look sharp enough. Now, as I'm looking on the right hand side, what are you noticing? So I have three elements here on the top. And I could have added way more. But I just needed to prove my point. And what you're seeing is that they are looking at least differently than the ones in the bottom. Because what's happening is that for each and one of them, even though we have more space, we are starting a new line. As well as each and every element is spanning from one side of the screen all the way to another side of the screen. Even though, again, we can change the screen size it's still going to do the same thing. Now, the bottom ones are behaving a little bit differently. So they are not starting a new line, as well as they only take up as much space as necessary. And what's happening is that in the CSS or in the HTML, what's happening is that there's elements that by default, we're going to have display property. In fact, all elements have by default, some kind of display property. Now, Property is going to be the same, but the value might be different. Where for some elements, the property is going to be block by default right away. And for some of them, it's going to be inline. And what's happening with the block is that with block level elements or block elements, they will always going to start a new line and they will going to take up the full width. Now, for the inline ones, they will not going to start a new line and only going to take up as much space as content is necessary. Now that is important because you will going to use this a lot whenever you are styling it, whatever you're dealing with some kind of layouts, whatever you're dealing with, I don't know how it looks, it will going to play a big role later on, especially the more and more work you're going to do with CSS. Now what's really nifty is that we can control this property. So we're not just looking at it and saying, okay, there's nothing I can do. I just have the span and this is an inline element. Because what we can do is we can go over here. We're going to say display. So that would be the name of the property. And let's change it. Let's say that this is not going to be inline anymore. And by the way, notice if I'm going to write inline, nothing is going to change. Because by default, all the inline elements already have this set to display inline. But we can do display block. And now check this one out. So I'm going to say display block. And the moment I save it, all of them start a new line and all of them span from one side to another one. Now we can do the same thing here with the block ones. Again, I would first need to show you that if I'm going to go here and if I'm going to say display and we're going to call this block, nothing is going to change because again, by default, they are block level elements or block elements. However, we can do in line and now notice what's happening here in line. And now we have them here as in line elements. So now they're again taking only as much space as their content, and they're not starting a new line. And that's something that I mentioned in the very, very beginning when I talked about div and span, and I said I'm going to talk about this later, but this is when we're covering the fact that all the elements are going to have either inline or block set for display property, and this will going to matter as we actually start working with them and start styling them in CSS.
right, we know what is the display property. However, probably your next question is, well, where we can use that knowledge that we know that some elements are going to be blocked and some of them are going to be in line. Now, just to look at a very basic example, let's look at a horizontal centering. Now, I can tell you right away that the moment you're going to learn everything about Flexbox and the grid, those are probably going to be your go to things for centering, whether horizontally or vertically. However, we can look at some basic examples where we can just do it with good old regular CSS. So let's start first by getting rid of this display in line. So let's keep them the way they are, the way they have been created right away by default. So I'm going to get rid of this display block and now I'm just going to save it. So how we can horizontally center whatever we're dealing with, whether it's block element or inline element. Well, first of all, let's work with the parent. So what is the parent? Well, the parent would be body. I'm going to head over back to the body. Or I'm sorry, CSS. And I'm going to select the whole body. Now, the moment I'm going to write text align, because we know that was the property to actually center the text. Notice what's going to happen. So the moment I save it for the block elements, only the text is going to be centered. But they're still not going to be centered because they're spanning from one side all the way to another side. However, once I make the screen bigger, notice the inline elements we can horizontally center by just using this text align property. However, for the ones that are by default block, only the text is going to be in center. So your next question probably will be, well, but how can we center the block level elements or block elements? Well, let's figure it out. So you know what? Let me make this decent size. So not too big, not too small. And then let's look at them. So I have block level elements. Why don't I add some width here? So I'm going to say for all my block elements, I'm going to have a width of, I don't know, uh, 150 pixels. Let's see what's going to happen. So I have my block elements, all of them width with 150 pixels. And the way we can center them horizontally is by using the margin property that we already covered in the CSX model. And the way we're going to write this is going to be margin. Then remember, we had an option of having a top bottom margin and left and right margin. Now for the top bottom, we can write whatever we would like. But in my case, I'm just going to write zero. But again, please remember, you can write 50 pixels or 500 pixels. It doesn't really matter in this situation. What's more interesting is that we can write with left and right auto. Now, what's auto going to do is it's literally right away going to place it in the center. So right now, if I have margin zero, this is the reason why they're stacked one on top of each other. But what's neat is that they are, in fact, in the center because now I have some width and I added the margins. Now, if you don't believe me, let me add, I don't know, 20 pixels. And now this is going to be top. I'm sorry. Yeah, top and bottom. Now, if you're a little bit confused about his auto, we could have rewrote this a little bit differently. We could have said it like this. Let's just get rid of the margins and let's just write for all of them. We're going to have margin. Then we're looking for left. And then again, we use the auto. So in this case, this is going to push it all the way to the right hand side because the left margin is going to be left for auto. And then if I'm going to copy and paste it and if we're going to say, let's say margin right is going to be auto. Now this is going to be in center. So it does this exactly the same thing without top and bottom margin but just works with a horizontal margins. Now, obviously, if you don't believe me, I can just comment this out. And now this is going to be all the way on the left hand side because margin right is going to be auto right over here. But that would be the default setup anyway. So if I'm going to comment this out, it's going to look exactly the same way. But if you would want to place in a center, the inline element, we can use text align center. And for the block level element, we would want to use again, let me rewrite this same margin. And again, in this case, maybe 20 pixels and left and right is going to be auto. And you'll see this a lot where we are using this in order to center it. Uh, but again, let me repeat that the moment you're going to learn the CSS flex box as well as CSS grid, you most likely will going to use them for centering because once you learn them, they offer you more options and they are a little bit more straightforward. We also need to cover the fact that browser does respect top, bottom, margin, and padding for block elements, but does not respect it for inline elements. And in order to hit this home, 
we'll make a simple mobile nav bar in the process. We're also going to cover list style type property and descendant selectors in CSS. Let's start with an easy one. The block level elements or the block elements. So for this, I'm just going to get rid of everything that we have right now in a CSS. We're going to head over to index HTML. Later on, we're going to change it. We're going to add obviously some different elements here. But for now, I just want to show you that if I have, let's say, div and if I'm going to go here in the CSS, we already covered this, that if I'm going to add the background, let's say background blue color white. And if I'm going to add, let's do the easy one. Padding all around is going to be 20 pixels and margin all around is also going to be 20 pixels. Now what's going to happen? Well, margin is going to be respected as well as the padding is going to be respected. Now it's going to make a little bit more sense once we're going to work with the inline ones, because you'll see what happens with these elements and why they differ. Now, in this case, maybe we can get rid of a div again. We are going to save the CSS. We are going to delete it in the HTML. And let's create our nav bar. Now for the nav bar, we're going to use the unordered list. Then we know that within the unordered list, we have a list element. And within the list element, let's place a link. Now for the link, we're going to place hashtag since this link is not going to go anywhere. And then we're just going to write home. So this is going to be our first link. Now let me maybe make three more. And we're just going to change the values here. So first and foremost, I'm going to select a few of them. I'm going to delete them, all of them at the same time. Then we're going to add, I don't know, this is going to be about us page. Then we're also going to have the link to, I don't know, products page. And last but not least, we have the link to contact us page. So four pages. So far, so good. Once the HTML has been set up, we're going to head over back to style CSS and we're going to do our styling. Now, first, we need to understand that for now, we're having these margins here that are coming by default from the browser. So I would like to get rid of them. And remember, we had an option of changing or selecting, sorry, all the elements. And then now we already have covered these two properties where I'm just going to add the margin. So margin right away by default at the moment is going to be zero for all of them, as well as we're going to get rid of the padding. And then there's going to be property that we're going to cover in a few videos, which is going to be box sizing. And we're going to write box sizing. And in this case, we're going to write border box. Again, I'm not going to cover this right now. We're going to covered in a separate video because it's going to make a little bit more sense. So far, so good. So we have right now the margin is zero. The padding is zero as well as the box sizing. So now we're having actually a far different view right now. So we got from the we got away from all the default styles. OK, what's next? Well, let's maybe add some font family. We know that we can add it for whole body and we're just going to write font family it is going to be. Let's go with Verdana. And we already know that this is going to give us the font stack. And the last one is going to be Eric sans serif. And obviously, we see right away that the fonts have been successfully changed. Now, since I want to show you the property of list style type, let me just comment this out for now. Now, you don't have to do this on your end. I'm just going to do it over here just so you can see what this property is doing, because otherwise it's going to be like, well, are you sure that he's doing it correctly? Because nothing is changing. Also, in the CSS, we can select the children. Now, in our case, what's happening? So we have an ordered list, correct? Then we have list item, who is the child of the honored list. And there's actually four children. And then each and every list item has the child of the link. So how we can select them? Well, we have an option here of going on ordered list. So we're selecting an ordered list. And then we're saying all the list items that are children of honored list, we would like to select them. Now, for them, we would like to select the property of list style, list style, because this is obviously a list. And then we have list style type. Now we have many options here. Again, we have Armenian, circle, whatever, uh, disk. Maybe we can check it out, disk, how it works. And yeah, it doesn't really change anything. Let me see another one. Square, maybe square is going to be different. So now you can see that there's going to be square. Let me try one more last one because I don't want to spend the whole day on them. Uh, we have upper Roman, we have alpha. Let's try this guy, maybe alpha Roman. So now I have Roman numerals, but mostly what you're always going to do with the list, you're going to write something like this. You're going to say, I don't want these dots. I just want them clear because you will use these lists for your navigation. So in this case, you're going to be setting this up and you're going to say list style type none. 
So once we have successfully added this property of list style type with the value of none, now we can head over or I can head over. I don't know. Did you uncomment this or not? And now I'm going to uncomment this again. And now we can place it again without any default margins, paddings, as well as set the box sizing to the barter box. And now let's work with our links. And again, we can do the same thing. We have the honored list, correct? Then within the honored list, we have what? Well, we have these links. Now I can do this directly. I can just say all the links that are going to be within the onward list, or we can be more precise. We can say here that if there's going to be, let's say, for example, some other link elements directly here as a children, maybe it would be a little bit more precise to use this li. In our case, this is not going to make any difference. It will only make a difference if you're going to have some link elements without these list items here. That would be the case where if you want to select only those ones, you would like to use this li. But in our case, either of them would have worked. We can either do UL, LI, and then the link, or we can just say UL, so on our list, and then we're looking for the link. Please understand that. What we're going to do with the links? Well, let's decide. We know already that we have the text decoration. So let me get rid of the text decoration, and we're just going to say none. So far, so good. Then also, we know the property of text transform. And for the text transform value, we're going to use capitalize. So now all our text is going to be capitalized. Also, let's add some letter spacing. Let's say for the spacing, we're going to have two pixels. So far, so good. Then we have two pixels. Also, maybe let's add some background. Let's say that the background is going to be hashtag two, two, two. So the background is going to be black and the color is going to be, let's say, uh, orange F one five zero two five. So, so far, so good. Everything is working out. However, what if I would let me make sure of F one five zero two zero two five. So hopefully this is going to be the orange one. Now, the key here is I would like to add some padding here, top and bottom for my elements, as well as maybe a little bit of margin in between. Now, eventually, once we set up everything, we're not going to have any margin. But just to prove your point, let's say that I would want both. I would want some padding top bottom as well as I would want some margin top bottom. Okay, let's try it out. Let's say, first of all, padding is going to be all around and we're just going to say padding is going to be five pixels. Okay, already something interesting is happening. I'm having the padding, but they are overlaying one on top of each other. And that's definitely not the look that I want. And okay, we're going to keep on moving and I'm going to say margin is also going to be top bottom and something left and right. However, maybe since you don't believe me, you would be like, well, okay, you're just writing it incorrect. Let me write different way. Let's say top bottom is going to be 10 pixels as well as 10 pixels is going to be left and right. Now what happens? The links are moving left and right. And obviously in this case, we just see the left side because there's nothing here on right hand side, but they're not moving top and bottom. So what's happening? Well, remember links were in line. They were inline elements. And what happens is that browser is not going to respect that as you start adding these paddings here, as well as the margins for the top bottom. So in our case, in order to fix this, we would need to make them as the block level elements. So how do we do that? Well, first of all, let me get rid of this. Let's say that I would like to get rid of margin padding. We are just going to rewrite this. And in this case, I'm going to say display. And now instead of inline, which was the original one, the default one, I'm going to say display block. So check this out. So now my links are all the way from one side to another side of the screen. And now if we're going to start adding padding, and let's say for us, the padding is going to be uh, top bottom is going to be, let's say 10 pixels, and then left and right is going to be 10 pixels. Now, obviously, again, the padding is going to be only shown on left hand side because there's plenty of space right here. So we're not going to be able to see. But what happens right now, my links are actually respecting this padding top bottom, the browser is respecting because they're block elements. Now the same thing, if we would want to do this, but again, we are not technically wouldn't want to do it in a mobile uh, menu, but I mean, maybe who knows, but you could add the margin. So let's say I could do just a margin all around in this case. And now these 10 pixels of margin of left and right are going to be respected, not just the left and right that uh, like we had previously. But again, in this case, probably this is not something that we're going to use. But again, just to show you that for the block elements, the browsers will going to respect the top bottom padding and margin. 
However, for the inline elements, they'll not gonna respect the top and bottom margin and padding. At this point, we know two values for the display. We know that there's gonna be a display block as well as display inline. What about we cover the inline block just to see how this is gonna work? Now, I'm gonna show you this with link elements who are by default obviously in line, but just please understand you can do this with any element. Basically, you can set this to inline block. Now, I'd just like to show the characteristics of inline block. So, let's start by simple hello world. And again, like I said, we're gonna be choosing some kind of inline element. In my case, I just find the link to be fastest. Let's write, and there's gonna be value of link within the actual link. And let's copy and paste it, I don't know, four times. So these are going to be my heading one with these links. Now, obviously, like I said, we would like to cover inline block. We already know that there's going to be an issue. If I'm going to be styling the links and let's say font size is going to be 60 pixels, then let's add maybe some background of red. This is going to be a good option. Then also we have an option of adding the margin. Now, the moment we're going to be adding the margin, there's going to be a kicker though. If we're going to add 10 pixels, notice what's going to happen. The margin is going to be only applied again left and the right because for now the browser is ignoring because it's looking at it and saying, Hey, listen, buddy, you're an inline element. I don't care whether you're adding the margin, which in your case, you're adding 10 pixels all around. I'm just adding this left and right because you are displayed inline. So, your next question would be, Does that mean that each and every element, if I want that margin, does it have to be block? So, let's say, do I have to do like this display? and block well the answer would be very simple no you don't have to because in your case you would be like i don't want this to be spreading all across i just want them all in one line but then i would like to add still some margin so how do we do that well i think i already answered by saying that we're going to be looking at inline block and we just write inline block so what's happening with inline block and let me comment this out and then you'll see that right now we don't have the margin notice how they moved and if I'm going to add inline block, now we move. And if I'm going to add more margin, just to show you, then obviously this is going to be 30 pixels right now. Because the more margin we're going to add, and let's say 600, or you know what, let's do 60. Now we're going to have 60 pixels margin. And if you would want your margin, top, bar, top bottom margin, to be respected, you, and if you don't want it to be display block, so taking the full line, you have an option of using the inline block. And again, you can use this on any element. I just showed you with the link. In the previous video, I mentioned that we will gonna cover the box sizing, and I'm gonna make it actually with an example because, like always, and I know I keep repeating this, but it makes much more sense if we're looking actually at the example. Now, what we would like to do here, I guess, again for the whole CSS, we're just gonna delete this. Uh, we're also gonna go to index HTML. I'm going to say we're not going to need the unordered list, but instead we're going to create a divs. In fact, there's going to be three divs for the div. Let's say first box number one is going to be our class. And let's write here with a heading one, uh, simple text. I am, uh, with, uh, I am with a border box, border box. Then the next one, let me just copy and paste it. And uh, let's copy and paste it two times. So the second div is obviously going to be with box of number two. And the third one is going to be with the box of three. And again, we'll just use this for styling here. Let's just say I'm normal. I am normal. And then for the third one, let's write I am without border box. And we're going to save it. OK, so we have three divs within the three divs. We have heading ones. Again, the most work is going to be in the style CSS. And let's start styling. So first and foremost, let's select box and we're just going to write box number one. Now, since I would like to have multiple styles for each and every box, let me repeat maybe when we could group the elements. We'll just say box number two. And we're going to write a dot again, box number two, as well as comma and box number three. I'm just keep forgetting the dots, but I think it's going to be okay. Now, what I would want for all the classes. Because again, that was the whole point of this grouping. So I'm going to say 200 pixels is going to be my width. And then we're also going to do, I don't know, height of the same of 200 pixels. Excellent. We have the width and we have the height. Now what? 
Well, maybe let's add some colors, but for the colors, since they are going to be separate, I'd want to actually select the actual boxes on their own. So box number one is going to have the background of, let's say, red. Then we're also going to add a little bit of coloring with white. So that's going to be this style. And you know what? In this case, we can just copy and paste it because there's no point of rewriting everything. So we can say that I would like to select whatever these lines and we're going to copy and paste it two times. Then let's write different values. So this would be box number two. This is going to be box number three. And you know what? Actually changed my mind. Why don't we do this one? 100 pixels because you'll see actually. No, you cannot do this. My apologies. I need to go with 200 pixels because I have heading one. Uh, please disregard whatever I just did. And back to the colors. Now for the second one, we're going to add maybe, I don't know, blue color. And text is still going to be white. So here we can also do the green. Now, as we're looking at it, first of all, you can see that I messed up. I could have used the color right here. I could have said color and white. And let me just spend 30 seconds to delete these guys. So again, we're going to select them with multiple selectors. And we're just going to delete them since all the colors are going to be exactly the same. Now comes the most interesting part of where we're starting to work with the border box. So why we're using that property and why we're using the actual property as well as the value. So why we're using the box sizing property with the value of the border box. Now, in order to demonstrate this, why don't we add some padding now for the box number one, which was going to be border box and then for the box number three. So leave the middle one, the box number two, just the way it is. So here I'm going to say like this, I'm going to say that I would like some padding. And I'm going to add padding all around. So I'm going to say 20 pixels. Okay, so I'm already noticing that my box is getting bigger. Okay, let's do the same thing here. Let's say for the third box, it's also going to be the same thing. And again, we're getting the bigger padding on the left hand side, as well as we can see that it's happening on top of bottom. Now, if we really want to actually check this out, we can head over to the bigger browser window. Or you can do it in a small side browser window. It's really up to you. And then we can again refresh how we can go to Google Developer Tools. And if I'm going to click on Inspect, I'm going to open up the tools. I'm going to right away zoom in so we can see better. And that was a little bit drastic. I didn't need to go that far. But we can stay something. I cannot pick the right angle. Uh, let's say head. Within the head, I'm not interested in anything. I don't know why I opened head. I actually needed body. Uh, let me open up the body. Now, within the body, I have my boxes. What do you see here on the box? Now, if you can clearly see on the top, I have 240 by 240. However, on my right hand side, it says 200 by 200. Again, let me head a hover over back. And as I'm hovering over the elements, you can see that there has been added some width and some height because we just added the padding. Because I said padding is going to be left and right and top and bottom. So what happens is even though originally it was 200 by 200. Now, in fact, this is 240 by 240 because we added the padding. OK, don't believe me. Let's go over to box number three again. Same deal. So even though I'm having here right now, this 200 by 200, what's happening is on the page right now, as I'm looking at it again, this is 240 by 240. And we can also see this over here. So I have 200 by 200, but then my paddings are being added on the left hand side, on the right hand side. <laughs> it's obviously a different. It's the opposite, the left hand side and the right hand side, as well as top and bottom. Now, why this matters? Well, as you're going to be working with CSS, as you're going to be working with your layouts, this is really going to mess you up, especially if you try to position something somewhere. And you just add a padding and this is totally going to mess up your layout, your view, and probably most importantly, your mood, especially in the beginning. So what do we do about that? Well, let me head over to the box number one over here and let's add the property that we just learned, which was box sizing property. And for the box sizing, we would like to add border box. Now, what does border box do? Well, what happens with border box? border box is right now and we can actually click on box number one and now check this out now this is probably going to be clearer but even though you can still see it here uh, at least i can see it on my window i can see that this is still 200 by 200 but i guess this is going to be a little bit better 
we're notice what happens now. The padding is added on the inside, so the content is actually 160, which again might mess you up your content within, but at least it's not gonna mess up your whole layout. Now, is it the same thing with the third one? Well, no, this is still without a border box value. So what's happening is this is the reason why we're using the border box. And that's the reason why in the beginning, remember when we had that universal selector, when we said that we would want to select everything, uh, that was the asterisk, then we're adding margin is going to be zero. The default margins should be gone. Then also the padding should be gone. So we could always add their own paddings. And that's why we added here this box sizing with a value of the border box. So that's why we said here border box. So now all of them are exactly the same. The only difference right now with a one and three is the fact that the padding has been added on the inside. But the key is that if you're adding this property, it will not going to mess up your whole layout. If you're adding padding to a element, because padding is going to be applied inside of the element, not the outside, making the element bigger. Well, we're still on a topic of display property. Eventually, inevitably, as you're working with CSS, you're going to come across the opacity property as well as visibility, and you're going to see the value for display property set to none. So why don't we cover all these properties with these values just so we can see the difference. Now, within the index HTML, we will going to create three new divs, and we're going to say there's going to be a div. Now, the first one is going to have a class of none because we're going to look at the class of none. And let's, I don't know, write also maybe the name here and let's copy and paste it. Now, once we copy and paste it, I would like to select both of them and let's write here opacity is going to be equal to one. So that's going to be my class name as well as the value. And as always, you'll see why we're doing that just in a second. And let's write over here opacity is going to be, I don't know, five. And this is going to be basically opacity of 0.5. And then the last one is going to be opacity with zero. So let me select this. And now this is going to be my opacity with zero. I also would like to have the div. And you know what? We might as well copy and paste it. And let's set this up with a hidden. So you know what? No, let's give this a class of visibility. So the name is also going to be visibility, but the value is going to be hidden. So visibility, hopefully I'm typing this correctly. Now let me save it. This is going to be my divs. Now, for each and every div, let's again add, as always, some general styles. Let's say div is going to have some background. Background is going to be blue. There's going to be a little bit of margin all around. So we're going to say, I don't know, a little bit of margin of like, let's say 10 pixels. And right off the margin, why don't we add some coloring as well? And let's say that color is going to be white. So what's happening right now with these properties? Well, we have the classes, so we can say none. And here I would like to start using by display. Now this is not going to be display block, the inline block or inline. Instead, we're going to set this up with none. And now let me first add all of them with opacities and with visibilities. And then I'm going to go over to the actual developer tools and then we'll see kind of the differences. So for now, what we're seeing is that with the class of none and display of none, we cannot see the element. And that is true. Now, what other options we're going to have? Well, we had, I uh, believe, opacity this is going to be equal to a actual opacity property and opacity property is going to do something very similar where this is going to control the visibility now the max value is going to be one which is going to be by default right away uh, displayed and then we have an option of zero which is going to make sure that the actual class is not displayed meaning the element or whatever but we're since we're using the class to select it the one that has the zero is not going to be displayed now, in this case, obviously, I need to select the proper one. So if my class was zero notice, I'm having right away the div. However, we cannot see the div because this is where, again, we're working with these values where opacity is changing. Now, if you remember, it was something very similar as we're working with the colors where we're using the RGBA value. Remember, we had color and then the last value in RGBA was the transparency or the opacity. So the same thing is working here just with the whole div where by default all the opacities are going to be one so that's why we don't need to write it and we can see it clearly like this however if we change it to zero which would be the minimum value then we cannot see the div anymore and also i'm going to have the value of five which is going to be zero five 
Now, I'm not going to cover each and every value between zero and one. Just understand that we're just using right now the round values because they just make a little bit more sense. But if I'm going to say 0 0.5, the opacity, the transparency of this div is going to be like this. So it's going to be somewhere between the middle of totally hidden element as well as totally clear elements because we're going to have the transparency of five. Now, if I'm going to change this to 0 0.74, then my opacity goes bigger because it goes towards one, meaning I am less transparent. If I'm going to go with 0 0.25, then the element is going to be way more transparent because we're closer to one. So you're bouncing in between these two values, zero and one, and whatever value you're picking, in our case, 0 0.5, then the transparency is going to be like this. Now, last but not least, we have here also the visibility. And for this, we had the class visibility and we're going to go with visibility property and notice what happens with visibility we have an option of hidden or i can head over here and again we can have the hidden or visible now the visible again is going to be by default because all the uh, elements are going to be shown by default but if you would want to have hidden then we're going to have the hidden. now maybe in order to kind of see what's happening like i said it's going to be better if we're going to go to developer tools just to see how everything is working. Now, if we're going to head over here to inspect, we see that there's going to be my elements and maybe I can make this a little bit bigger Then within the body. Notice what's going to happen. So I will going to have my display of none. Then I have my opacity of one as well as here. We're working with opacity of 0 0.5 and then I have the opacity of zero as well as I have my visibility. Now, what would be the key difference? You see, as we're working with display of none, this is taken out out of the flow. So we cannot even see it here. However, as I'm hovering over the opacity, I see that there is an element. So the element is there. We just cannot see it right now in the browser. However, with display of none, we're taking totally out of the flow of our document. So even though I can see it technically that it is in the HTML, I cannot hover over it. I cannot select it. I cannot see it more in more detail. However, with opacity, only thing we're doing as well as visibility, we're hiding that element. We're not taking out out of the normal flow of the document. So those would be the key differences. If you want to totally get rid of the element, you would use display of none. So maybe head over. Let's back. We have the display of none that would totally take it out of the flow of the document. If you would want to, let's say, change the opacity, change the transparency, you would use the opacity and choose some kind of value between zero and one. And if you just want to hide it, you'd say visibility of hidden. So those are the properties. Those are the values. And that is in general how we would use them. At this point, we already know how to add background colors in CSS. But what about images as backgrounds? I think it would be really cool if we would learn that. Not only will we learn how to use background image properties, we're also going to take a closer look at shorthand syntax which in essence will going to save us the unnecessary typing. Okay, our next subject is really, really interesting. And that is going to be the background, how we can add background in our CSS as an image. Now, in order to start working on this, we will going to have to get images. So I would like to spend this video with the setup. Now, you don't have to follow along. You can just go to resources and get everything that I'm going to be doing in this video. But I do want to show you again to repeat where are we getting images, how we can save them and how we can crop them. Now, before I do anything right now with images, let me just delete my CSS. So CSS is going to be clear as well as in the index HTML. We're going to get rid of all these divs that we did use in the previous video. OK, awesome. We also can delete this guy. We don't need it. The photo is going to go bye bye. And then, yeah, let's go and look for images. And you know what? I don't need the console. I don't think we will need it. And let's open up the new tab again. We can use Pixabay or Pexels. I'm going to go with Pexels. Uh, what kind of image we can be looking for? Let's say we're going to get this one. This is kind of interesting. And again, the way we'll do that, we're going to save image as and then we're looking for where we're saving this. So in this case, I'm going to call this big image. Now, you don't have to technically name it this way. But there's a reasoning behind this. So again, this is really up to you. I'm going to say that this is going to be big. Then another image that I'm going to be looking for is going to be, let's say this guy, 
and again, we're gonna do save image as, and I'm gonna call this one small again, name it however you would like, and I'm gonna name it this way. And then what else we have? I guess we can maybe work with uh, the actual building here. Let's say save image as. Now, the key here is gonna be that I would like to create a folder, and then I'm gonna save this image in the folder. So, I'm gonna call this first of all folder image, that's gonna be my name, and then first I would like to create a new folder. And again, this is just to show you something how we would get the path so here. Let's say IMG or images it doesn't really matter. I'm going to create it and then I'm going to save it within this folder. Hopefully you were successful. Now I'm going to head over to my folder and I would like to crop the small image. So the the one that's in the images folder as well as the big image can stay the same, but the small one I would like to actually crop it and not in the Photoshop, I'm just going to do it the quick way in the actual Mac. So I'm just going to say within the tools, I would like to adjust the size and let me just get something small. Uh, you know what? I actually want the really, really small. So I'm going to say 100 by 100. So this is going to be a very, very small image. Let me save it. And I think now we have all our setup. So we can go ahead and start learning about background image property in the CSS. Alrighty, neighbor, hopefully you have the same setup as me, whether you downloaded, whether you follow along the last video, and now we can start working on the background property for our images. Now, first and foremost, in the index HTML, we're going to create a div. Now, this div is going to have a class. Now, the class is going to be big IMG. And within this div, let's say that there's going to be just some heading one with uh, I am. I am, now let me make this proper one. I am big image. Now let me copy and paste this. And let's say one, two, three. Then the second one is going to be the small. So we can say small image. The third one is going to be the folder image. Again, kind of straightforward. This is going to be the small image. And you probably already can guess what we're going to be doing anyway. So let's say small image. And then the last one is going to be the folder image. So I am folder image. Nice to meet you. Okay, index HTML done. Awesome. Let's head over to style CSS. First, let's select all the divs. And let's say the divs are not going to have any kind of width. So they're going to be spanning all across, but we will going to add some height. So let's say height is not going to be two pixels. Height actually would be, I don't know, let's test it out by 400 pixels. I think that's going to be a little bit too drastic here. Let's cover 300 pixels. Maybe that's going to be bigger. Well, at the moment, it's still kind of big. But you know what? It's obviously the fact that I'm working with the browser window and I have zoomed in a lot. So not there. I'm going to zoom in there, but zoom out over here because I always want you to see a little bit better. So I can see that I kind of went a little bit drastic where I had 175. So in this case, it looks better with 125. So now I maybe I can no, not really. Okay, 400, not, not 54,000 or 5,400. Let's try 400. Yeah, and I think this is going to do the job. Excellent. Also, I would like to add the color. So let's write color is going to be red. Let's save it. So far, so good. And now let's start working with the backgrounds. Now we have done already too many times the background property. So I'm not going to show you with the color. However, the whole point here is to show you how it can work with images. So for the class of big image, what I would like, first of all, let's select the background. That's going to be the first step. Then for the background, the value in this case is going to be URL. So this is where the difference comes in. We're not placing the color. We are writing the URL. Now within the URL, we need to show the path. So where this image is located. Now, where is this image located? The big image. Well, it's in exactly the same folder as our style CSS. So it's very simply. We can just look for the big image. Then I'm going to do the forward slash. And in this case, this would be the big image. Now we can also and let me just save it. First of all, just so you can see that there's going to be an image. But let's look at the other options we had. We obviously could have done it like this, could have said it like this. This would still going to work. But again, please remember, it's going to depend whether you are opening up with the browser. So if you're going to go over here and if you're going to click on, let's say, index HTML, then the different paths are going to mess up over there as you're opening directly in a browser. 
so just keep in that mind. So this is gonna be the safe one where even though I'm gonna open up with the browser directly, this is still gonna work. So again, this is just something you need to keep an eye on. Now let's save this again. And what else we have? Well, maybe let's test it out over here like this. Let's say big JPEG. Now, is this working? I think it is. Again, we can do the same thing. You know what? Let me open up the new browser window and we're going to cover everything that we again did in the index HTML. So let me open this up. So this one is working right now. Then let's do this guy where we had the quotation marks. And I'm sorry if you already know this, so it's annoying to you. So it would be showing here on my live server. But if I'm going to refresh, it's not going to be working here as I open up this directly with the browser window. So again, this is something we already covered with the index HTML where we have the relative path. But this is something that we're going to work with the browsers as well as with development servers. And this is the syntax that you'll use a lot, whether that's going to be again, react or node or something like this. Again, I digress, but it can sometimes really throw you off if you're just messing around and if you're not getting the correct values. So for me, I'm just going to be sticking with this. Whatever you pick, it's really up to you. Okay, we have the background. Now, with all my yammering about the actual uh, path, I didn't tell you that basically we're getting the image. So that's the neat part where we have the background right now. And the background is in fact image. So if I'm going to make this bigger, still notice. We're going to have a nice image. Now, there's going to be a couple of things that are happening by default. And that is something with CSS where some of the things you already have noticed, like let's say display properties, they already preset. Now, one of the things that we're going to again cover in a few videos is the fact that this is repeating. So the background image, it fits one. If the div is getting bigger, it needs to fit another one. And this is going to be repeating again. We're not going to cover this right now. We're just checking how this would look in general. Then let's do small image. Remember, that was the other one. And again, you know what? In this case, maybe let's just copy and paste it. There is no uh, reasoning for me to not copy and paste it because I think it's going to save us a little bit of time. So let's say small image. So I'm going to be looking for the small guy and check this out. So I'm going to change this. And again, this is in the same folder, so I don't care. I can just use small jpeg and what do we see over here well we see that literally the image was repeated not only the x direction but as well y direction so again that is something that's happening by default so it will going to matter what kind of image you're making because i'm sorry using because the reason why i wanted to show you the small image is that even though we we're going to cover later on the properties that affect this so technically we could get the same look where the small image is still going to be covering our whole div, it's going to be distorted and it's not going to be very pretty. So it does matter what kind of image you're picking. So please don't pick like an image of 25 and 25 and then wonder, well, why my image looks so bad or why does it doing this repetition? Because that is something that's happening by default. And I know that's quite a lot that you kind of have to remember that, okay, the display property is by default and this is by default, but there's nothing I can do. It's just this is how it is. It is happening by default, and I just need to cover it. Now, last one is going to be folder image. And successfully or happily, that was the big one. Let's say small, and I don't know why I uh, deleted the image. Could have just said with folder. Now, I don't want to use the small one. Now, I have to look in the folder. Now, the reason here, again, was to show you that we need to use the path. So we have to use the path where we're looking for the images. Then within images, what we have? Well, we have folder image. Now we were successful and now I'm getting the folder image. So big takeaways. If you want to place an image, use the background property that we already have covered many times with the colors, then use the URL. And then within the URL, you need to get an image. But please understand that the image you're picking matters because the small image is going to be repeated. Well, since it is hard to dismiss the background image repeated, we might as well start with that property and cover the options we have for the values. But in the process, we're also going to touch on something in the CSS that is very similar to the last rule. Now, remember, the last rule would be something like this. So if I'm going to copy and paste it, and if I'm going to say with a div and the height, I'm going to set it to the 200. 
and let's say color is gonna be blue. What do you think is gonna be displayed? Do you think the first one or the second one? Well, it's gonna be the second one because this is the last rule. Well, the same works with an order, and you'll see what happens here with the property of background repeat. And this is not specific to this property. This is gonna be happening with all of them. And you know what? I might as well show you right now. So the order is gonna work like this. That even though let's say I have the height here first for 400, even within the same rule, if I'm gonna write here height and 200, what do you think is gonna be displayed? I think at this moment you already know that this is gonna be 200 because again, the same how we work with the last rule, the order also matters. So if you wrote this first, fine, this is gonna be displayed. But the moment you're gonna add the same property with a different value, then obviously this is gonna change because this is gonna be the last in the order. Again, I digress a little bit, but I'm gonna be using this as an example, so you might as well get used to it right away. Okay, we have a background repeat. Now, what would be the property? Well, surprise, surprise, this is pretty obvious. It will gonna be background repeat. That's gonna be the property that will gonna control the repetition of the image. Now, again, remember that there's gonna be some things by default. So if I'm gonna write here repeat, and then I'm looking for the values, notice you're gonna have no repeat, repeat, repeat X, round and space. So we're gonna check some of them. I don't see the point of checking actually all of them, but we're gonna start with a very simple one, repeat. Now, what happens with the repeat? Well, nothing happens with the repeat because it is set by default anyway. So again, something to keep an eye on. Then the next value, and this is where the order starts working, where I'm not going to be commenting them out because I might as well write the next one because the next one is going to be affected. Now, in my case, I'm going to write not uh, repeat. I'm going to use no repeat. Check this out. So what happens now only this image is displayed once. So if this is 100 by 100, well, sorry, dude, but this is as much as it's going to cover. Now we can also maybe add some border just to, first of all, refresh what we already learned. So two pixels, solid red. And the second one, just to show you that this is all the space that div would have. But this is how much the background is actually image using. Okay, what do we have next? We have repeat X. Now repeat X is just going to be repeating the image this direction. And again, I know that it's kind of hard to see, but I will going to make this bigger, the browser window, just to show you that even with the bigger images, if the div is going to get bigger right now, in the x direction, the CSS is going to repeat the image. Because as you see, there's one image and there's a second one. Now it was easier to see with the small ones because there was 10,000 of them. But it also is happening with the big images. So don't think that it's only happening with the small images. By default, all of them are going to be right away, the background repeat and set with the value of repeat. What else we have, I digressed already. And you know what, I'm just going to do it the simple way. I'm going to say that I'm going to repeat this line, my meaning copy this line, and then we're going to repeat X. Again, $10,000 to whoever uh, guesses this. And yes, this is going to be X direction. So good job, whoever you were. And then we're going to say Y direction. And again, kind of obvious what's going to be happening. It's going to be repeated in Y direction. And then we also have the space and round. So let me... Copy and paste this. Let's write space. And for the space, what's going to happen is that there is going to be space in between these images. Again, kind of obvious. You can see that there's going to be space in between whatever images are being repeated. And the last one is going to be the round. Now, round is going to make sure that uh, only round images get in there. What do I mean by that? Well, if you notice that if you have the repetition, if it's not going to be able to fit an image, it's basically going to fit like half an image. Now, in order to show you that, let's go to the big one because check this out. So we have big image, but then notice how this is basically like half because notice the basketball post is going to be right here and then it doesn't cover it completely. So the hoop doesn't fit in. Now, what do we do here? Well, we're going to say that we would want to use the same thing. Background. I uh, Okay, I'm gonna forgot already background and why I'm tapping this uh, background not repeat. We're looking Yeah, we are looking for repeat. Uh, what was the value around? Okay, and let's test it out how this is going to happen. Now, in this case, I apologize. 
uh, this is gonna fit only one because what happens? Oh, I'm sorry, two. So basically, by the time it's gonna get to the bigger, if it's gonna be able to fit two, then it's gonna fit nicely too. If it's gonna get smaller, notice now it's gonna fit only one. So if I'm gonna get really big, then if there's gonna be space, it's gonna fit in. I don't know, let's say three, but obviously, in my case, I'm not getting get to three, but in the bottom here, check this out. So we have the second image, but it is not using the whole thing. It the image basically is cut off. So that's what's happening with the last one, which is going to be again background repeat round. Now I'm kind of skipping over these ones because in most cases, I think you are going to be using the no repeat again. It really matters what you're doing, of course, again, and everything. But I think especially in the beginning, you're mostly going to be focusing on this background repeat and setting this to no repeat. I might be wrong, but that's just my opinion. Interesting. But what if I don't want this repetition? What if everything that I'm seeing with background repeat, I don't like it. So I would want some kind of property that would fix the fact that the repetition is happening. Now, again, in order to make this, oh, you know what? I think this is going to be fine for now. Uh, I can just leave them. It doesn't cover too much of my space. I'm going to have to add only two properties anyway. But what's happening is we can use the background size property for this. Now, for the background size, we're going to look at the few options, few values. And the four, first one, the most important one, is going to be background size. And then we're looking for the value of cover. Now, what cover is going to do is regardless of the size of the div, the background image is always going to fill up the div. Now, it's also going to do the same thing, even though the image is really small. Now, you know what? Actually, we're going to delete it. My apologies. Let's do it like this. Let's say background. And just to prove my point, size is going to be cover. Now, what's going to happen is, like I said, I believe in the first video that the actual quality of the image is going to suffer dramatically. See this? We have the first image nicely covers everything as well as the second image nicely covers everything. Now, I'm not going to make this one smaller, or bigger. We might as well go to the bigger browser window and you'll see the same thing. Now we have the first one that the image is cleanly covers everything. And then the second one, which is really distorted because we have picked this small image. Now, the property did its job. It did cover everything. However, this is where you need to be careful. We're not picking to image of the small. Now, we also have an option of contain. So here, let's write background, background again. We had size, background size. And let's say that this is going to be cover. Now with the, I'm sorry, not cover, contain. Uh, with the contain, there's going to be an image. However, if there's not enough space, so this is going to keep the ratio of the image. But if there's not enough space, again, there's going to be repetition. Don't believe me. Let's write background, back ground, background repeat. And let's go with no repeat. And you'll see that only one image is able to fit there uh, while we're still keeping over here this ratio. So that's going to be the difference between two of them. And again, in my most cases, especially in the beginning, I believe you're going to be using this cover in order to nice make nice headers or banners or some kind of parallax effect. You're just going to pick a nice image. You're going to set the background size to the cover. So this is always going to cover and then you're going to be good to go. Brilliant. We know how to work with background size property. So what's next? Then we have the background position. And as you can see, I already did the misspelling. So let me make this correct. And now what we're going to do? Well, here we're going to be changing the position of the background image. And as always, it's just going to be much more easier for us to actually test it out instead of spending three hours talking about it. I will going to do a little bit of spring cleaning, though. I will going to get rid of this background repeat as well as this background size cover for the second one. I also would like to set up background no repeat for the second guy. And we're going to write background repeat. And we're not going to be repeating. Now, here we're going to be testing out pretty much everything on a small one. But once in a while, we're going to check the big one just so we would want to see the differences. And let's say here, background, we're looking for position. And then we have the percentages values, the pixel values. But we also have straight up text. Now, for the text, let's start with the most basic one which is going to be exactly in the center. So if I'm going to write center, notice what happens. Now the background image is sitting in the center. And again, the difference between the small one and the big one is 
that obviously with the small one, we can see where the image is sitting with the big one. The image is still going to be covering the whole div. However, the positioning of the image is going to change now in order to show you that we're going to do background again. We're looking for position and then here we're going to be placing in a center and now pay attention. The moment I'm going to save it, the background image is going to shift a little bit because now this is going to be the center of the image. And again, I'm not going to be testing out on both of them because I already we have an idea. So I'm just going to be testing out with a small one because this is going to be clear where the image is going to be sitting. But just please understand that the same changes would be affected with a big image. However, the difference would be that the big image is still going to be covering the whole div since obviously we have a background size set to cover. Now let me save it and now let's look at the other options and you know what maybe let's leave the center and we're just gonna add background position a few more times so we're gonna say background position and we have an option of bottom so now this is gonna be sitting in the bottom i'm gonna copy this i'm gonna say left so now the image is gonna be left then we have background position and obviously we have an option of right and sure enough this is gonna be sitting in right and then we have the top so background position, and then we're looking at the top one. And sure enough, yeah, it's sitting here exactly on the top. All right, so far, so good. So we have covered the name positioning. And you know what? Maybe let me just make this one smaller because I think we're going to be able to see everything. And now I would like to delete them because, again, you're going to be able to see them very clearly anyway in your text editor if you're looking for suggestions. So let me delete them and let's work right now with percentages. Now, what's happening with percentages, we have an option of working with a Y value and the X value. Now, that is going to be obviously the axis, whether this is going to be X axis and Y axis. Now, in the beginning, we start again by default, and that would be zero, zero. So originally, if I'm going to comment this out, this is going to be a, exactly the same positioning. However, here we can change these positionings. So let me again, I don't know why I'm saving here. And let's say that I would want to place it 20% on the X axis, and then 20% on the Y axis. So how this is going to work? Well, I'm going to say 20%. And the moment I'm going to save it, notice it moved 20% on the X axis. We also have an option, like I said, for the Y axis. So if we're going to go 50%, now this is going to be 50% on the Y axis. And that way we can really manipulate the image however we would like. So if I'm going to go all the way to 100, let's say something like this and something like this this is obviously going to be sitting right up here now i cannot again tell you which exactly properties you're going to be using throughout this course most likely all the time we're going to be settling basically for setting in the center now if you don't like how your image looks in the center obviously just understand that you would need to change the background position and you're going to be good to go all right we have one bad boy left which would be background attachment but for the background attachment, we're going to do a little bit more realistic example. First things first, we would like to get rid of the height as it is right now with 400 pixels. And we're going to say min height instead. So this would probably make sure that even though the content of our div is not, let's say, big enough, 400% of the view height, it always is going to be at least minimal height of 100% view height. Now we can say here view height. And as well as always, you don't have to just use this in view heights. I'm just setting up this with view height. You can use this with the pixels as well. That would be the first thing. Then we're going to get rid of, let's say, color red. And we're going to add some green one. I'm going to say that the color is going to be green. You can also add right away some font size of, let's say, 60 pixels. And now I'd like to place this text in the center. Now, we haven't covered this yet. We haven't covered the flex box. But we were going to use it quickly. Again, don't please hang up on this. We we're going to cover all these properties later on with the values. So for now, just type with me and we're going to place the text in the center. So we're going to say first display is going to be equal to flex. Then we would like to justify content in horizontally. So we're going to write center and align items also in the center. That would work. And this is going to place it exactly in the center. I would probably still want to add the text in the center as well. So I'm going to add text align and text align is going to be in the center. There's a little bit of margins and paddings that we're getting. So maybe why don't we do a quick reset or preset where we add just margin it is going to be zero. Now we have already covered these properties with values. 
padding is also going to be set to zero and box sizing is going to be set to border box and box sizing border box. Once we save it, we have three big containers, each of them having a hundred percent of the view height since we already have covered the view height items. Okay, what's next? Well, we have the background attachment now for the background attachment. Let's maybe also change some few things around because it's going to be much more easier to see once we have the big images. And here the changes are going to be very simple. I would like to have the big JPEG for the third guy for the folder image. And for the small one, I'm going to change this one to the folder image. So I'm going to say here like this. So I would cover this line of code and I'm going to basically cut it out, copy and paste it right here. So now I'm going to have my second one. And then for the third one, I'm also going to get the big JPEG. So I'm going to copy this one. And you know what? We're going to copy and paste it here for the background image. Now, what else we're going to do? Well, we're going to have the uh, background size set to cover. Then we're going to get rid of the repetition and position. So I'm going to say these guys are not going to matter. I'm going to say background and we're going to have size is going to be for all of them cover. And you know what? We can maybe add also no repeat. So let's do like this. Let's copy and paste it. Let's add right here. No repeat. And here this is going to be no repeat. So all three of them are going to be exactly the same. And you know what? What else we can do? Well, position, we can maybe add center. So let's say background position. Position is going to be in the center for all the images. And you know what? Again, let's do the same thing where we can just copy and paste them. So I'm going to copy and paste them now for all my whatever the banners that I have right now, the position is going to be in the center. Now, where does the background attachment comes in? So as I'm scrolling, I can see that I have three massive images and we can see it actually better on a bigger screen where we have the I am the big image. I am the small image and I am the folder image. And all of them are big banners that we will going to later on use usually for our websites. The moment we load. This is going to be the big image that we're going to be loading as a background image. However, we have an option of setting the background attachment. How is background attachment going to do? Well, let's figure out. So for the middle one, because it's going to be easier to see in the beginning, we can just write background. And then we have an option of background attachment. So here we have the scroll and the fixed. So that's what we're looking for. Well, the fixed one is going to make sure that the background image stays fixed while the text is still moving. You want to see that here? This would be the one that doesn't have the fixed. And as I'm scrolling down, check this out. So the second one is going to have the scroll effect, whereas we're moving up and down. We're having this parallax effect where the text is moving, but the image stays actually fit because it, the background attachment property has been set to fixed. We can do the same thing for all of them now that we know how this is going to work. So again, let me select the line. I'm going to copy and paste it. We would want to copy and paste it to the first one as well as to the third one. Now, all of them are going to have it. And now again, we can check it out. So now this is going to be for all of them where we are up and down and the background attachment is going to be fixed. Again, this is going to be something that we're going to be using whenever we're going to load the page. There's going to be big banner image. And as we're scrolling up and down, the actual property is going to be set to fixed. And as a result, we'll be having this parallax effect where the text is going to be moving. However, the background image is going to stay fixed. While we're still on a topic of background images, I would like to cover gradients and CSS. And gradients are very, very cool feature of CSS. But I can tell you right away that there is more to gradients than what we will cover, because we will use gradients for a very specific reason to add overlay for our background images. And if you feel that you would like to research gradients in more detail, you can always utilize external resources. With that being said, what in the world are gradients? We always we're going to start with an example, and this is not going to be different. We were going to get rid of all the heading ones right now, as well as this div, and we're going to create six divs. So we're going to say div, the class is going to be, let's say one, and then we're just going to copy and paste it. So Let's do the second one. And you know what? Let's select all of them right away, all the class values. And we're just going to change it here. Let's delete this. And here, let's say number two, then number three, 
read, and we're looking for the four. Uh, surprise, surprise, this would be five. And then this is going to be box number six. I'm going to save this right now. Then we're going to head over to the CSS. I'm going to select everything and we're just going to delete it. We're going to start very simply by adding some width and height to our, all our divs. So div number one, number two, and all the way up to the six is going to have the width of 150 pixels. Then we're also going to add the, let's say, height of 150 pixels. So let's say height of 150 pixels. And then we would like to set them side by side. So again, we're going to use the property with the value that we're going to cover a little bit later, which we're going to be display flex. And again, don't get hang up on this because this is a very easy thing. We just haven't covered it yet. Okay, what do we have? Well, we have the gradients. How we can start working with the gradients? Well, there's many ways, but in our case, we're going to use the background. I'm going to say that number one is going to have the property of the background. And here we can use the linear gradient. Now for the linear gradient, we have values that we're going to have to input for the colors, as well as the direction. Now direction, again, there's going to be already some default one. So if I'm going to write for number one, red and green, what do you think is going to happen? When I'm going to save it, the gradient is starting from the top, which again would be the default if you're not adding here the positioning. And it gradually changes the color from the red all the way to the green. We can also test it out, let's say, with number two. So let me copy and paste it. Let's say here that I'm going to be selecting the box number two. But for the box number two, I'm going to change the direction of where the color is going. So let's say in this case, I'm going to write two. And then we're looking for the top. Now, the moment we're going to save it, notice this box right now is, in fact, working like the way it should be. Now, you know what? Let me add a little bit more margin. Let me say the margin is going to be, let's say, five pixels. So that's going to be my five pixels. And then, you know what? I shouldn't have added display flex to the div. Should have went to all of them. And here I'm going to say to the body. So my apologies. We're going to head over here. And we're going to say that for the body, we're going to add display flex. Now, technically, you don't have to do it. We're probably going to be able to see six boxes but I just think that it's going to be a little bit easier if they're going to be side by side. So the moment we'll save it. Now, this is how they're going to look like. But you know what? I'm noticing right now that actually the boxes are really small. So maybe let's just leave it without a flex. So I'm going to save it. And then we're just going to see boxes one by one. Again, I did a little bit of a detour, but I think you, we were going to get over that. Uh, OK, so we have red coming all the way to the green, which would be the gradient. And then again, the direction would be the default one from the top to the bottom. But if we change it and if we say to the top and here we can say red, green, again, color is going to start then to the top. So the first color we're going to write is going to start with the bottom and then we're going to go to the top color. We're not limited to adding these two colors. We can add whatever color values you would like. So here I can just say blue, yellow and just keep on typing away again. I can add another 50, but Hopefully you already understand the idea of what's happening is that we are pretty much setting up these values so far. So good. What else we have? Well, then we have number two. Uh, we can add obviously number three. So let's say and you know what? It's probably going to be easier for me to grab this class. Let's add the dot because we're going to be selecting a class. And here we're going to say four. What I would like to show you right now is that we also have an option of working with the, the degrees were not limited only to adding this to the top. We can say that, you know what? No, I didn't want to change the second one. Let me undo it. And let's say instead of red and green, let's write like this. Let's say that we we're going to be looking for degrees and 150 degrees. So let's see how this is going to look like. I'm going to save it. And now what's happening is I obviously did not the color. So let's say number three, and this needs to be right after that. And now it, I see that I'm having it from the 150 degrees. So it's starting from, let's say, red, and then goes all the way to the green. Now, if we're going to change it, let's say 315. Again, this is changing where the colors is starting. Again, nothing really fancy. You're just changing of the direction of your gradient. We also have an option of adding this by letters. So in this case, if we were going to copy and paste it, 
and you know what? Let me select properly these lines. Let's say I'm gonna say these guys, and again, talking and typing is not gonna be my strong suit at the moment. We're gonna copy and paste it. Let's say we're gonna change this one to number four, four, and here let's change it from the degrees, let's say to the top left. So we can say two top and left again. This would start with red, then green, and then would all go all the way up to the top left. Now, if you want to the top right, you can write to the top right. So now it starts here, and we end up here with a green one all the way on the right hand side. And hopefully, you understand that by changing these directions, we are changing where the linear gradient is going to start and where this is ending up. Now, in our case, what we are going to be doing, we're going to be doing this for the overlays. And we're going to see that in the next video with a very, very clear example. But I would just want to show you two more things that we are not limited again to the color names. We can use whatever color values we would like. So let's test it out. Let's say that we're going to be looking for number five. Then again, we're going to have the background, say background, then we're having a linear gradient. And here, instead of using the color names, we can also use the hex values. But what we were going to do a lot is going to be with RGBA. Now, the reason for this RGBA is going to be much more clear in the next video. I'm going to be covering the actual background image. But for now, let's just test it out. Now, we remember for the background image is what we had. I'm sorry for the RGBA, what we had. Well, we had the values. So red, green and blue. And then we were looking for the opacity or the transparency. So let's say if I'm going to start with 0 0.3 transparency, this is not going to be more towards the black, it's going to be more towards the white. Because if I'm going to go with total zero, this is going to be in white. And here the opposite would be the fact that if I'm going with zero, zero, and here the last one is also going to be, let's say 0 0.9. So let me add the comma, and then we're going to have 0 0.9. Now what's happening right now is nothing. Uh, because I probably have some kind of uh, mistake. And sure enough, I do, because I have here one zero. Okay, so so far, so good. And then I also have one extra zero because there should be only four values total and I have five. So once I add it, since the direction is the default one where it starts basically uh, from the top to the bottom. And actually, to quickly show you, uh, the default one would be like this. So if we're going to write to the bottom, nothing is going to change because that would be the default one. So once we're going to save it again, notice we're starting from the top and we go to the bottom. Again, as always, we have the default values and this pretty much is going to be one of them. And here I would like to work with the RGBA. So that's the reason why we start by 0 0.3. So this is kind of transparent and we go all the way to 0 0.9, which is almost almost black. Now for the six, we can do the same thing. We're just going to test it out with a to the left just to see that this for sure is going to work. So let me copy and paste it. Let's say, let's say here, we're looking for six, so dot six, and then add, let's just add here, I don't know, to the left or to the right, it doesn't ma really matter. So we can say to the left, and now we have the initial color starts here with 0 0.3, and then it goes to the black one, which is going to be on the left hand side. At this point, we can have a look how we can combine gradients with background images. And as a side note, I purposely delete the previous lectures and recreate a new HTML content almost each and every time, because while it might seem like a waste of time, I think it helps us with our muscle memory, where we can get comfortable with typing HTML as well as CSS. I mean, I might be wrong, but that is my reasoning behind it. So what we're going to build right now? Well, like I said, we will going to delete everything that we created before, just so we can get comfortable by typing HTML and CSS, as well as we can get rid of these guys. There's going to be new divs. And for the new divs, we're going to have two of them. Uh, the first one is going to be just a, let's say, simple div, which is going to say hello world. And for this one, let's call this one, I don't know, class and banner. And now we can copy and paste this. And let's say that there's going to be another div, which we're going to have the class of header, as well as this is going to say hello, uh, people. Again, not too original, but I think this is going to do so far. So good. We have two divs. What are we going to have here within our style CSS? 
um, we can first start by selecting the both of the divs and set up the mean height. So I'm going to say for both divs, we would want to have the mean height of, let's say, 100 view heights. This should be looking really good. Then we're looking for the background images. So I would like to place background images on both of them. And you know what? No, let's first add it in the center again. We haven't covered this technically, but we're going to say uh, display flex. So display should be flex. After that, we have align items in the center. So this is going to place it the vertical in the center. And let me get rid of this guy. And justify content is also going to be center as well as text align should be in the center. So in this case, we're going to be placing everything in the center. So the text is going to be in the center. And you know what? Let's add font size again with 60 pixels and color. I don't know. Maybe let's try something else. So what we're going to have for the color, we're going to get, I don't know, orange, something like this should work and fine. We will save it. And what are we going to have next? Now we would like to start working with a banner, let's say. So I'm going to say for the banner, we already know that we have an option of background. Now for the background, we know that we can use the image. And now let's again use both of the big images. So I'm going to say big JPEG here. Now let me add maybe the quotation marks and proper path here. Let's say I'm going to be looking for the big JPEG. I'm going to save it. And we already know that we need to add a few more properties because for now, this is not going to be working out really well. So we're going to say like this, we're going to say starting with background and we're looking for what? Well, we're looking for a uh, repeat or maybe let's start with a uh, size. Let's say size is going to be first. We're going to be covering. So the size should cover. Then what else we had? And you know what? Let's get rid of that quotation mark. We'll save it. So now the size is covering. And we also had background repeat. Let's say no repeat. And uh, position is going to be center. Background positioning is going to be in the center. So, so far, so good. And what else we're having? Well, I think the last one was what? The attachment, right? So we had background attachment, and this is going to be fixed. Awesome. We have our setup with the banner. Now, what's next? Well, now I'd like to show you how we can work with linear gradients and what kind of issue we would be solving. And you know what? I know that this is going to be weird, but this is a little bit bugging me, these margins here. So again, let's do that little thing what we did with the uh, rest of the elements. So we said all the elements. It's going to have some margin of zero, padding of zero, and the box sizing is going to be equal to, let's say, border box. So now I'm going to get rid of these margins. Okay. And the issue that linear gradient is going to solve is the fact that right now, if you're saying, if you have an image, you wouldn't be, in some cases, able to see the text. So let's say, in our case, we technically could see the text. But I think that if the image would be any brighter, it's going to be much more hard to see the text. So the solution we can do is we can place an overlay using the linear gradient. So how this is going to work out? Well, I'm going to show you this. However, I'm going to show you this on the second one on the header, just so we can see the difference, first of all. And I'm also going to show you how we can shortcut this, because you're probably looking at this and you're like, well, this is really annoying. We're technically really typing four properties here with the values. So isn't there a shorter way how we can do that? And since it is CSS, yes, there is a shorter way. So in this case, we're going to say header. So I'm going to say we're going to start looking for the header. So that would be our, my first thing. Again, let me set up a nice curly braces. And then what I would want for the header. Well, I'm going to start the same thing. But instead of right away going with an image, we have an option of adding the linear gradient. So let's start here. Let's say that there's going to be a linear gradient. And now I'd like to decide on a color. Now, well, what kind of colors we can have? I guess we can start with maybe black one. Maybe this is going to make this image less bright. So we know that we can have RGBA then we need to have the comma. So that would be the proper syntax. And again, another RGBA. Before that, before all the examples, I was using one color. And then there was some second color. However, if I would want, let's say, everything to be in the same color, I can just add the same color. So I can say 0, 0, 0. So that would be my black one. And the linear gradient here is going to be 0 0.5. And I can do the same thing here. I can say 0, again, comma, 0. And let me make this properly zero. Then that is going to be my third zero, I believe. And then I'm adding my fourth one. 
0 0.5. Now let me check. Yeah, I have five. No, again, I have one extra zero because this is technically wrapping here. So now let me save it. And now I have my gray color because obviously this is exactly the same where I'm having my RGBA one value as well as the second value is exactly the same. So this is the reason why this is not starting from somewhere and ending somewhere. Well, technically it is right behind the scenes. We're starting from the top, but we're ending with the bottom because we haven't set any kind of direction. But since this is the same color, everything's looks the same. Everything is unison. Now, if I'm going to change this and if I'm going to say 0 0.1, notice that right now it's going to starting from the top where this will going to be bright. And then we're heading over here where this would be darker. But again, I would want it to be the same. Once we have added successfully our linear gradient, well, now what? Well, now we're going to work with our image. So we're going to be looking for the image. However, this is important that we're adding here this comma. Please don't omit the comma. And then you're going to be looking for the mistake because there will going to be a syntax error. And here we're going to say URL, since this is where we're going to be looking for the images. Now I'm going to look for either the folder or we can maybe look for the same image just so we can see the difference. I think that would be actually better because that way we can see one image is not going to have the linear gradient and the second one that would have the linear gradient. Now the image again was big JPEG. So forward slash, then we're looking for the big JPEG. And now we're going to have the image. Now the question would be, you would say, well, first of all, you can right away see the difference. So we have one that's going to have no overlay. And the second one where the text is much more clear because we have added the overlay. Now, this obviously is not some kind of set overlay that you always need to use. You can use whatever color you would like, like I said before. But in my case, I'm just showing you with this kind of value just to show you that it is darker. And again, this is really up to you. If you want to use the yellow color as overlay, you can use the yellow color. Sometimes we're going to do something like this, where we have the, uh, let's say, logo, and then we're using the same overlay for this picture. So it doesn't have to be black or white again. And that's the reason why you have these RGBA values. Now, lastly, I would want to show you is how we can shorten this, because for now you would be thinking, OK, so I have all this. I have the URL. Everything is working really well, meaning the image. But I still need to add the cover, no repeat center and all that, because right now I have two images. So I'd like to fix that. Now we can technically write this all out and there's nothing wrong with that, but we have a shorter way. So here we can write that the image is going to be always in the center because we have the position of center. And you know what? Maybe let me kind of put them in order how I'm putting them here. So we have the center. Then we're going to have forward slash and the cover. So we can use this. And then we would need to write what we would like to do. So we're going to say no repeat. And this is going to be fixed here like this. And what happens? Well, we have added all these properties without writing actually the properties just by adding the values. Now, be careful here. You can change this order. So let's say I could say no fixed and then I'm going to write no repeat. So this is going to work fine. However, don't mix these two up. Don't say it like this. Don't say cover and then center because notice what's going to happen. Well, the image is not going to be showing. So these two guys, if you're writing them, just make sure that you write center. Then we have forward slash. And then we're using the color. And that way, you know for sure that your image is always going to be shown. So this is basically how this is going to look like. Let me make save. And I think it looks awesome. I think it looks really good. And now I can see the text much more clear. All right. We know the basics about the linear gradients. How about we check it out some external resources that are going to help us tremendously as we're working with linear gradients. So we're going to head over to our good gold friend, Google, and then I'm going to write not learn. I'm going to say uh, CSS linear gradient generator. So that's going to be my text. Now, the moment we type that surprise, surprise, this is what we're going to be getting in our search. And we're going to be looking for this CSS gradient generator from the colorzilla. Now, what's really cool about this is that we can come up with whatever colors we would like and we can really set up our gradient and they were going to spit out back the code. And we just need to copy and paste it into our browser, meaning I'm sorry, into our text editor. Now you'll see a lot of mumbo jumbo here. And the reason for that is we're not going to cover this right now, but there's something called uh, browser prefixes and don't worry about them right now. Again, only thing you will need to do is just grab this code and copy and paste it. And everything is going to be working fine in our project. 
well, later on towards the end of the CSS tutorial, before we start working on the projects, we're just going to take a look at what are the browser prefixes and why we'd want to use them. But for now, probably don't pay too much of attention over here. And I know there's a lot of code in here, but just keep in mind that you only need to copy and paste it and you're good to go. Now, first, let's say we can choose whatever direction this is going to be or orientation, horizontal, vertical, diagonal, radial, doesn't really matter. Let's go with a horizontal. Then also we can choose the color format. Now we can go with hex or we can go with RGBA. Now I can tell you right away, even though you're going to choose the hex color, however, if you're going to start changing the opacity, what's going to happen is we were going to automatically switch to RGBA. So just because you picked hex, if you're going to, let's say, change the opacity or transparency, then the format is automatically going to be RGBA. Now, let's say this would be the hex color. So what kind of color we would like? Again, we click on this box here. We just click here. Let's say we would want to go with the red one. You want to change the opacity. Here you go. We can change the opacity. We can say that, I don't know, the opacity is going to be something like this. And again, we can clip it here. So that would do the same thing where I'm changing the opacity. So now this is going to be a little bit more transparent Then the same thing I can do over here. Let's go here, maybe with the green one. And this is not what I want. Uh, I would want to click over here. And then I'm going to say, I don't know that I'm going to be picking something like this. So that's pretty much going to be my uh, transparency right here. And then also, if you want to change something here, let's say color, you want to remove this color, just delete it. So just say here that this dot just delete it. So we got rid of this color. You want to get delete this color, we can delete this color. So now we're getting this RGBA. You want to add one more color. Let's say you change your mind. And as you're hovering, notice we can just click it here. This is going to add the plus sign. And let's say that this is going to be my color. Now I'm not going to show you each and every possible option. I will understand that this gives you a lot of flexibility. So like I said, what we would need to do is just grab this code that we have. And again, we can. there's many ways how we can copy this. But for me, I'm just going to select this all. We can copy. And I'm going to head over back to index HTML. I'm going to call this div. I don't know color Zilla just so we can see that color Zilla. Hopefully this is how they were spelling ultimate color Zilla. Yeah, I think that's going to be fine. And then we'll save the style CSS as well as we're just going to have the color Zilla. And you know what? Let's do it like this. Let's just copy and paste it and see how this is going to work like. So if I'm going to save it. Sure enough, this is going to be my div and I have everything working with my gradients. So we have successfully copy and pasted. Now, if you want to change the direction, you can always change the direction and so on and so forth. So if you don't want to let change just settle for the basic colors that we're picking only two colors, you can always head over to Colorzilla and pick whatever gradient you would like. Brilliant. We're covering CSS properties like there's no tomorrow. And next on the list, we have float, clear, position property, media queries for responsive design, Z index to control the Z axis, and before and after pseudo elements. Right off the bat, I can tell you that if you don't grasp any or all the properties slash topics we cover, don't panic or get discouraged. We will use all of them in the project. So I'm more than 100% positive that if some things might be unclear, they will crystallize in the project setting. I do want you to get at least a general feel for them. So here it goes. All right. First on our agenda is going to be the flow property. We're going to start very simply by creating some kind of div. You can actually give it a class. Let's say class again is going to be something like banner. Then within the banner, we're going to place our image and we're going to go with our small one. So let's say source. We're looking for small. That's going to be the image name. And then let's write, I don't know, whatever, some kind of alternative. So small image. And by the way, I know that I have been avoiding alternatives all the time. So that's probably something we should always add. What was in the small image? Just to double check. So we had some kind of mountains. Let's say that this is going to be nice view. That's going to be our text. So nice view. Okay, so far, so good. And once I save it, obviously, this is going to be my image. Now, what else I would like here? Well, I'm going to say paragraph and for the paragraph, I don't know, 50 words that should do. I'm going to save it. So now we have the paragraph. Okay. We already know that the reason why we're having the margins here and the reason why we're starting a new line is because paragraph is block level element. But let me throw you a mind grenade. 
I'm gonna head over back to style CSS. First, we're gonna select banner, and then for the banner, I would like to have just some kind of border. And the border is going to be five pixels solid. And as always, I'm going to go with the red and let me add maybe a little bit of padding. Let's say padding is going to be 10 pixels all around. Now, what happens if we use the float property? Well, I can just say for the image, since I have one image that I would like to float it and I can just say float. And then we're looking for a few options here. Let me get my suggestions again. Let's say float. And the float we have left, we have right, and we have none. Now you would be tempted to say that this is already floated to the left because what's happening is that image is already floated to the left. However, by default, we have for all of them none. Now, do you want me to prove that? What happens here? So I'm going to save it floated to the left. Now, check this out. Even though the paragraph is supposed to be a block level element where this is starting a new line. Right now, we took the element out, in our case image, out of the normal flow. So now the paragraph is actually wrapping around. Now, if we don't want this look, then we would need to go for what? Well, we have an option of clear. So for the paragraph, I would say that I would want to use the clear. And then I have a few options. I can have clear both. So in that case, if there's going to be, let's say, two elements that have been one floated to the left and one to the right, or I'm going to be looking for the actual flow direction. So in this case, if I floated to the left, I would need to write that I would want to clear it also on the left hand side. So now I'm having back again, the look that I had before, where the paragraph was actually respecting the fact that it was starting a new line. Now, if I'm going to make him, let's say mistake and write that I would want to clear it from the right. Notice again, this is not going to work. Well, in this case, this is not going to work because I wrote it incorrectly, this should be G H T. But still, what's happening is that even though I use the clear property, my value was incorrect. So that's something you need to remember that if you're floating something, let's say, in one direction, if you want the next element to clear it and start normal flow of document like it should be, you also need to use the right or left property. In our case, that would be the left. So now we have the paragraph. That is actually respecting that it needs to start a new line, just like it should be. Now, so let's test it out with a right one. Let's say that I'm going to be looking on a right. And again, same thing happens is because we're using for the clear left. So now the paragraph actually goes up. So if I'm going to, again, use the right, that would be the correct one. Notice, again, we're going to be starting a new line. What else will happen? When we have an option of, like I said, if there's going to be, let's say, two of them, we can use something like both. Now, where we would do that, I don't know. We can head over to index HTML and we can copy and paste this image. Again, there's going to be two small images. Now, one is going to be, let's say, with a class of first, just to show you kind of how everything would work. We're going to add a class. This is going to be one. And this is going to be number two. Now, what's going to happen right now? Well, both of them, first of all, are going to be floated to the left side by side, or I'm sorry, to the light because we added float, right? But in my case, now we want to use the class of one. So I'm going to say that only the first one is going to be floated to the right. And then this guy is going to stay. So everything is working fine. However, if I'm going to say two, and also I'm going to float it to the left. So float it to the left. Now, again, the reason why we have normal everything because if we have clear both. But if I would write just clear, right? Notice where our text is going to be sitting right now. So, right. And now my text is sitting exactly in the middle because even though the, it is avoiding the actual one that we have on the right hand side, it's not avoiding the left one. Well, you might say this is not true. Now I can see we're starting a new line. Okay. What if I go here on a number two and let's say that the height is going to be 300. What is going to happen right now? Now my image is really big. So even though we're starting here, new line, because there is the one on the right, the left one is still not being taken care of. So in this case, if we would want to avoid that, we would say clear both. And now we finally have our paragraph where we have as a normal next element. Now it's really up to you. If you want to float it to the left and have paragraph side by side, that is also an option. Just to quickly show you though, if we're going to go bigger, with this image right now, 
if let's say I'm gonna go with thousand is gonna be my height. Notice that this is pretty much really gonna be big and it's gonna leave actually also my dip. So what would be the suggestion how we can fix that? Well, we have an option here of overflow and hitting. So that way the image, whenever it's gonna be getting too big for the parent div, we can use this overflow with the value of hidden. And now at least the image is gonna stay within the bounds of this div. Now, again, this was a little bit too drastic. Let's say 300. And you know what? I can just get rid of the second one just to show you how we can do them side by side. So let's say there's not going to be any more in the second one. And now we will going to imagine the scenario where we want them side by side. So we like to look how everything looks. Okay, so we have floated here this one to the left. So this was fine. Or you know what? To the right. We can delete the second one. We don't need it anymore. And we also don't need the clear property. Let's say that this is exactly how we would want. We would want them side by side. Now, what we can always do nicely is to have some kind of margins. So for number one, I can say margin. And let's say margin left is going to be, I don't know, 50 pixels. So that way I can get more margins in between them if that's something that you would like. And that's in general how we're going to work with a floats. Just to give you a taste of what we're going to be doing in a project, why don't we make a three column layout with divs and with floats? Now, in index and HTML, we're going to create, first of all, we're going to get rid of this closing div. I don't want that. And you know what? Let me make this a little bit smaller for now. And let's write that there's going to be a div. Now, the div is going to have some kind of class. So I'm going to say class of one. And maybe we can add some text here. I don't know, 10 words. This is going to be good enough. Now, I'm going to copy and paste this two more times. And I'm going to change these class names. I'm going to say this is not going to be number one. Instead, we're going to be looking for number two. That's going to be my name. And the third one is going to be number three. Again, very, very original. I'm going to head over back to my CSS. And just because this is a little bit annoying to me, the default ones that come with, because I would like to show you how the three column layout is going to come. Uh, I'm going to do a reset again, where I'm just going to say margin is going to be equal to zero. Padding is going to be equal again to zero and border box is going to be equal to a box sizing border. I'm sorry. It was box sizing box, it's not shadow. We haven't covered that one yet. And border box. Again, it might be an overkill in general for the small examples that we're doing, but I just like to show you a correct three column layout and otherwise it's not going to good. I look good as good as I want. Okay, so let's start with the class number one. Let's say that for the class number one, we're first of all gonna float it to the left. Now, again, we noticed already that something is happening because our layout changed, but I think it's gonna be easier to show you background. Now, background attachment is something we covered, but I don't want it. I'm gonna say background is gonna be red. And what else I would want? Well, maybe let's add some height of, I don't know, 200 pixels. So that's gonna be my first thing. And now let's add some width. So I already have floated to the left. And since I want three column layout, since I have three divs, I'm going to set with with percentages. Now, you don't have to do this as 33. If you have four divs, then you use for 25 percent, if five divs, 20 percent and so on and so forth. And there's no rule that you have to use this kind of percentages. The only reason why I'm doing this is because I have three column layout. So I know that I need to divide 100 percent by three. And this is going to be the closest one that I want. Okay, what else I have? Well, I believe I had the div number two. So I'm going to say here class was number two. And obviously, we can head it over here and say for the div, all of them are going to be floated to the left. I am copying pasting a little bit too much, meaning I'm repeating the same things. But just so we are on the same page, let's work one by one. And here again, we're going to say the same thing. So this is going to be my second one. And you already have guessed it that if I would want the third one, I would again need to do something like this, where this is going to be number three. And let's do this one as a green one. So let me delete this. This is going to be number three. And then we're going to use the green. So this is going to be something we're going to be doing in a project. Now we're going to be doing a little bit more sophisticated, not with red, blue, and green and all that. But the general idea would be that if you want some kind of column layouts, we're going to be using the floating one. And just to tell you that why this was technically incorrect, because I was repeating 
the actual properties with values. I didn't have to do that since all of them is going to have the let's say height here with 200 pixels. I could have just done something like this. So if I'm going to cut this out, then I'm going to also cut it out. These guys, let's say like this. Now I'm floating all of them. So all the divs now, obviously, if you're going to be adding more divs, this is going to mess up. But since in our case, we just have three divs, I can just use this element selector. And then what else we can do? Well, we can get rid of all of them. So I can just say here that for each and one of them, the only that I would be interested is in fact the background. Now that way, again, notice when the moment I'm saving, nothing changes, everything, nothing breaks. I still have my three column layout. Now, the reason for that is because I know I have all the divs. So I added for all of them left and then some type of height. Now you're not limited. I can just say something like this here and just say that the height is going to be, I don't know, 400. So I'm still going to have the 400 height. Now my columns are going to be bigger. And regardless of the screen size, I'm still going to have three column layout. I do want to mention, though, that we do need to work with clear. So in my case, what if I'm going to say heading one with a simple hello world? I save it. Okay. Everything is looking fine. So technically we have cleared the ship and we have three column layout and we do have over here right now our heading one. But we know that if we're going to go and let's say add one more div, then this is not going to be the layout that we're looking for. So we're going to go here and now the heading one is going to be sitting actually side by side because again, we do have the property for the clearing them. So in my case, I would want to say heading one and you're going to have the clear and the option would be, I guess the best case scenario would be both. Now I know in this case, this might look like a unnecessary example. You could say, well, the heading one was still fine order. And then there's going to be cases if you're using with floats and by the way, I want to let you know that in most cases you're going to use at this point already probably a flexbox. I do want to cover floats though, and we will going to do the project with the floats because I think it's important for you to know the floats. But whenever you're using the floats, you do need to start practicing of the fact that whenever is going to be coming after something that you're floating, you're adding this clear property. Otherwise, there's going to be cases where you're looking for mistakes and it's really hard to find. And that's why this is the easiest way where you right away use the clear property. And again, you can set it to the left. You can set it whatever direction you want, but or you can use the both, which in that case, at least you're making sure that whatever direction you're floating, this is going to be working fine. But I would suggest using the property right away, just in case you don't run into some kind of mistakes later on. Moving on, we're going to talk about positions, whether that's going to be static, whether that's going to be fixed. We also have relative and absolute. Now, the first one is going to be static, but to tell you honestly, most of the this video, we're going to do the setup for the next positions because the static is going to be by default and there's going to be nothing really exciting about that position value. Now, what I would want to do is I'm going to get rid of this div. I'm going to say there's going to be another div, just a simple div. Then let's add a two paragraphs with, let's say, I don't know, 40 words here, or maybe, you know what, that was an overkill. I think 20 is going to be fine. I can just save it. So this is going to be my paragraph. Then for this guy, I'm going to add class of one. Then I'm going to do exactly the same with the next one, where the class is going to be number two. I think that's going to be sufficient enough. And then within this paragraph, let me add the span. I can tell you right away, though, that again, the span is not special. The positioning we're going to use is going to be special, but it's going to work with any kind of element. In my case, I'm using span as an example, but you can use anything. And here I'm going to say I am or hey, I am. So hey, buddy, I am uh, absolute. Now, at this moment, he's not or she's not absolute at all. But later on, we're going to make it absolute. And let's say class is going to be special. So this is going to be our special kid. We have the hey, I'm absolute. So what do we have in CSS? Let's start with the div. The div is going to be border. And I have a warning for you in this video or next following videos. The coloring is not going to be the most exciting one. It's going to be actually quite hideous, but hopefully we're going to be able to get through this. Let's do background yellow. And 
my hope was is that it would help you at least understand the general idea, but we'll see. Maybe it's gonna be the opposite. Maybe you'll be like, well, this doesn't make sense at all. So I don't know. We'll see. We'll have margin top right away. Again, this is gonna make a little bit more sense later on. So I have the div. It has some margin top. And you know what? I'm gonna add more. I'm gonna say 40 pixels. Then what else I have? Well, I have two paragraphs. Now for the one, I'm gonna do a uh, not padding. Background is gonna be blue. So that's my one. Then I'm also going to select it and I'm going to select it properly. I'm going to say, oh, you know what? I deleted it. I'm going to say that I'm selecting this guy. We are copying pasting for number two. I don't know. We can do maybe number two is going to be, I don't know what, what we could do. Green. What do you think? Yeah, I think green is going to be fine. Okay. So we have number two and then we have the class of special. Now, for the class of special, let's just add, I don't know, background. And I choose something like this, light coral, which is, again, going to be very, very uh, hideous. But we're going to live with that font size. I don't know, 20 pixels, something like this. So this is going to be my span. Like I said, position static is very, very boring because all the elements, again, by default, just have this position static. What position static means in general that... If I added this class with a par, I'm sorry, paragraph with a class of number two after the paragraph with a class of one, this is how it's going to be displayed. So that's going to be exactly our normal flow of document. So if I'm having here the span, let's say after the text, then this is going to be displayed after text. Now, where would you use the position of static? Well, similarly, remember how we had the text align property. So if I had, let's say, text align of all of them right if i would want some of them just to be a normal one i used to use a text and then we use text align left now in general by default all of them were and this is obviously a mistake all of them were text aligned to the left but if you set the parent to some kind of let's say text align right then you use this default one well the same with the position static if you're going to use some kind of different positioning for the parent then if you would want some other one within that parent to have the normal positioning with the static, then you would use position static. Otherwise, you can write it here. I can say position, and I'm not going to use relative. I'm going to use static. You'll notice that nothing is going to change because by default, all of them having this position static. So that's the reason why everything stays the same. Thankfully, position relative is much more exciting than the position static. And maybe we can test it out. So we have right now maybe the the class of one. So we have a div with a class of one. Man, we can, I think, work on this guy. So let's say we have position, and we already know that we have an option for the static. Now, the moment we save it with position relative, you notice nothing changes. So we might be tempted to say, okay, so it's pretty much like... Static. However, you would be a tiny bit wrong because with a position relative, what we can do is we can set it relative to its normal position. So whenever it was sitting normally in the flow, we can actually adjust that. Now we can do that with four properties. And the first one is going to be top. So let's say relative to a top where it was sitting. So in our case, what we can do, we can say, I don't know, for example, 50 pixels. So what happens is I moved it 50 pixels away from where it was sitting relatively with its normal position. So now it's sitting basically 50% or I'm sorry, 50 pixels down. Now we can use multiple values here. We can say, let's say maybe REMs. So for the left one, I'm going to use like 20 REMs. So not only we're we going to place it 50 pixels down relative to where it was normally, also we we're going to do 20 REMs left from where it was sitting relatively. Now, since I would like to use multiple values, I'm going to say, I don't know, right is going to be now, I don't know, 50%. And obviously, this is going to be more. So now we are also using this top one. So maybe that wouldn't be the best example where we have already left one, and then we're using the right one. So why don't we do this? Why don't we comment this out? And now we're going to move it to the right. So now this way, we're pushing it relatively to where it was sitting normally, 50% uh, from the right. Now also we have the bottom. So we could push it from the bottom. And again, we're going to do the same thing where top is going to be commented out. 
and then we're gonna work with the bottom. And for the bottom, I don't know, we had REMs, we had percent. I guess we can again do the pixels, it doesn't really matter. So I can just say 200 pixels, and now we pretty much moved it away from the screen. So maybe let's not be that drastic. We can also do 20 pixels, and now we just move 20 pixels relative of where it was sitting up because moved it 20 pixels from the bottom. And that's how we can work with position relative in the CSS. Hey, okay, if you thought that position relative was somewhat fun, wait till you meet position absolute, which is, in my opinion, a real rock star in the CSS. What do I mean by that? Well, let's take a closer look. First, I would like to get rid of this relative, or we can just delete it maybe altogether. Later on, actually, throughout this video, we're going to add it back. But for now, just to show you how everything is going to work, I will going to delete this position relative. Where does position absolute come into play? First, I'm going to go to the special one, since this was the reason why we added it. And then let's say position here, since this is our option, position. And then for position, we're not going to go with the relative. Well, we're going to go for absolute. Now, once we save it, notice what happens. Already, we're having some interesting changes. Okay, so far, so good. So what's happening? Well, with position absolute, we're also placing this position relative. However, this position relative to the nearest ancestor that has the position relative. Now, if position absolute cannot find that ancestor, if it doesn't exist, then it places itself relative to the body. Now, if you're checking here in the index HTML, how many ancestors does this span has? Well, it has the first one, the parent with a class of number two. Then it has the div, which is the second one. And then since none of them have position relative, then it looks for the body. Now you don't believe me. Let's test it out. So here we're going to write top since again, these are our properties for the manipulation of the position. And let's say for the top is going to be zero because we can add any kind of value and we can also add zero. So let's say top zero and right is also going to be zero. And let's see what's going to happen. And what happened? Well, the absolute special. So the special class with position absolute moved all the way to the top right corner of the body. Because like I said, if there's gonna, not going to be an ancestor that basically is going to work as a position relative, then we're not going to be able to capture that. You want me to show you? Okay. So if index HTML, I had position number two or class number two for the paragraph. If we're going to head over back to the CSS and if we're going to write position, and in this case, this is going to be relative, notice what's going to happen. So now this span with a class of special is going to be sitting in the same position with position absolute and top right corner zero zero. However, this is going to happen within this paragraph with a class of two. And the reason for that, because we added this class of relative, or I'm sorry, we added the position of relative. Now, what's going to happen if I'm going to remove it again, it's going to go back to the body. Well, we can also test it out on a div. Let's do the same thing. We're going to say that the position is not going to be static. Instead of we're going to change it. And I was going to say that this is going to be relative. So now this is sitting zero and zero. However, within a div. Now, nothing is going to happen if we're going to place here the position relative in one, because what we need is the actual ancestor. In this case, this is just going to be a sibling for the class of number two paragraph. This is not going to be an ancestor for this class of special. So that's the reason where whenever we place something with a position absolute, if we don't want it to be placed relative to the body, we need to have some kind of parent element or ancestor element that's going to have a class of relative, or I'm sorry, the position of relative. And just to show you that we can actually place it in the body again, wherever we would like. First of all, let me change it. I don't know, 50% here, let's say 50% top and 50% bottom, or I'm sorry, right? So this is going to place it somewhere here. And you can see that there's one thing missing. And that one thing is the fact that we haven't looked at a transform property yet. And we will going to look sooner because at the moment you can say, well, it's technically not sitting in the center. And that is correct because we would need to shift a little bit the position of this element. However, this is close enough for the center for us just to show you that we can use any kind of values, whether this is going to be percentages, whether this is going to be pixel, 
again, really anything you would like. And then like this time, I can just remove the relative and you'll see that this is going to be sitting pretty much all the way in the center here of the body. Because again, there is no ancestor that does have this position relative. So this is not placed relative to those ancestors. Now, one thing, though, in the next video, we're going to be looking at position fixed. In this case, if you place it here with this position top, let's say 50 50, this is going to disappear as we're scrolling. So if we're going to be adding more elements here and as it was going to be scrolling down, this element with a class of special is actually going to disappear as we're scrolling. So it's going to be scrollable. However, with position fixed, what's going to happen is that the element is going to stay. So even though we're placing right now relative to the body, this is not going to stay on a page as we're scrolling down. Last but not least, we have position fixed, which in a lot of cases we use for navigation buttons or maybe for navigations. Again, it's not exclusive, but that's probably where we're going to see it the most. And for this, we're going to head over back to index HTML. Then I'm going to add, I don't know, some more paragraph with massive amount of text just because we would need to scroll. So let's say paragraph and I don't know, 500 words is going to be here. Massive paragraph. And then at the very bottom, just to show you that this is actually working, we're going to create a button. Now, the button is going to be very simple. Again, whatever button type is going to be button for the type. And here we can just say nav button again. This is not going to be really nav button, but it's just going to do the job. I'm going to save it. There's going to be my nav button. And this is you know what? This is not actually big enough. Because I'm not, I cannot do any kind of scrolling here. So let's do one more thing. Let's write another paragraph. In this case, let's try maybe for 5,000 words. <laughs> Lorem, and for some reason I cannot write it. So we're going to test it for 5,000 words. I'm going to save it. Now what happens? Well, nothing happens really. Because again, let on. Oh, so now I refreshed and now it's working. So I have long, long, long text here. Hopefully you can see that I'm doing a lot of scrolling right now. And all the way in the bottom, I have this for nav button here, all the way in the bottom here. Okay, now what I would like to is to show you how the position fix is going to work. So I'm going to head over again, and I don't really need this text, meaning I can head over back to styles. I don't need to scroll up in the HTML. And I would like to first of all change the comment. This is going to be position fixed. And now let's work with our button. So here, let's say all the way in the top, we're going to have our button. And what do we can? We have background. I don't know. It's going to be red. So sure enough, it's going to be red. The font size is going to be bigger, just so we can see what's happening. So 40 pixels. And maybe let's add the coloring of white, not counter reset. I don't want that. Color white people. This is what we want. So this would be our nav button. Now we can click this obviously all day long and nothing is going to happen because we haven't hooked up the JavaScript. But for this, we just need position fixed. And what I would like to do is set it up here all the way on the top. And as I'm scrolling, it should be sitting. And for this, we have position and we have position fixed. Now, the way the position fixed is going to work is this is going to be set relative. But in this case, this would be set relative to the actual document. So in the beginning, notice it totally disappeared. So we have position fixed, but we cannot find our button. And as you're scrolling down, it's not there. As you're scrolling up, it's also not there. And in order again to see it, we would need to set it relative. Now, in this case, we're setting relative this to the document. And as we're going to be scrolling, it's going to be sitting here fixed. That's the reason why it has name position fixed. So let's say here, uh, zero, zero, first. Let's say right is also going to be zero. And what do we have? So now I have my nav button. So as I'm scrolling up and down, then this is going to be sitting. And again, we can see the nav. Now I'm not going to show you the other properties with values where we had top, right, left, bottom. I mean, you can explore that on your own. But in general terms, this is how the position fixed would work, where if you set something with position fixed, it's going to be relative right now to the document. So all the document that we're working on. But as you're scrolling, it's going to stay in that position. Excellent. Our CSS journey finally has led us to media queries. And the reason why media queries are so, so cool in the CSS is because they allow us to work with responsive design. And in a nutshell, they allow us to style elements 
depending on a screen size. So we can have different styles on different screen sizes. And with the projects, there's obviously going to be more complicated examples with column sizes and all kinds of things. However, for now, I would just want to show you the basic example where there's going to be a div and we're just going to work with some properties. Now, with media queries, we're going to be working with min width and max width. And again, rule of thumb would be the min width is going to be starting from. So just remember this and the max would be up to. And in general, we're going to do mobile first, where we're going to start all our styling from the small screen. And then we're going to be adding the media queries as our screen size gets bigger, because that would be probably easier than working with the desktop and then going the opposite direction. But as always, we're going to see all this throughout this example. And in the index HTML, again, we're going to do a very simple one. I'm going to say there's going to be a div. Uh, we can maybe add this again, some class to this div. Let's call this a bannery. And then within the heading one, uh, we're going to say hello world. Uh, I am learning, uh, learning CSS, learning CSS. Once this is going to be saved, I mean, obviously my writing at the moment is hideous, but maybe we can fix this by adding like this. Maybe this is going to be a little bit better. Or we can just add the text capitalized that we already have learned. And once we head over back to the CSS, we can start styling. Well, let's do some, again, awful examples with colors. We're going to write over here. Body is going to be, let's say, background yellow. Again, just so you can be mad at me. And then once we have the background yellow, I am going to go with the banner. So the div that has a class of banner. And I would like to add a, I don't know, background of blue. Now, this is going to be my choice. Now, last but not least, I would like to head over to heading one. We know that we can use the element selector and let's say color white and text. Like I said, let's do not text align or you know what? Yeah, maybe let's test it out text center. Then we can do text decoration and add maybe an underline as well as we have an option of text. And then here I would like to work not with decoration, not with aligning, not with shadows. In fact, I would want to work with text, 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 text transform. Yeah, sorry. Uh, and that will going to be capitalization. And this is how this text is going to look like in this screen size. Now, the thing is, we haven't added the media query. So what's happening is, and I'm going to show you right now on a bigger screen, that regardless of the screen size, this is how our web page is going to look like. And let's say we decide that, okay, this is perfect for mobile view. So once the screen size is small, this is awesome. However, as the screen size gets bigger, I would like to change some things around. I don't think that my users would like the yellow color and maybe some other properties. Okay, so how do we do that? Well, working with media queries, the syntax would be like this. So we need to have the ad and then we're looking for media. Now we need to write media. And then we write screen. Now it is important the syntax here because if you're gonna make some kind of small, even syntactical error, your media query is not gonna work. And maybe if I'm gonna remember, I'm gonna show you this once we set up the media query. But even the smallest space is gonna matter. And trust me, because I'm getting questions already on the course. So yeah, this is happening. So you need to be kind of very careful about it. Not that. I mean, your site is going to break. It's just your media query is not going to work. So here we're looking for min width. So that would be the syntax. And now we can use whatever values you would want. Now, in my case, I'm going to use pixels. But again, remember, you can use REMs if you want or anything like, like you would like. And let's say here, 576. So what I'm saying is starting from 576, there is going to be some kind of rules. Now, they can be different rules. They can be the same properties with different values. This is really up to you. So let's start here. Let's say body. So starting from 576, what is going to happen to the body? Well, designer suggests me that the body should be background red. Okay, that's a good start. Then I'm going to be looking for a different background for the main. So I'm going to say not main, sorry, banner. So I'm going to write for the banner. We would want background and let's say yellow. So I'm going to kind of not flip it technically because this is obviously blue. And then for the heading one, this is where I would like to add some more styles. So I'm going to say here, I don't know, color is going to be black. And then I'm going to be looking for the font size. So font size is going to be, I don't know, uh, 60 pixels. 
So basically, this is gonna be massive. Okay, we don't see anything. There's no changes. Yeah, but the thing is, we are not past the 576. Because again, what we need to remember is that this notation means that starting from that screen size. And since I don't want to mess up this view, we will gonna head over again to the bigger browser and you can already see the changes. Now when the changes are happening, well, we can see that once the screen size is less than 576, the moment we're going to get past 576, then we're going to be getting new styles. Now you want to see it a little bit more. We can do obviously, as always, our development tools. And what happens here on the right hand corner, you are probably seeing here the actual width of the screen. Now what's happening here, this is saying 576. Now the reason why this is happening, because obviously, I have zoomed in here, because I already have set up my zoom. So if I'm gonna set my zoom to let's say 100, like it normally would be and just for tutorial, I think it's easier. If we're gonna go actually again back to developer tools, you'll see that this is actually happening from 576. Now let me again make this smaller, then we can do and this is not what I wanted to do. Uh, my apologies, we would need to go to 127. Then I'm going to open up my developer tools. And then we can start looking here that starting from 576, the changes are going to happen. Well, there's actually a little bit better way in the developer tools how we can notice that. So let me first make this again, probably bigger. And you know what, I can just make this one maybe smaller. And you know what, what I would want? Well, here, I would like to zoom in and not over here but in the actual document. So let's zoom into 200. And then in the developer tools, notice what we're going to have. So we're going to have the little thing where we can be looking at the screen sizes. Now what I have right now, I have the width of 400. And then of height of 509. Now if I'm going to be expanding this, check it out. So starting from 576, what's going to happen? Well, we're going to see that we're going to have our changes. So those are the kind of two things that if you would need to know that within the developer tools, if you want to check it out on different screen sizes, you have this option, you don't have to do the normal way. However, even if you're not doing this with the screen sizes, you're still going to be able to see, which is going to be hard to see because it's going to be probably written in a small tense or something like this. Now back to the media queries, you know what, let me just close the developer tools. And let's stick for this one now. And like I said, within the media query. If I'm not adding this text decoration underline, if I'm not overriding this in 576, what happens is that the underline still stays. So even though I said that starting from 576, I would want some different property values on the heading one, because I didn't add this text decoration underline here. This is the reason why it still stays. And also I have an option of adding the new property. However, this new property with 60 pixels is only going to work from that 576. The moment we're going to be again back to the small screen, this is not going to work. Now we also have an option of adding as many media queries we would like. So how this is going to work? Well, we just copy and paste it. And you know what, uh, before we do, let me just uh, do a little bit of undoing. And let me show you where would be the mistake. So what if I'm going to do it like this, what I'm going to say, media screen, and then in between the end and the actual parentheses, I'm not going to leave any kind of space. Do you think the media query is going to work? Or remember what I told you is that even the smallest mistake is going to make the big difference. Now check this out. It doesn't matter how big the screen size gets, the media query is not working. And we can refresh all day long. And this is not going to change. And the reason for that is because the smallest syntax error in this case, even as simple as just leaving all the space, and pretty much everything is going to be messed up. Now I can tell you right away, my biggest issue is always writing something like this. So I do it something like this. And then I'm looking for three days, where is my media query. And I don't understand whether it's a browser's fault or anything like that. Because obviously, my spelling is not the best. So I always have issues with the width. That's just something from my book uh, to let you know to maybe so you can avoid it. And now Let's go back and let's say add another one. And now this is going to be the kicker, where if this is going to be starting from min with 576, in this case, I obviously would want to have some bigger screen size. So let's say this is not going to be seven, I'm sorry, 576. We're going to say 
768. So once we get to 768, then we're going to flip it around again. So here we can do green again for the body. The background for the banner is going to be blue again. Uh, the color, I don't know, could be red, red. And maybe let's add some another property here. But I'm just thinking what kind of property I could add with the text. Maybe let's do text align and not center. We can do maybe right. And that's going to work out. Or, you know, what? even more fun one. Let's add a font family of Verdana. So the moment we're going to get to 768, then we're going to get our Verdana. Let me double check whether I corrected my mistakes that I did on purpose. Otherwise, this is obviously not going to work. And we're going to head over right now to the bigger browser window. So we have less than 576. The moment we get past 576, and obviously, again, in my case, if I have zoomed in, this is obviously going to be on a bigger uh, screen size. But as I keep going, notice what happens. The moment we get to 776, I have all kinds of things happening here. I have Verdana, I have text right, and I have the backgrounds and everything, all that. And this is again to show you that this is how we would work with media queries. Again, very, very basic example. Throughout the projects, so we're going to be using a lot more different properties, and this is going to look much better. But the general idea would be like this. Now, we also have an option of max width. Now, for the max width, let me just flip this around. So first of all, I'm just going to comment this out. And then what we would want is the same syntax. However, we're going to write max width. Now, how the max width is going to work? Well, the max width is saying up to. So we technically flip this around. Since we already had here the rules or whatever the CSS properties and values, we are saying here up to this 576, we are going to have these values. So these are going to be the values that we shown. However, if we're going to get past 576, notice what happens. So these are our original styles that we wrote. So what we're saying here is up to the 576. And then we're going to go back to whatever styles we wrote over here. Now, one thing that we need to be careful with max width is that we can easily overwrite this. So if I'm going to comment this out again, and if I'm going to say max width from 768, and again, let me select this here. Let's say max. And this is not what I wanted to do. Let's say max width. Now, once I write 768, what do you think is going to happen right now? I'm writing here up to 576. And then I have another max width 768. So if I'm writing here up to 768, do you think which style is going to be shown on the screen or rendered in the browser? Well, we can already see on the right hand side that this is going to be this 768. And again, the reasoning for that would be that we're saying the max width for 576, but 768 includes this. So we're overriding it anyway. So what we are saying is, OK, yeah, you said 576. But what I'm saying is that I would like to have the 768. But again, the interesting thing over here is even if I'm going to change it here, and if I'm going to say, I don't know, 40 pixels, I'm still going to be getting this value. So even though I'm writing here 768, I'm overriding this, I don't know, the font size, right? So that's what's happening. But let's test it out with some kind of property that maybe is not affected in the banner. Now, we already know the border radius, border radius, and that could be, I don't know, 20 pixels. Now, once I save it, this is what happens. So the banner even though it is max width up to 576, we're still getting this right now, the border radius, because we are not overriding it over here. So this is going to happen with the properties that we're overriding. And this is the case where you need to be really careful. So if you're going to have some kind of properties here that you're not overriding this 768, then they're obviously still going to be shown. So that's something that you need to pay attention to. Another interesting doozy is a Z index in the CSS. And what we're going to do is we're going to set up some example with some images just so we can see a little bit better. And for this, you know what? I will going to get rid of all this mumbo jumbo that we had before in the CSS. We're first all going to save it. And in the index HTML, we are going to create maybe the same thing. We can leave the div, but within the div, we're going to add some images. Now we're going to start with the small one first. And it doesn't really matter because we're going to be changing the sizes. And let's say here, I'm going to be looking for the image. 
Now I'm going to start with the small one. So I can just say small JPEG and let me add the class because we will going to be adding some changes individually by each of the images. So let's copy and paste it. First of all, let's say class of number two. And we're going to be looking for class of number three. Uh, what else we can have? Okay, so we have small. We obviously also want the big one. So I'm going to say big JPEG. And then let's look for the folder. And again, just for simple reason that I would want them to be different. And then, you know, this was obviously not in a folder, but in images. And then we're looking for a folder image. First things first, we would need to fix, obviously, the widths here. The heights are just massive. So let's say for all the images, I would like to have, I don't know, width of 200 pixels. And let's try it out with 200 pixels. And right away, the height also for 200 pixels. And we'll see what happens. So 200 and 200. And this is obviously a mess up. This is not what I wanted. Let's go back over here and let's save it. And now we have 200 by 200. So far, so good. Uh, you know what? Maybe it's not so far so good because... Let's do maybe 100 pixels because that way this is going to look a little bit more decent. It's so, okay, 100 by 100. Now, this is going to look good. Um, uh, what else I would like? Well, for now, let's just work with the div and let's say for the div, or maybe let's say banner since we have the class already, I would want to have some margin. Now, the margin is going to be like uh, 20 pixels all around, so there's going to be some margin, and I would like to add some width. Let's say 70 view widths. That's going to be my width, as well as some height with some, I don't know, 70 view heights. So 70 view heights. Let's save it. So this would be my div. And let me add the border right now. And for the border, I would like to add, I don't know, five pixels solid. And let's go with the red. So something like this, just so we can see where the div is actually sitting. Excellent. You know what, though? The one thing missing, we can maybe do width of a little bit wider. So this is going to look a little bit better. Now what? Well, now let's test it out something else. We're going to say position. And since we already have covered position absolute, let's see how this is going to look like. So what I'm saying for all the images, they're going to have the position absolute. And again, we have already covered this. So now they're just sitting here. Now we haven't added position relative yet. So that's maybe something we should do. Because we know that we have the ancestor, and for the ancestor, we would like to add position relative. And at the moment, what I would like is to control them one by one. So, since I have a classes, there's going to be the image with a class of one, and then image with obviously class of two and three. And let's just first start by positioning them. So, for the image number one, I'm going to say top is going to be zero, and left is going to be zero. And then, what else we're going to have? Well, let's just copy and paste it. Let's say two and three. And then obviously here we would need to change different classes. Then here we're going to write number three. And then here we're going to have different positions. So let's say for number two, I would want 10%. 10% from the top, 10% from the left. The same thing over here. We can do 10% from the left. And you know what? For this guy, maybe 20% from the top and 20% from the left. And the moment we say it, what happens? Well, we're noticing that we're having the images. We have the image number one, then the image number two, and the image number three. And as we're looking at it, we can see that the third one is closer to us. Now, the reason for that is very simple, because this was the third image. But this would be the Z index that we're controlling with, I'm sorry, the Z axis that we're controlling with Z index. And the reason why the third one is going to be the closer, because the actual image was the third in line. And the first one was further away, or is further away, because it was first one in the line. So how we could change that? Well, we know that we have the option of working with Z index that would control this Z axis. And why don't we test it out? Why don't we have a look of how this is going to work? So let's say for number one, we would want to work with Z index. Now, one thing that I would need to let you know right away is that with Z index, automatically you're going to be getting zero. So all of them by default are going to have zero. So even though I'm going to add for the first one zero, nothing is going to change because the rest of them also right away have the Z index of zero. So instead, what I would like to do, either I need to go bigger than zero 
So in my case, I could go to one and check this out. Now, my first one is actually closer to us because we increase this Z index value on the Z index property, or we can do something like this. If we know that all of them are by default zero anyway, it doesn't really matter. I can just say that this was going to stay zero, which again would be the default. And then we can say Z index negative one. So that would be for the this guy. And then for the third one, this is going to be Z index number two. So Z index and we can just go negative. Now, what do we see? We see that the first one, even though this shouldn't be like that normally, is displayed closer to us. Then the second one is further a little bit away. And the third one we're controlling here with Z index of negative two. So this one is further and further away. And like I said, even if I'm going to comment this out by default, this is how it works with Z index of zero. So that's that's the reason why this is going to be displayed closer. Now we can have all kinds of values here. It doesn't really matter. You can write something like this 999 as long as this value. And obviously, this is the case if you want to place this one behind the element number two is more negative than this guy. So instead, if I'm going to write, let's say 900 and this one, we're going to say 901, then you can already guess what's going to happen. So now the third image is going to be displayed closer to us than the one that is number two, because we changed the Z index values. However, there is one kicker about the Z index, and that is the simple fact that it will only going to work if you're going to have position relative or position absolute, meaning it's not going to work with position static. So let's have a look at how this is going to work. And in our case, what we can do, well, we can go back again to negative one as well as negative two. Let's do it something like this. So this would be negative two. We can save it. And you know what? Maybe let's flip around and let's say that we would want, I don't know, to be shown. OK, so how this is going to work? Well, we can do, I don't know, position static, right? Because we added the for all the images, we added this position absolute. So what if why don't we go back and why don't we say that for the number two, we would like to add position static. OK, so far, so good. So this image is still going to be up front. But then let's say in this case, we're going to change this and we're going to say that, you know what? The Z index is not going to be negative, but instead we're going to go with a positive. And we're also going to go with this guy being positive so we can do something like this. So now again, we have pretty much the default look like we had anyway. But you know what? I would say, hmm, I don't like this. Even though I still have the static one, I would like to have the Z index. In my case, I'm going to say Z index is going to be 100, just so I'm making sure that this would be bigger than the previous two. And nothing changes the moment we save it because it's not going to work on the static one. So we cannot do the static one with a Z index. However, if we're going to change this one to relative, obviously this is going to be again up front because we can use it with relative as well as with absolute. All right, we have covered position absolute. We have covered Z index. So I think this would be a great time to look into pseudo elements before and after. In every practical case, pseudo elements style specific parts of the element. And like, for example, in the case of before and after, you guessed it, before and after the element. Uh, but what's more cool, we can insert HTML dynamically from our CSS, essentially allowing us to avoid extra markup. Don't believe me? Why don't we take a look? And by the way, this might be a longer example because we were going to cover multiple other things as well, like smaller things, but still important. Uh, first and foremost, I would like to get rid of the all the old stuff. So I'm going to say all of you guys gone, disappear. We'll head over back to index HTML. We're going to do a little bit of spring cleaning, too. We're going to say that in the index HTML, we would just want, uh, first of all, one paragraph. That's it. Nothing really special. One paragraph on the way. Uh, here, let's write, I don't know, before and after a pseudo, pseudo elements, just like the video name. Let's save it. And we have the paragraph. Now, if I'm going to head over back to the CSS, I can first very start very simply by saying that P and now I'm going to have the colon. Now, what you're going to see maybe in older syntax is something like this, where people just wrote uh, the name of the element because we were going to be inserting 
before and after the paragraph and then one colon. However, you should probably stick with a uh, CSS three syntax where you're adding two columns again. You'll see one colon and technically that is correct, but I would suggest working with two columns. And here we're going to write the first one, the pseudo element B4. And what's happening next? And nothing is happening technically next, but we always need to have the content. So the content property should be always there. Now I'm going to show you example what happens if we don't add it. But first, let's just say content. Then we have the colon. And now what we would like to write over here. Well, let's say I'm going to write over here. Hello. And I'm going to add the space and check this out. Now, the moment we're going to save the CSS, we'll see the hello over here. So that's really neat about the content that this is pretty much adding the content in our HTML. So we didn't need to add this content. Don't believe me. We can head over back to our browser tools. We can see the inspection. And then as I'm looking at my body and I don't, I mean, this can stay for now. I think it's going to be fine. But if I'm looking at the paragraph, notice we're having the before. We didn't add it here as the markup in the HTML. However, we are able to do that from our CSS, which is really, really cool. Again, very basic example right now, but we can do a lot of interesting features using this. Okay, what else we can do? Well, we can add whatever CSS we would like over here. So I can say font, uh, let's say weight is going to be bold. Uh, then we can be looking for font size. So I can say font size. Uh, to REMs or something like this. So very, very massive text, as well as maybe let's add color. So the color can be red and I can go on and on and on. And actually, we will going to do that because we're going to be looking at a little bit more sophisticated examples. But to understand the basic idea, we can add some kind of content before and after the content of the paragraph. Now, that is important because if we're looking at the actual browser tools, we see that this is before and after the content. And this is going to become important once we're going to talk about images. So just please remember that. Okay, and what do we have next? Well, let's look at the after. So again, the syntax is going to be exactly the same. And why don't we start the same way where we just look at the content property. So I'm going to say content. And in this case, we're just going to write after. The moment we save it, we notice the little after. So we know that this is going to be working. But what if I would want to insert some kind of box here? Well, at the moment, everything is happening in line. We're seeing that whatever content we were adding, this was happily happening in line. And that is happening by default. But what if I would copy and paste them? And let's add it over here, too. And notice, obviously, this is going to be right now on the second line because there's more text. But I can bring it back to the one line because, again, this is all in line happening. But what we can do is we can do this is display block. So I can say it like this instead of display in line. I can just change this. We can do display block. Text is going to be red, but we can add, let's say, background, which is going to be black. And what happens now? Well, we added the content in before and after the paragraph, but we can add it as a block. So I can do the same thing over here and we can copy and paste it. And sure enough, what's going to happen is that I'm going to have my paragraph but before and after the content of the paragraph, I'm going to have my pseudo elements. And as you're looking at it, you're like, OK, but what if I don't want a text? What if, let's say, we would want some kind of box? Mm, I don't know. Let's try it out. So we can say over here like this. So I'm going to delete everything that we had here. And we can say display. This is going to be display block. Why don't we get rid of the text? Because let's say we would just want simple box. And what we can add over here? Well, we can do width, maybe 50 pixels. We can do height, 50 pixels. And we can do background, I don't know, green. So something like this. Now, what happens? Well, the block is displayed. So everything is working fine. But what if I decide and I say, well, what is the point of this content if all I want is here the block? So technically, I wanted content only with hello. Okay, let's test it out. I'm going to comment this out. And sure enough, nothing is displayed. And this is something that I want you to take away that content property, even with an empty value, is required. So whenever you want to insert something, even though there's not going to be text, you do need to have this property with this kind of value. Simple enough. And typically, I could just stop here with this example and say that, OK, we covered everything that there was, at least at this point, with before and after elements. But I would like to make a little bit more interesting example. 
where I would kind of want to show you that how we can use position absolute so we can use the Z index and more realistic scenario where you would use this because at the moment you're probably looking at it and you're like, okay, thanks for telling me, but that is probably the first and only time that I'm going to do that. Where in fact you can use the before and after in a lot of interesting cases. Now, enough of me yapping, and let's head over to index HTML and we're going to add one more thing. So, we're going to say here that right after the paragraph, now you can delete this, you can delete the HTML and CSS. I'm going to leave it just in case so you have it for your own explorations later on. But I'm going to say here div and I'm going to add the image. Now, this is important, so make sure that you're adding the div and image because we we're going to go over this image and just to give you a hint. We're not going to be able to add before and after for the image. And again, we're going to cover this in a few seconds, but uh, just make sure you have the div and you have the image. And also do that because I would like to show you a few other things, how the image is going to be interacting with this div and how we're going to use this later on. And um, let's start maybe with a, I don't know, we can do big image or we can do the small image. You know what? No, let's do the big one because I do want to show you the actual uh, responsive images. So at the moment, obviously this image is massive. And okay. We already knew that. So typically what we would do, well, we're going to rush back to the CSS and we're going to right away, try to add whatever property where we would change the width. So we could do something like this. We could say, uh, image is going to be the width of, I don't know, uh, 300 and then hope for the best that image is going to look like this. But while this works and all this is fine. There is a better way, but we're going to use all throughout probably the project. Well, not every single case, but you understand the idea where I'm going to first work with a div. So I'm going to say the div is going to have some kind of width. And in most cases, that width is going to be responsive. And then the image is going to be set responsive to that div. Now, how does that work? Well, I can say div since I have the div. And for the div, I'm instead going to say width of let's say 50 view widths again we already know this this would be the percentages of the screen and then let's add some margin to it let's say margin 100 pixels top bottom and auto left and right so i know that i'm going to have it here somewhere in the middle now i also would like to add maybe a uh, let's say border so let's say border two pixels solid just so you can see a few other things later on and solid i don't know as always we're going to go with red Okay, so we're getting somewhere. So we have the right now the width of an image with something 300. And then the div is actually responsive because it is sitting in the center. However, what's happening is you see that the image obviously doesn't fit here. So what we can do is with an image. So since this is already responsive, we can add the 100%. So what's happening right now is the image is going to be responsive depending on a div. Meaning as I'm going to increase the size of the div, also my image isn't going to increase because I already set this up with 100%. So if we're going to be creating some kind of column layouts or anything like that, this is exactly the syntax we're going to be using. What are you noticing, though, is that even though the div covers nicely left and right and top, there's this space in the bottom. And you might be tempted to say, well, Okay, so I had the width. Oh, let me add the height. And hopefully for the best, everything is going to work out. And the moment we save it, nothing changes. And in order to get rid of this annoying space in between, let's say, what you're going to have in the div as well as the image, we're going to have to make the display property. And we're going to say display not in line, but we're going to have to display block. And this has nothing to do with before and after pseudo elements. This has everything to do with how we're going to be later on working with a div and image again syntax would be that for the, let's say some kind of column layout the div is going to be responsive then for the div i don't think we're going to be adding border each and every time but we're going to be adding the image within the div and then the image is going to be responsive depending on the width of the actual div as well as we're going to set it as display block now we technically don't have to do it we could have avoided that but by showing you this i believe that i'm going to save you a little bit of time because as you're going to be working with css eventually you're going to add some kind of paragraph let's say hello there or something like this and now for sure you're going to have some kind of input 
Now, obviously, I'm getting my paragraph right now because I already have selected all the paragraphs. So let me fix this. Let's say there's going to be heading one. And now you're going to be able to style actually on the basic selection instead of what would happen if you were going to remove display block. What you're going to see there is going to be this extra margin, so the extra space. And you're going to be sometimes real annoyed where you're like, listen, I'm styling this left and right how I would want, but this is not working. So in order to get rid of this annoying default margin that you're getting, again, we would just need to use display and display block. Again, nothing to do with pseudo elements. Everything has to do with how we're going to be later on working with our divs and how they're going to be interacting with images within the divs. Okay, so we have covered this one. Now let me get rid of this uh, border. We don't need this. And now let's decide what we're going to do. Well, we can start working with before and after. Now the temptation would be like this. Well, I have the image and I would like to insert something here in between the image. So I could just say image before and let's go for the content and let's start very simply by, I don't know, content and the content is going to be hello. Now, the moment we save it, nothing happens. And the reason why nothing happens because image element and I'm really shortened in this. There's obviously big theory behind this and all that. But in general terms, image is already the content because again, let me repeat. And this was the wrong screen. If we're heading over again to our paragraph, we're noticing that this is placed before and after the content. Now, image tag by itself, the image is the content. So we're not going to be able to do that. Long story short, you're not going to be able to add before and after for your image. This was one of the reasons why we added the div, because we do want to work with these pseudo elements. Now, in the process, I also showed you other things about how the divs with images are going to be uh, interacting, but in general, you're not going to be successful. So I mean, I can repeat this 10 more times, but this is not going to work so far. So good. We have covered this. What else we have left? Well, why don't we actually look how we can insert the before and after as we having the div in the image. Now for the div is actually very simple. We do have the content. So I'm going to say div before. Hello there, buddy. And what I would like over here. Well, I know I need to have the content. So I'm going to say content. And even though there's going to be something else, I'm just going to say the empty content. So what else I would like here? Well, I'm going to say border is going to be two pixels solid. And let's go with the gray one. Okay. So for now, I'm having this guy. So there's some kind of border. Okay. Why don't I make this interesting? I know that there's some kind of width and there's some kind of height. And I know that I have the div. So why don't I make it the width to be not some pixels, not some absolute value, but also 100%. As well as why don't I make it height 100%. So I can just say here, height 100%. Now, the moment we save it, again, nothing changes. Okay, um, but we already know the position absolute, right? So I can just say position is going to be absolute. And then let's see what happens. So not relative, but absolute. What happens? Well, now this is really big. Okay, probably not something that we wanted. Hmm, what else we can do? Well, we remember that whenever we're working with position absolute, this was looking for what? Well, for the first ancestor that had what? The position of relative, because otherwise this is looking for the body. So that's the reason why this is so massive. So what would be the solution? Well, we have the ancestor. The ancestor would be div in this case. And what we can do is position and we're looking for relative. So now what happens is that this is going to be 100 percent. Now you could might be arguing. You can say, well, this is not really 100 percent because what's happening right now. You cannot you can see these spaces here. And the reason for that, again, is going to be the border box. So we can have box sizing and uh, not box shadow. For some reason, this is popping up and we will, by the way, cover box shadow. So that's going to be covered. But if I'm going to go with box sizing, notice this one. So right now I'm having the actual border box. And what's really cool is that this is exactly like I would have them when I div. So you notice the idea. So we added this two pixels and now this is going to be 100% 100 height. And then this way we can start actually doing some more interesting things. Now, what would be the more interesting things? Well, we know that we can place it relative, relative, obviously, to our ancestor. And also we can use the negative values. Hmm. So how this is going to work? 
so i could say top is going to be negative 40 pixels so we're going to lift it up a little bit as well as left is going to be negative 40 pixels so where this guy is going to go well now this is going to be sitting right here one annoying thing you might be looking at you're like yeah well okay it looks kind of cool but why this is covering the image right now well you don't want to cover an image what do we have what property we had and i already actually showed you so probably the easy answer would be well z index right so what is the z index right now for the image well that's actually automatically zero but if i'm going to make for this guy negative two what happens well now this is going to be hidden behind the image okay so far so good why don't we take a look at the after one and here i'm going to do something like this i'm going to say div after now in this case i would like to copy and paste a lot of them because i don't want to rewrite them all one by one so i'm just going to say something like this and now let's change the values so we have div before and after content is this going to stay the same empty however here i'm not going to be looking for the border i'm going to say that there is going to be actual background so not a border gray but we're going to say background gray so background is going to be gray now what is going to happen here well for now we're going to cover everything because obviously the width and height is 100 percent and what we're doing is we're having this top is negative 40 but i can change this i can say top is going to be negative 20 left is going to be negative 20 as well as let's create a z index a little bit smaller so this is should be sitting all the way on the back then we're going to be having this image or not image basically a block with background gray and then we are having our image okay so this probably would be a little bit more interesting example where we can start using again the pseudo elements before and after probably again not the biggest example that you could see in the world meaning you can use all kinds of other things with pseudo elements but at least this would give you like a little taste where it would be much more interesting than just displaying the block now we can add the block quotes i mean again there's tons of interesting things we can do this is just I think in my opinion more interesting than what we did before and you don't have to do this along with me because we haven't covered a few of these properties but just to show you how this is going to interact with the page i'm going to add some things we haven't covered yet again you don't have to do them i'm going to leave them in your code so you can maybe uh, actually explore them later on but don't worry about it again we haven't covered them but what i would like to do right now is as i'm hovering i would want these guys to move so how this is going to work? Well, first of all, I'm going to head over here. And again, we're going to cover, we're going to write something we haven't done yet. So I'm going to say, as I'm hovering the div, I would want before and after to actually move. So I'm going to say after, and I'm going to copy and paste it. And one thing we have covered, though, even though we don't know, understand these selectors yet, uh, we have covered that we can actually group them together, right? So I can say before and after so both of them are going to be selected and what i would want well i would want top of them to be zero left of them to be zero and yeah that's going to be it so let me save this okay so what happens so as i'm hovering this is actually getting headed now we can also add a little bit of transition and again please don't worry about the properties and the values we will going to cover them as also don't worry about the selector this is going to be covered in a few videos but what I can do here is I can say transition and we're going to do all 0 0.5 pixels and we're going to write linear and now let me copy and paste this line of code. We're going to head over here, copy and paste it to and check this out. So as I'm hovering now, this is happening over 0 0.5 seconds, much more cooler example than what we looked at a simple block and simple text here on the top. And in general terms, this is how you would use the before and after elements. Just remember, again, you need to use the content. Uh, you are not going to be successful using with an image. And you're placing this before and after the actual content of the element, not before the, and after the element. Hey, guys, before we deep dive into CSS transitions, transformations and animations, I would like to take a quick pit stop and revisit selectors in CSS. Some of you might be wondering, well, why are we just taking a quick pit stop and not full on two hour stop? Well, here's the thing. Yes, there are many more selectors in CSS. I am fully aware of that. But here's my argument. 
you want to use CSS to make cool stuff, right? Websites, applications and so on and so forth. And to tell you, honestly, we can easily do all those things just by using simple selectors. So I think it is much more productive that we cover only basic selectors, start creating awesome stuff. And then if we need to get something very specific done and we need a very specific CSS selector for that, we can always go back and learn that selector. So in this module, we will refresh on selector basics as well as cover some other essential CSS selectors. All right, why don't we start with the basics that we already have covered all throughout this course, but it's kind of important starting point. So let's say within the HTML, we're going to say there's going to be heading and I'm going to purposely name them exactly the same just so we can kind of see the difference. So I'm going to say there's going to be heading one with an ID of heading and I'm going to call this I am uh, ID heading. So extremely simple and we're going to copy and paste this line. And we're going to write that not there's going to be a heading with an ID. There is going to be instead of class. And here we can just write a class heading. Again, just so we can see that there's obviously going to be a difference with selections. And you know what? Last but not least, let's add a little tiny paragraph with a hello world in it. So far, so good. Now, what's happening in the CSS? We already know what basic selectors we can use. So let's say if I would want to select them all, I can just say selection of all, and we're going to be looking for the color red. Now, all of them are going to be with a color red. We can also select the ID and I can say for the ID, I would want what? Well, first of all, I would need to have the hashtag. Then I would need the name of the ID. And then let's add maybe a different font size. 40 pixels is going to be good enough. Then we have text transform property also. So let's transform it to uppercase. So this is going to be my uppercase dude. And you know what? Let's change the color. So here we would like to change the color. And we already know that there's going to be specificity. So even though we selected all the elements and added color red, since this is more specific, we are overriding the property value that we had with a less specific selector. Now we can also use the class. And again, this would be the difference that if with an ID we had a hashtag, with class, we always need to use the dot. And even though they're named the same, they're going to perform the completely opposite because we're going to be adding different styles here. So let's say font size is going to be instead 20 pixels. So this is going to be simple. Then text transform. We're going to be looking for the capitalization as well as let's add the color green. And again, more specific. So we will going to be overriding this, whatever value we had with universal selector. Now, last but not least, we had the element selector where we can just write a letter spacing it is going to be, I don't know, 20 pixels again, basics that we have covered, but it's important to keep them in mind. So just in case we wouldn't forget them. Next one up, we have descendant and child combinators and probably the toughest part is going to be for you listening how I struggle with a descendant name and everything else is going to be very straightforward where children can be descendants, but descendants are not going to be children. <laughs> and I know it might be confusing a little bit right now, but I think with an example, this is all going to make sense. So what I would like right now is head over back to my HTML and within the HTML, we're going to create some divs. So let's say, first of all, all these suckers are going to go because that was the last video. And then within the index HTML, we are going to do a little bit of cleanup and let's say there's going to be a div. However, with the div, I would like to add some class. So I'm going to say that there's going to be a header class on a div. And within the div, let's place, I don't know, heading one, where we're going to say I am child and descendant. And like I said, watching me struggle with the name as well as the spelling is probably going to be very funny. Hopefully this is correct, descendant. And then we're looking for another div. And then within this div, again, we're going to do the same thing. We're going to have the class of this is going to be header. And for some reason, I wrote obviously here header, which is not what I wanted. And let's add, I don't know, another unordered list. Within the unordered list, there's going to be a list item. And here we're going to say heading one, where this is going to be this. And then hopefully I'm spelling correctly. And now this is going to be my list item. Now, where do those selectors come in play? Well, let's say if I'm going to write very generic, I'm going to say div 
and let me delete this. Let's say div and not there. Uh, div. So finally, div. And if I want to select all the heading ones that are within the divs, I can just create a space. And now I'm looking for my descendant. So everything that's going to be as an ancestor, where div is going to be ancestor for this heading one, this is going to qualify, as well as this guy is going to qualify, because both of them are descendants from the div. And simple enough, we can just say, I don't know, uh, color is going to be red. Now what happens? Both of them turn color red. Now, the reason why this dot is not here, obviously, because this is sitting within the list item. So don't get confused. We're just talking about the heading ones right now. However, we also have an option of children. So if I would want to select the direct children of the div, well, the syntax would be like this. So in this case, we have the space. Then we're looking for the angle bracket, and then we're going to write heading one. So in this case, we're going to write color. And in our case, this is going to be blue. So if I'm going to change this, and if I'm going to say the only heading ones, there are direct children of the div, because you notice right now I have the div, but then I have the honor list and then list item. So the rect parent would be the list item in this case. This is not going to be the actual div. So that is the reason why all of them have been selected with red. But then if you're adding direct child, then obviously only that direct child is going to be styled. We're not limited using the element selectors here. We could use the class. And that was the reason why we added the class when I said header. And again, let's say I'm going to be selecting all the heading ones. Same thing. Again, I'm just looking for descendants. And we're going to say color here. And the color is going to be green. Now, what's also happening is that this is going to be more specific. Now, you might argue with me. You can say, well, yeah, it's just because you wrote it as a last rule. Okay, let's test it out. Let's put it on top. And once we say what happens, still everything is green. And the reason for that, again, I use the descendant selector. So all the heading ones within the class of header, and we can use the ID here. We can use anything we would want. Again, we're just looking for descendant selectors. And however, though, this is more specific. So even though we wrote this on the top and then we added two more rules, directly looking for the class is more specific. And that's the reason why we're overriding this. And that's something. Uh, to keep in mind that the specificity is going to matter. Now, I also can do, let's say, header, and then I can look for the elect child. So in this case, maybe let's say for the heading ones, there are direct children of the class of header. I would want the color to be purple. Now, what do you think is going to happen? Well, I'm pretty sure only the first one is going to be purple. And in a nutshell, this is how we can work descendant and child combinators or selectors in the CSS. Next one up, we have two pseudo elements, which would be first line and first letter. And just by looking at him, I think they were going to be much more straightforward than the before and after. So the first one is going to style the first line. And the second one is going to work with first letter. As always, let's get rid of everything that we had in the previous one. Save it in the index. This is going to be very simple. It's going to work with not a div, but we're going to have the paragraph. Then the paragraph is going to have, I don't know, lorem, 30 words, something like this. So this is going to be my paragraph. And then if we head over back to the CSS, we can just say paragraph and use the first line. So this is going to style the first line. And in our case, we can just say font weight is going to be, let's say, bold. So now the weight is going to be bold. However, if we would want the first letter to be bigger, again, the same thing. We are working with first letter. And let's say font size is going to be, I don't know, three REM. So as straightforward as it gets. First line and first letter. Fresh after that, we have pseudo classes. And the first one is going to be the hover. Now, with the pseudo classes in general, the main idea is like this. So as the element is going to be changing some kind of state. Now, in the hover, this is very simple. So as we're going to be hovering over the actual element, then something is going to change about that element. Now, again, this could be anything with the CSS, and we can apply this to all the elements. Now, later on, we're going to be looking at specifically to the links. So those pseudo classes are going to be specific to the links. But however, we can use on everything. And you know what? Why don't we make an example? So first, let's get rid of this. We can save it. And in the index HTML, we can maybe leave the paragraph again, just to show you that everything works on all of them. Let's write maybe a div. Then with div, let's add a class. 
just to show that this is going to be working with the classes. There's going to be header. I don't know. Within the header, we're just going to have uh, some kind of text as well. Maybe 10 letters, something like this. And then let's add the link. Now for the link again, we're just going to have a dummy href, meaning this is not going to link anywhere. And here we're just going to say that, I don't know, this is a link, something like this. And now let's decide what we're going to do. So let's say that for the paragraph, I would want, as I'm hovering, to be a bigger font size. So I'm going to say paragraph, but then here we need to use the hover. So now we're hovering with this class. And this would be the difference between the two dots that we used previously on pseudo elements and with the classes. So with the classes, this is just going to be one set of colon. That's all. And here we're going to say, as I'm hovering, I would want the font size to be, I don't know, 60 pixels on the paragraph. Now, what's going to happen as we're hovering over with the mouse, then obviously this is going to be very big. Now I need to head over back and maybe this wasn't the best example because this is going to be triggering over the place. So maybe let's change it. Uh, I don't know, font. All right, let's do the color. This is always a good escape. We can say color and let's say red. So now as I'm going to be hovering, the, the color of the paragraph is obviously going to be red. I also have the class, so we can do the same thing with the class. So let's say for the header, uh, we're going to be hovering and we can change the background to, I don't know, blue. As I'm hovering over, notice what happens. Also, we're not limited to, again, one property with one value. We can write that color is going to be white here. Again, whatever CSS styles we would want over here. And let's say as I'm hovering, sure enough, I have the background that's going to be blue and the color is going to be white. No last but at least I do have the link. So let's say for the link, there's going to be again hover. So as I'm hovering over the link, what should happen? I don't know. I'm going to say text decoration is going to be none. So only as I'm hovering, then the underline is going to disappear. Now, what happens as I'm hovering over the link? I have no underline. So that's how we can work with hover pseudo class in the CSS. With hover pseudo class selector, it was somewhat straightforward. So only the changes were happening as we're hovering over the element. However, with links, we have a little bit more states. So link can be just general link, then link can be visited. We can also hover over the link and the active link. So why don't we take a look again? Bye bye. You're going to be gone. And also within the index HTML. We're just going to create a bunch of links. So let me first delete all of them. Then let's say here again, this is going to be just a general link. So let's write general link. Then we're going to copy and paste it here. We're going to write, I don't know, a visited link. We can go with this. We can just say visited, visited link. So that would be the second one. Then we have the active one and the hover one. So for the hover one, again, this is going to be very simple. I'm just going to say hover, although what's going to happen is as we're hovering all of them, you're obviously going to be able to see anyway. But that is just a side note. And let's write with active one. So active link, something like this. So a few of them were with capital letter and a few of them were just going to be with a, a lowercase letter. Now, this is, again, somewhat straightforward, meaning only thing we need to do is just say that let's say we'd want to select all the links. So how are we going to write that? Well, we can just say that all the links that have been on a page. So let's say a link and then we're looking for something. And let's start very simply by color. And let's say the color is going to be aqua. Now, all my links are going to have this color again. Very simple. Now, we also have the option of visited because we can click on a link. So that way we're visiting the link. Now, in order to do that, we're just going to say visited. So if we have clicked on a link, let's say a red, so something like this. Now I'm going to head over to the second one, the visited one. But again, you can click on any link. And what's going to happen the moment we're going to click on it, all of them are going to be red. Now, what is the reason why all of them are red? Because our href attribute is here the hashtag. So if we would want, we wouldn't want this annoying thing. We're just going to write HTTP. HTTP, then again, we're going to have to forward slashes. Let's say google.com. At the moment, I'm going to save it. Notice this is not visited link. So just please remember that if you're going to have multiple links that are going to be pointing to the same thing, if you're going to click on one of them, obviously the same thing is going to happen. Now, 
again, we here we have multiple options. If you don't like the fact that all of them technically have been visited, you can just change this around to Google. Just remember that the moment you're going to click on one of the Googles, they're also going to be visited. So let's save this. Okay, so this is going to be visited link. Then what else we had? So we had a hover effect. So that was again for all of them, obviously, since we we're going to be able to hover. Uh, in this case, I don't know, color is going to be blue. Now, what happens? So as I'm hovering over the link, obviously, the color is going to turn blue, even the one that has visited, because again, this just shows that we have clicked on a link. Now, last but not least, we have the active one. And the active one happens as we're clicking on the link. So there's going to be the split second as we're clicking on the link. So link is active before technically it says that it was visited. So for this, we can just say active again. And I don't know, we can have the green one. And this is where we're going to be really have to pay attention because this is going to change literally over the second. So as what happens is as I have over here, and if I click on it, I mean, yeah, and if I'm holding the left key, then obviously, we're going to be able to see that this is not visited in link yet. This is not anymore blue because we're not hovering. So this would be the active one. So that's where we would use this pseudo class selector. Now, the moment I'm going to let go of the actual, obviously, left key, then what happens is I'm visiting the Google first and foremost, because this was the link. And now all of them are red. Now, the reason why this is red, because we already clicked on it, but the rest of them were Google anyway. So now all my links are showing as visited. Now, this is in general how we can use pseudo class selectors with links. Whether that's link, visited, hover, or active. We also have an option of using the root pseudo class selector where we're styling the root element of the document, which in our case is going to be HTML document. And right off the bat, I can tell you that this is probably going to be used mostly for general styles, as well as we're going to use it with CSS variables that we haven't covered yet. Now, how this is going to work? Well, first of all, let's get rid of all this old garbage well it's not really garbage but i just needed to use some kind of word so let's get rid of the old code then in the index html we're gonna i don't know create uh heading one and that's not what i wanted to do so i'd like to delete them here and let's start by heading one so this is going to be a simple heading one heading one let's say i am heading and then let's add two paragraphs now, for the paragraphs, though, I would want to have two classes. So there's going to be paragraph with lorem. So I don't know, 20 words, as well as I would like to add the class. Now, the class is going to be absolute. It doesn't really matter how you call the class, as long as you, as always, remember uh, how to actually style it in a CSS, meaning you remember the name so you can access the class. And here, let's say responsive. And then we're going to have a look at what would be the difference within the root element so far so good so we have all our html now for the root again we're going to do something like this and the most basic way would be doing well let's say background is going to be red now again this is something we already have covered so obviously if we're selecting the html and we're saying that the background should be red what happens is that since this is pretty much the root of our old document just because we style this red obviously right now we're going to have the background red so far, so good. Very simple. Now, if this is annoying, we can just comment this out. Maybe some of you hate the red color, especially since it's for the whole background. But what is more interesting and what it would be the cases apart from CSS variables that we haven't covered, but we will going to cover later. And again, I'm will going to revisit the root because this is where we're going to be setting up the variables. But where else we can use the root? Well, we can use it for general styles. So let's say that I would have a heading one and the font size is here. I don't know, could be anything as long as you're using the REM. So I'm just going to say font size is going to be three REMs. So remember, this was responsive values. However, they were responsive towards the root. So they were responsive as the root was changing. OK, but what about the paragraph that was absolute? Let's use actually the uh, absolute values, which would be pixels. And here we're going to say font size of 20 pixels. Now, what I also would like to do is for the responsive one, add the same value just with REM values. Because remember, the whole idea was like this, that one REM was actually 16 pixels, correct? That was the default one coming from the browser. So this should be exactly the same. So the question here is, 
for the responsive one. If I'm gonna add, let's say 1.5, what is that gonna be? Well, if we do a little bit of math, we know that 16 1.5, meaning this would be 24 because we had one full 16 and then we would add eight. So in that case, we would be getting exactly the same 24. Now, if you don't believe me, I think we can just check it out here in the browser and we'll see that both of them are exactly the same. So where does the root element come in right now? Well, we already know that the reason why we're using the REMs is that let's say if the user would like to change the font size. So if the user would be like, you know what? I don't like how the fonts are, let's say, too big or too small. So the user can go always uh, actually to their settings. And the way we go to the settings, again, we click on this icon, then we're looking for the settings. And then within the settings, we have the font size. So what happens is if we're going to change this, let's say, to the very large, the text that was used with REMs is going to become very large. Now, don't believe me. Notice now this is large already. We know this, but we cannot see technically that this was bigger than it used to be. However, we can see it here with two paragraphs where previously they were exactly the same because they were 24 pixels. The moment we change the settings on a user, because this is depending on the settings on a user. Now this is getting much more bigger. Okay, so that was the, something we already have covered. Now let me put this back on a medium just so we can see that again, both of them are going to be exactly the same. And now let's look at the root element. So what's happening is if we're going to be styling something relative to the root, we can go back to the root and we can change these settings. So let's say in this case, I was styling everything towards the root. So my heading one was three REMs. And obviously, most likely, you're going to have your paragraphs that are going to be smaller. However, they were smaller relative to the root. So if I'm going to make a change here of, let's say, font size, and if I'm going to start changing with the percentages, if I'm going to say 100%, nothing is going to change because this is still going to mean 16 pixels. However, if we're going to go 150 pixels, notice what happens. So now we're increasing the value here by these 50%. But this was relative to the actual root. So everything that we're going to change within this property in the root, what we're going to have is the responsive values. But again, the absolute one didn't change because absolute was just 24 pixels and I'm good to go. The relative one is the one that you can say, OK, this is going to be three REMs. So relative to the root. So if you're going to be changing something to the root, let's say you can make the whole document, whole web page, whole whatever application. And at the end of the day, you can be like, yeah, well, three REMs is okay. And 1.5, but I would want to make it bigger. So you can head over back to the root and you can just change these values. And it will going to be affected all throughout the document where you use the responsive values that are related to the root. Hey guys, in our next module, we'll cover transform transition and animation properties along with their supplementary properties in the CSS. While these are definitely important topics, I'll try to keep examples short and sweet. Since I think it is more important to spend time working with these particular properties in our projects where we can get a better understanding, how can they be used in the real world situations? Briefly, transform property applies some type of transformation to the element, be it translational along X axis or Y axis, rotation, scaling or skewing. Transition property, on the other hand, is in charge of making state changes occurring over some period of time. So let's say we hover over the button and the background color of the button changes. With transition property, we can control how long that stage change will occur. Animation property is very similar to the transition with major difference being that we're not limited to just two points, beginning and the end of the change. Animation gives us many extra points where we can control how the change from one state to another takes place. We were going to start our transform journey by looking at the translate. But before we do anything in the CSS, I would like to head over back to index HTML. And here, like already, usually we're going to create some divs, but we're not going to place any content. We're just going to say that the first one is going to have class of one. And then you probably guessed it here. We're going to have class of number two. Then we have the third one with class of number three. That's going to do with HTML. And then we have the CSS. 
well, in the CSS, let's just start by some general styling. And let's say, I don't know, width is going to be 150 pixels. Hopefully, this is going to look good. If not, I'm going to change it. Then the height also is going to be 150. Let's add height 150. And this is not what I wanted. So this is going to be the correct one. And what else? Well, we can also add maybe display, not in line, but in line block. So a little bit different. This is not going to be display block, which obviously would be by default for the divs. But this is going to be in line block. Okay, what is next? Well, we can first add maybe some colors. So let's say background is going to be red for number one. So that's going to be my div. And you know what? Let me copy and paste it again. One, two, three, as well as I would like to change these. So this guy's going to be number two. And for number three, I don't know. Again, whatever colors you would like. I think I'm going to go with my typical ones of, let's say, green. And then the last one is going to be blue. So again, let me select this. Let's say over here, I'm going to be working with the blue. So nice three blocks. Uh, maybe I'm going to make this a little bit bigger because I want them side by side. And you'll see in a second why. Now, what is the situation with translate? Well, first of all, let's get the property, which we're going to be transform. So transform property. But then within the transform, you notice that we're getting the rotations, the scaling, as well as as we start scrolling down, we have the skew and translate. Now for the translate, it's going to be very interesting because translate is going to be the function. Now, what does that mean? Well, that means that we can get translate X, which is going to work with the X direction. Then we have the Y, which is going to work in the Y direction. And then we just have the plain old translate. So let's start with X. Now, like I said, the X is going to work with X axis. So here I can write whatever values I would like. I can write pixels if I want, or I can write percentages. Now, just to show you how this is going to work, I can just say, I don't know, 20 pixels. Now, what's going to happen is that the box is going to move right now 20 pixels to the right because the value is positive. However, if we're going to change it, and if I'm going to say negative 20 pixels, obviously, this is going to move negative 20 pixels. In this case, though, the movement is going to be to the left. So if we're adding the negative, this is going to move the left direction. However, positive is going to move the right direction. So far, so good. Now, we also have an option of 50% or I'm sorry, percent, but we we're going to use 50%. Now, how is that going to look like? Well, let's say we're going to move it 50%. And obviously, since the value was positive, again, we move the right direction. Here's the kicker, though. 50% means 50% of this 150 pixels. Don't believe me? Well, let's look at the third one, which was blue. And you saw that initially they were exactly in the same position. Now, if you didn't notice that, then I can just comment this out and you can see that their city exactly where the other one was. Okay. What if I go over here and I do the same thing where I use the transform just only with the pixels. So what happens is I can just say not 50%, but let's say 75 pixels. And you can see that 75 pixels would be exactly the half from 150. So that tells me that this 50% is going to reflect on the actual width of the element. So if I'm going to change it here, let's say to 300 pixels, then obviously this is going to move way more. Well, maybe this was a little bit too drastic example. Let's maybe go with 100. And then we can see that this is not going to work exactly the same <laughs> because they're not going to be in one line. But I hope you understood the idea where if I'm moving this to the right, by 50%, that is going to mean exactly half of its width. And I can double check that by moving the third guy exactly 75 pixels, and they all going to match. Well, if we're looking at it, we see that there's going to be translate X. Can we do translate Y? Well, I think we can figure it out. So we have transform. Then for transformations, we can do instead of X, we're going to do Y. And here again, let's test it out first by pixels. So if we're going to say 30 pixels, then right away, let's do the negative. Now my box moved up because I went into the negative direction. So if I'm going to get rid of the negative one, now you see it went down because we are moving the positive direction. Again, very straightforward. You want to move it up. This is going to have to be negative. You want to move it down. Then this is going to have to be positive. 
we also have an option of actually combining them both. So let me comment this out. Let me start a new one again. Transform, translate. And then if I'm not adding X or Y, now the first value is going to be X axis. And the second one is going to be Y axis. Again, endless amount of possibilities. And I don't think that there is a point to covering them, but just to show you how this is going to work. So let's say I would like to move this 20 pixels on the X direction and then, you know, 30 pixels in the Y direction. So what happens is that the box moves 20 pixels to the right and then 30 pixels down because we moved it obviously in the Y direction. If we want to move it, let's say a little bit more, we can do 200 pixels by 300 pixels. And then now the box is going to move 200 pixels to the right and then 300 pixels down. Again, we can use the percentages here. We can use the negative values and I'll let you explore in more detail if you would like to. But generally, this is how we could work with transform and translate function within the CSS. Next one up, we have the scale. And you'll notice that a lot of things that we already have are with translate is going to be very relatable to the scale. Now let's start maybe with the red one and let's use transform and then we're going to set it equal not to translate, but we're going to use the scale. Now scale again is going to have a few options. We can have the scale X and we have scale Y as well as we have scale. So there we can enter both values for the X one and the Y one. Now with the X, what's going to happen is that if we're going to go past the value of one in the X direction, the element is going to grow the X direction. So let's say if I'm going to say two, then the element is going to get twice as big in the X direction. Notice it happens on the right hand side and on the left hand side. However, if I'm going to go less than one, so let's say 0.1. Now the element is going to be half the size, but the trimming is going to happen on both sides. So not only let's say on one side, but the trimming is going to happen on the left hand side and right hand side. So now this is going to be half the size of the previous element. That would be the X direction. Obviously, we can do the same thing in the Y direction. So let me just copy this and let's say for the number two, number green one, instead of X, we're going to place Y and notice what happens. So now the element is going to be half the size in the Y direction. You want it twice as big. And again, I'm just using the round values. You can do something like this. So obviously this is just going to grow a little bit more than the normal one, but I'm just using two just so you can see that for sure. And the element is growing. Okay. So that would be the Y direction. And self-explanatory, we can use both values. So if I'm going to use the same thing here, and if I'm going to copy the transformation, let's say we're going to add a new one, then this is going to be scale. And I would like to, I don't know, zoom it, or I'm sorry, not zoom it, make it smaller X direction and Y direction. This is the only thing we need to do. So now what happens is that this element is half the size X direction, as was Y direction. Now I want to make it bigger can make it 1.5 as well as here. And now obviously the element is going to be bigger X direction and Y direction. Very, very straightforward. If you ever need to increase the size of the element X or Y direction, you can just use scale. After that, we have the rotate. And I have to be right away straight up honest with you that with rotations, the X and Y directions are going to be hard to see, especially as I'm showing this in the example. Now, what's going to be easier to see is going to be rotate Z. And we're also going to look at the shortcut. And that's the reason why I'm going to start right away with our rotation Z, because I think you're going to be using that more often than just X and Y. Now, how the Z is going to work like, uh, let's say, first, we're going to be looking for transformation. And we're working here with the second one, I believe, right? That was the green one. And then we have rotate and then we're looking for the Z. Now, the way this is going to work, if we were going to write some kind of degrees, let's say 45 degrees, this is going to be the easiest one to see because this is going to be rotated right now on the Z axis. Very straightforward, very simple. So if I'm going to say 180, now this is obviously going to move 180. And this is obviously going to be exactly the same like we had before. But let's say if we would want to, I don't know, go with 135 then again, this is going to look exactly like the 45. You get an idea. We have 360 degrees and then we can rotate the element however we would like. Now, how this is going to go with X axis and Y axis. So here we have a transform. Are right, you know what? 
before we actually cover the x and y axis, I also want to say that this is going to be exactly the same. So if we're going to let's say copy and paste it to the red one and change it around to I don't know 340, we're going to get some kind of rotation because this would be the shorthand. So we don't have to type Z, we can just say okay, rotate and both of them would mean exactly the same thing. Um, yeah, that is just going to be side note. Uh, hopefully you got that. And then last but not least, we're going to be looking at both of them, the X and Y. And here I would want transform. Then I'm looking for, like I said already, rotation. And for rotation, I'm looking for the X value. And in this case, if I'm going to, let's say, 20 degrees, like I said, this is going to be hard to see. Because what I'm doing is I'm rotating this x direction however if i'm telling you that this is going to be 90 degrees we're not going to be able to see that because if we're looking at the x plane line right now we have rotated this exactly 90 degrees and this is going to be harder to see now we can also do the same thing let's say here comment this out and we're going to do the y direction so let's do transform and then rotate Y direction and again, this is going to work exactly the same. Where let's say 20 degrees is going to rotate it, so this is going to be a little bit small at this moment already. Y direction because previously, remember, it got smaller in the x axis because we were flipping it around the x axis. Now we're flipping it around the y axis, so this is the reason why 20 degrees is going to make this smaller here. Now, if I'm going to go 40 degrees, this is going to get even smaller, 60 degrees. Is going to something like this, even smaller. And then finally, again, if I want to flip it around, I can do 90 degrees. And then my actually element is going to totally disappear right now because we have rotated this 90 degrees. Since it is not our first rodeo, we already can guess of what the skew is going to do. And the fact that skew is going to have, again, the X direction, the Y direction, as well as we can combine them both. So I guess we're going to do the simple one with number one. And here I would like to again work with transform. Then I'm going to write type skew. We're going to first look at the X direction. And here again, we're going to have to write degrees. So if we're going to say 20 degrees, this is going to skew it this way. I can also have the negative value. And this is going to skew the other direction. Now let me copy and paste this. And let's say that I would like to have the skew y for the second one and now obviously this is going to be the y plane that's being skewed now last but not least you already guessed that that we can do the both of them and let's say here that we're going to be looking for number three and that's not what i wanted to do i didn't want to show you the bigger screen it doesn't really matter we can see everything here on a smaller one and let's say if i'm going to go negative 20 degrees or you know what let's do 40 degrees and let's just show you that if i'm not going to add and uh, no i didn't want to delete it uh, if I'm not going to add any kind of value in the Y direction, what happens is that this is going to only skew the X direction. Don't believe me? Well, I can do the same thing here. And now, as you can see, both of them are exactly the same. However, if we're going to add the second value here with degrees, this is also going to spin it the Y direction. So let's test it out with 20 degrees. And here, if we take a have a look, then we see that this is going to skew it both directions the y direction as well as x direction. Awesome. Once we have the general idea about the transform property, we're going to shift our attention to transition. And if in one sentence, I would need to answer you what is transition, that would be change happening over some period of time. And again, the example is going to explain it much more better. But if I would have to give you one sentence example, that would be it: a change over time. Now, you'll notice also that transition property is going to be a lot similar like we had with background, because this is going to have quite a few of them. And eventually, we're going to look at a shorthand. And the setup is going to be exactly the same. We're going to have three divs. And let's figure out one problem. Let's say that I have three divs. We already know how to use the hover pseudo selector. And as I'm hovering over those divs, I would like to change the color. So for now, I have red, green and blue. But let's say for all the divs as I'm hovering, and again, we would need to use the pseudo selector, we would like to change the background color. And let's say background color is going to be whatever you would like to be. In my case, I'm going to go with coral. 
so far, so good. As I'm hovering over the divs, the color is changing. However, you're probably seeing noticing that the color is changing instantly. And while that might work in some cases, you probably would want to happen this change over some period of time because I think it's gonna look smoother. Now, how do we do that? Well, first of all, let's just work with number three because I would still want you to see the other two where change is gonna happen instantly. And let's say for number three, first we would need to start working with transition. Now, for transition, we first would need to say what kind of property. Well, is it this gonna be? I don't know. The font size is this going to be, I don't know, with or whatever. Well, in my case, I'm going to say that transition property is going to be the background. So here I'm going to write background. Okay, so far, so good. Okay, once we save it, what happens? Well, nothing happens. We're still having this change instantly because the second thing we would need to add is transition. And then we're going to be looking for duration. So how long this transition is going to take place? We can use the seconds, we can use milliseconds. Normally, we're going to settle for something like 0 0.3. But just because I would want you to see how this is happening, I'm going to go with quite a big number, and this is going to be four seconds. So as I'm hovering over, what happens? Well, the color is changing. However, the color is changing over a period of four seconds, not instantly like with the rest of them. And this is something that we can do with transition property. Luckily for us, as we're working with transition property, we're not limited to only one property. So what if, let's say, for number three, the one that actually has the transition, I would like to add another thing, another property with a hover. Well, we have a few options. I can either add this property here for all of them, since here I'm just selecting all the divs, or we can be more precise and I can say, you know what, as I'm hovering over the three, I would like to change, I don't know, border radius. And in this case, I would need to add my pseudo selector. So I'm going to say, as I'm hovering over the three, I would like to have border radius. And let's say this is going to be 50%. And again, I would just like to pay attention to the fact that I could have added this to all of them. And it's going to do exactly the same thing. The difference would be that this is going to be applied to all the divs. In this case, since this is the only one we're using the transition property, that's the reason why I'm adding it specifically to hover off three. So as I'm hovering, what happens? What I see is that my border radius changes instantly and the color is taking four seconds because for now, only thing we're having is transition property and the name was background. So the way we're going to do this is we're going to have a comma. That would be the syntax. And then we just need to, again, write the property name. Now, in our case, this is going to be border radius. And we also have an option of, let's say, what kind of duration is going to be for the second property. If we don't want it to be four seconds, we just need to, again, another value. In our case, we're going to leave it for now the same. So this would be four seconds. And this is going to happen the same way, where the color is going to take four seconds, as well as the border radius. However, if we're going to add here, I don't know, uh, two seconds, then the radius is going to happen in two seconds. And you can see still that color is changing. So that would be the way how we can add multiple properties with our transition property. Stunning. We officially know the basics and general idea behind transition. Why don't we take a look at the transition delay property as well as how we can write the shorthand? Because otherwise you might find it annoying if you're going to have 50 properties, if you're going to have to have to specifically name all of them in your transition property. Well, first and foremost, let's go with delay, since I think this is going to be as straightforward as it gets. So again, we're going to write transition. So we're saying transition. Where are you? Uh, delay. And then we're saying for some kind of delay. Well, I don't know how long you would like to wait. Do you want me to talk for nothing for 10 seconds or let's say three seconds? Now, the moment we're going to add this, what's going to happen is that this is going to take three seconds. So this would happen over three seconds. And now only then the changes are going to take place. Now, as I'm hovering, I'm going to wait, 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 wait. And then after three seconds, my transition takes place. Again, nothing really to add as straightforward as it gets. This is just going to delay your transition. So far, so good. Well, what about, like I said, if this gets really annoying, if you have multiple properties that you would like to change over here, do you think this is going to be the best syntax where we just need to add the property, the duration, delay, and this is where the image comes into play. Meaning, remember when we were covering the background image? Eventually, we came up with a really neat and nifty syntax 
where we just wrote all our values. So we can do something very similarly over here. Now, first of all, let me delete this. Let's say that we're gonna get rid of this. Then I also would like to probably get rid of this hover because otherwise this might be a little bit confusing to you. And let's say that we only gonna be working with our third div. Let's just leave the other two alone. And we're gonna copy and paste it. And we're gonna say that we're gonna be changing two things as we're hovering, border radius and background. But what I would like to understand that we can add anything over here, as long as we are following the proper syntax. Now the proper syntax would be like this. We're gonna first have the transition. Then we're gonna have to write the name of the transition. So let's say in our case, or I'm sorry, the name of the property, we're gonna write background. So that that's gonna be our first thing. And then we're gonna be looking for how the transition is gonna take place. So how long the transition duration. In our case, we're gonna say, well, this is gonna be three seconds. And then we have an option of adding if we would want to have some kind of delay. So in my case, let's say I'm gonna be looking for five seconds. Now, the moment we're going to save it, first of all, please understand that this is going to be optional. What you really, really for sure need is going to be these three seconds. And you know what? Just to make it actually a little bit uh, more understanding, I'm going to right away add it. And now what happens is that the background is going to change place in three seconds. Now, I'm still having my border radius. So maybe let me comment this out because this might be a little bit confusing. So the background is going to take change in three seconds again. Something really similar we already covered, but this would be the shorthand. Okay, so far, so good. Then we have an optional one, and that is going to be how the transition is going to take place. But we are going to cover that in the next video. So for now, I'm just going to leave this blank. But we also have an optional of delay. So let's say in this case, I'm writing the delay, and then I'm saying the delay is going to take two seconds. Now, first, as I'm hovering, we're going to wait for two seconds, and then the background is going to be changing over the period of three seconds. So far, so good. What else? Well, if I would want the border radius, I can do the same thing. I can say border and I have the same properties here. You want to write the same ones, you can write the same ones. Or we can say, I don't know, the border radius is going to take place over five seconds, as well as the delay is going to be, I don't know, one second, something like this. It doesn't really matter as long as you make sure that these properties are correct. Now, let me uncomment this. Now we're going to wait for two seconds for the background to change. And then after one second, I'm going to have my border radius, which is going to take five seconds. Again, something we already have covered. What's really nifty, though, if we would like to have the same duration, the same delay and all that, we can write even bigger shorthand where we just write like this. We're going to say, first of all, all the properties. And this is a syntax. So don't write it your own. This needs to be in this word of all. Then we're saying how the transition duration is going to look like. And in our case, I don't know, we can say for just for change again, this is going to be four seconds and delay is going to be, I don't know, five seconds. Again, this is going to be optional. So you might not add it. You might add it. It doesn't really matter. And then I'm going to first of all wait for this div to appear because that's going to be the thing when this pretty much this transition right now is taking place. Now, the moment this div is going to appear, notice what's going to happen. So as I'm hovering now, we're going to wait for five seconds. So we're waiting, 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 waiting. And the moment our five seconds are up, then both of the things are happening. The border radius as well as the background. And both of them take change over four seconds of time. Now, this is how we can work with delays as well as this is how we can work with the actual shorthand for the transition property. We're almost done with transition property. But in the last video, I mentioned the optional transition timing property. So why don't we take a closer look? First and foremost, I want to tell you that there is a lot to this particular property. And the reason why we are going to cover bare minimum is the simple fact that at this point in time, in my opinion, that would be an overkill to spend more time on it. The general idea behind the property is to specifically decide how the transition is going to take place. And just to let you know that there is a default value already of ease. And that is the reason why the property is optional. Now, what other values are we going to have? Well, first and foremost, if you're looking at the shorthand, you see that the transition timing function is going to be placed here. So first, we're going to have the property that's going to be affected. Then we're going to look how long the transition is going to take place. And then we have the transition timing function. Now we can write it separately 
and during the example, we're gonna look at both ways. But right away, just to let you know that in the shorthand, this is gonna be placed here. Like I said, the ease value is gonna be default one, and that's the reason why it's optional. And as we're looking at these values, the ease one would be slow start, then this is gonna go fast and the slow end. Then we also have the linear, so that would be the same speed as well as we're looking at ease in and ease out, so slow start and slow end. And then last but not least, we would have the ease in and out. Now, like I said, this is just going to make a little bit more sense as we're looking with an example. And you know what? I will going to do redo the actual index HTML. So first of all, let me get rid of these divs as well as we're going to clean up a little bit of CSS because I would like to restructure it a little bit. And let's say within the index HTML, I would like to start by creating a div. Then the div is obviously going to have a class. Now, the default class is going to be the first one. So I'm going to say default. And let's write maybe also the text over here. Then I would like to create another one. And in general, we're going to create six of them. Now, I know this might be a little bit annoying, but since I would like to show you how they would work, we're just going to have to go along with that. Then we're going to copy and paste it. Then we're looking at linear. So linear timing function. Also, we have ease in and out, ease in and out. Or you know what? Let's start just with ease. Then we have ease out. And last but not least, we have ease in and out. So that would be the last one. Now, all this is nice and fine and dandy. But as you can see, I did a little bit of extra work. So let me get rid of this guy. Let me get rid of this guy. And let me get rid of this guy. As well as you know, this is also an overkill. So for some reason, I decided that I'm going to be adding way too many examples that I would want. Okay, now that we have the HTML set up, why don't we start with CSS? And like I said, the ease is going to be default one. But maybe we, before we start looking at the actual timing properties, why don't we set up the divs? So I'm going to say for all the divs, it's going to be exactly the same. We're going to have the width of I don't know, 100 pixels. The height is also going to be 100 pixels. So let's write height is going to be 100 pixels. Then we also have an option of background. So let's write the background blue. Now all of them are going to look something like this. We can also add the color just so we can see the text a little bit better. So the text right now is white. Uh, you know what? We also can use a little bit of margin all around. So let's say margin is going to be 15 pixels. And now we're having the margin as well as let's set up some default transition. So I'm going to say transition and all the properties are going to be affected. And this is going to take one second of time. Now, what kind of transition? Hmm, I don't know. Let's do div hover. So as we're hovering the div, let's combine whatever we already learned about the transform. So why don't we write transform? So we're going to be transforming. And the way we're going to transform it, we're going to translate it by, let's say, 100 pixels. And like I said, by default, right away, you will going to be having this ease. So if I would have right over here, ease, that would be the default value anyway. So technically, you wouldn't have to write this. Now, if I would want for all of them linear, you can just type linear. And then what's going to happen is the transition is going to have the same speed all throughout this transition. So it's going to start the same way and the same way. And during transition, it's also going to perform the same way. Uh, just to let you know, again, we have an option of testing them out like this, or we can go individually. And the way I would like to set up individually, I'm going to delete the linear one just to show you. And here we're going to say ease. So we're going to be targeting the actual div that had a class of ease. And here, let's write the transition timing function. So we can say transition, transition timing and obviously this is going to be uh, impossible to find and then we're going to be looking for let's say ease. and again this is going to be exactly the same how we would be writing this like this so i could have wrote it transition then all then whatever two seconds and ease and again this is just to show you that these are possible options since we have already set up the div here with transition of all and one second i'm just adding here this timing function. But in general, normally we would write something like this, where we would specifically go with each and every transition. Now, I don't want to do each and every transition for all of them because we have six of them. 
So that is the reason why I'm using the shortcut where I already set up everything in a div. So the properties, all of them, the timing is gonna be one second. And then for each and every div, we're just gonna look at different property value for this timing function. That's all we're doing. And as you notice, this shouldn't be no difference. So the first one is gonna be exactly the same as the second one. Because like I said, the default value is gonna be ease. So if I set up these, this is going to look exactly the same. Now, what other values we're we going to have? Let's say we can look at linear. And for the linear, again, we can just copy and paste this. And let's just change this to linear. Let's say linear. And the moment what's going to happen, notice that there's not going to be this slow start or slow end. And this is going to take exactly the same speed as throughout the whole uh, transition. What else we have? We have ease in and out and ease in and out. Okay, so first class, second class, and third class. So we might as well copy and paste it three times. And this is not what I wanted to do, as well as not, not this is what I wanted to do. So let me select the line. Let's say that I would want to select actual line and let's copy and paste it. Um, you know what? Let's let's do one more time. And here we can right away delete all three linears. So we're not going to be selecting the linears. And yeah, let's just name it ease in. And I know this might be a little bit annoying. But again, since I would like to show you at least the general idea behind it, uh, there's going to be a little bit of typing. And then we're going to be looking for ease in. Then also we have ease in out. Ease out. As well as the value here is going to be ease out. Ease out, and last but not least, we have ease in and out. So ease in and out, and there will gonna be more options for you. Again, if you would like to go and research it, just type in a Google the CSS transition timing function, and you're gonna see way more options. But again, in this case, I don't feel like this is necessary for us, whatever we're doing right now, because we can just get away with learning the simple. Linear, ease in and out, and ease out, let's say. So the moment we save it, what's going to happen is that with linear, I'm going to repeat probably for a third time, but this is going to be same speed. Ease in is going to have the slow start. Slow end is going to be for the ease out. And last but not least, we have the ease in and out, slow start and fast and slow end. Now, as we're hovering again, the default one is going to be exactly the same as ease. Then we have the linear one. Just gonna have the same speed. Ease in is just gonna have the slow start, and then it's just gonna perform normally. Ease out is gonna have the slow end, and then we'll have again the slow start, slow end, and the fast during their transition. And those will be the basics behind the transition timing function in the CSS. Next one up, we have animation, and probably since they're gonna be so similar, one of the first questions you're gonna have is gonna be like. Okay, I know the transition, but why you're shoving this animation in my face right now? And the answer is actually very simple. You see, with transition, we always went from zero to 100. And that's going to be obviously in a nutshell. We're going to look at an example and yada, yada, yada. But just to give you a one quick, short one uh, sentence answer, transition goes from zero to 100. Always. We went from some kind of state that was here, let's say on the left hand side, and then our box moved to right hand side, and then it moved back. What's cool with animation, we have way more options. So we can have the points. So the animation is not going to go from zero to 100 all the time. Instead, we can have the zero, then let's say 1% and dot, 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 whatever percentages we would want. And I know, or you know already, what I'm going to say is that we're going to have to look at the example, because as always, this is just going to make way more sense. And again, Yes, we will going to be deleting CSS. We will going to be deleting HTML because I do find it much more convenient or much more productive if we get used to working with HTML and CSS. We could always, let's say, expand on the previous example, but that I think robs you the actual opportunity to work on the muscle memory. Again, it is my personal opinion. You might disagree with that, but that's just the way it is. And here, let's start by simply saying that there's going to be div. Now, this div is going to have some kind of class, and the class, let's say, is going to be transition, just so we can see the difference. 
and we can also maybe write transition name here. Maybe that's gonna make sense. And then I would like to copy and paste it. And now I would like to actually delete the, these values. So I'm gonna say that I'm gonna get rid of the transition. And here we're gonna write animation. And you already probably guessed it that we're gonna be styling one with transition and the second one with animation. Now within the CSS, let's just say that both divs are gonna look exactly the same. So again, width is gonna be, I don't know, 200 pixels. Then we can do the height. Uh, that's gonna be 100 pixels. Also, maybe let's add a little bit of margin all around just so they're not stacked one on top of each other as well as, and you know what, obviously this is not gonna be class. This is gonna be the div. And then let's start with specific classes. So for transition, I'm gonna say, and you know what, last but not least, let me add color and white here. And for transition, what I would want for this div. Well, first of all, let's add some background. And let's say background is going to be right. So this is going to be my transition. And also, I would like to say that there is going to be some kind of change. So I'm going to do this with transition. I'm going to say that there's going to be transition. Now all the properties are going to be affected. This is going to take two seconds. And let's do a linear since we know that ease is going to be the default one anyway. Okay, so far, so good. As well as I would like to work with my hovering because obviously this transition should take place as I'm hovering. So I'm going to say as we transition, as we're hovering, what should happen? Well, let's say background is going to turn yellow. Again, nothing really um, original. As well as, I don't know, we're going to work with a transform property. So I'm going to say transform is going to be, again, translating X direction by, let's say, I don't know, 100 pixels. So something like this. Now, what happens as I'm hovering, then this is going to move all the way to the right. And then as we're not hovering, we're moving all the way to the left. Okay, so far, so good. So what about the animation? Why this is so special? Well, let's start working on this dip. So first of all, the name was animation. And now let's add maybe a background of, I don't know, blue, something like this. So this is going to have the background of blue. And what else we would like to add over here? I don't know. Uh, we can start working with animation maybe right away. Now, for the animations, we would need to set up keyframes. So the syntax would be something like this. We would need to write, first of all, hat. And this is going to be very similar, like we worked with media queries. Remember, we did something very similar. We had the hat and then media. Now, in this case, we were going to have to write the keyframes. Now, the naming matters here, meaning if you're going to name this Grandpa Bob, then you also need to reference it in the animation with the same name. So don't write something here. Uh, different than the within the animation because this is not going to work. This is as simple as that. And I'm just going to call my animation move. And like I said, the difference would be that we're not going from the state of zero to 100. We have multiple states here. Now, how do we access these states? Well, we can use the percentage values. So I can say four to zero percent. This is going to have some kind of value. And first of all, I'm just going to say transform and let's translate it. I don't know, 20 pixels X direction. So I'm going to say X direction, 20 pixels. So this is going to be my zero value. And then also I can have an option here of saying at 50%, this should be translated, let's say 100 pixels. So again, we can copy and paste it. And let's say 100 pixels. Now we're not limited to only having the one property here. Because as you can see, we're working just with transform. We also can do, let's say background. And again, this could be as many properties as you would like. Now, let me add the semicolon. Otherwise, this is going to throw an error. And let's say background is going to be red. So at 50% of the animation, the background is going to be red. Then we can add 75. And as always, the reason why I'm using these round values is just to give you an idea. Please understand that you can use 1, 2, 3%, 1.5. It doesn't really matter. But the, I'm not obviously going to cover all of them because it doesn't really make sense if we're going to be going from zero to 100 by each and every incremation. Uh, you know what we can in this case, maybe grab these values already. So we can say translate. And in this case, I would want to move it 100% negative. So this is going to shift to the left. The yellow color is going to be also the color for the background. And last but not least, let's go for the 100. Where and you know what, again, I copy and paste it way too many times. Uh, and for the 100, I don't know what I would want. Let me decide. I'm going to go back again to 20 pixels, I guess. 
as well as i'm gonna set this up with green so that's my animation now at the moment as i'm refreshing the page nothing happens and the reason why nothing happens because we still need to set up the animation now for the animation again similarly how we had we transition we have the long way of writing this or we have the short end so first maybe let's start with the long one and then we're going to bounce back to a shorthand version now for the animation we're going to say first of all animation name so we always always need the animation name and this is where the naming comes important again if you name this something else don't write grandpa maria here or not grandpa maria grandma maria and let's say here i'm going to write move since this is obviously the name of my animation now once we save it nothing happens because there's two more properties that we need for the animation so not only we need duration so similarly like we had with transformation or transition i'm sorry then we also need the count so how many times this animation is going to take place so we're going to be looking for animation and then we have the count property animation iteration count animation iteration and then we're looking for the count we have all kinds of options we can go one two whatever 12 and we're also going to have infinite value now we're going to look at the infinite value later on let me just go with two so this is going to run two times now notice what happens on the right hand side this animation is right now bouncing to 50 percent and then 75 was negative 200 and then we're going back to again to a zero and again the animation is going to take two times because we had the count here of two now you can already see that this gives you way more options transition was very simple i go from one side and i go to another side and then the values are changing from zero percent to hundred percent with animation this gives you unlimited amount of options now keep in mind though this 10 seconds is going to reflect this 50 percent so if i'm going to write here let's say 20 seconds then my 50 percent is going to be already at 10 seconds and so on and so forth so these values are correlating to each other so if we're going to write one second this 50 percent is going to mean 0 0.5 seconds and so on and so forth okay so far so good now what about the shorthand because we see obviously the long way of writing this now for the shorthand again this is going to be very very similar to what we had with transitions first is going to be the name and you know what let me go up here and select them all and just comment them out the first one is going to be the name then again we were looking for how long this is going to take place so duration and maybe in this case let's write five seconds as well as the last one is going to be how many times we're going to run the uh, animation and let's use the infinite value because that way you'll see that the uh, animation is going to be bouncing infinitely and whatever again we have the 50 percent 75 and the animation is just going to keep on repeating because we set up this value with the infinite bounds and this is how we can work with animations in the css well we're still on a topic of animation why don't we take a look at the animation fill mode property and what it stands for now the theory is that animation fill mode is helpful with defining the values outside the animation now in practical how this is going to look like well i don't know maybe in index html let's get rid of this transition we don't need it as well as let's make our css a little bit more slim where we're not going to have these styles for transitions because we already have covered it and you know what also i would like to get rid of all these comments here and you know what might as well let's get rid of the animation for now at least and delete all the information that we had within the move animation to begin with just i would like to start from the scratch so i have my animation and you know what the moment i save it obviously this is going to be my div and let's imagine some kind of scenario where there's going to be animation and i would want to start with opacity of zero which would mean that we wouldn't be able to see this div and we're going to do the animation where it goes back to 0 0.5 opacity so then we would want to decide how the animation fill mode is going to come into play first things first let's set up our animation and i'm going to say that at zero percent there's going to be the opacity of zero so i'm going to write opacity zero then also there's going to be 50 percent animation so at or you know what let's maybe write 25 percent at 25 we would like to transform property again and this is going to be translate x 
negative 200 or you know what? 200. Let's do 200. This is going to shift to the right as well as let's add a little bit more opacity. Now, in this case, opacity is going to be, I don't know, 0 0.25. Since this is 25%, then let's copy and paste it. So let's say one, two, uh, we have 50%. Yeah, that should be enough. So with 50%, we're going to have the opacity of 0 0.5. Then at 100%, we're also going to have a opacity of, let's say, you know what? No, let's change around. Let's say 50% is going to be opacity of one. And then once we go back to 100%, we're going to have a opacity of 0 0.5. We already know how we can use the animation. So I'm going to write animation. And the name is going to be what? Well, the name was move. So that would be our first value. Then we're looking for how long the duration would be. So let's say five seconds and let's run this two times. Now, the moment we save it, our animation is kicking in. Everything is working fine. But what happens? Well, we get to the 50%. So this is where we're going to stop then. And here, obviously, there's a mistake. Sorry, yeah, I'm looking at it. I'm thinking why this is doing that, because I obviously left the translate with 200. So let me fix this. I would want to have not 200. So my bad, I was waiting, waiting for it. And I'm like looking at it. Well, wait a minute. Nothing is really happening. And then let's say zero. So this is going to bounce to the right, then bounce left back and then end up with a zero. So the moment we save it, now we have our animation where it bounces the first time, bounces the second time. And then the end of the second time, it stays back to a opacity of one because we can clearly see where the actual div is sitting for. And maybe that's not something we would want. Maybe I would want to end up with opacity of 0 0.5. So this is where the property of animation fill mode comes into play, where we can head over back here and we can say animation fill mode. And we have a few options. We have backwards where this would go back to original value, which in our case would be something like this, or we have an option of forward. Now, how the forwards is going to look like the moment I'm going to save it. Eventually, once the animation is going to stop running, my div is going to stay with opacity of 0 0.5. Don't believe me. Let's test it out. The animation runs the first time. OK, so far, so good. Then again, we run the animation the second time. And the moment it stops running, instead of going back to opacity of one, which would be our original value, we are going forwards and staying with whatever values we had here. So if I'm going to add, let's say, translation of 20 pixels, what's going to happen is my div is going to be by default right now also translated, not only opacity. And in general terms, this is how we can work with animation film mode, where you would want your div, let's say, to get the values that you end up with with 100%. Then you're just going to add animation film mode and you're going to use the value of forwards. Hey, guys, in our last module before working on a project, we will cover CSS variables, how to use them, why we would want to use them in the first place, how to add font awesome icons to our projects, and what would be the general syntax for the font awesome icons, text shadow and box shadow properties, as well as the external resources for both properties. We will also going to take a look at what in the world are browser prefixes and semantic HTML tags. And we'll take a look at useful Emmet snippets to speed up our workflow during the project development. Moving on, we have CSS variables, aka custom properties. And I can tell you right away, I really like CSS variables. I like to use them because they give us a lot of flexibility. Now, the main point behind the variable would be the fact that we can store the variable and then we can reuse it all throughout the document. Now, the syntax would be dash dash, then the name of the variable. And then what kind of value would like to hold? And then if we would like to use it, then we're going to have the property. And then again, syntax would be var. So that is the syntax. So please don't skip it. And then here we'll need to go again with dash dash and the name of that variable. Now there's going to be two types of scopes for the variables. There's going to be the global one where we can use it all throughout the document. And now we're going to return back to this selector. Remember, we were talking about pseudo selectors. And in that case, we were talking about the root where we actually are selecting the HTML element. 
so that way we're setting up our variables as globals or we can do it locally just to one element. Now, in our example, again, we're going to use mostly the actual colors or I think maybe exclusively colors because they are going to make most sense. But just remember, you can use it with any kind of property and throughout the project. This is exactly what we're going to do. First things first, we're going to head over back to HTML. As always, we need something to work with. So let's say heading. And in this case, I would like to have the class. So I'm going to say class. And here I'm going to use the same heading class. Now, technically, we maybe don't need to even add classes. We could have done this with heading ones, but you know, just because I like adding classes, we're just going to go with uh, classes. Okay, first one is going to be heading one. Then we're going to create another paragraph. I don't know. Here, the class would be, I guess, text. And let's, I don't know, have some lorem text. I don't know, 20 words. I think that's going to be enough. Okay, so far, so good. So we have paragraph and one heading one. So what's next? Well, now I would like to create a div with a class of main where I'm going to have another paragraph. Now, the reason for that is because I would like to show you how we can locally scope this. So I'm going to say first that there's going to be a div. Then with the div, we're going to have some class and the class name is going to be main. And within this div, there's going to be another paragraph. And again, just because I like adding classes, I'm going to say class and this is going to be equal to the main text. And again, we can do the same spiel. 20 words, please. Thank you, Emmett. Now, moving on after the div, there's going to be two more headings. One is going to be with a class of, I don't know, uh, second heading. Again, this doesn't really matter what kind of class names you have, or you can select later on with headings with the element selector. But I think I'm just going to stick with the actual uh, classes. So heading, and I can just do it over here like this. I can say that, first of all, yeah, this is going to be heading. Then we're going to copy and paste this. So I'm going to say one more heading three. And let's change the class here again, just so we can see actually how this is going to be happening. We're going to have third heading. Now we have the main heading, two paragraphs, and one of them that is important sitting within a div. And then we have the another heading. Now, if we're heading back to HTML, or I'm sorry, CSS, then you know what? For the time being, I'm just going to collapse this just so we can see a little bit better what we're doing. And then let's start by selecting the colors. Because this, that usually is going to be something we're going to use the CSS variables where let's say that if I would want for the heading some kind of color and I'm going to say color hashtag F15025. So that's going to be my orange color. So far, so good. Then also I have an option of using the text. Remember that was for the paragraph. Again, we're going to have the color hashtag 32FF and 0E. So that was the green color. And I would like to also have the for the main text. So for this guy over here, I'm going to say main text. And then I don't know, we can use color. Hashtag uh, 1313 and F8. Okay, so I have three colors. Now, what happens if I want, let's say, color for the second heading? Well, you can say you have many options. You can either include it here with the heading one or you can just reuse the color again, really pick and choose. Okay, I'll listen to your advice. And I'm going to say second heading. And I would like to reuse one of these colors. No, let's say this is going to be this orange one. So I cannot again type color or we obviously could have copy and pasted. There's no big deal. But since I really like typing 0.25. Okay, but what happens later on? Let's say a simple example that I change my color. I say, you know what? I really don't like this orange one. I would like to have some kind of color. And okay, I mean, it's easy. I can just change it, right? You can say, well, change the, I don't know, variables, say 39, and hopefully this is going to be better. So now we're having a darker orange color. Okay, but what happens in all the instances of this color? Now, in this case, obviously, we have only two of them. We have the heading and the second heading. What is going to happen if you're going to have a five page website. Are you really going to jump through every instance where you have the color and change this color? Because it might be a little bit annoying. Or, okay, you don't have this case, but you have another case where by mistake you typed like this. You were typing, you were busy, you were watching TV or something, and then it doesn't even match your original color. Another mistake. Or, you know, what to do. So, what would be the solution? And this is where the CSS variables come into help where we have a way of storing these values. 
and then I can just reuse them all throughout my document and they were gonna be stored in one place. So there's not gonna be any typos. That's number one. And number two, the moment I'm gonna change it in my main setting, whatever I'm storing these values, they are gonna be changed all throughout my document. Don't believe me? Let me show you. And for this, you know what? I will gonna do a little bit uh, more of actually commenting out because again, I don't want this to get in our way. So I'm going to save this. I mean, we already have covered this. Technically, again, there's no real point of saving these colors. We have colored the hex values, but just in case so you have everything that we're doing in a lecture, I'm just going to keep this in the comments. However, I will going to collapse this because I think this is going to be easier for us to work with. Like I said, there's going to be two places where we can store these values. One is going to be locally for some kind of element. And the second one is going to be globally. Now, the global one is going to make sure that we can access it everywhere. And again, we were going to be going back to the root. Now, if you remember, the root was selecting the HTML element. So saying whatever I'm doing right now is I'm working with HTML element. And in this case, I would like to start with declaring a variable. So I'm going to say primary color. And again, name this whatever you want. The Madea, the orange, the Chicago's, the again, doesn't really matter. Are you going to name something rela related to the color? If you're storing the color value, probably. I mean, unless you really uh, are a rebel or something, you will going to use something that relates to the value that we're going to be holding. So in my case, I'm going to say primary color. And then I would say that I would want to store F15025. Now, the key here is I can reuse it where I would like. So again, I can say heading. And in this case, again, we're going to use the color property, but this is where the change happens because instead of using this value, I can say var again, that was the syntax two dashes, and then I'm going for my variable. Now, at the moment, we have only one variable, so it's kind of hard to mess it up. But in general, we're gonna have five, six, seven, ten. It doesn't really matter. Now, check this out I have access to this color. So, if I would want for the second heading, no problem, I can just get the same thing. So, I can say like this, I can copy and paste it. And I believe the class name was second heading. Correct me if I'm wrong. Second heading. What do you see here? And I see this orange color. You don't like the orange color? Well, no problem. Let's delete this. Let's say this is going to be hashtag 1313FA. Uh, so all my headings are blue. I hope you already see how much more beneficial this is than copying, pasting each and every line that you're working. in. It might seem like no big deal to copy and paste it first five times as we're working with these silly examples. But the moment you're going to start doing some kind of relevant work, you will going to appreciate CSS variables a lot. And I mean it a lot. Okay, now we have this cover one covered. What about if we create another color? And let's say I don't know, or you know what, let me show you another property. So since we have been covering everything here with the colors, why don't we create another one? Why don't we say main transition? Because like I said, we can store anything we would like here. We already have covered transition, so we should be very similar to the shorthand where we have the all. So this would be all the properties. And I'm going to say 0 0.3 or four seconds. And then the transition is going to have the transition function of linear. So transition is going to happen linearly. OK, and what I would like right now is for the second heading. So that's going to be my element. As I'm hovering, I would like to have the different color. And you know what? Let's add a different color. Also, this would be, let's say, primary. And we're going to have another variable, secondary color. And this is going to be orange. So again, let's say F15025. I know I deleted it and now I'm adding it again. My apologies, but I just wanted to show you the blue one and then got carried away, deleted it. Now it's back. OK, now as I'm hovering, I would like to change the color. And again, I can use the var since this is globally. I can access this anywhere. I can access it in this paragraph and that paragraph it doesn't really matter. Now I'm showing the heading, but hopefully you understand the idea. Secondary color. Here I come. As I'm hovering, this is going to be the color. Now also at the moment, there's no transition. As I'm hovering, it happens instantly. Well, I don't want that. So I can say transition again. And then I'm going to be looking for what? Well, var again, the syntax and main transition. What's really cool, again, I can add this transition if, let's say, I set for all of them 0 0.4, I can re reuse this all throughout the document, everywhere I would like. 
you want 0 0.5 later on, you can add 0 0.5 later on. Obviously, if you want to have some kind of unique transitions, you wouldn't want to do this. But in my case, I usually prefer just to sticking with one transition unless there's really, really something major that I would like to change. I mean, not for every project, but in general terms. So let's say, as you can see, again, the transition is happening. So everything is working. So we have successfully created the variables and we know how we can reuse them. Now let's look with the local scope. Because so far, we are just working with the main scope. And again, I'm not going to show you the example, but we could access this here with a paragraph. We could access this in the text because the reason for that, because we set up the root and the root right now has these variables. I hope you understand it. OK, what about the local one? Well, the local, let's say, paragraph right now is sitting where? Well, this is sitting in a div. I can target the class. This is going to work exactly the same, but I'm going to say it for the div. Because again, this maybe is going to be a little bit easier to understand, but we could have used the class. And in this case, I'm going to say primary, primary red, or you know what? Let's just write it like this primary red color. And I'm going to set this equal just to simple red color. I could have used the hash value, it doesn't really matter, but in my case, I'm going to say the simple red color. Okay, what is within the div? Uh, if I remember correctly, within the div, we have main text. Okay, so. Class name, main text, here you go. Uh, color is going to be what? Well, I can use again the variable name, right? So var, the syntax, dash, dash, primary red. And you also right away saw two options. So I could have uh, used, you see, the primary or secondary. And I also could use this primary red. The moment we save it, sure enough, no questions asked. We're having this paragraph read. OK, what about can we access these values somewhere else? So let's say we are trying to access this another th heading, the one that's all the way in the bottom with a class of third heading. I mean, we can always test it out. We can say third heading. That's going to be the name. And for this heading, I would like to access again the color as well as I would like to access var. And let's try for primary red. And let's see whether this is going to work out. And the moment I save it, nothing changes. Hmm. Does that mean that this is going to be locally scoped? As always, we can head over to our developer tools and say inspect. And we'll be able to see what's happening with inheritance. So this is going to be my body. Now, what happens on my heading one as I'm looking over it? Well, I see here that I'm using the primary color and all that. But notice what's telling you. Inherited from HTML. Inherited what? Well, we inherited colors, one color transition. So far, so good. Now, what happens with this guy with the one that's sitting within the main? Do we see it here? So we have a paragraph. So what paragraph is inheriting? Well, it's inheriting two things. It's inheriting from the div, the primary red. So we can re reuse it everywhere within this div. And obviously, since we set it up in our uh, CSS with the div, understand that I can add as many divs and this is going to be scoped to those divs. So this is just the way normal CSS would work, but it also has access to these values. So if you want locally scoped, you can create some kind of variables. Uh, in most cases, though, I'm not a fortune teller, but I would assume that you're going to be probably setting up everything globally within the root and then just reusing these variables all throughout your project. As you're going to be creating more and more web projects, in most cases, you will going to need some kind of icon. Um, the service that I really like to use is font awesome icons. Um, just a disclaimer. There is many, many icons you can get out there. But well, the reason why I like using font awesome because they're free. They are easy to get up and running and they have a very straightforward and simple syntax. As always, we're going to get rid of everything that we had within the CSS. Then the same with an HTML. We're just going to say that we're looking for them. Let's say we're going to be looking for heading one, heading three. This is all gone. You know what? Also, I'm going to clean up a little bit my head because we were going to be copy and pasting this. So I'm going to say that I'm going to copy and paste it. And then uh, we're going to change this not to Google fonts. We're going to say uh, icons or we can say font awesome. It doesn't really matter. Uh, we'll save it. Now we have a clean document. What's next? Uh, we always go to our good old friend Google. And we're going to be looking for fontawesome.com. And we can type font awesome icons, and doesn't matter. In my case, I think 
I'm right away gonna have fontawesome.com, and this is gonna be your startup screen. Now, within the startup screen, if you never have worked with fontawesome icons, we can go over to the docs where they explain everything that you need to do, and the basic use would be very similar to what we have done already before, meaning there's gonna be some kind of element, and the difference would be you we were gonna have to include the font awesome to our document. That's gonna be the first step, which we're gonna do in a second. But the moment we have it included to the document, we need to create an I element. So this is where I'm saying something similar because we would need to create an element. And then for this element, we're gonna add the classes. Depending on the name of your icon, this is where you're gonna be choosing different classes. However, don't skip on this first one. You need to include FAS, or if there's going to be different type of icons that would need FAB. Now, there might be an also the pro one. That's the one you need to pay. Or this one says regular, but as far as I remember that this was for the pro one, you had to pay. And this was the FAR. Uh, what else? What else? As we're scrolling down, then I tell us pretty much what would be the font weight. We don't really care about that. The styling we're going to cover in a second, the moment we're going to have actually in a document. This is going to be another styling. Uh, yeah, that would be pretty much with the docs. Uh, here we would have the icons. So whenever you want to search for icons, you just click on icons and go ahead. Just pick whatever icon you would like over here. Uh, if I would want, I don't know, Amelia or Android, I just click on it and you're going to get the syntax. Now, like I said, for the Android, let's say this is going to be FAB. And then the name FA Android. Now, if we're going to head over back to the all icons, let me show you just one with FAS. Just so you didn't think that I'm pulling the wool over your ears. Uh, let's say archive, maybe. Hopefully, this is going to be FAS. And yes, it is. So this is going to be FAS. That would be another type of syntax. Uh, how can I start working with Font Awesome? Okay, let's have a look. We have the start option. So let's click on the start option. And the first thing they provide you is right away CDN. The moment we're going to understand the general syntax, I'll show you how to download. And I'm also going to explain why am I downloading. You don't have to download, but I'm going to give you my reasons for it. Uh, let's copy this right away. So it tells us that it has been copied. We're going to head over back to the head element. And in this case, above the style sheet. And maybe let's add the some kind of uh, comment here, let's say custom CSS, just so we can see not custom. And this is going to be our CSS within the body. What we're going to do? Well, let's create these two icons, let's say in the beginning, because I don't think we need any more to actually understand the basics of it. Now, the first one, like I said, this would be the element and we can still use the MF. So this hasn't changed. And then we're going to have the I and then we're going to be looking for class. In my case, I'm going to say FAS, FA home. That would be the name, the, the icon that I'm looking for. The moment I'm going to save it, notice what's going to happen. In the document in the browser, I'm going to have my little icon. Now, just to give you a heads up, if you want to control the height of the icon, you can use their own classes. I always prefer to do it in my CSS because I feel like I have more control over it because then I don't have to jump back and from uh, the document and actually changing it here. Because understand you're changing this in the HTML. So if you're going to add it in, let's say, 15 places, I find it easier if we're going to set up actual class with the uh, actual value. But again, this is your option. So you can say something like 5x. And there's going to be different values. We can go with 1x. Let's say this is going to be 1x. Then we have 10x. So that would be the biggest one. And so on and so forth. Again, if that's really something you're interested in, you can head over to documentation, explore it more. I don't prefer doing this way. Again, I told you my reasons, but you can do really whatever you would like. Awesome. We have our basic one. And you know what? I will going to leave the size just so we can see actually better in a browser at the moment. So I'm going to say something like 5x. So now we're going to have the big icon. If we want to add some custom styling, we can just head over back to the CSS. And then remember, we had a class name. We had this class of FA Home. We can actually style this. We can say FA. Now, the name is important again. If you're going to name this FA Orange, it's obviously not going to get to the class. However, if I'm going to be targeting this class and I'm going to say that the color of my home icon is going to be green, what you see in a browser is the green color icon. We also have an option of working with some kind of parent element. 
so i can say span here and then let's maybe add the facebook icon just so you can see that how we, we can work with fab now i'm going to do a little bit of emma shortcut that i haven't been doing and i'm going to show you that actually in the emmet video where we can just have the element and then dot and then we're adding the classes so in my case we're going to say facebook the result is going to be exactly the same we're going to be getting our element with our classes and i will going to show you that in the emmet video but in general this is how it's going to speed up your workflow uh, we have the icon we have the parent element why don't we add the class and let's say here properly we're going to say class and we can use the id we can target the actual element again it's really up to you and we're going to call this social icon and within the styles we can do the same thing we already did so i'm going to say social icon and now let's i don't know add the font size like i said we can add the font size bigger so in our case since this is going to be font awesome icons we can use the font size because we were going to be able to access the size with the this property and then let's say for rems so now this is going to be much more bigger and we can maybe add the color of i don't know blue now this is going to be my icon with a blue color so those would be the two options how we can access it with a CSS. Now I'd like to head over back to the font awesome documentation and go over why I would like to download, especially why am I downloading for the project, the font awesome icon? Well, here's the thing. I really like font awesome icons, but what's really sometimes annoying is the fact that they're updating their versions and they're changing some type of syntax. Just to give you an example. When they switched to five item five in the beginning, you only could style it with the parent element in the font awesome four. You were actually able to access the class like this when it was sitting in an I element. But then once they rolled out the font awesome five in the beginning, you can style this only by accessing the parent element. Now they're back again where you can style the class. And what happens is that if you include the CDN, this CDN technically is just going to be dealing with whatever icons you have so far so good so that would be good enough for your project but in my case if somebody's watching the tutorial they are including their own cdn unless they're obviously using the source files but what happens is that they're using their own cdn and then the version has already updated and then they're trying to let's say style all their icons with just accessing the class of a hey home and for that particular reason, they cannot do it for that particular version. And they're mad because they're like, well, excuse me, you are doing the tutorial and you are able to access your font awesome icons directly with this class here on font awesome. But then I would have to do it here with the parent. So that's the reason why I always like to include actually download the font awesome icons, include them in a set of files. And then once they're in a set of files, I can say, hey, listen, so I'm doing the tutorial. If you want to follow along exactly, I don't know whether the font awesome version has changed, but you can always access the ones that I was using. Again, long story short, it just saves me a time later on as they roll out the new versions of font awesome. After all this talking and yammering about uh, unnecessary stuff, maybe for you, I'm going to head over to download because that's where we can get the icons. We can click it over here. And first of all, they were going to tell you right away what files you would need to include. You want to use the SVG, use this file. You want to use the CSS version, use all CSS. However, one thing that is very important is to have the whole folder there. So don't just drag and drop the file because the file is going to be looking for the actual folder. Now, in order to do that, let's just actually click it. Now we're starting to download. I'm going to head over back to my actual documents so in the finder i'm going to go to downloads then this is going to be my font awesome and i'm going to open up the zip file i'm just going to say that i would like to copy this so let's copy this and within the css we're just going to copy and paste it now this is going to be my font awesome good i have my font awesome now what's next well first of all let me show you what happens if we don't have the link so i'm going to delete this and the font awesome icons are going to be gone but then remember, we have the option of looking for this file, whether all GS or all CSS. Well, let's look for it. So here again, we would need to use the link. And then what am I doing? Well, I'm looking for font awesome. That's my folder. 
now i already know that css is going to be located there so i'm just going to head over for the css and then i'm looking for all css and that's going to be my path if you named your folder differently here then understand that you need to look for the folder where you have your font awesome icons and now i have them back and that's pretty much going to mean short how we can include font awesome icons to a project and start using them and we will going to use them a lot throughout our projects so you will really get to know font awesome icons right after the font awesome icons on our agenda is going to be text shadow property as well as box shadow property for this we're going to go first to index html we're going to set up i don't know one heading so let's say main heading and then we're also going to have some div now the div is going to have a class of box so simple div class is going to be box that's going to be enough for our html and within the css let's start styling the first the text so this is going to be heading one uh yeah you already see the text shadow property i think that's kind of self-explanatory but what values are we looking for well the first value is going to be x meaning this axis and the second one is going to be y axis then we're looking for also the blur as well as last one is going to be color it's going to be much more easier if i show you so let's say one pixel one pixel so first let's start very easy just by one pixel and one pixel and we can also do the color of red now what's happening is you notice that we are getting the text shadow if i start changing the values you'll notice where the values are changing so if i'm going to say five pixels notice right now the direction is going to be x direction so far so good and we can change it also the y direction so if i want to change the y direction i can set up here the y direction you don't want actually the x direction you can write like this so again you can delete the pixels you can just leave zero it's going to do exactly the same thing now let me leave one and one and the blur is going to be the blur of the shadow so i can stay let's say one and one but i can make it blurry less blurry more blurry and you get an idea last but not least we have the color again any option under the sun you want to go with rgb you go with rgb you want to go with rgba go with rgba hex whatever you name it and that would be the text shadow then we also have box shadow and for the box shadow first let's work with our box let's say width is gonna be 200 pixels that would be our width then we can also add some height 100 pixels background blue uh margin is gonna be let's say 20 pixels all around that's gonna have to be our margin and now let's work with our box shadow and here with the box shadow we have one extra that would be an optional i'm going to show you that in a second but the general idea is going to be exactly the same we have the box shadow property again the first one is going to be for the x value then the second one is going to be for y value then we have the blur and then we're here looking for the green now obviously this is just going to be the color and what happens is you notice that i'm getting my back shadow as well as again i can change these values and you'll see exactly the same things like we were doing before that is all good but we have also nice external resources so first start let's text uh, shadow and generator and we're going to head over to this site it doesn't really matter there's a bunch of them you can pick any one you want i have no real preference usually the one that first one jumps out and i'm good to go i'm going to say no and then you see the example obviously so this would be example text if you want the distance notice this is going to be my distance if you want the blur this is going to be my blur you can change the angle i mean whatever options you would like and what they're do at the end they're just going to spin you out the code so this would be the code that you're going to be looking for you also can choose obviously the opacity that would be with the color name and this is going to give you whatever values you like now in this case if we're going to be choosing let's say for rgb i would want this one so that's going to be my red color only thing I would need to do is just copy and paste this code. I'm going to head over back to my text. I will going to comment this out, the easy one that we had, and just copy and paste it. And now we're going to have this text shadow. Okay, so that would be for text shadow. We also have an option for box shadow, believe it or not, generator. And that meaning sarcastic, of course, there's going to be something for the box shadow. If you're already using for text shadow, you could imagine that 
they both of them are gonna have some kind of external resources, and not only some, there's gonna be a bunch of them. The reason why I'm showing you right away the box shadow because the result is gonna include the browser prefixes, and that is actually the topic of our next video. So I purposely picked right now the text shadow and box shadow just so we can talk about them. Because remember when we were talking about linear gradients, we first time we met them in the color Zilla when we were generating the linear gradients. Well, again, we're looking at the browser prefixes. So I think now it would be a good time to talk about them. So here again, we're doing the same thing. We see that there's going to be some kind of value. So this is going to be my box. If you want horizontal length, horizontal length, vertical length, vertical length, blur radius, blur radius. And this is that spread where you can kind of spread it over here. That would be something optional. Again, as you're using, uh, remember, we had three values. So this would be the fourth one. Again, if you want to include it, include it. Then shadow color, the background color, I mean, you name it. Really, we can pick whatever we would like over here. Again, opacity, we can change it. And the only thing that's missing is over here, this text. Now, what I would like to do is, first of all, refresh it. And hopefully, this is going to go back to actual zero. And I would like to show you with a hover effect, because that would be probably a little bit better example. So let's say here we're going to be first starting with horizontal length. And I'm going to go with like five, something like this. Or you know what? Uh, no, you know what? Yeah, let's stay with 10. And then I'm going to show you the actual uh, how this is going to work with five. So let's say I'm going to save this first of all, or I'm sorry, copy and paste it. So grab whatever values you have over here without changing anything. We're going to head over to the box and we're going to say for the box. We need to have actually as I'm hovering. So I'm going to say as I'm hovering, I would like to copy and paste these tiles. And then first of all, I'm going to get rid of this one and let's add maybe transition because this is going to be a little bit nicer. We already know how to do that all. Um, let's say 0 0.5 seconds and let's say linear. Now what's going to happen is as I'm hovering, notice now we're getting our box shadow property. And now that we have covered box shadow and text shadow, we understand the basic idea. I would like to talk about the browser prefixes. All right. What are these weird browser prefixes? In a nutshell, vendor prefixes, as they're also called, are the ways for different browsers to add support for the latest CSS features. Browser prefixes are needed as the browsers experiment and test it out their implementation of the new CSS3 properties. And an excellent external resource that we're going to use is going to be can I use that com. Now, the basic syntax would be like this. Again, we would have some kind of browser prefix, which in this case is going to be for Chrome. Then we're going to be looking for, let's say, Mozilla. And at the very end, we're just going to write a normal CSS property. Uh, let's head over maybe first to can I use dot com. And this is going to give us more ideas. So I can write can I use dot com. And then here I can write whatever property I would like. And most of the cases, let me just show you with CSS grid, because this is still going to be lacking a little bit of support. Now, as you're looking at it, you see that let's say that in IE9, so Internet Explorer, this is just not basically supported. However, in 10, this is a partial support where you would need to use the prefix of MS. And then let's say in 11, again, it says the same thing. However, if I'm going to head over to Chrome, you see that this is all green. So everything is supported. And that way you can decide what is happening with the property and what you would need to do. Now, here is the 10,000 question, $10,000 question. Do you need to add this every time you're looking for the property? And my answer would be no. Let me give you an elaboration why I wouldn't use that right now, why I wouldn't add them manually by hand like this, as well as the actual reasoning behind that. You see, as you're going to be progressing of development, you'll learn many, many ways how you can write all your CSS and then set up some kind of automation where it scans through your CSS file and then adds them automatically at the very end. Instead of you typing this out, let's say three times. And this really gets annoying as far as I'm concerned very quickly. Now, I have to tell you, honestly, I don't remember when is the last time I was typing the browser prefixes. Because again, you use something like gulp, you use, I don't know, another NPM module or anything like that. And they were going to do the work for you where you can set up everything, how you would like to add those browser prefixes, meaning like, let's say for what versions of the browsers and all that. And it is much more faster. So throughout our projects, 
I'm not gonna be adding them manually. This is just not gonna happen because, in my opinion, it clogs up really the CSS and it loses the purpose for me to actually explain everything if you have to look at a bunch of code like this. Now you can do it. I mean, I'm not saying there's nothing wrong with that. You can technically write everything by hand, rule by rule, but I'm just telling you that there's gonna be a much more nicer options how we can just get all the browser prefixes that we need. Uh, also, I would like to show you maybe a one uh, quick and dirty way how we can do that. So if we write auto prefix or GitHub IO, but you can obviously search for it uh, over here like this. So auto prefix, sir, let me write it over here. And then we're going to be looking for this guy. And if you would want, you can just copy and paste it basically. So let's say that I know that there's going to be an issue with linear gradient. And let's imagine that in my CSS, I would have the main heading. Then in the main heading, again, we would copy and paste it normally, let's say our whole CSS file. But in our case, we're going to say, I don't know, uh, background, background, uh, linear, gray. And here we need to have proper dash gradient, right? And as you can see, my spelling is as always awesome. Uh, and then let's write whatever colors, let's say red and blue. And what's going to happen, the actual auto prefixer is going to spit back already prefixed code. You can copy and paste your code here and get everything that you want. But again, this would be a quick and dirty way. There's better ways how you can actually make this automatic where again, it scans through your file. It just basically adds them. And I haven't had an issue where uh, let's say I have to do this manually because everything is done for you. So you can look in the clean CSS. And at the end of the day, you can get all your browser prefixes anyway. And my main point is that we will not going to be adding the browser prefixes in our projects. Excellent. Our next topic is semantic HTML. Okay, well, what does that mean? Well, in general, that means that you use specific elements to structure your content. Instead of div this, div that, spawn this, spawn that, HTML semantic tags are no different than regular tags. Their syntax remains the same. We can still add classes, we can still add IDs to them, and we can style them from the CSS using the element selectors. However, they do provide us with a structure, and their content gives a browser an idea of what to do and how to do it. Using semantic tags also improves your site's accessibility for, let's say, screen readers and keyboard navigation. I would suggest, though, not to get too worked up about it because you have more important things to worry about. And since using them will seem natural, the more projects you're going to build anyway. Okay, so how do we can start working with HTML semantic tags? And first of all, I guess we're going to get rid of everything that we have in the CSS. Then we're also going to head over to index HTML and kind of give you an idea how before HTML semantic tags came along, we were writing HTML and CSS. Let's say we had some kind of nav. So we wrote here div, then div had a class of nav. So within the nav, we placed everything that we had in the nav. Now, again, I'm just going to use three dots to give you an idea. Then let's say you had some kind of a header. Again, you had a div and class, and then here we're writing the banner and so on and so forth. So again, we can write div class, and let's say this is going to be footer. And hopefully you understand the idea. Well, this is technically okay. First of all, it doesn't structure anything in your content. You're just looking at 10,000 divs. And that doesn't really make sense as well as it doesn't tell you the browsers, anything what is happening within your content. And like I said, also the accessibility is an issue because screen readers are not going to differentiate between that. Now, what would be the solution? First of all, let me save the styles here. And we were going to be looking at very general examples because, like I said, as we're working with the projects, we were going to be using those elements. And it's not like just because we're at the element, our site is going to break or anything like that. And like I said also before, I wouldn't really worry about it too much anyway right now because the more projects you're going to build, the more semantic tags you're going to use, the more you're going to remember them, understand them, and life is going to be easier for you. Okay. So we're all going to be looking, we can just say semantics, not semantics, semantic HTML. We can maybe try this one. 
and they pretty much spit you back everything that there is about semantic HTML. And first, maybe we can look at the images. And the general idea would be like this, where for the header, let's say we're going to be use the header element and we're going to have nav element and section section is going to represent some kind of code. Then let's say a side and a footer. And what's happening again, we can add IDs to this. We can add the classes for this. We can place the content here. And just because you add this HTML tag, your HTML or CSS is not going to break. It's just going to give you a structure where you're looking at. You're like, okay, so this is going to be my header where I'm going to have the header. Okay, so this is going to be my nav. And the same way the browser is going to work and the screen readers. Now we're going to understand what is happening. Now, like I said, we were going to be covering this way more in a project because we were just going to use them. So that's the best way how to actually cover this is just to use those elements. Now, if you do want to research more, again, you can go to W3 schools where they again explain everything, what is happening and why would you use them? I'm going to do my explanations as we're working with the project because this is just makes more sense. And in general, the idea would be very simple. We'll just go with some kind of header. Then there's going to be a footer and then everything else I'm going to be structuring within the sections. And then within the section, let's say if I would want something separate, we're just going to, I don't know, set up the article or something like this. We can place the nav within the header. We can use the header within the section. There is, you know, you can have multiple options. It's not as rigid as you think right now. Just because you learned about them doesn't mean that it's exactly how you need to use them. Yeah, there's some general ideas behind them. You probably wouldn't want to put the footer where's the header. But again, if I would be you, I really wouldn't lose too much sleep about it. Awesome. Before we start working hard on our project, why don't we take a look at the amazing snippets that Emmett provides to speed up our workflow? Because at the moment we have been using only one thing, which is basically to generate the tags, the our HTML tags. Well, if any of you have missed that we have been using Emmett all along, or maybe you're not using the Visual Studio Code, if we're going to head over again to the browser and if I'm going to type Emmett, if you don't have the Emmett, meaning if you're not using the Visual Studio Code, because if you are using Visual Studio Code, this is going to be built in right there in the Visual Studio Code. However, if you're not, you can go always here to their documentation and download and add it to your actual text editor. Now, there's probably also going to be an option for you to use some kind of extension. That might be another route that you would want to use. And if you would want to, I don't know, explore more Emmet uh, snippets that we're going to be working on, you can head over to their documentation. And like I said, in general, we have been using only one uh, Emmet a suggestion where we are just getting our tags, meaning as we we're working with a CSS, they were also giving us suggestions. And as a side note, if you would ever want to get the suggestion, so let's say I'm going to type a dot, type something. So this would be my class, but then I press the space bar and I would still want to get the Emmet suggestion in the CSS is going to work exactly the same way. If you're going to press control and space bar, you're going to get the suggestion. Like I said already before, the only thing we're going to be have been covering so far has been creating the tags where we just press whatever name of the tag and we are creating. However, as we're working with Emmet, we have far more options than that. Now, what would be the first one? Well, let's say that there's going to be a heading. However, this heading one is going to have right away a class. So how we would do that? Well, in Emmet, we just need to type dot and now we can start adding the classes. So let's say here, I'm going to say main. So this would be the main class. And you know what? If you think that you'll need more classes, you just need to keep typing dots and the class name. So let's say secondary, then whatever big and then something else. So what you're going to have at the end is a heading one with all of these three classes. OK, so far, so good. Now, we also have an option of working with IDs the same way. So I can say here heading one. And again, we will do the same thing. And then the hashtag and then ID value. Again, we can use the same one. And we're going to be getting the heading one with ID of main. As you already saw it before with the classes and with an IDs, we can put together and obviously we can combine them. So if there's going to be heading three, that's going to have the ID of third and class of third. You can write something like this and we're going to be getting our heading three with some kind of text. And this is something that you're going to see me a lot doing throughout the project 
where I'm just gonna come up with, let's say, some kind of name. So this is gonna be our nav bar. I'm sorry, that's not gonna be a HTML tag, but let's say we're gonna be typing header. Now the header would have some kind of class. So let's say there's gonna be a header. And if we would want to add another class, I don't know, main or something like this, then we're just getting in the header. And this is tremendously going to speed up your workflow where you're going to find it really annoying typing your HTML tags and then later on going and adding classes or IDs. So far, so good. So what else we're having? Well, we can create right away divs with an IDs and with a classes as well. Now, we already know that we can just type the element and then whatever. However, with divs, we have a little bit faster way. So if we know that there's going to be a div, we can just type whatever we're going to be adding for this div. So in this case, let's say that there's going to be a div with an ID of box and then with the classes of box number one, box number two, and so on and so forth. What I'm having right away is the div and I have right away the IDs as well as the classes. Okay, what else we have? Well, we can create children within Elm Emmet. So let's say I'm going to be looking for the div that we're going to have the list item within the unordered list. So I can say like this. And then if we use the angle bracket, that means that now I'm going to be creating children. And we're not limited to unordered list or lists. And I'm just using this as an example. So I can say, you know what? There's going to be a unordered list with a list item. However, your question would be, well, usually when we create unordered lists, we create multiple elements. Don't worry, Emmett got you covered. So again, we can do the same thing where we say div on our list, list item, and let's come up with however list items we would want. We want five, we can just add here this multiplication and just say five. So this is going to create five of them. And right away, we have the div on our list and whatever list items we wanted over here. Well, we can also place a text within the element. So let's say we're going to have some kind of paragraph. And within the paragraph, we're going to write some kind of text. So some text. Now, the syntax would be these uh, curly braces. And the moment, again, we are just going to get the suggestion. And then we're having the paragraph with the text inside of some text. As well as we can combine whatever we're having here. Let's say if we would want to create multiple items, uh, we can say like this. We can say on our list. Then within the on our list, there's going to be list, list items. And we're going to multiply, let's say, by six. So we can say something like this. However, within each and every item, we can place that number there. So for this, we're going to have to use the dollar sign like this. Now, the moment we were going to be looking at it, notice, by the way, right away, we can look at the info of what we're going to be getting anyway. So that's something really neat with Emmet suggestions where you can expand it and you can see what is going to be your result to begin with. So let's say here again. As you see, I lost my suggestions. However, no worries. Just pressing control and space bar, I can get them back. And then either typing return or the tab, I'm going to be getting the values from one to six. So this would be the general snippet uh, syntax with an Emmet that will tremendously is going to speed up our workflow.